still not sure if she was evil, but she was definitely angry. I used to work as a guide, and then as backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert, called Indian Canyon. The spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or early 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead, with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of the little farm. All of that, of course, now was just crumbling, rotten ruins. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week I was also camped in an Indian canyon, but further down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as quote-unquote backup, a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and the spotty satellite phone service, the only reason that we weren't shut down or that people weren't dead was because we were just lucky. Not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now, we had radios and someone listening to them 24-7, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory, anyway. One of the boys' groups was camped at the, at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills about two miles away from me. The other were just a mile beyond them. The girls were close, too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on the top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side and a little road branching off the main dirt road running up the canyon, and the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away. Though to drive to them... I'd have to go back out to the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot. Maybe a five-mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being headed by my wife Jessica, divorced now. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys' groups and the girls' group, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week, and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop any off or anyone off water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot well out of sight of the group on a small smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some big long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a ten foot circle digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it in the sand. I bent them into a dome four feet high and ten feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking it. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter mile away, and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear up to my lodge. As I was walking back down to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me. But when I stopped and looked, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high, wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off, and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' groups in the desert below, and it wouldn't reach me for a couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on the little dormed frame. 
I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all, so I had a pretty close to an airtight, waterproof shelter, as possible with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door, so that once hot rocks had been placed inside, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it to be as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure I had ever built, really. It was nice. I spent a good, maybe an hour, gathering sage and juniper, and I covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was kind of a soft place to sit for an extended period of time, but mostly I did it because I was intending to invite a new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July all crammed inside a sweltering home, just sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rum some onto my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. Next, I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I dug with all three. I left them there and I went to go gather some more. I made this to be a smaller load, because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I stared at the small depression in the sand where I'd placed it minutes before, and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it off at the edge of a creek twenty feet away. I had that feeling again like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and I put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there, though the flat, soft, dry sand? I don't think it could go through that. I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling of being watched come back, except this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out of the woods and find whoever it was. The radio which I kept on me, strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but it suddenly crackled to life. Brian and the boys' group, doing evening checks, you know, a little early, so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably thirty of them into a a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled all the dry wood and brush that I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath because that was, that feeling was back. Still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly big, I saw someone moving fast through the trees straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me in my sweat lodge and my ten-foot-tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting all you down. But when you called in, but... I considered this to be your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're all just finishing up dinner. I'll go get Katie and Jess, and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of the three of you come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, 
No, I don't think so. Why? It's nothing, I said. I just thought somebody might have come down looking for me when I was out gathering some rocks. Some of my stuff was in different places than I remember leaving it all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had the time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it. I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my little sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said, accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse that we make on the trail that we call possibles bags, to disguise the fact that we're in fact grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It'll help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It'll be a very hot place once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it's important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge using some long willow poles that I'd made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know that we were married, and we'd found it best not to let the kids know or people in the new wilderness know because it could become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hollowed ground. I made the last-minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys' group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried that I'd end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. And also... The smell. Also, also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, but off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice, and that maybe I'd join the next session if Katie, or to Katie, as if she was the last to enter and I sealed the door behind them, burying the edges of the poncho in the sand, like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two, and felt... hot. So I walked into the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards, and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least ten minutes enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up in those trees. I stared hard, and I couldn't see first anybody, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine thirty or forty feet away. Too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl, with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me, and the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath and did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough. I'm not a runner, but I was sure that they had been headed in the direction away from the little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone about an eighth of an, I guess an eighth of a mile, almost to the road where I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. 
My blood ran cold and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing I saw was making any sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had been pulled and ripped off. And they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground, in the bushes, and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar, and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. "'What happened?' I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. "'We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a bit about, you know, what it means to know your personal history.' The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought that you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer. We had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold, like really cold, and it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight that I had. We started them checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were the lucky ones and lucky that no one got hurt and so on and so forth. And amidst skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to the camp. But Katie stayed. Katie, who'd been with me through so many other unexplainable things out there, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire's out, like it's cold out. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago also feel like they've been sitting in a creek. That's what she said. What are you not saying, Dan? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a little Native American girl who can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, the first one that you rolled into the circle, and I walked away for a few minutes, and when I returned, it was over by the creek, like someone came and moved it. But there were no tracks, and I couldn't have rolled it there. Then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and I heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I had chased her for about 30 seconds when you all screamed and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three in the morning early, Jessica woke everybody up and said that it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and wouldn't drop it till we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars when I wake up, so I moved in close just in case but I didn't get under the tarp. Neither did Will or Josh. He's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before I got before it got light out, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and I was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little native girl with two braids and a blue and gray headband up in the tree over to my face staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh on the other side of the shelter yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream until I talked to Jess about the quote-unquote rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been really worried about the rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt someone reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over to face her for a few minutes. She said that she was terrified to open her eyes. 
When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of nowhere. Or rather, in the middle of everybody. Opposite of nowhere. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled up and sat up. I was grateful that he did, but curious as to why. He told me that he had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought that he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off. That's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point, and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me, and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about his horrible dream about a little girl dying in that cabin when it was burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, had told everyone that we're trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's the new guy, is in on it too, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie, it's probably a good idea for everyone to be under a shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group's site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while, but then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. Skinwalker Summer before I was born, there was a systemic program that destroyed Native American culture and ripped off the United States government while doing so. It was also victimizing many of those that intended it to serve. I speak now of the Native American Indian training schools or boarding schools set up by various churches and government entities in the United States during the 19th and first half of the 20th century. The goal was both assimilation and elimination teach the Native Americans housed in the school how to be good Christians and Americans with useful skills and abilities with English, but at the same time suppress their own language, religion, and culture, and get paid by the state to do it. Now don't get me wrong, there's some good that came out of the system. There were job opportunities that became available to graduates that they would never have had otherwise, but the cost to benefit was ultimately not worth it. Many participants were victimized in every way that a child can be victimized. In my own ever-be-humble opinion, the best thing to come out of this program was the rejection of forced assimilation and the resurgence of interest in traditional languages, cultures, and religions. But like I said, this was way before I was born. During my life, there was a weak continuation of the program in many areas of the country, some churches continued to propagate a Christianization of Native Americans by offering their children placement in good Christian homes during the school year where they could get a white man's education. Yes, that's the term they used, and it is offensive, and learn English as well as be taught quote-unquote proper religion. This program has now been largely discontinued. Current efforts are to build up the educational opportunities available to the reservations to where a proper education is available to all. I have personally volunteered time and money to such enterprises and will continue to do so. Early Years In my early years growing up, my two older sisters often complain about seeing things in the house that freak them out that none of the rest of us saw. I personally thought it was all in their heads because whenever I would come in the room, they claimed it would stop. I never saw anything. I won't venture to describe much what they did. That's their story to tell if they ever care to. 
Let's just say they were frequent mentions of floating eyes and disembodied heads and faces. Again, I never saw any of that. But I did end up spending many nights vigil on the floor of one of their rooms as a preventative. I honestly suspected that it related to maybe confirming a peeping Tom issue that we had in the neighborhood that seemed aimed at the little girls on our street. This detail frames our initial responses to the event that this post describes, as well as some of the aftermath. The setup. When my older sister Layla was 12 years old, she made a friend at school. Lily is from the Navajo Nation Reservation in the Four Corners area where Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona all touch. It's the only place in the United States where four states come together and a bit of a tourist trap moneymaker for the Navajo Nation who owns the place, where it happens to be. I visited it once. It's pretty cool to get your picture taken with each foot and hand in each different state. Worth the cost to visit at least once in your life, and believe me, the money goes to good ends. Lily is living with a good Christian family for the school year, and she and Layla did off. In previous posts on other subreddits, I've described how my mother, Canary, was a Christian missionary to Japan, who ended up doing research and writing books in both English and Japanese, that they were not particularly Christian in nature. We were raised with Japanese actively spoken in her home, and at gatherings and activities outside of our home. Many of my parents' friends were Japanese. We were taught to respect the language, religion, and culture of others, period didn't matter which ones. And so, as Lily learns better English, Layla learns some Navajo. As Lily and Layla share religious experiences in a Christian context, Layla learns from Lily the ways of her religion, and it's mutually enriching. But then the school year draws to an end, and Lily's to return home a few states away. Layla's distraught. Canary opens discussions with Lily's mother, and it's decided that Layla will go home with Lily since there is room on the bus taking many young Navajos back home. They will return together in the fall when the new school year starts. And so begins a pattern that will continue for much of Layla's remaining years of grade school. Lily never lives with us, or not considered a suitable host family for a number of reasons. But she always returns to the same family, so she remains in the same school. Layla spends her summers on the reservation, and boy, she comes back home tanned. But even with the natural darkening of the skin, her blonde hair made blonder by that same exposure to the sun, and blue eyes are impossible to hide. She's not of a dine, said Dinah. The Trigger When Layla is 17, she's helping Lily's family at a roadside stand where they sell much of their jewelry. Lily's family is famous for their silver and turquoise jewelry. What they don't sell to trading posts, they sell directly along the roadside. Something Lily made very clear from the beginning is that Layla would not be learning anything about making jewelry. Family secrets are family secrets, and even other Navajo families would like to learn her family's techniques. This is a multi-generational nope. But Layla can help. This family sell wares, however. On this day, things did not go well. They make some good sells. That's not the issue. They have a visit from a person whom the family pays great deference. Layla has never seen them so respectful with anyone before. The visitor speaks no English, but is clearly very unhappy about the presence of my sister with the family. Her aspect is angry and indignant. While Layla barely understands what she says, the gist is understood. When the visitor is left, Lily's mother tells Layla, Tomorrow you go home. I cannot protect you from this. And so, Layla returns home for a month early by Greyhound. She gives no explanation. It will be years until I get the full story that I'm sharing here. The Consequence about a week after Layla returns home, some things start to happen. To understand this part of the story, you need to understand a bit about the layout of our neighborhood. Our house is on a three-quarter acre 
0.3 hectare lot at the end of a circle with a farm on one side and a small river running behind it. At this time, the other side of the river is mostly fields and horse pastures. There's animals we normally see here. We have about a hundred cats living in and around the property. We have dogs, we have frogs and muskrats and other creatures that need the river to live. We have snakes and every kind of insect that you can imagine. We're too far into the populated area to ever see any large predators, though. No mountain lions, no coyotes, no wolves, no bears, no foxes, and not really even many raccoons. There are cows and horses in the neighborhood, and a rooster crow will wake us up most mornings. But this night, I'm awakened from a deep sleep by Layla. We all gather into the highest room in the house, the room where Layla sleeps when she's home. There is a howling in the breeze coming from somewhere beyond the river. I'm not clever enough to know the difference between wolf and coyote howls, but it's definitely along those lines. I've heard this song before when on a survival camp in the desert. It came clear and crisp on the wind and woke me then. It was so cold at night in the desert. The fire was out, but the howls were far away, so no worries. Then a response came from the other side of us and it was much too close for comfort. I didn't sleep again that night. And now something like that song is being sung here in town, where it has no business of being. And it's getting closer. At my oldest sister's instruction, we all join in prayer together. After that, I don't recall much more that night. I wake up in the morning on the floor in my sister's room, when asking about last night, no one will talk about it. I have a million questions, but will get no answers. And then night comes again. This time we're all gathered in my sister's room, and the sleeping bags are brought out. We pray together, and eventually drift off to Wonderland. Only to be awoken by howling again, only much closer. I drift in and out of sleep. In the morning, there are scratch marks on the back door. Only they're too high for a normal canine to have made. And they are deep and powerful. The Medicine Woman This day, Layla is able to get Lily on the phone. After they talk, my oldest sister drives Layla somewhere. But again, no one is telling me anything. I'll later learn that Lily gave Layla the name of a medicine woman near us. Name and address, no phone number. Lily told her to tell the medicine woman what had happened on the reservation and that a dog man had been sent. In the evening, Canary brings a priest to bless the house in each of us. After he leaves, my sister brings in a short old Navajo woman with a deep smile and a great deal of silver and turquoise, literally from head to foot. She wears a short round hat and has her hair in two long gray braids down both sides of her face. They go at least to her knees, have a lot of silver and turquoise woven in them as well. She has three bundles of smudge. One is definitely white sage, but I have no idea what the other two are. She smudges the house and each of us. She uses each of the bundles for different things. She chants and sings in Navajo the whole time. My sisters go into my sister's room with her, and you can hear talking and more singing. I'm not allowed to see it, and I've never spoken of it again. We again huddle in my sister's room that night. We pray together and sing church songs together. The old Navajo woman sits in a chair in the hall beside the back door and watches and listens and hums to herself. When the howling starts, she gets up and walks outside. Tonight, the howling stays distant. It never approaches. In the morning, the old woman smiles at me kindly. She says, Three more. Layla explains that we all need to do it again for three more nights. And we do. Smudge and chant and songs and prayer. The howling seems further each night. The last night is not heard at all. Howling of that kind will never be heard again in my neighborhood. In the morning, Layla makes a gift to the old woman, some beautiful pieces of jewelry that Lily and her family had given to her over the years. They are accepted gracefully. 
looking at one of or looking at one that had particular emotional importance to my sister, she shakes her head and hands it back. No. She keeps the rest. Her smile is rather deep at me as she leaves. I'll never see her again, but I can never forget her deep, pure smile. She was a force for good in the world. Later. When in later years, as I learned the rest of the story described above, I asked Layla to explain Dogman to me. She just smiles and says that talking about it will invite it, and that it's not an invitation that she's making. She will speak no further about it. Layla and Lily continue to be as close as any sisters, but Lily will never allow Layla to return to live with her on the reservation ever again. She says it's too dangerous. Lily does eventually live with us. She lives rent-free while going to college. For all intents and purposes, she's my sister. I ask her once about this evening, and she smiles and chides me with one phrase that I hear most often from her. You talk too much. She then tells me that this is not for me, and that's all I'm ever going to get from her on that matter. From what I've been able to gather from hearing my sister speak on the matter twice more over the years and just picking up things here and there, it seems that no matter where my sister went, this dog man would have found her, and it wouldn't have ended well. The medicine woman helped us by misdirecting it and sent it an impossible trail to follow and keep it busy. Until this assignment was replaced by a new one, I could be wrong about this, but that's what it sounded like to me. I have, of course, since heard of skinwalkers, and I now realize that this is in a modern term for maybe what Lily was calling a dogman back in the day. It wasn't a term that any of us had heard of when these events happened. I never saw it. I was never told too much about it. I'm not a source of any useful information on the topic, really can only relate what happened one summer many decades ago when my sister returned home unexpectedly early from the reservation. The Aftermath In the years after this event, my older sisters would move out and on with their lives. During the winter following these events, I start to wake up in my room from time to time to find a floating face of a beautiful woman over me. As gorgeous as she is terrifying, and in a flash it's gone. This only ever happened in the lower part of the house. In the highest part of the house, next to my sister's room where we gathered in those tense nights in August, there's a large family room. After these events, every time I take a nap on that sofa in that room, the sleep is fitful and disturbed. I have no history of sleep paralysis at this time, but now experience something like it. I wake up unable to move or speak, fight myself upright only to find that I'm dreaming and now awake unable to move or speak and cycle would continue on like that. I sometimes fight for up to six layers of dreams of waking up until I'm actually awake and perfectly able to move and speak, more like a dream of sleep paralysis than the actual thing. As I'm drifting off to sleep on this sofa, I'll sometimes feel a weight on top of me. It often feels like it falls through me. I feel like I'm out of sync with my body and either floating over it or falling through it again and again and again. It's like a dream of falling and not falling at the same time. Yet at the same time, on the edge of the sleep, I hear a cacophony of voices chanting some indecipherable something that sounds like a black-masked clip of the Beatles. It is maybe three seconds long, then it stops, and a few minutes later starts again. Sometimes in one ear, sometimes the other, sometimes both, but not in sync. This also happens a few times in the lower part of the house. I dread falling asleep on that sofa, and yet I seem to irresistibly drop off on it quite frequently. Nowhere else in the house do I experience this combination of odd dreams and sensations. I do not know if all this relates to the events of that summer. I only know that it never happened before, and never stopped happening, after for as long as I've lived in that house. A 
I've been watched my whole life. 27. I've been thinking about putting this here for a while, but I've been delaying organizing all the events on paper. There's a lot. I keep remembering more and more every time I pass over this with a red pen. So I'm sorry if it's grown into a huge post by the time it sees the light of day. So to speak. Basically, throughout my life there's been a figure, or a few, following me from house to house, sleepover to sleepover, and even appearing at work and school sometimes. I know what you're thinking. I promise I'm not crazy. It would be impossible for other people to react to these events too, if they were all in my head. And though I try to be as investigative and rational as I can whenever something strange happens around me, check the windows, doors, locks, check for intruders, etc. There's still a huge number of instances that I have no answers for, nor does my family. The earliest memories I have of the ghosts was as a child. When my mother remarried, she moved in with him and his two children, younger than me, both of whom have experienced things too. It was a small two-bed, one-bath. Outside of the room where my step-siblings and I slept was a small corridor, which basically was only big enough so that when you entered it, leaving the kitchen, the bathroom was on your left and the bedroom was on the right. That's it. And that's the spot I first remember seeing a man who would stand just outside the bedroom door every night. He was at least six feet tall. He had boots on with filthy pants that wrinkled loosely about his legs. I never saw what he was wearing up top, but I did get the impression that he had great big eyes. I was too afraid to look at him directly. I still don't like to think about that face. We'd have the door cracked a bit for the kitchen light to come in at night, and he'd suddenly appear and block out that light. He'd just stand there, looking at us through the door. We'd call out to our parents, but there was never anything there to show them by the time that they arrived from the master bedroom on the other side of the house. This and the typical shadow people stuff, like leaning into doorways, as well as items disappearing, carried on for the next few years. Whenever my cousins would come over for a sleepover, they would become nervous upon entering the house. And if they just knew something was wrong... They started showing me pictures on their new camera phones. Remember when we called them that? And they were pictures of orbs. I told them it was just dust. They'd sometimes ask me if anyone else was home because they could hear voices coming from the next room. By then, I knew we had something paranormal going on for certain. But I didn't believe them at first. Because how could they have experienced something new before me at my own house? Well, soon after, I started hearing my mother call me into the room, and it turned out to be empty. Voices. Check. I started to think that I was losing my mind at seven years old. We were also starting to spot people walking around in rooms if the door was slightly cracked. People as in new figures, not just the man from the doorway. People walking in circles aimlessly or waving their arms around. Why are ghosts always doing the strangest things? I once saw a woman with blonde hair and a red dress with large white polka dots. And they leapt into my parents' bedroom from the living room where I was watching TV. She didn't approach the door. I didn't see her beforehand. She just appeared mid-stride and just sailed into the next room and disappeared. I just saw the tail end of her dress... I could make out the blonde hair from my peripheral vision. She made no sound. My whole family's Hispanic with no light-haired people in our circles at the time, and there's no way our parents had anybody over at our house, especially that tiny house without everyone even knowing. About 2003, I was maybe nine by then. We were getting ready to move into a bigger house, which was way better suited for the needs of our family. I was looking forward to literally geographically getting away from that house, the ghosts, the dread of nightfall. It seemed like a nice prospect, until my first day alone in the house. 
My parents were very trusting of us kids and left us at home during breaks during school. We were watching TV, and then my stepbrother and sister and I started hearing a clapping sound. It was coming from one of the back rooms. Scared, we went to look, but there was nobody there. Clapping? Yep. One person clapping loudly, as if to congratulate a performance, but there was nobody back there. And it was my stepsister's room that it was coming from. The door was closed. And no, we did not open it until our parents came home. It should also be noted that my stepdad's brother moved into the small house shortly after we moved into the new house, and no paranormal activity has been reported there since. Happenings still happened regularly at the new house. However, sightings through doorways, full conversations in empty rooms, and electronics turning on and off on their own, typical ghost stuff. And we grew up, and we were just kind of learning to shrug it off. It became a thing for any one of us to suddenly declare that they'd just seen something because honestly, it happened that often. Here's a side note. We had a dog while we were at this new house, and the dog's name was Nemo, who shortly passed away under unknown circumstances. He just died out of nowhere. We buried him in the backyard and put a cross there, but removed it shortly after the new dog started peeing on it. Okay, back to the story. The night we first got the second dog, Charlie, I put him in his little kennel, which was situated at the foot of my bed. I latched the door shut and climbed into bed. Shortly after, I heard Charlie's collar jingling, so I assumed that he was awake and started to whimper. Not thinking, I patted on the bed next to me like I used to for Nemo, and shortly after, I heard claws rough scratch the carpet. You know, like when a dog kicks off the ground when it jumps, and then the bed slouched where he landed. I felt small paw prints circle around, and a little body flop down on my bed at my, by my feet. It was then that my heart started to flurry as I remembered that I had closed and locked Charlie's kennel. There was not supposed to be a dog on my bed. So I hopped out and turned on the light, and lo and behold... Charlie is still in his kettle, and there's nothing on my bed. I didn't sleep that night, and needless to say, that little guy and I became best friends after. I'd hold on to him on nights that I was really scared. Not that anyone's asking, but as of writing, 33121, he's 16 and still running around. Old for a miniature schnauzer. Probably not related to the ghost stuff, but it's abnormal enough for a dog of his type, so I thought it's worth pointing out. Around this time, circa 2009, something new had started to occur. I called it the glaring, because that's what it felt like. It didn't feel like I was being watched, it felt like I was being stared at heavily. Picture walking into a busy room and everyone stops what they're doing and just glare at you. No talking, no breaking eye contact. Glaring. Now imagine that room is always the darkest and coldest one, despite having the largest windows. It felt thick. The glaring happened in several rooms sporadically, but it almost always presided over the front living room, which is why our family had taken back the den space more warmly. Instead, I've just sort of grown up and have since moved out and so far as I know they still don't use that front room much it was also at this time that I started feeling the bottoms of my shirt get pulled on as if a child was trying to get my attention I also remember an instance when the glass sconce over the hallway light was thrown across the hall I had just walked past it to go to the bathroom and I was just closing the door I heard a humongous crash. I opened the door and saw pieces of glass spinning across the floor. My mom asked, what was that? And I just told her to come look. That sconce was attached to the wall in such a way that it looked like it had been lifted out of the metal setting, which was screwed into the wall and then pushed out from the wall in order to become loose enough to even come close to maybe falling down. 
or else it would just fall back into its metal setting. I know I hadn't closed the door, so it couldn't have been vibrations from a closing door. We still don't have answers. And I've returned to that sconce fixture time and time again, trying to figure out how it came off of its rest. The bulb is still bare to this day. I never replaced it. Ugh. Now, I mentioned before that we had been seeing figures leaning into doorways or rooms peeking at us. But one time particularly jarred me. It was a night when my step-siblings were there and my family and my parents had stepped across the street to pick, up, to pick me up at my neighbor's yard. So I was alone. I was studying on my bed without my glasses on. I'm nearsighted. And I start detecting one of those figures from my peripherals. It gets real quiet around me like the air got sucked out of the room or something. I look up with my fuzzy vision and I see that familiar shape pull its head back and hide on the other side of my door to the hallway. Oh, hey there, ghosty. I say and I return to studying. Then it comes back again and this time when I look up, it doesn't pull back immediately. It hesitates for a second. And before it quickly vanishes behind the door, I saw its face. No details because I was... Like I said, I wasn't wearing my glasses. Except for the most prominent features that I could see. Great big eyes. I freaked the F out and called my parents to come back home because the ghosts and they came home right away. At the time, I must have been 15. Almost every night this entire time, I'd awaken in the night to look out into the hallway and I'd see that man just standing there in the dark. Other times I could hear footsteps in the dark entering the hallway of the kitchen and heading up to the doorway of my bedroom and then stop and start walking in place. Pat, 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 pat. Shoes tapping the tile floor, just behind the slightly cracked door. I could see the shadow figure out there going up and down with every step, always looking directly in my direction, as if they knew I was watching them too. God, that freaks me out, I just remembering it. I remember thinking how illogical it was. Seeing things that weren't there must make me crazy, right? I moved away from there when I was 19 and moved in with my partner, whom I'll later marry. We've been in several apartments and have rented rooms. Every single place we go, there are those figures. There are voices. There are things going missing. My partner and I once found a small child-sized handprint on the sliding glass door of our third-story apartment. We have no kids and no kids visited us, and we definitely cleaned it since we moved in. We also have seen a man sitting on our bed, tying his boots from the corner of our eye on several occasions. When I was 25, I think, I reconnected with my biological father and he told me stories that he remembered from when I was small. It was just him, my partner, and me having breakfast at Denny's or IHOP or something. It had been since I was three or four years old since I'd seen him. He was telling me about the times that I'd wake up at night and he'd pull out some crackers and cheese for me to eat as a midnight snack without my mom knowing. But I digress. He continued into some weird things that happened when I was little. He said that on several nights... He would come into my room to check on me sleeping and he'd hear me talking as he approached. As he got closer, he said he almost thought he heard a voice say something back to me. That's when he charged into the room and asked who I was talking to. He said that I didn't know and out loud he just told whatever was there to leave me alone and leave us in peace. I guess it did until he was out of the picture and the new stepdad took his place. That story sends shivers down my spine, not because I remember it, because I don't, but in the back of my mind I always knew that there had been something watching me. Ever since the corona lockdowns have been a thing, and now that we're spending more time at home, we're noticing less and less activity going on. While it's been extremely unsettling journeying with these entities, none of us have ever felt at risk of harm. And so I never sought help to rid ourselves of them. It's just surprising now, that's all. It's been so many years. 
I still hear talking and movement in other rooms. The sounds of fabric like someone's clothes are moving around in the room. It can be heard sometimes in midday. It's all just nuts. The hole in my room. My house has had portal problems for as long as I can remember. We don't have a haunting per se, since we believe it's a vortex of some sort for spirits and entities to cross through, so they come and go. But most stay a while before leaving, if they ever do. There's a cemetery up the street that I frequent often, and we speculate a possible connection between the two. I decided to compile a select few stories from over the years in case it may be of interest to someone, because it sure as hell interests me. My chest was getting very tight just typing this out. I'm aware I over-explained things, but I think I'd rather provide more information than needed rather than less. Obligatory, I'm on a mobile, so sorry if any formatting issues occur. You know the drill. Background. My siblings, a 27-year-old male and 24-year-old female, and I, an 18-year-old female, were raised in the same house since birth. My brother has since moved out twice, while my sister and I remain at home with our parents. We're all pretty intuitive and sensitive when it comes to energies, particularly my sister and I. Ever since we were young, we individually decided that there's some sort of portal in our basement, which is now referred to exclusively as the hole. The hole resides in an unfinished part of the basement, which was used for storage for the first 22-ish years of my parents owning it. It's an odd indent built into the wall that goes from floor to ceiling floorboards, just wide enough for a person to stand in, behind where the wall would be if there were, if it were built right or straight, however you'd like to put it. It's in the far corner of the room, the only one not visible from the door. When it was storage, the room connected at the opposite corner from the hole to our laundry room, like the corners of the room overlapped and formed a high doorway between. Activity. Whenever I was young, for as far back as I can remember, I was petrified to go into the room. Whenever my mom asked me to get her something or anything like that, or even just to go to the laundry room without quickly switching on the light in the storage before running from the door as fast as possible, which was still extremely nerve-wracking for me, especially little me. On the occasion that I didn't turn on the light, I could feel something watching me intently from the opposite corner. Twice I saw what I think were glowing eyes in the dark. Around the same time as the aforementioned was occurring, I was having repetitive nightmares for years until I was probably maybe nine or ten, I believe. It was the exact same spot up to a point. I was being hunted by a man with half of a face through an abandoned hospital. The only difference is that every night he'd inevitably catch me. He would torture me to death in a new way each time, seemingly more sadistically each time than the last. I'd wake up just as I began to feel what I'm pretty sure was my life fading away. It felt so real, so painful. I'd wake up with marks occasionally that corresponded to what had actually happened in the nightmare the night before. Take note that this was when I was five, possibly younger, round about till about ten-ish, and my mother was careful to shelter me from any violent media or concepts when I was young, so these ideas shouldn't have been imaginable for me at the time. When I finally worked up the courage to tell my mom about my nightmares, she prayed over me and blessed me with holy water. Catholic moms, man. And within a week, with her continuing to pray for it to stop, they suddenly disappeared, and I noticed that the entity was making me petrified downstairs, was either gone or not showing itself anymore. We came to the conclusion later that whatever it was had attached itself to me and was feeding off of my fear of it through the influence of my dreams. She thinks it was a demon, but I'm not sure of that. Small things happened over the years, 
but from the time I was about 10 to 13, it was nothing remarkable. Yet when I turned 13, my brother and his girlfriend moved in after she got pregnant or pregnant in order to be able to provide best for their child. We converted the storage room into a quote-unquote apartment for them. He finished off a small square of the laundry room to be my niece's room for the time, so the two rooms were no longer openly connected. We had barely ever entered the room in years, but it still had a very heavy feeling after so much time. While moving stuff around, activity like things going missing and popping back up, and electronics turning on and off began to start up. Whoever was here at the time, they didn't like being disturbed very much. After my brother and near sister-in-law got settled in, it died back down, partially because they felt the hole was too ominous and covered it with particle board that remains there to this day, but stayed active enough to let us know that something was still there. It would turn on flashlights that had dead batteries in them from the year before or require a hard push to turn the button on and off. And when you go to grab them, Sometimes it would set my niece's electronic toys in the middle of the night, knock on walls and whisper, stuff like that. We just learned to get used to it after a while of being in the room often. This past summer, my brother's family moved into their new place and moved into the apartment to escape my traumatic old room upstairs, which is a whole different issue itself. Of course, as they began packing stuff up, the activity got more noticeable again, as well as when I was moving my stuff in. I've been here since about July, and I think I've experienced more activity in the room in the past four to five months than all of my life before combined. I began not only hearing them and seeing their influence on electronics more and more, but sometimes seeing figures and seeing them interact with non-electronic objects, like opening and closing the doors in the basement when no one's looking. In the beginning, the first I saw was when I rolled over at night and glanced toward the foot of the bed, toward the hole, where I saw the silhouette of someone's shoulders up for a split second. It didn't make me feel scared, but unsettled me for a moment as anyone would if they saw someone in the room at night. The entities would listen when you talk about them in the house. We can tell. So I talked to my sister about it the next day and said something along the lines of, it's kind of rude of me not to have a couch in my room yet. He could have just sat in the corner of the bed if he wanted. Well, the next night I came back from the bathroom, opened my door to a dim light of my wax melter, and I swear up and down that I saw the corner of my bed before flipping on the light after a split second. Obviously there is no figure when the light was turned on, but there was an impression of a butt on my bed sheets as if someone had just been sitting there. This confirmed that they definitely listen to what we say in the house, at least, but they seem to be more responsive when not being talked to directly. So it's easiest to just talk about it with my sister to influence their behavior. Every once in a while, I'll feel a new presence appear. One of the most noteworthy newcomers was a real dick to start. In the beginning of it, I'd feel a massive feeling of dread that someone was standing right behind my door to my room, about six feet tall. After a few times of just standing, he switched to walking down the stairs, right by my room, but only the bottom six stairs, and then proceed to stand at my door for minutes. This mostly happened at night, and when I told my family about it, my mom took me out of the house to tell me that she'd heard it too, and I'm not crazy. She thought it was me going downstairs, but she waited to hear my door open and close, but she never did, because who she heard wasn't me. I think the worst time that he got me was the last time he tried to mess with me. It was just about noon, and I was watching TV in my room while, my home, while I was home alone, when I heard the sound of someone walking down the bottom half of the stairs. He stood at my door for a minute without making a sound before starting to slowly jiggle my door handle. I thought I was going to have a panic attack because the only exit had an unknown entity on the other side of the door. I sat frozen for at least 15 minutes, just watching my handle jiggle, until it stopped when my dad came home. 
For some reason, the fact that it was in the middle of the day made it feel even more threatening. I got really fed up at this point, and I started ranting loudly to my sister about how he's all talk and isn't going to do shit. How he's just wanting to intimidate me and needs to learn his place in this household. I honestly expected a little bit of backlash, but he only walked down the stairs one more time that night before stopping, and hasn't happened since. Most recently, a couple weeks ago, my mom decided to try to pray away the portal for no reason because they hadn't caused anyone harm or annoyance in a long time and I honestly enjoy their company. I've never wanted to banish any entities or their means of transportation if they haven't done anything harmful. Since she made the first prayer, they've been very upset with my mom and more shy around me compared to before. The day or two after she prayed, I was near the top of the stairs making pizza rolls when my mom went downstairs to do laundry, singing on the way. When she was halfway down the stairs, my bedroom door that I'd left open slammed closed. The door swings open rather than closed, and it was done with force. They wanted to make sure that she knows they're upset with her. The next night when she's taking a bath, when the towel hanging behind her head fell into the water. She said in all the years of living here, that hasn't happened to her once, but didn't think much of it until she went down to reach for the towel on the floor and saw the hand towel across the room pulled to the floor. To say the least, she wasn't pleased with being bothered during bath time. Since she decided to make this prayer... I've noticed they will not be active while I'm in the room anymore at all. But practically as soon as I step foot outside, there's tons of movements and sounds starting up. I'll come back, and my door will be open when I left it closed, or vice versa. And sometimes things will even be moved slightly before I return to the moon. I'm not sure why they're feeling the need to be so much more active when there aren't any direct witnesses at the moment. I don't get the feeling that they're mad at me. They're just upset that someone tried to close their portal that's probably significant to them. I tried my best to coexist with them peacefully and be kind. And it kind of feels like she ruined the bond, which I know sounds insane, but it's a kind of a weird situation that I'm in, and I've also learned to accept. I care for them and their well-being regardless of their physical person or if they're not a physical person. And she offended my guests. That time I did security in a haunted building. First off, I know not all believe in otherworldly things. No cheese off my biscuit. You do you. I'm not here to tell you you're wrong. I can only share what I experienced for myself and leave you to draw your own conclusions. I'm assigned to an extended coverage over the better part of a year in a hundred-year-old haunted building in the downtown area of our major city. I will spend most of my weekend nights patrolling while there in the process of reconstruction and asbestos removal. Every weekend, I arrive to find different areas inaccessible due to asbestos abatement or other construction needs. The project takes longer as a fair amount of the building is being actively used by businesses, which makes the reconstruction trickier. Many of the changes being made are a postmodern insult to the classic features of the building. It hurts my heart to watch the beautiful and elegant appointments give way to the new stylish and moronic ones. The bathrooms had solid granite stall dividers. Now they feature mundane modern metal ones. Classic 100-year-old chandeliers get replaced by LED moon ring lights. It's like putting bright lipstick and rave glasses on the Mona Lisa. At the beginning of the construction, there are two side hallways that remain intact from the original build out of the building, and that feature the original office config. They'll both be destroyed before the construction is finished. One of them is on the twelfth floor, and even on the brightest light of day, that particular corridor is oppressive and creepy. 
You simply cannot get enough light into that space to make it feel bright and cheery. Now, I am told by the tenants and staff of various deaths associated with the building over its 100-year history. The lawyer shot by his jilted lover on the top floor. It was the long-forgotten trial of the century from the same century that saw the O.J. Simpson case. She was also acquitted, despite having confessed to doing it. The young woman in white, who purportedly tried to fly from the roof and failed. The three-year-old who cries in the basements. Something to do with childhood measles, I'm told. But nowhere do I find any reports that feature the twelfth floor. That notwithstanding, there's something dark and brooding in that corridor. If the light is out, down that hall at night... I shine my flashlight down it and move on quickly. The Full Moon Now there's one particularly active night, by which I mean the whole building seems to be vibrating with energy and strange things afoot. It is the 13th of the month, and a full moon at that. Wheeled scaffolding in one area under construction is in a different location on every patrol. I never see or hear it move, but it's all over the place that night. Now, this has happened before, and it remains a creepy curiosity, but this night, it was just more than normal. On the second to top floor, I can see what appears to be the shadow of another person coming up behind me, and from the position of its head relative to my own head, there may be five feet, 1.5 meters away, when I spin around and see nothing. Just an empty hallway. Looking back the other way, the second shadow's gone. And so, I go on down quickly to the twelfth floor. As I walk down the long main corridor toward the old creepy side corridor, I feel like I'm being watched. I look down that creepy pit of darkness without any use of a light. And there, to my horror... See in the blackest black against the black, the shadow figure of a man standing in the middle of the hall with his head flopped to one side in the most unnatural way. If not for it being at eye level, it really looks like a hanging man. With no hesitation, I shine my flashlight down the hall to get a better look and see. Nothing. Just an empty hallway. I lower the flashlight again. And now, it's just a black hallway. The figure does not reappear in the returning darkness. I've had enough of this corridor for the night. I will not patrol it again this shift. I turn to go down the stairs to the 11th floor. I have this intense feeling that I should watch my step. Like someone or something wishes to push me down the stairs. I grip the rails on both sides as I descend. A few steps down... I feel a gust of air on my back. There is nothing in the building that can produce a draft on these stairs. This weekend is the only time I ever feel a gust of air on any of the stairs in the building. But now, while feeling like I need to watch my step, I do. In the early morning, shortly after sunrise, I turn the keys over to my relief for the next 12 hours. I say nothing to him of the events of the night. When I return 12 hours later for my next shift, he shares with me having felt unsafe on one of the stairs in the building and even feeling wind on his back. He can't figure out where it came from. I ask him which stairs. Of course, it's the same stairs from the 12th floor to the 11th floor where I had felt it the night before. My first patrol that night, I again feel unsafe on that stair and a much smaller puff of air at the back of my head. I turn and yell. You've got to do better than that if you really want to scare me. Nothing else happens this shift. The building returns again to its quiet and calm. Afterwards. Until they tear out this creepy corridor to replace it with a modern office configuration, I always make sure to get all the lights down and have them turned on before the sun goes down. Some four months later, I learned from one of the tenants that a man had hung himself in that hall on the 12th floor during the 1930s. Somehow, this news came as no surprise to me. 
Meanwhile, the scaffolding still moves around at night, even when no one's in the building to move it. I once or twice hear a crying sound in the basement. The first time I think it might have been a cat, but the building manager assures me that there are no cats. It's the three-year-old ghost, he says. He also says he doesn't believe in ghosts, so... One tenant relates being approached on the top floor by a dapper old gentleman in a very outdated suit who simply vanishes before saying anything. He thinks it is the shot lawyer. I never see anything there. The floor feels at peace. If he is there, he's not as upset about things as the hangman on the 12th floor. Now when they do start to dismantle that original hallway on the 12th floor creepy presence brooding down there becomes rather more active and a bit less predictable. I now feel it increasingly out in the main corridor that still remains essentially unchanged from the original build. At first it feels angry towards me. It wants me scared and it wants me hurt. I dread going to that floor on every patrol. Some patrols I take the elevator from the floor above or below, look out at that floor and then go to the next floor and leave it at that. Then I start to feel it in the middle of the main corridor in front of the elevators waiting for me. If I take the stairs down, I always feel the malicious presence wanting me to slip, trip, or fall down those stairs. But to be honest, I hate going there for a completely different reason, too. I can't begin to express how much I dislike the tacky changes that they're making to this classic building. It feels like a violation of her beautiful, turn-of-the-century soul. On one occasion, when the creepy, brooding presence seems to be absent, I look over what they're doing to the space, and that's mostly been the side corridor, and I shake my head and honestly weep a little bit. It's such an affront. Suddenly I realize I'm not alone. That unseen being is there, but it's no longer angry toward me. seems to have decided I'm not part of the problem, but feels the same way about the changes as it does follows me down two more floors before it withdraws. As it leaves, it feels to me like it just can't stay away from the twelfth floor. Its floor for very long at all. This changes my patrol for the remainder of my time I'm working at this site. It's never again an angry, creepy experience to visit that floor. Despite the door next to the new office in the area of the old side corridor constantly unlocking itself, I have to relock it at least three times a night. I often feel its presence a floor or two before the twelfth floor, and it stays with me for a floor or two after. Sometimes I feel thoughts in my head. It's sort of like the experience I often get, where I'm about to open my mouth and say something, just to have a friend or sibling say the exact same thing, like they had thought of it first, and I had somehow gotten it from them before they spoke. Or like the way I always know when my children are lying to me. They really hate that. It feels like the being wants me to know that he hadn't killed himself. This was done to him by others. This is repeated often, but then a few months later, a quiet admission. I did it. I can't take it back. Accompanied by a wave of a feeling of sorrow, regret, and remorse. Then it feels like it wants me to leave here and maybe go home with me. I simply say, that will never work. My family won't want you around. The floor feels very sad the rest of that shift. I look into it. I can never find his name or likeness in the full story of his hanging. Only the rumor shared by a tenant of his death. I never have a name to call him by. Since this particular contract ended, I never been back to the building. I suspect if I ever do return, I'll still have a strange friend waiting for me there. Rock House I'm a 28-year-old female. The story I'm about to tell you happened back in 2016 with my best friend Chris. Now, Ever since the day that Chris and I met, we've always got ourselves in the dumbest things ever. 
I mean, Chris ran away once, and he had my nerves all messed up. But he came back because he had no money. We weren't the smartest teens, but we still enjoyed life. So one summer night, Chris and I were hanging out, and we were trying to think of a place to explore, like we always did. And at the time, I told him I've never been to the old rock house in Greenwood, South Carolina. Now before I get started, let me give you a little history on the rock house. A man named Thomas, Tom Payne Tolbert, built a fireproof house in 1926. The fireproof house was constructed entirely from stone, concrete, glass, and steel. After years of family homes burning down, Tolbert lived in a detached kitchen and used the large house to store family heirlooms. Tolbert lived with his, or rather, Tolbert lived his later years in isolation. The now crumbling fortress is accessible only by foot, and no one's ever lived inside its walls. You can look up way more about its history online if you like. Now back to the story. I've always been told that the rock house had many spirits in it and around it, but like I said at the time, I've never been to it. So with that said, Chris and I took my cousin's car and headed out to the old rock house. I've heard of people going in the daytime, but never really heard of people say that they went at night. We, being dumb, went at night because why not? Ghosts and spirits never bothered me much, so I thought, why not at night? Once we pulled up to the woods and parked on the side of the road, I get the bad feeling run all over my body. I sit there for a moment. I believe Chris sees this look on my face and asks if I still want to do it. Something is telling me not to get out, but at the same time, I want to see this place even at night. Yeah, let's go see how scary this place is, I told him. Hell yeah, let's do it, he replied. We get out and start walking through the woods. And as we're walking, we have our phones out for light. And we're making jokes, acting silly like we always do. We can never take anything seriously, no matter what. As we're walking, we don't realize how quiet it is to be in the woods at night, in the middle of summer. We find our way to the front of the house. Chris is in front of me, and we're looking at the house. No front door, no windows. All you can see is pure darkness. For some reason, I just can't move even though Chris is walking to what used to be the door. At this moment, I realize that we're in complete darkness and there are no sounds. No animals, no bugs, no wind or anything. Just pure silence. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I see something in the top left window. But before I can completely look... I hear something to the left of me, and I look over, but I see nothing. Only the darkness. A feeling of dread falls over me, but nothing's there. Chris is now at the door of the house and looks inside. I look at the windows, and there it is. Something is there in the window looking down at me. My body turns cold. Those eyes, I'll never forget those eyes burning a hole in my soul. Bright yellow reddish eyes like fire. All of a sudden I hear Chris say, Oh, hell no. He turns to run to me, but my body's still frozen. He grabs my wrist and pulls me to run. He never lets me go. As we're running, we're jumping over fallen trees and everything on the ground that people left over time. And as we run, I realize something is running beside us. And I don't dare to look back. My body is now in autopilot mode as Chris has the grip still on my wrist pulling me. My mind's blank and my heart is racing, and at one point I feel like I can feel breath of whatever it is that's chasing us. The moment we make it to the car, everything comes back to me and I'm back in control of my mind and body. We jump in the car and Chris goes to start the car that he has, and he has his face covered by the steering wheel as he tries to start the car, but it's dead. The car is dead. We start freaking out with my head buried between my legs and Chris still hiding his face and I yell out, This is it, Chris. This is it. This is how we die. This is how us white people die in movies because we do dumb shit like this. Chris yells back at me, Shut up, we're not gonna die. The car will start. I can still feel this thing outside of the car. It's just there. Is this why there are so many spirits here? Does it take the souls of people who have been caught to come here? feel it looking at us, 
Something wants me to look at it, but at the same time, a voice in my head is telling me, no, and I don't want to cry, but I gotta cry. The car starts and Chris tries to speed off. We start going down the road, but then one of the tires blows. We're now on the side of the road again, and we just sit there, not wanting to get out. It's quiet again. The feeling of being watched is still there. Luckily for us, a guy in a truck pulls up behind us. I feel safe right now. The guy pulls over and helps Chris change the tire. I hold my phone as a light with my back to the woods, and I still have that feeling. I want to turn and see what's there, but I dare not to. Something's telling me not to look. After the tire gets fixed, we head to the huddle house close to... I guess it's close by, and I need to calm down. The poor lady working that night sees something's wrong with us, and what, with what little money that we had, the lady helps us pay for a meal. The next few days, strange things start happening around my house. For example, I'm in the kitchen fixing something for lunch. My roommate and I are talking like normal, and the cutting board goes flying across the kitchen. She gives me this look like... See what you just caused? Shit keeps happening for no reason, all because you want to visit haunted places. I pick up the cutting board, and at this point I feel like I need to make things right. I've always been told that if you disturb the dead, that you have to make things right. So with that being said, that weekend I go see some friends who don't live that far from the rock house, and I tell them that I need to go there. So we do. This time it's fully daylight. Once we get there, I still have the feeling, but I don't say a word. Once we get to the house, my friends go in and look around. They explore the place, inside and out. I look to the left of me and see nothing, but the feeling's still there. My body's weak. As I walk and I look in the direction that Chris saw something at, then I look into the room to the left of me and I see that the room is full of designs and paint all over the room. The whole house is covered the same way. But there's something about this one room. I walk into the room... And there's a pentagram with all the markings around it. I walk over to it and examine it closely. I walk around seeing if it's done right. And to my eyes, I see that it is. I yell out to my friends, Hey, I think somebody tried to summon a demon or something. As soon as the words leave my mouth, something comes crashing down. I nope the hell out of there and I just start running out of the house, sadly leaving my friends inside, not meaning to. All I do is run through the woods yelling, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't stop until I'm out. My friends come after me wondering what's going on and I tell them about the other night and what happened as well. At this point, I just want to leave. We all get into the car. Then my friend starts... My friend who is driving goes to start the car, but once again it's dead. Just like the other night, but in a different car. My mind goes back to the other night with this big, dark creature coming to mind for some reason. i never seen it before. Was it the thing chasing us that night? Was it putting itself inside of my mind to scare me more? So many questions. I try my best not to freak out. I called my roommate to come pick us up. As we're waiting, a car pulls up. He must live on this road and knows what happens. He says every time somebody goes to that house, their car's dead when they get back. He helps jumpstart the car and we go down the road. I see my roommate and I just jump out of the car and jump into mine. I speed off as fast as I can, wanting to get as far away from that place as physically possible. My friends meet me at my house and I made a promise to myself to never go back to the rock house. For some reason, Chris and I stopped hanging out. We didn't get into a fight or anything, we just stopped being friends and we never spoke about what happened that night until a few weeks. We both seemed to have forgotten that night. I called him and asked him what it was that he saw inside that house to make him do what he did. He doesn't remember what he saw, but he remembers the night. I thought I wouldn't forget, but I did until a few weeks ago. Someone told me that a brain will block out something so traumatizing that you won't remember that it even happened so you can live your life like normal. Maybe that's what our brains did for us. So, we won't live in fear forever. Now it's 2023, now that I remember that this story is recent 
to a few friends of mine at work, and a person told me that they want to go visit the rock house. I told them, no, they don't, but they really want to, not believing in ghosts, and they've never really experienced anything ghostly. So I said, go if you want, but I promise you, I won't be going back to that place ever again, and once you do, you won't go back there either. The witch that used to live behind me didn't scare me as much as whatever was in the woods that night. Yes, a witch used to live on the property behind my house. Visitations from a very close friend of mine. I'm going to preface this with a backstory. In fall of 2001, I met Susie in English class. I was assigned the seat directly behind her. Her first words to me were, I love your jacket. My name's Susie, by the way. And from a handshake and a smile, developed an incredible bond between two strangers over many years. As high school went on, and we met in ninth grade, our friendship blossomed and grew. We confided in each other and we helped each other. Yeah, she helped me more. I sucked at math. We protected each other. She almost fought an ex-girlfriend when she found out that she dumped me for no apparent reason other than it, I was too nice, quote-unquote. We were there for each other, and we loved each other. It wasn't a romantic thing, though. It was a unique type of love that to this day I've not experienced again. I was brother to her, not Robert. And to me, she was my baby sister, something I still cherish to this day as I never had a sister. Getting closer to graduation, we talked about what we were planning to do. I was dead set on enlisting in the, mil in the military, much to her horror. And as brothers and sisters do, we bumped heads. And sadly, there was a small falling out between us in this regard. Graduation came. I enlisted. I went off for training. A year passed before we reconciled. And I found out that she had enlisted as well. And was due to leave in a few months. And this was sometime in 2005. We picked up where we left off, and we kept in touch as best as we could while we were away from each other and home. Years passed and I got out of the service while she remained. Through this time, I met my now wife, and we found out that we were expecting. A very short time later, maybe one or two weeks, Susie let me know that she was expecting as well, and that she would be coming home in a few months once her baby was born. Our kids are about two months apart. In 2011, she came home, and a group of old high school friends threw her welcome home party. We hugged after many years, laughed and caught up, and I met, my, well, I guess I met her baby. It was the greatest feeling in the world at the time, being a new dad myself as well, and seeing my little baby sister or mom. In October of 2011, I lost Susie in a vehicle accident. I was at work when I found out. My reaction was to keep working. We all have different reactions when it comes to tragedy. Mine, unfortunately, was to bury myself so deep into work that it just never happened at all, and everything was fine. I didn't attend the funeral, I ignored calls from friends, and work took priority. And it worked until 2013. Here's the story. My wife gave birth to our second child in October of 2013. Due to the birth of having complications and the proximity of the hospital to her parents' home, we stayed at my in-laws for about one and a half months. One day I went to bed as usual, having the next day off from work, and I dreamt I was outside of my old high school. In this dream, I could make out details. I could see people and faces, colors and smells. I knew I was waiting for someone because I was across the street from the dismissal gate. I heard the bell ring announcing school is out. I saw students stream out, street signals turning red and green, students laughing and talking, very vivid details. And all of a sudden, every sound was toned down to a gentle whisper. And I see Susie walking out from the dismissal gate. Purple blouse, purple backpack. Yep, purple was her favorite and jeans, holding a book to her chest. She crossed the street towards my direction, and she should have seen me directly in front of her, but it was almost as if she was in her own world and I was just a ghost in her world. 
She walked past me and I kept calling, calling her by her name, but she didn't reply. I must have called out to her at least six or seven times and she finally turned. Her eyes met mine and she came back running to me with the biggest smile ever. And she hugged me. I can't describe the feeling, but I felt it. I physically felt her body and her grip. I held her tightly, and she pulled away and said the following. Brother, where have you been? I've been wanting to come and have, have you visit me. I just remember saying, I'm sorry, I've been wanting to, but I've been so busy at work. As I was responding to her, she let go of me, backed away, smiled, and started walking back in the direction that she was heading, north. I told her to wait and asked her where she was going. She said, I'm sorry, but I have to go. We'll talk soon. She just kept walking. I started to call out to her again, and she just kept walking. By this point, I remember I started to cry while I was calling out to her, and the next thing I knew, I woke up from my sleep. I sat up in bed and saw my wife feeding her newborn, looked at my oldest son sleeping next to me, and just started bawling. Bawling in a way I haven't since I was a child. It must have been at least 30 or 45 minutes worth of crying. My wife put her baby down in his crib. They came and asked what was wrong. I told her what had happened and how real it was, how real it felt. She said it was a visitation and it was meant to finally bring peace and closure to the fact that I never said goodbye to Susie. A few weeks afterwards, I finally visited her resting place. It took me at least a year after that event to fully accept the fact that my little sister was gone. I've had two smaller things that happened after this. Around 2014, I decided to get a memorial tattoo with her name, and a quote from a song that struck a chord with me while I was still healing from this. The day after I got the tattoo, I dreamt I was at work, and again, it was vivid. The smells, colors, faces, even the heat. I could tell it was summer. I was taking a break and sipping some water, and again, the volume on everything became toned down. And I see Susie walking towards me, the same big smile on her face. She says nothing, grabs my arm, looks down at the tattoo, looks at me and says, I love it. Thank you and walks away in the same direction that she came from, north again, and I wake up, but instead of crying, I smiled and just said a quiet thank you to her. Just last week was my most recent experience. My wife said that she was tired and asked if it was okay to go get takeout. I said, yeah, that was fine. I told her if she could get Burger King, since it was close, maybe only a half mile away. She said it was fine, but she'd rather get something else. I think it was chicken. Anyways, this meant that she had to go in another location. That was out of the way, maybe two miles away, I believe. She came back and asked me if I could get the food ready for the boys while she went to go use the restroom. I obliged and began to unbag the meals for the kids. The kids meal with a toy. And I paused when I saw the toy. I stood there and I was just smiling and laughing. My wife came back and asked what was funny. I showed her the toy. It was a Powerpuff Girls toy. She said, Okay, so what's the big deal? I told her, Well, this is Buttercup. Funny story. These last two days at random times I've been remembering Susie. I've just been having memories flood back, and Buttercup was her favorite character from the cartoon. I'd like to think that Susie's been saying hi, and not just this week but for the last few years. Could these experiences be chalked up to the guilt of just having ignored her passing? Maybe. But I know that it's not. I know somewhere my little sister's keeping an eye on me and saying hi from time to time. A bond like that that we shared doesn't just disappear when, you know. So, wherever you are, Susie, I love you and I miss you. Not just on Memorial Day or your birthday, but every day. But I'm happy knowing that you're around. And if you made it this far, thanks for your time and I apologize for the long, long, long story. I hope it brings a smile to someone who needs one, especially with everything going on around us. Reach out and tell your family and friends that you love them and let them know how much they mean to you. If there's one thing I learned from this, 
It is to say to those around you that you love them while you're alive and let them know while they're still here too. Poster Fire, The Bot Hell Hell House Spring 2014 Not that many poltergeist survivors can say that they witnessed seeing a poltergeist flee the scene of a crime. By crime, I mean arson. Well, I can. On one of the most horrifying events I faced while living in the Bot Hell home was the day the poster caught fire in my office. Recap. Tina and I had witnessed a lot of activity in the weeks leading up to the poster catching fire. I'm talking about bar stools being thrown. Our bedroom light was going off and turned back on by itself in the middle of our sleeping. Loud bangs, loud footsteps, door slams, and yes, one Bible catching fire. All of that happened within a week of the story I'm about to tell you. The advice given to us by friends and family was to smudge the house. The internet said the same thing. Smudging lessens the activity, quote-unquote. But let me tell you, smudging never lessened the activity. Not in our house. It made it worse. This story is proof of that, in fact. The night before the poster caught fire, I asked Tina if she would feel comfortable smudging the house. Tina's an excellent smudge person. Tina's more thorough, you could say, than me. She smudges every nook and cranny. The next day, we woke up and got ourselves ready for work. Nothing unusual about that, except the house was still smelling like burnt sage, which I thought was good. Your house should smell like sage if you smudged the night before. I later found out that smudging before going to bed is dangerous, extremely dangerous, I compared smudging before going to bed to kicking an open fire ant house bed before having a picnic. Tina and I got up that morning, and we did what we always do. We got ready for work. The feeling of being watched is lessened. Thirty odd minutes later of us waking up, Tina walks up to me and kisses me goodbye. Now it's just me in the house. The only thing on my mind now is beating Seattle traffic. I gotta get out of this house and get to work. A few minutes after I stepped into the shower, it happened. The devil arrived. Every fire alarm in the house starts going off. I'm standing in the doorway of my bathroom, half dried off, thinking, Oh shit, it is happening. I knew right then that something was up. I didn't know what specifically, not yet anyway. Something's up though, and it's not good. I remember running through the master bedroom and reaching our bedroom doorway, and that's when I saw it. I feel a large mass run right by me. I can't see what ran past me, I can only feel it, and it was huge, taller than me, and wider than me. All I could hear besides the fire alarms going off was this loud stomping sound. My eyes and ears turned toward the direction of the stomping noise and followed it downstairs, and suddenly, the front of the house opens wide and slams shut. That is, it. The door just opens wide on its own and slams shut. That's when my brain says, Give chase, Keith, give chase. I'm thinking, give chase to what? I still haven't determined if someone was even in the house. I haven't even seen anything. The door just opened and closed on its own. What am I chasing? So, I do what my brain says. I run down the stairs and reach the front door. I should be able to get a good glimpse of the intruder as he's leaving the house. I throw my hand on the front doorknob and nothing happens. The front door does not open. Correction, though. The front door doesn't budge, not even a centimeter. I must have fought with the doorknob for about two seconds before realizing that I had a fire to deal with. Smoke is billowing from my office upstairs. I run to my office and there it is, ladies and gentlemen. There is a fire. 
the wall behind my computer desk is on fire. The poster specifically. How many seconds could have transpired between the fire alarm going off and where I'm standing now? Mm, maybe 30 seconds? The first thing I do is kill the fire and toss my damp towel over it. The fire didn't put up a fight, it was just gone. I turn up and run downstairs again. The house is filled with smoke. I get to the front door and try to open the front door again. Nothing. The door will not budge. This is the same door I saw open less than a minute ago. The doorway felt like it had been welded shut. The fire alarms are still wailing in the background. I can taste the chemicals from my burnt poster in my mouth and nostrils. And that's when it dawned on me. The house is not the one under attack. I am. Think carefully about it, Keith. The next few decisions could be your last. What are you going to do? I was in shock at this strange stage, because I remember the events vaguely at this point. Suddenly I'm on the phone with the 911 operator. I'm screaming at her that the house is on fire, and she's maintaining her level of professionalism in the process, asking me in a calm voice, What's the address? Every time I utter my address through the phone, enormous amounts of static break out. I'm talking about loud electrical interference, not just static. We go through this, I can't hear you, can you repeat the address, routine for about 30 seconds. Finally, she gets my address, and in doing so, lets me know that the fire department's on the way. I hang up and call Tina. Thank God she answers. Tina can hear the fire alarm screaming through the phone. I blurt out for her to come back home. Come back home. The house is under attack, and I hang up. The front door, for reasons I can't explain, finally opened. It opened within seconds of the fire department arriving. How ironic. The firemen dart in and, at my urging, proceed up toward the office. They said I did a good job putting the poster fire out. Tina runs into the house a minute after they arrived and grabs me. I was half naked and shaking like a leaf because all I could remember was Tina throwing blankets over me. I'm shivering and shaking like a wet puppy. I'm not afraid to admit that I was crying and quivering like a baby, too. You would have thought somebody had doused me in a tub of ice water, cubes and all. That's how cold I was. The fire department never could determine what caused the fire. Tina and I knew. This is the second fire incident that we've experienced. Note. There will be two more fire incidents in that house in the coming weeks. When the fire department left... All Tina and I had now was each other. The demons who did this are still here, snickering at us. Whatever ran past me in the upstairs hallway had to have been the ringleader. I'll always remember what I felt as it ran past me. Evil. Diabolical evil. Neither of us could think of a solution to our problem at all. The only thing left to do now is to contact the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, that up to this point, has been ignoring us, giving us the runaround. That's the only logical thing to do now, right? Who else can help us? Tina and I looked at each other and reached the same conclusion. We're marching down to the local parish office, and we are not leaving until somebody sees us. Story number 12. This is why, even though I'm not a believer, I don't deny any paranormal activity. I think this happened around four or five years ago when I was 16 or 17, more or less. I've always been a skeptical person, and I usually try to prove things by using the scientific method. For example, when I was a very little kid, we had a cat and I pushed her one day from a very high distance to see if it was true that cats always land on their feet. By the way, she landed perfectly. I'm sorry I did it, though. And I know this has nothing to do with the actual story, but I find it very relevant because it explains my initial behavior in the really weird parts of the story. So now the actual story. This happened in Spain, where I live. And I think it was at the very end of the summer, more or less. 
I went visiting a friend in town where we both live, and it was a really good day. Sunny, but surprisingly not hot enough so that I could wear large pants, which I love. We were hanging out like we usually did at the time, talking about whatever was in a room. It was the most normal and chill day that we possibly could enjoy. So she and her mom were the only ones living in the house that summer. And while we were talking to her mom, her mom told us that she was going to go buy groceries for the next week. So she closed everything in the first floor, windows and doors, and now we're alone in the house. We kept talking about our stuff when suddenly it starts getting really windy and the windows in the second floor were all open because it was summer. If we run too close, all the windows, stuff gets thrown and all that. And then just one window is left, and my friends ask me if I can get close, or sorry, if I can close it for her, because it's in the guest bedroom, and she's afraid to go in there, because she believes that it's haunted. So I don't believe in this, as the title says and we just went inside and closed it without thinking too much. Then we returned to her bedroom. I ask her about why does she think it's haunted, and she begins to tell me that she and her mother sometimes see a shadow that looks similar to a man, completely still, facing towards them between the curtains. She also told me that her mother thought that it had been a ghost, because when she sleeps, quote-unquote, she wakes up and can't move. And then the shadow man would be in her room looking at her from, I guess, I guess from her feet, which nowadays, thinking about it, we probably didn't know at the time that her mother was very likely to have sleep paralysis. After telling me all this, she starts to get nervous and feeling unsafe. So since I just want to hang out with her, I offer myself to get up close and close the door so she feels better. So I close the door and knowingly I closed it so that I would make sure that it's not going to open unless force is applied, I put some kind of weight on our side of the door on the floor. Then I looked outside, through her window, and suddenly there's a fucking storm outside, like in an instant, with bolts and everything. And I get a little worried because that might slow me when I have to walk her home later. My friend, who is also weirded out by the strange change in weather, decides that she wants to keep talking about this ghost in the guest's bedroom. She explains again that what she believes is real, but guesses at something else and calls it a quote-unquote demon, which is why I use this tag. And right this moment when she uses that word, things start to get serious. Thunders start to sound very loud outside, which alerts us. And out of fucking nowhere, we both feel it at the same time. This chill sat in, in the back of our necks, and suddenly it gets kind of cool in the bedroom. She suggests that we get under her blankets, which we do. And when we start talking about these really weird changes inside the house, the door that I had previously closed opens. And it was the fucking worst. I didn't open in a normal way. And it couldn't have because of the weight that I'd previously set on the floor. But it was fucking slammed against the wall of the bedroom and it was very loud. Excuse my expletives, but that's what's written here. At this point, I am shocked beyond belief, and my friend is legit having a panic attack and is crying about how she's way too scared at that moment and that she just doesn't want to die. I tell her that I'm going to get up and close the door again and also look outside in case her mom got to the house and is pranking us or something like that. She grabs my arm in terror, again saying that she doesn't want to be alone with this demon. And since I'm growing nervous because of the situation and her reactions, after all, we were teenagers back then, I grabbed something big, and it was her bedroom, and had just approached the door with it for protection. I told my friend that if anything was going to catch her or me enter the room, it would be before closing the door. I was going to give it hell before I made anything to her. So she let my arm go. I go to the door and proceed to close it, but before doing so, I showed my head outside of it to see what was going on, and although I didn't see a single thing, I felt like I was in danger if I didn't close the door as soon as possible. I finally closed it and went with my friend to hug her, and I reassured her that if anything came in, I was beating the shit out of it. I tried to talk to her about whatever it was so she could calm down, because really, 
She was completely sure that we were going to die, and after what happened with the door, I became unsure as well. Minutes passed and things got calmer, and we talked normally, but always checking on the door. We finally hear her mom come back from the house, and I go outside to the bedroom to meet her. She had finished buying, and suddenly everything is normal. The house is not cool now. Neither is my friend's bedroom. There's no more thunders or storm outside at all, so I feel safer, and I go in to investigate the house for things that maybe could explain what happened. I went down to see if any wind could have opened the door, but as the mother told us, she closed absolutely everything. I entered the guest's room to see if there was anything weird or something unusual, but nope, found nothing that could explain the situation to me. And I know after all that, this may sound weird, but after inspecting everything I could think of, I'm completely terrified. In the end, because of our fear of my friend, and I decided it's better that I go home and I just leave almost immediately. When I arrive at my house, I see the time and it was still early in the day. I thought it had been my friends for hours, when really it was just about a half an hour. The event happened around 20 minutes or something like that since my friend's mom left, and in those 20 minutes, even the weather changed and came back to normal. And that was it. Up till this day, I still don't know what happened. As the narrator, I apologize if some of that didn't make sense, but I'm trying to make sense of the text as it comes at me here. <laughs> Paranormal Hospital I was a surgical technologist in labor and delivery for about 10 years. I worked for a non-for-profit Catholic hospital for almost four years out of the 10. When I first started in the department, two techs had already worked there for a very long time. We'll call them M and J, and myself, K, told me stories about Sister Mary Margaret, who was a surgery tech back when the hospital was still ran by nuns. Needless to say, Sister Mary Margaret was very much by the book and left a little room for her co-workers' errors. Jay knew about Sister Mary Margaret, but M had worked there so long. She'd actually worked with the nun. M began to tell tales about instances when she'd heard Sister Mother Mary Margaret in the OR suite long after she'd passed away and up to the current time frame. Being a born skeptic, I thought M and J were just hazing the new girl. I wasn't buying a bit of their nonsense. Well, fast forward to when I'm off at orientation and working my 12-hour night shifts. I'd be in the back, setting up the OR suite or stocking supplies, and I could hear the shuffle of shoe covers. Just as high heels made the clack-clack sound. There's a very distinct sound that shoe covers make when they truffle along the hospital floor. I just sleuthed it out and figured M and J might pull one of their night shift nurses up to prank me, or just to see if I'd fall for it. Well, I just had to hop out there, catch them in the act, and let them know that they weren't fooling anybody. So, I popped out into the hallway, ready to scare the scrub pants off of whomever was trying to prank me. But, when I jumped into the hallway, no one was there. There was no movement in the hallway. Swinging of the doors, chatter of the intercoms, nothing. Needless to say, I was really perplexed. So that first incident just kind of got a shrug from me and I went along working. As time passed, these incidents became more and more frequent. We had more new employees and M and J were training them. M and her new orientee had an incident where sterile supplies were on the OR bed and the bulb syringe floated from the top of the supply line at a 90 degree angle for about a minute and then dropped to the floor. I really began believing them that they relayed that story to me during a report. I could tell that they were both honestly shaken up by the whole ordeal and I actually felt pretty bad for them. They were scared, trust me. These two were not actresses. There was no way that they could have given such an Oscar-worthy performance either. I continued having my own encounters with the shuffling shoe covers, 
unintelligible whispering, all of the hallmarks of a typical haunting. Some of my tech co-workers continued reporting the same kind of activity. None of the activity was as egregious as what M and her orientee experienced with the floating bulb syringe in midair. When this all stopped being amusing to me, when I went to the OR at about 2.30 or 3 a.m. to stock linens and sterile water and saline into the warmer, I'd done this a hundred times. It wasn't anything new. For those of you who are not familiar with hospital warmers, they're equivalent to leaving the hospital and going straight to Narnia. These miraculous inventions are what makes your hospital blanket so nice and toasty. We also put sterile water and saline into the top portion of the warmer to heat up liquids used externally so the patient doesn't get hypothermic. To give you a visual, it literally looks like an industrial-sized stainless steel refrigerator. It performs in the same way, except instead of making everything cold, it warms everything up. Thus, the hospital warmer. I had taken the linen cart and some water and saline bottles with me to stock up everything. I left the cart in the hallway outside of our two surgical suites. The warmer was in between both all our suites in a little cubby beside our crash cart. As you very well know, hospitals are known for migraine-inducing bright light. This was one of the few things that I disliked about working in the hospital. Whenever I was able, I'd spare the blinding fluorescent lights as much as possible. So... I proceeded to stock the warmer without turning the lights on to spare myself the glare whenever I could. The OR suites were darkened and shadowy, but I could always easily get around. I'm sure everyone's familiar with refrigerators and freezers already, and they're aware that refrigerators pretty cold and the freezer part is obviously frozen cold. The warmers at the hospital basically work on the same premise. The refrigerator part warms the blankets, while the freezer part makes the external water and saline bottles really toasty. That's exactly what we want. So I opened the refrigerator part and expected to be hit in the face with some pretty arid heat. It was cold. Wait, what? Is it broken? It has to be. There's no way this warmer could be this cold. Something's not right. Then I also checked the freezer portion, which should have been even hotter. It was actually colder. Nope, this isn't right. It was not normal for this warmer to be this cold. The fans were blowing warm air, but it just wasn't warming anything up. It was then that I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. I'd never felt that way at a job previously. I turned around and looked up to see a black mist and smoke toward the top of the ceiling. At first I thought maybe some part of the warmer's electric had fizzled out and this was the beginning of a fire. The problem was... The black mist and smoke was on the ceiling, and it was the opposite corner of the warmer. I looked at the warmer's connections, and everything was as it was supposed to be. There was nothing wrong with the warmer. There was something in the OR suite cubby that was not friendly and rather malevolent. I knew it wasn't Sister Mary Margaret. She'd never do anything menacing. I can't explain how, but I knew not only that it wasn't her... I knew that she wasn't there to help protect me from whatever this was. It was slowly seeping down from the corner of the ceiling towards myself and the warmer. I did what seemed to be the most sensible thing and I began reciting the Lord's Prayer. It paused, full stop. As I continued, it looked like a film being played in reverse. It slinked back to the corner that it came from. As soon as it was just about gone... I turned to hustle out that little cubby area and back to the hallway. I happened to notice when I turned around to face the warmer, it was back to its normally toasty temperature. I didn't ruminate on it long. I just booked it out of the OR suite into the hallway and back to the nurse's station. Sleep paralysis or something darker? Growing up, I would see and hear horror stories of my older sister's sleep paralysis fits. As early as age eight, I recall feeling off in the early mornings or late at night and going to check on my sister. On several occasions, I'd walk in and see her laying on her bed, on her back, eyes bulging out of her head 
as if signaling for me to help. Her mouth slightly ajar as faint sounds barely escaped her lips. Her fingertips would sometimes twitch, but it wouldn't be more than a few seconds. Before I'd start screaming for my parents to come rushing into the room, it terrified me. The sight of her like that, she was so helpless and fear plagued her eyes as it would take only a few moments before she was able to vocalize anything. Now might be a good time to mention that I grew up in somewhat of a practicing Catholic household. I went to religious education classes, got confirmed, no meat during Lent, that sort of gig. The only one of my parents' three kids, I might add, to be confirmed. Now I say somewhat practicing because while my mother did her best to drag us to church every Sunday, my father wanted no part in it as we grew up and or I guess my father wanted no part in it as he grew up with my devout third world grandmother who had him attending grade school with the nuns paddling him and whatnot. He was a burnt out, needless to say. He was and still remains, however, a man of science and reason. When things went bump in the night, my mom was in front and center with a rosary while my dad laughed and usually debunked whatever mystery was there. Regardless, every time we were scared at night, or if we had bad dreams we couldn't wake ourselves up from. My mom would tell us to pray and that we would all wake up fine. I would opt for an Our Father or a Hail Mary when it felt warranted. As my sister and I reached our teen years, she unfortunately got involved with drugs. I won't go into too much detail, but at its worst, she was utilizing heavy stimulants to support her multiple jobs and a full caseload in college. He only exasperated the fits that she had. It got to the point where she started sleeping with a crucifix underneath her pillow. It sounds crazy, I know. Even more so considering this course of action was being taken by the same person who dropped out of religious education classes for her fear of her edgy atheist boyfriend in high school maybe would judge her for it. As an older teen and then young adult, my parents, or more so my dad rather, after becoming aware of her past addiction, would blame her previous drug abuse for the reason that she suffered these episodes, for lack of a better term. He would shrug them off as maybe the mind punishing itself for the gift of personal afflictions that her family sustained during the course of her using. Yet still, it always felt more than that. She would report dark figures in her doorway, figures with red eyes that would put pressure on her chest. She would tell me how they laughed at her when she would pray for them to leave. Tears welling up in her eyes and she would recall the accounts that took place the night before. She's older now in a serious relationship with her own family. Years of sobriety under her belt and little to no bad dreams these days, let alone sleep paralysis episodes. And then it was my turn. I'm a mom on the slightly younger side. I have a school-aged kid who still occasionally finds his way to my bedroom on those rare nights that he had a bad dream. I have a bed in which, when closed, if you will, is a twin size. When it's expanded, it's a bit larger than a queen. I mention this because while I don't move much of my sleep, it gets a bit cramped when I wake in the middle of the night to my son trying to squeeze his way in. One night, same as many other nights before, I felt him climb in. We sleep opposite each other when my bed isn't extended. And per typical seven-year-old sleeping behavior, he donkey kicks me throughout the night. Being a light sleeper, I wake up to the slightest whisper. Call it mom instincts, I guess. As such, I wake up frequently throughout the night, maybe eight to ten times on average due to discomfort or stress. Whatever might be happening, what have you. This night in particular, I had more difficulty than usual staying asleep. As a habit, I check my phone every time I wake up just to know how much longer I have before my alarm goes off. On this night, the last time I recall checking the time, it was about 3.09 a.m. I'm a side sleeper, and I was facing my wall and sun as he slept. I'm unsure when I woke up, or if I really was that deep asleep, when I felt a looming presence behind me. I felt that prickly feeling throughout my body and my mobility became restricted. 
It's hard to explain it, but I felt every fiber of my core telling me that I couldn't look back. I simply can't. I began having dark thoughts, and while I couldn't speak out loud, I started praying in my head. I couldn't pray correctly. My words were jumbled and my prayers were out of order and nonsense. I just felt this overwhelming feeling of fear and dread. Whatever it was, it just felt evil. Now, I've had my fair share growing up with whispers in the night, unexplained shadows and apparitions, impressions on my bed as a kid, you name it. But never have I felt the feeling of a dark entity. What's even more insane is that I could feel my son naturally stirring in his sleep, his legs on mine. I knew I had to be awake. It's been about a couple of months since that happened, and I've had smaller episodes since. Two nights ago, I was tossing and turning in my sleep when that dreadful, tingling sensation occurred again. I felt something applying slight pressure to my neck, almost like fingers pressing down. Without opening my eyes, I immediately and mentally shouted out, My God! It's stronger! And the feeling went away. It's odd because I've never said these words before, and when I said them, without thinking of them beforehand, I felt like I had only seconds to get them out. Before what happened, you might ask. I'm not sure. I also don't care to find out. I've read studies on sleep paralysis. I've also read up on the science behind it as well as the folklore it's been mentioned in for decades and decades. Being a decent combination of both of my parents, I prefer to find a rational explanation behind my experiences like my father would. However, I'm never foolish enough to fully trust science and abandon faith all you know, all together. To summarize, it's terrifying, encompassing, consuming, and morbidly fascinating once it passes. Black-Eyed Kids and Wendigo This story happened to me about 12 years ago. I was around 24 at the time, and I worked hospitality so I'd be later at night when my friends and I hung out. So at around 9 o'clock, my friend and I decided to go out for a drive, someplace we'd never been, just get in the car and go. I offered and wanted to drive because my mother was out of town and I was using her Mercedes. It was one of those early 90s e-bodies, the ones that were like big piles of heavy steel, a real tank of a car. I only mention the car body because it becomes relevant later in the story. He happily agreed and we hit the road. We lived near Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the time. Good old Wisconsin where you get a lot of really good stories that I've noticed. Seems to be a pretty paranormal state. Either way, we drive north out of the city and we drive for about an hour when I see an exit that I don't recognize. So I decided to get off there. There was nothing at this exit other than cornfields. No gas station, no restaurant signs, no visible light of a town in any direction. So, we're in a place that we don't recognize. But that was the whole point. Just driving to go nowhere because the speed limit was 35 and we were in no rush. The moon was out enough that everything was pretty visible too. About a mile into the cornfields, we could see two kids on the right side of the road. We comment on how weird it is because there's no housing or stores or even lights on the horizon. Plus, it was 10.30ish at night. Naturally, there were two larger guys. So we didn't really worry about anything. So I slow down a bit so we can inquire if maybe their car broke down or maybe if they were okay. As we pulled up, I noticed the kid in the front's clothing. It was a stained cream-colored tweed-type shirt with real tattered sleeves and overalls with only one strap. He appeared to be maybe 12 years old. The second kid was taller, wearing a red flannel-type shirt, the old-time-looking khaki pants. However, I could barely notice the taller kid standing further behind the smaller one, because as I pulled up noticing the clothes, I got to see the whole child, we'll call it, fully and his arms were to his side, slightly raised, almost in that iconic zombie way. But his eyes? I couldn't take my eyes off of his, 
and I did my best to mutter to my friend. You seen this too, right? His eyes were pitch black, blacker than the night, but easy to see as he stood there staring back at us. I didn't know what the heck I was seeing, but I've never been so frightened in my life, and I did have several odd experiences that have left me unable to deny that there's more to this world than what we understand. So we're stopped for a moment, locking eyes with whatever this thing was. It was no child. It was evil. I have zero doubts about that. We quickly agree to go, and fast. We're not going to inquire with them. This was straight out of the twilight zone, and I remember the hitchhiker. And that's not happening tonight. No, sir. So we go and we clamor between ourselves. What the fuck did we just see? What the fuck was that? Still no signs of homes, just open cornfields. How these two kids could be there, I don't know, but I believe that they weren't even kids. So I keep driving and we get out of the fields into a windy, wooded road, shortly after maybe about five minutes. Here in Wisconsin, there are just random historical markers displaying whatever year this happened in, with all the information on it. And I can only mention that because I passed one on the curve, so I glanced at that. As I'm driving through a curve going about 45 miles an hour, a creature walks in front of my car, my mom's car, and as I saw it, it was nothing that I've ever seen before. Its spine was tall, it stuck above the hood ornament as I hit it. It was a gray color and looked like nothing I'd ever seen. It had a very tall arch in its spine, almost like when a cat hisses and goes on its toes, that kind of shape but in a very tall, gangly creature kind of way. I hit this thing straight on the tank of the bends. My friend is freaking out at this point. I stop immediately, but now we're both a bit scared from the children of the corn, and now this thing is literally within minutes of another. We decide getting out's not going to happen, but I decide to stay, stay in the car locked, but I use the car and its lights to see what we hit, and make sure whatever the hell it was that it was dead. And I just needed to know what it was that I saw. I drive in tiny circles, backing up and forwards looking for this creature, but after checking every inch within a hundred yards and not seeing a thing, including not even a drop of blood where I hit it, and I hit it straight on with the bends making contact with its spine, body, and head anywhere. That was unnerving. And although I wanted to check my mother's car, that would have to be dealt with further down the road. We were not going to get out of there. So we decided to head home at this point. Fifteen minutes later before I got back home into the freeway and I needed to get out and see how bad the car was. As I got out to check, and I did this quickly as I was not taking any chances, not tonight, I noticed my grill was busted in, but nothing too bad. So I made sure that it was secure and got back in as quickly as possible. My friend decided to stay inside the car. Recently, I heard of the black-eyed kids. That freaked me out a bit. I didn't know that it was really a real thing. I thought I just saw a couple of demon kids or damned ghosts. I didn't really know what to think. Till this day... I've looked through tons of photos of supposed cryptid beasts and mythological creatures looking for what I hit. And the closest I've found is some Algonquin drawings of Wendigos. And they were very close to what I believe I saw and that I hit that night. It seems to me very odd that both things could happen so close to another and not be related. Possibly it was an evil area. Or possibly a ley line. I don't know. I'd like to point out I've lived in Wisconsin a long time, and it was not a deer or a coyote or anything else. What I hit was nothing native to known Wisconsin landscape, and neither were those horrid kids. I'll never forget either of those faces, and I just hope I never come across them ever again. Ask Reddit 2. A few years ago, after I had graduated Bible college, 
A couple of college friends and I had been out for coffee and chatting late enough that the shop had to close. We didn't feel like we were done hanging out, so because this was the town that I had lived in for the past 12 years, my three friends asked where a cool place to hang out was. Preferably a place that didn't have, you know, hours of operation, as it was now past 1 a.m. Didn't take long for me to remember this nature center near my old high school that had a beautiful walking path that went around a small lake. So I suggested there, and off we were. We parked in a public lot in front of the school so there was no risk of towing or tickets, and we walked across the football and track field towards the nature center path. Now, the walking paths were closed off by an almost complete fence, as you were supposed to enter by the main gates at the pavilion, but because I'd been in photography class in high school, we had found a way in for free that didn't also require a long walk to the pavilion about half a kilometer away. Just up the sidewalk beside the football field, the fence turned to cut through some trees. But in the trees, there was no fence, so you could easily get in if you were okay with a little bit of foliage. Just up the hill from this line of trees also happened to be the city's graveyard, which was also right beside a mental health hospital that was about a hundred years old. So it hadn't always been the loving facility it now claimed to be. While my friends and I walked up the slight hill to the trees, one of them spotted the gravestones and inquired about what else was there. Immediately, everybody forgot about the nature center walk and we continued up the hill to see what this small cemetery had. And we had visited it during photography class as well, by the way. Being that I'm already sensitive to spirits, I gave a little prayer that the Holy Spirit would protect me, but also show me and us if there is an area that we should or should not go. We walked around the small section, occasionally feeling the need to pray for an unrestful spirit to be at rest, until we discovered that the cemetery continued up to the next level of the hill and actually stretched for a kilometer or so back. We continued to walk around, sometimes praying, sometimes just noticing the ages on the stones, maybe appreciating a cool name here and there. One of my friends, Eric, who also seemed to be sensitive to spirits, but whereas I was turned away by how negative and possibly dangerous some seemed to be, he was drawn to those same ones. Occasionally there would be plots where he lingered and I felt my spirit become heavy, but on those we'd pray for peace, and once it felt clear, we'd move on. As we walked east toward the back of the cemetery, I could sense something very unsettled in the far corner. I prayed again for protection for mine and my friends, and we got closer, but I couldn't shake this growing feeling that I specifically was being watched by something in that corner. As we got to that last row, my friend ventured north to each plot, but I decided it was best to stay further away. Fully aware that not only was this spirit unsettled, it was angry. I told them about it, and they prayed as much as they could, but neither of them could sense or feel it, so they prayed wherever I pointed or gestured to. Eric, however, seemed quite content to linger in that last row, even hanging back for a while as we moved on. As we turned to walk south, away from the angry spirit, I could feel the eyes burning into my back, giving me chills like I'd never experienced. I continued to pray for our safety, focusing more specifically on me, but it seemed that almost every word I whispered in prayer, the angrier it got. Until this point, any spirit we prayed over either found peace, or at least stayed where it had been. Not this one. As we moved further away, I could feel it was just as close. My two friends decided it would be best to have one on each side of me, almost as protection, and they had hoped that Eric was further behind, and that would cover my back. Well, it didn't. We kept walking, and it kept following, getting angrier and angrier as we went. I checked over my shoulder over and over, almost expecting to see some sort of creature physically following. But still, it was only a dark shadow. Almost unnoticeable, almost excusable. There came a point as we neared the southernmost path that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I couldn't feel it anymore. It was gone. 
It was like it had reached its tether point and couldn't go any further. I breathed deeply and I relaxed. We were finally in the clear. We turned west and kept walking, and we could see our exit only a few rows away. My friend on my left got distracted by a cool gravestone and stepped away from the side completely, which I hadn't barely noticed. Then it touched me. Being suddenly surrounded by a spirit of fury, it grabbed my shoulders and it felt its hot breath as it whispered into my ear. I didn't even give it time to say anything. If I did, I would have remembered or understood it. I just yelped and jumped away, hopefully out of its grasp. All three of my friends jumped into defensive mode and prayed for it to leave me. And once it had been pushed far enough back, we booked it out to the exit. Just outside the exit, a security guard from the mental health home was looking in, probably concerned that he saw four young people walking around the cemetery. As we booked it past him, he asked if we were in danger, and we honestly didn't know how to even answer him. As most people laugh at us when we explain how real spirits and ghosts are, Not stopping to talk, we passed the man and continued back down the hill towards the school, the guard just staring into the cemetery, looking for what we were running from. The whole way back to my car, my friends were praying that if the spirit had attached itself to me, that the bond would be broken. And before we got in the car, they prayed more, and the whole drive home they prayed that it wouldn't and couldn't follow. And before walking into my apartment, They gave a final prayer that it was not welcome and couldn't enter. I was supposed to just drop them off, and they would drive the hour back home so they could work in the morning. They didn't leave me alone that night, and I don't think any of us really slept, even though it was stone-cold silent until the sun came up. Saved from being a dwarf king's wife. Back when I was in primary school, around seven years old, I'm 32 now, we lived in a small apartment that was surrounded by trees. We had neighbors, but you'd have to go through a narrow alleyway before you get to the village's road. I always play either by myself or with other kids under a huge mango tree or some other small fruit tree, and sometimes we'll get distracted and not notice the time until it's pretty late. Then I'll come home. I had no idea that this was the start of a couple of weird and scary six years to come. Ever since I had my first communion at six years old, every time I'd go to Sunday Mass, and during communion rites, I will always faint if not, I'll feel dizzy to participate. I always attributed that to either lack of sleep or a hot temperature in the church or whatever. My parents had me checked for anemia and anything that could cause frequent fainting spells. But the doctors can't find anything. They said I should just get some rest, drink water, stay healthy, and the other common stuff. Fast forward to when I'm ten years old, I started seeing little black shadows before fainting. Again, this happened during the communion rite. The scene is this. I'll start feeling sick, either can't breathe, dizzy, or just feel like vomiting. And when people start to fall in line for communion... I will see these little shadows like they're looking for someone. Then if I make eye contact with any of them, I'd lose consciousness. I never told my parents about this and kept happening around until the age of 12. I always thought that they were like hallucinations and I'm about to pass out. Since I was a child, I never believed in superstitions. I only believe in anything that had a scientific explanation or logic. For when my mom told me not to cut my nails in the evening because they said somebody was going to die or a soul will possess my body once I threw my cut nails in the trash, I kept telling them, nope. I'll tell them if they tell me it's because it's dark and I won't be able to see where I'm cutting them and I'll believe you. When I started having my menstrual period at 12, the attacks became longer. The fainting spells would now start when the homily starts and I'll regain consciousness after the communion rites. My parents and my other aunts started being weirded out by this because they've been bringing me to doctors, but nothing, no diagnosis still. Then my healer grandpa, my mom's uncle, came from the province to come visit Manila, and they met to catch up with each other. A healer in the Philippines, otherwise known as an 
Albulario is a witch doctor, folk healer, or medicine man who practices folk medicine and uses medicinal plants in their combination of modalities such as herbalism, prayers, incantations, and mysticism. We could say it's similar to a shaman. Their services are considered either a first or last resort for addressing illnesses, and their patient claims that the practitioner has supernatural powers that modern medicine doesn't provide. Anyways, my mom told him everything, and he said that he can't see anything when he looks at me. I didn't understand this until later. He said that there's a veil covering me like a protection of some sort. So they did a suab, where I had a bedsheet draped over my head and a pot of boiled water with me, inside with tons of leaves thrown into it. The goal of the suab is for the person being treated to inhale the steam from the medicinal herbs in the pot of boiling water while the healer is outside praying and speaking in tongues to rid themselves of bad energy. Once done, I remember the covers being lifted and then I lost consciousness. When I woke up, it was time for my grandma to leave, so we bid him goodbye. My mother didn't tell him what happened, nor did I ask. That next Sunday, I completed Mass without fainting. Everyone in my family, even the other families at church, were congratulating me for not fainting. So the fainting has never happened anymore, but I sometimes still see shadows in my peripheral vision and thought that they were just my imagination or maybe I just had bad eyesight. This is what I thought until we were visited by my grandpa again two years later and he started asking my mom about my suitor. This raised my eyebrows and I asked what he was talking about. There was a dark dwarf king that wanted me to be his wife. The veil that Grandpa was describing was a veil put by the Dwarf King to hide me from the other dwarves. This also hid the fact that I was wearing a crown of thorns underneath. So what he described when he lifted the covers, when he was doing the sub, was the following. 1. I was wearing a crown of thorns under a black veil, and my spirit, or somebody that looks like me, was seated at a queen's throne covered around with thorns. 2. He saw little black shadows scattered around the house, as if observing what was going on with me, and ran as soon as the steam escaped the lifted covers. Three, and when I fainted, he caught me. He got scratched by these invisible thorns. He also said that it all started when I was playing alone under these trees, and I may have talked to or made friends with somebody whom I thought was human, since I was very friendly and very talkative. When I got my period, they started rushing and became desperate about the process of wedding because I was quote-unquote ripe to be a vessel and give birth to a dwarf king's child. This explained the longer fainting spells. My grandpa said that every time I faint, they're luring me away to get communion and bring me to their dimension, which I don't remember anything about, to be honest. Anyway, for those of you who know, I guess, or who don't know, When we do communion, we celebrate him, the story of Jesus, how he gave himself completely to give us a better life and start new, and a fresh relationship with God. Now the wedding I mentioned means that I was to die a virgin in this world, and they'll either abduct me or lure me into theirs. He also said that if I were to lose my virginity to somebody else, I'll no longer be quote-unquote useful to them, and that they either will kill me or give me really bad luck. Fast forward to now. My uncle and his aunts are saying that my kids, a boy and a girl, have their guardians since I'd been blessed and protected when the ritual was done. I didn't know that it actually got passed on. Anyhow, my kids are both sensitive, and I'm glad that they tell me what's going on with their lives so I know I can protect them if any of that shit happens again. Dark History and Secrets Behind St. Agnes In the small, secluded town of Greenwood, New Jersey, nestled amidst a dense forest and hidden from the prying eyes of the outside world, stood St. Agnes Church. Its weathered stone walls and towering steeple reached for the heavens, a beacon of faith and solace for the townsfolk. But beyond its tranquil facade, a tale of darkness and mystery was woven into the very fabric of the church's existence. 
whispered had long circulated among the townspeople about the eerie secrets that lay dormant within the walls of St. Agnes Church. Legend spoke of an ancient burial ground, forgotten by time, upon which the church had been built. Restless spirits were said to roam the sacred halls, their mournful moans echoing through the silent nights and their ethereal forms glimpsed by those who dared to venture there after dusk. Generations had passed down the stories of the church's twisted past, and among the town's eldest residents, tales of a malevolent clergyman named Reverend Barnabas were shared with hushed tones. Revered as a shepherd of souls by day, Reverend Barnabas had an insidious presence that hid beneath his charismatic exterior. Rumors hinted at his involvement in the occult and unspeakable rituals that defied the teachings of the church. According to the age-old folklore, Reverend Barnabas' descent into darkness had been a gradual one, fueled by an insatiable thirst for forbidden knowledge. The dusty tomes of forgotten lore became his refuge, revealing secrets that were better left concealed. The once pure sanctuary of St. Agnes Church became tainted by his perverse curiosity and unholy experiments. Whispers grew louder about the hidden catacombs beneath the church where Reverend Barnabas conducted his sinister practices away from prying eyes. The townsfolk, gripped by fear and curiosity, dared not speak openly of the horrors they believed lurked beneath their very feet. However, as the moon reached its zenith, they would occasionally catch fleeting glimpses of dimly lit candles flickering in the depths, accompanied by distant echoes of agonized cries and the haunting melodies of an organ that seemed to play itself. One fateful night when the ominous storm shrouded Greenwood in darkness, a courageous group of townsfolk banded together, driven by an unwavering determination to confront the malevolence that gripped at their beloved church. They armed themselves with crucifixes, vials of holy water, and flickering candles. Guided by their collective resolve, they descended into the forbidden catacombs, the musty scent of age and decay filling the air. What they encountered in those shadowy depths would forever sear their memories and haunt their dreams. The winding corridors revealed rows upon rows of weathered skeletal remains, meticulously stacked as if in a macabre symphony. The feeble candlelight cast eerie dancing shadows upon the ancient bones, illuminating a chamber that seemed to pulse with an evil presence. At the heart of this haunting tableau stood Reverend Barnabas, his eyes gleaming with malevolence and madness. A chilling silence settled upon the brave souls as they stared into the abyss of the reverend's twisted creation. With a wicked smile that curdled their blood, he beckoned them forward, daring them to challenge his authority and the foundations of their faith. But bolstered by their unwavering belief, they raised their crosses, invoking prayers of protection and unleashed vials of blessed water upon the unholy abomination before them. The very air cracked with the force of their collective conviction, repelling the malevolent energies that emanated from Reverend Barnabas. Inch by inch, they forced him back, his form growing increasingly distorted and ethereal, until with a final shriek of defiance he dissipated into the shadows, leaving behind a void of darkness that slowly receded. In the aftermath of their harrowing encounter, the townsfolk emerged from the catacombs, their hearts heavy with the weight of what they had just witnessed. With solemn determination, they sealed the entrance of the accursed chambers, entombing the memories of Reverend Barnabas and his blasphemous experiments forever. St. Agnes Church, once tainted by the darkness that had consumed its shepherd, began to heal and reclaim its sanctity. The townspeople, scarred by the horrors that they had faced, dedicated themselves to ensuring that the church remained a sanctuary of light and hope. They scrubbed away the lingering traces of malevolence, replacing them with fresh coats of paint and heartfelt prayers of redemption. Over time, the haunting tales of St. Agnes Church's eerie past transformed into cautionary folklore. Visitors to Greenwood would be regaled with stories of restless spirits that still whispered in the wind and shadows that danced in the moonlight. The townsfolk, ever vigilant, would 
share accounts of faint organ music that wafted through the night air, a reminder of the evil that had once tainted their beloved place of worship. As the years rolled by, St. Agnes Church became a symbol of resilience, a testament to the power of faith to overcome even the darkest of shadows. The townsfolk, though forever marked by the scars of their encounter, found solace in their collective spirit and the bond forged through their shared struggle. Today, the church stands as a beacon of serenity, its doors open to all who seek comfort and guidance. The echoes of its unsettling past have faded, but not disappeared entirely, leaving behind a subtle reminder of the battles fought and the victory of light over darkness. So should you find yourself wandering the winding streets of Greenwood, drawn to the age-old allure of St. Agnes Church, take a moment to listen. Listen to the whispers of the wind that caresses ancient walls. Listen for the soft murmurs of the past that linger in the breeze. For within those whispered echoes, you may catch a glimpse of the resilience and courage that turned a once accursed church into a testament of hope. A reminder that even in the face of the inexplicable, the light of the human spirit can prevail. My True Encounters with Ghostly Presences It all began when I moved into this old, cozy house in a quiet neighborhood. Little did I know that it held secrets beyond my wildest imagination. From the moment I stepped inside, a peculiar energy enveloped that place, making my skin crawl. Strange things started happening. A flicker of movement from the corner of my eye, unexplained sounds echoing through the halls, and objects seemingly shifting on their own. At first, I dismissed these occurrences as mere figments of my imagination, trying to rationalize them away. But as the days turned into weeks, the activity intensified, leaving me no choice but to confront the inexplicable. Late one eerie night, while lying in bed, the silence broke only by the creaks of the house. I heard it, a whisper, soft and faint, carried by an otherworldly presence. My heart skipped a beat as I strained to catch the words spoken by an unseen entity. Though their voice was barely audible, it seemed to call out my name, echoing with a mix of longing and urgency. Determined to uncover the truths behind these spectral whispers, I delved into the house's history. Countless hours were spent researching, speaking to locals who knew the area well, and poring over dusty archives in search of answers. Slowly, the puzzle pieces fell into place. A former resident who met a tragic end, their spirit lingering in search of resolution. I embarked on a mission to communicate with the unseen entity, to offer solace to their restless souls. Through late-night conversations, I began to understand their pain, the unfinished business that bound them to our world. The encounters continued, growing more intense and tangible. Objects would move of their own accord, doors would slam shut with eerie force, and an icy chill would settle in certain areas of the house. Shadows danced and flickered, seemingly alive with ethereal energy. Though fear gripped me at times, my insatiable curiosity and compassion propelled me forward. I sought the assistance of seasoned paranormal investigators, and together we explored the depths of the house, armed with various detection devices, hoping to capture evidence of the otherworldly. Our investigations yielded chilling results. Audio recordings that captured disembodied voices, whispers from beyond the veil, and photographs that revealed mysterious orbs of light, their presence defying explanation and sparking wonder. Yet, amidst the chilling encounters, a deep sense of empathy grew within me. I realized that these ghostly beings were not malevolent entities, but remnants of lives once lived. They yearned for acknowledgement and understanding. With careful research and heartfelt conversations, I pieced together fragments of their stories. Each encounter brought me closer to understanding their plan and helping them find the closure they desperately sought. 
Now, for all you brave Redditors who wish to venture into the realm of the supernatural, I offer you a ritual, a symbolic gesture of connection with the spirits. Light a white candle in a quiet room, close your eyes, and softly speak words of compassion and understanding. Open your heart and mind to the possibility of their presence, acknowledging their existence with respect and kindness. But let me remind you, to approach this ritual with caution and respect, the spirit world is a realm we can never fully comprehend, and it is essential to tread lightly and ensure your own safety. So if you ever find yourself face to face with the unexplained, approach it with an open mind and a compassionate spirit. Within those whispers in the night, you might just catch a glimpse of the profound mysteries that surround us all. As my journey with the supernatural entities unfolded, I couldn't help but wonder if there was a way to help them find peace. I sought advice from experts in spiritual practices and discovered a ritual, an amalgamation of ancient traditions and personal intent, which some believed could provide closure for these restless spirits. With a mix of excitement and trepidation, I gathered the necessary items, a bundle of sage, a small vial of blessed water, and a piece of amethyst said to possess protective properties. Taking a deep breath, I entered the most active area of the house, the room that I had felt had the strongest presence. In the dim light, I lit the bundle of sage, letting the fragrant smoke fill the room. With each waft, I visualized negative energy dissipating and a calming aura enveloping the space. I sprinkled a few drops of blessed water around, symbolizing purification and renewal. As the room became infused with the delicate scent of sage, I held the amethyst in my hand, feeling its cool energy grounding me. With a steady voice, I spoke words of compassion and release, addressing the spirits that resided within the house. I acknowledged their pain expressed my willingness to help, and offered them the freedom to move on from their earthly attachments. A profound stillness settled in the room, as if the very air held its breath. The sensation of being watched eased, replaced by a sense of serenity. Whether it was the power of the ritual or a shift in the spirit's energy, I may truly never know. But in that moment I felt a gentle, intangible presence. The weight of unresolved emotions lifted, replaced by subtle gratitude. In the days that followed, the paranormal activity gradually subsided. The once restless spirits seemed to find solace and began to fade into the ethereal realm they belonged to. The house, once fraught with their lingering presence, now felt lighter and more peaceful. Reflecting on my experiences, I realized that the ritual was not a definitive solution for every haunting. Each encounter with the supernatural is unique and finding resolution may require a diverse range of approaches, but the ritual served as a catalyst, an opportunity for understanding and healing to take place. Witchcraft The history of witchcraft is a complex and multifaceted subject that spans centuries and cultures. The origins of witchcraft can be traced back to prehistoric times when early humans developed beliefs in supernatural powers and magic. The story of witchcraft, as it's commonly understood today, begins in the 14th century in Europe. During this time, a series of events and cultural changes set the stage for a widespread fear and persecution of witches. These events included the spread of Christianity and the influence of the church, the bubonic plague, social unrest, and the development of witch-hunting manuals. With the rise of Christianity, the church sought to suppress non-Christian practices and beliefs. Pagan traditions, folk magic, and local healers were viewed as threats to the church's authority and were gradually condemned as heresy. The idea of a pact with the devil and the practice of harmful magic became associated with witches. The bubonic plague, which ravaged Europe in the 14th century, intensified the fear and paranoia surrounding witches. People were desperate to find someone to blame for the devastating effects of the plague, and witches became convenient scapegoats. 
Accusations of witchcraft often arose in times of crisis or hardship. The publication of various witch-hunting manuals such as Malleus Maleficarum, the Hammer of Witches, in 1486, played a significant role in fueling the witch-hunt hysteria. These books provided detailed instructions on identifying, interrogating, and punishing witches, leading to an increase in witch trials. The witch trials reached their peak during the 16th and 17th centuries, particularly in regions like Germany, France, Scotland, and Salem, Massachusetts. Accusations were often based on superstitious beliefs, rumors, and personal vendettas, or confessions extracted through torture. Witch hunts were conducted by both secular authorities and the church, resulting in torture, execution, or imprisonment of tens of thousands of people, mostly women. It's important to note that the concept of witchcraft varied across different cultures and time periods. In some cases, individuals accused of witchcraft were believed to possess supernatural powers, while in others, they were seen as practicing malevolent magic or engaging in harmful activities. Over time, as the Age of Enlightenment took hold in the 18th century, beliefs in witchcraft and witch hunting began to decline. The witch trials came to be seen as a dark chapter in history, fueled by superstition, hysteria, and misogyny. Modern interpretations of witchcraft focus more on nature-based spirituality, religious practices, and the empowerment of individuals, and they often are referred to as Wicca or modern witchcraft. In summary, the story of witchcraft and its origins are complex, spanning centuries and influenced by various cultural, social, and religious factors. The fear and persecution of witches during the European witch trials were driven by a combination of religious, societal, and economic factors, leading to the tragic persecution of thousands of individuals accused of witchcraft. As the Enlightenment progressed, scientific advancements and rational thinking began to challenge the prevailing beliefs in witchcraft. Scholars and intellectuals started questioning the validity of witch-hunting practices, and laws against witchcraft were gradually repealed. By the 18th century, witch trials had largely ceased in Europe. However, it's important to note that pockets of witchcraft and persecution continued in some regions. For example, in parts of Africa, Asia, and the Americas, Indigenous spiritual practices and beliefs were suppressed by colonial powers who saw them as witchcraft or pagan rituals. These acts of, per of persecution were often tied to the colonization and forced conversion of native populations. In the 19th and 20th centuries, there was a revival of interest in witchcraft and the occult, largely influenced by various cultural and intellectual movements. In the late 19th century, Figures such as Helena Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley popularized esoteric practices and helped shape the modern occult movement. In the mid-20th century, the emergence of Wicca, a contemporary pagan religious movement, played a significant role in reshaping public perceptions of witchcraft. Wicca, founded by Gerald Gardner in England during the 1950s, drew inspiration from pre-Christian traditions and witchcraft practices emphasizing nature worship, ritual magic, and the celebration of divine feminine. Wicca and other forms of modern witchcraft focus on personal empowerment, spiritual connection with nature, and practice of magic. They reject the negative stereotypes associated with historical witchcraft trials and instead embrace a more positive and inclusive approach to spirituality. In recent decades, witchcraft has experienced a surge in popularity, particularly in Western societies. Books, movies, and popular culture have contributed to a broader acceptance and understanding of witchcraft, often depicting it as a symbol of female empowerment and alternative spirituality. It's important to note that modern witchcraft encompasses a wide range of beliefs and practices, and not all individuals who identify as witches adhere to the same set of beliefs. Some witches follow specific traditions like Wicca, while others develop their own unique spiritual paths. In conclusion, the story of witchcraft spans centuries and continues to evolve to this day. From its origins in ancient beliefs and pagan practices 
to the persecution and trials of the European witch hunt era, the modern resurgence of witchcraft as a spiritual practice, the history of witchcraft reflects the complexities of human culture, belief systems, and the ongoing search for meaning and empowerment. An Airbnb experience I'll never forget. The city has been suffocating me. The constant noise, the never-ending hustle, and the relentless pressure. They were all taking a toll on my mental health. I was just 32, but I felt decades older. So I decided to escape to a place where silence was the loudest noise. Where the pace of life was dictated by the rising and setting of the sun. I found a quaint little Airbnb in the countryside, an idyllic log cabin surrounded by acres of dense woods far away from the maddening crowd. To be honest, it seemed like a dream, but little did I know it was a nightmare in disguise. Upon my arrival, the cabin appeared as charming as the pictures, rustic, isolated, and peaceful, but as the sun began to set, the cabin started revealing its true colors. At first, it was the little things, the way the wooden floor creaked under my feet, even when I was standing still. The peculiar smell that lingered in the air. Sweet, yet metallic. The way the wind howled through the trees, almost like a mournful cry. Then I started noticing the oddities. The mirrors in the cabin didn't reflect my image correctly. My reflection was always slightly delayed, as if it were another person mimicking my movements. The paintings on the walls seemed to shift when I looked away, their subjects twisting into grotesque figures. As the night fell, I heard whispers, soft, eerie whispers that seemed to come from the walls themselves. They spoke of sorrow, of loss, and of something darker that I dared not contemplate. Then came the figure. Every night at the stroke of midnight, I could see it in the window, a silhouette standing in the woods, watching. It was always there, unmoving, just watching. Despite the terror that gripped me, I couldn't bring myself to leave. It was as if the cabin had ensnared me in its eerie charm. Every day I would tell myself, oh my god, I'm leaving tomorrow. But when tomorrow came, I found myself drawn further into the mystery of the cabin. What is this place? What secrets does it hold? Why does it not let me go? The questions consumed me, fueling my curiosity and fear in equal measure, but I was determined to uncover the truth or be consumed by it. Days turned into weeks, I found myself weirdly drawn deeper into the hypnotic rhythm of the cabin. The whispers grew louder, the figure in the woods seemed closer, and the cabin's oddities became more pronounced. One day I found a trap door under a worn-out rug, led to a basement I hadn't known existed. The air was damp, filled with the scent of old earth and something else. A smell that made my stomach churn it was the same sweet yet metallic smell I'd noticed when I first arrived. In the dim light, I could see something etched into the stone walls. Symbols, old and unfamiliar, crisscrossed the surface in a pattern that made my head spin. The same symbols were carved into a wooden pedestal at the center of the room, upon which sat an old leather-bound book. As I approached the book, the whispers grew into a cacophony. I could hear distinct words, now a chant, repeating the same phrase over and over. I couldn't understand it, but I felt a pull, a compulsion to open the book. With trebling hands, I opened it. The pages were yellowed with age covered in the same symbols from the walls. But there in the middle of the book was a picture that made my blood run cold. It was a cabin, and standing by the window was a figure. The same figure I saw every night. But in the book, the figure wasn't outside the cabin, it was inside, staring directly at me. I recoiled in horror, dropping the book. The room plunged into silence. I could feel a presence behind me. I didn't want to turn around. I didn't want to see what I knew was there, but I had to. I turned. I turned around, and there it was, the figure. It was no longer a silhouette, but a clear, ghastly apparition. 
It was as if someone had taken a snapshot of despair and molded it into a humanoid shape. He reached out for me with a hand that was both there and not there. My instinct screamed at me to run, but my feet were rooted to the spot. I was a statue, a prisoner of my own fear. The apparition's hand touched my face. It was ice cold, yet it burned. As it did, I felt a wave of emotions flood into me. Sadness, anger, fear, despair. These weren't my emotions. They were its. Suddenly I was somewhere else. I was still in the cabin, but it was different. Alive. Filled with people. I was seeing through someone else's eyes, feeling their emotions, living their memories. I was the apparition. I saw the cabin as it was. Not a building, but a prison. A place of punishment for those who dared to challenge the natural order. The apparition, I realized, was not a ghost, but a prisoner trapped in the cabin for an eternity. The memories became darker, filled with pain and sorrow. I felt every moment of the apparition's loneliness, every second of its despair. It was too much. I screamed, or at least I thought I did. The next thing I knew, I was back in the basement, the apparition gone. I left the cabin the next morning. As I walked away, I could still feel its gaze on me. But it was different. It was no longer a gaze of menace, but of gratitude. I had shared its pain and solitude. I had given it something it hadn't had in a long time. Company. As I left, I glanced back one last time. There in the window stood the figure, watching me leave, but this time it wasn't alone. Standing next to it was another figure, a familiar one. It was me. I had left the cabin, but a part of me would always remain trapped in the eerie solitude, forever sharing the cabin's haunting secret. Oz? Zozo? I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. Our town was actually founded in the late 19th century. In fact, the cemetery where we would go play Ouija had gravestones that had birth dates starting in the 1800s. When I was about 14, I got into the idea of Ouija in the spiritual world, just reading about it all the time. I'm not a very religious person, but the opportunity to speak with beings who have passed over will never not fascinate me. So, it was around then that I and a couple of my friends made our own board, out of the box of my guitar hero. I drew the letters and words on it with a sharpie and we used a shot glass as the glass piece. I still have it in my parents' garage to this day, as a matter of fact. There were many, many times that we had older siblings drive us out in the graveyard at night so we could play. I want to share the name of it with you guys so you can look it up for yourselves. There's fucking videos on YouTube of the cemetery that I played Ouija in as a teenager. So just let me know if you do, and I can DM you for privacy reasons. It's pretty weird to see the name of your hometown in the titles of scary YouTube videos. But anyways, I just want to tell you guys the reason why I began taking it so seriously. And then the story that made me stop playing Ouija for years. There were five of us, and I was always the one asking questions. We would bring a big quilt for us to sit on, white candles and a lighter. Our board and peace. We'd hold hands and ask if anybody wanted to talk with us, sharing that we'd love to talk with them. And then begin. Two of my friends who were too scared to play would just watch and the rest of us had fingers on the piece. The second time we ever played, I asked the person that we were speaking to if they were buried there in the graveyard. And they said yes. I asked them their name, and they gave us initials. E.K.W. We said politely that we wanted to stop talking so we could go find a gravestone. We moved it to goodbye, and then we stood up, all pulled out our phones to use flashlights, and s sort of started walking around the graveyard looking for E.K.W. After several minutes, one of my friends yelled, Guys? The rest of us ran over to my friend who was standing there frozen, and there it was, E.K.W. She had died sometime in the 1920s. 
all five of us started freaking out, yelling, Hi, EKW, thanks for talking with us. We decided that was enough Ouija for the night. Let's end it on a positive note. Fast forward to a couple of years later, when I could drive. I had a tiny-ass manual Mitsubishi Eclipse, but she was the best first car ever. And we're still playing Ouija, mostly in the summers. I had the same few friends in a group through most of high school, but these girls were the most fun. Nobody else would follow me to the graveyard to talk to dead people as the sun goes down. So one night, we had our usual setup and had already had a conversation with two of some peeps. Then we said aloud that we wanted to speak with someone new, anyone. We wanted to make a new friend like EKW. Someone said hello, we said hi back. I asked this time its name. It said Oz. I thought, Oz, that's a weird one. But we kept dicking around with him. And then I asked him if we should be afraid of him. He said yes. I told him we were going to leave. He said no. Then the piece started moving back and forth between O and Z. I said, dude, I know your name is Oz. We get it. Then this fucker started moving down the alphabet, getting faster and faster. I remember that I had to read that when the piece is moving down the alphabet. It's a bad sign. I can mean the spirit that you're speaking with is pissed off or trying to come out of the board, whatever that means. I told my friends that we have to physically move it to goodbye, not let it keep sliding across the board, so we did. I picked up the piece and slammed it down on top of the goodbye. We all looked at each other. One of us said, yeah, let's leave. So we did. I grabbed the board and the piece. My friend started grabbing the candles and folding the quilt. We began walking back to my car. You know that feeling you get where something could be following you, but as long as you walk and don't run, you won't freak yourself out? I'm laughing while typing this, but thinking about it, two of them were already in my car, pulling the front seats forward and climbing into the back of my little two-door shit queen. I was almost out of the cemetery about to walk through the gate when I hear running footsteps behind me. I didn't even think about looking back. I let out a screech and started sprinting. I was about 10 feet away from my car and I probably reached that hoe in like four strides. I was booking it that hard. I ain't even fast either. My manual that wishes you were an automatic wouldn't start. I kept stomping on the clutch and brake and finally my key turned, all while my friends are screaming at me, go bitch, go. It's a gravel pathway only big enough for one car at the time that we have to drive up and down to get in and out of the graveyard. My poor baby was fishtailing and I was moving so fast. It's so dark too. There's only one street light near the graveyard and it's right at the entrance at the turnoff from the main road. We were surrounded by nothing but trees and the dim moonlight. So we got back to our friend's mom's house and we're all practically yelling at her in the kitchen about what had just happened. She called us idiots and said that she doesn't want to have that shit in her house. So, I took it back outside and put it in the trunk of my car. I didn't have the feeling that I was being watched anymore, but I just felt different. I don't know how to explain it. I went back inside and they were already looking up the name Oz and Ouija. Middle School Madness and Hallway Hauntings The middle school I attended was once the first high school built in the downtown area of my hometown in the early 20th century. Comprised of three main halls, a gymnasium, and a large office building where the library and auditorium were located. At this time, my mother worked in the main office and would work through the summer while students and teachers were gone. On one such day, she was in her office alone when she heard the front door open and the sound of a group of children walking toward the office. She called out with her normal friendly demeanor, expecting them to round the corner any moment. Instead, she heard the door to the auditorium open and the sounds go with it. Now thinking some children were where they were not supposed to be, she quickly got up and walked into the auditorium to tell them to leave. She was confronted 
with only empty and lonely seats and the dark, unlit stage. Feeling uneasy, she began her exit, and as she did, she heard a child giggle somewhere in the darkness. Shortly after, she was again in the office alone, when suddenly she heard a loud banging come from the library above her. Worried but dutiful, she made her way up the stairs and opened the door to the library. Every chair and table was tossed and tipped upside down in a haphazard and cluttered fashion. Scared and annoyed, she quickly reset everything and made her exit. She would go on to complain for weeks about this repeating in that location. The final and most extreme of her experiences happened in the office. She was filing paperwork and organizing things for the assistant principal, who wasn't on the school premises at the time. She was walking back and forth between her office, the conference room, and the assistant principal's office. She had just walked into the conference room and felt a sharp and aggressive tug on the back of her head. She whirled around expecting to see an assailant, but there was nothing. Determined to stand her ground, she mustered up her courage and shouted out that she would not be bullied or made afraid, and that she had work to do, as if reprimanding a child. After which, things calmed down in that building. The 8th grade hall was a whole other matter entirely. The summer going into 7th grade, we decided to do a little ghost hunting of our own. A trio comprised of myself, my mother, and my grandfather entered the empty hall in the late afternoon. We sat on the old steps in silence for a while, looking down the hall with our backs to the entry to the girls' gym. After a while, we began to hear what sounded like footsteps on the old basketball court in the girls' gym. Startled, but... Well, excited. We quietly walked into the empty gym. The court creaked and whined as we walked across it until we came to a halt in the middle and just stood there for a minute. An eerie feeling came over us and a creaking sound began to come from the court, as if footsteps were circling around us. Feeling uneasy, we began our exit. As we opened the double door to the gym into the main hall, all three of us looked down at the end of the hall that connects to the 7th and 8th grade halls together and we saw a tall, thin, and inky black figure swiftly glide across from right to left and out of our sight. Filled with hormonal courage, I charged down the hallway toward it, but by the time I reached the end of the hall, there was nothing to be seen. Freaked out, we called it a day. Sometime later, after school hours, I had just finished training with the track and field team, and I was walking up to the main office where my mother was. As I was walking, I began to hear a loud and repetitive banging noise. Confused, I looked around for the source. I looked up and through the high windows of the girls' locker room, I could see a locker door opening and slamming shut repeatedly with force by itself. I stood there for a minute in bemusement, thinking it was a vent or something causing it, but no other locker doors near it moved. It continued to slam loudly as I made my way to the office don't know when it stopped. The final tale I have from this location is the one that creeps me out the most. Over summer going into 8th grade, while the buildings were mostly empty, a group of electricians and custodians were tasked with climbing into the crawl space above the 8th grade hall to solve a problem. They were going about their casual conversations in the front office where my mom was, drinking coffee and laughing as she heard them exit and head to the hall. About 20 minutes passed and she said that they all entered the main office. None of them were talking, no laughing. Their entire demeanor now off. These big burly men are now pale as paper and avoiding eye contact with her. She approaches the main custodian, a friendly and usually a candid older gentleman, and asks him what's wrong. He brushes her off in a somewhat rude manner that nothing is wrong and that they're just working some things out. Two years pass and none of these men will speak a word about it until the day that my mother confronts the main custodian, demanding what made him act so craven that day. He breaks and finally tells her. 
says that he and a few of the guys went up into the crawl space that day. They had been working for maybe ten minutes when they saw something. Something that scared these men so badly that they would rather be reprimanded for not doing their job than go back up there. Men who pride themselves on their integrity, turning away from their responsibility out of fear of what was up there. When she pressed him for more details, he refused and told her to drop it, never speaking about it ever again. Attention truth seekers and lovers of the paranormal. Paranormal M is the ultimate destination for those who crave a dose of the supernatural. Hit subscribe to our channel and hit that like button. Poltergeist. The Disappearing Cross. I'll always remember the events of this day. It was the weekend that Captain America the Winter Soldier movie came out in the United States. April 2014. A month before this movie came out, my cousin flew down from Dallas, Texas and stayed with me and my girlfriend up near Seattle, Washington, a small town called Bothell. My cousin had always been aware of her ghost sort of speak, meaning she knew just enough to want to still come. To be safe, she brought along with her a gift for me and my girlfriend. Hopefully, this cross will protect us. Written on it were the chapters Joshua 1.9, Phil 4.13, Psalm 28.7, and Matthew 19.26. Each verse spoke about maintaining one's strength, one's faith during troubling times. My girlfriend and I had been having strong poltergeist-like activity, so reading something was extremely helpful. When my cousin arrived, she handed me the cross. We prayed over it and placed it in our bedroom. That's where my cousin said it would protect us. She said, keep it above your bed in your bedroom. A month later, the cross went missing. Understand missing objects, religious objects especially, is not a new phenomenon in her house. Things get taken all the time. Sometimes they return, sometimes they don't. The items that do return are never found in their original spot. This cross would be no exception. The question my girlfriend and I ask ourselves when an item such as this goes missing is what the heck is going on? I mean, we're talking about a sizable cross here. Six inches long, four inches wide, it's not something you can misplace. How could we? We nailed it high above our bed on the wall and it's gone now. No use looking for it, only two people are living in the house. My girlfriend and I fast forward to the premiere of the Captain America movie. It's Saturday morning. The cross has been missing for over a week now. I began doing my laundry early that day, earlier than usual. I figured it's best to get my chores done if I'm to go to the movies later on. I'm excited. I'm going to see the Marvel movie with one of my best friends. Let me get this laundry done as soon as possible, I think. I began my first load of laundry, the colored clothing. My girlfriend, Tina, is walking around the house doing her own thing, and I decided to go to my office and watch TV and wait for my clothes to wash. About an hour later, I noticed something peculiar. My first load of clothing was still washing. Now I know that there are long wash cycles, but this was weird. My brain knows how long it takes for my clothes to wash, I'm pretty sure I didn't set the washing machine to the long wash cycle, and it's taken exceptionally long this time. How unusual. I glanced toward the washroom, hoping to hear the beep. You know, the noise the washing machine makes when it's done. So I glance at the washroom and I look at the clock on my computer. I think to myself, what's taking my clothes so long to wash? A few minutes later, I hear this knocking sound. You know, the sound the washing machine or dryer makes when something's big inside like a shoe or something like that. The noise I'm hearing is coming from the washing machine. Once again, I'm glancing up from my PC and I look at the washroom. What could be making that noise, I wonder? At this point, the wash cycle had been running for nearly an hour far too long from what I put inside. Normally, I would get up and see what the commotion was all about. I didn't this time. I kept watching TV. Finally, 
washing machine beeps, informing me that the load was complete. Time to remove the clothing. I'm passive as passive can be, no hurry whatsoever as I pulled out my clothes and tossed them into the dryer. I immediately grabbed hold of something solid, not clothing, not shoes, not anything except a metallic wooden cross. I didn't know what it was until I pulled it out of the washing machine. There in my hand, in two pieces, is the cross my cousin gave me. Now some might say, well that, maybe the cross was just in there to begin with. Not so. As I mentioned prior, that would have been heard really early on. The thumping noises, I mean. The knocking noises I heard began 15 minutes before the washing was complete. Secondly, the washing machine was empty when I used it. Some might say, maybe you accidentally put the cross in the machine when you loaded the clothes. Wrong again. I sorted my clothes carefully, meaning items went into the machine almost one at a time. A cross this size was not going to be grabbed by mistake, and even if it was, I would have heard the bumping noise way sooner than I did. Maybe your girlfriend put it in by mistake. Well, my girlfriend was nowhere near the washing machine that day, and I never left my office. The washroom sits right outside my office. She would have had to stop my wash load regardless. I do my laundry. She does her laundry. It's important that I get those particulars out of the way for fear of people gravitating towards the obvious explanation. And that is understandable, though. Now allow me to paint the picture as near perfect as possible, because it even hasn't begun to get weird yet. In my hand is the cross my cousin gave me. It took a sort of beating in the washing machine, you could say. It's broken up now. I then called my girlfriend in the room. We both examined the cross from top to bottom. Here it is again, after being gone for about a week. This cross would disappear and get thrown a few more times before finally being left alone. My grandfather's ex-girlfriend wasn't human. Back in 1970, when my grandpa was 18, he was dating this girl who was a year younger than him for over a year. We're going to call this girl S. S was beautiful, sweet, kind, and easy on the eyes, according to him. When summer started, S invited him to her parents' house in the province. S was currently staying with her aunt while she went to school in my grandpa's town. My grandpa was skeptical at first because the area that S lived in was quite rural and would take five hours to arrive by bus. But Grandpa was infatuated with S, so he said, eh, what the hell, why not? So with permission from his parents, he packed up, and he and S were on their way. When they arrived at her hometown, he noticed a lot of people were staring at them. It was a small town, so the population wasn't that big. S showed him around where the shops were, the diners, etc. But Grandpa would notice people staring at them. The one time he heard a couple whisper, a swang. If you're wondering what the hell an aswang is, in Filipino folklore, an aswang is a malevolent, shape-shifting, flesh-eating monster. From what I learned by the day that they look and act like normal people. However, at night, they reveal their true selves. Back to the story. So S and Grandpa arrive at S's house. It was a large, three-story wooden home. Grandpa then met S's parents. They greeted him warmly and invited him in, and exchanged talks over dinner. Grandpa said that they seemed like a couple of nice normal people. On the first night, he was sleeping in S's room on the second floor. Grandpa woke up hearing a strange noise. The first thing he noticed was that S was gone. He assumed that she must have went to the bathroom, so he lied down again. But the weird sound continued. It was coming from the floor above. He said that it sounded like cats scratching its claws on the wooden floor, accompanied by what sounded like a person mumbling. He tried to ignore it, but it started getting louder until he could hear multiple clawing noises from above, like multiple cats scratching on the wooden floors as well as mumbling. S still hasn't come back at this point, which made him worry. 
But when he heard loud thumping from upstairs, like a person jumping, Grandpa's really weirded out at this point, so he covers his ears with his pillow. The next day, he told S that their cats were really loud and that he couldn't sleep. S just looked at him confused and said, We don't have cats. Huh? That's weird. I could have sworn I heard cats last night, he said. On the second night, he was woken up again by the same sounds. He said at that point he was thinking, what the bleep? Then he hears loud grunting from above, like an animal in pain. He tries to go back to sleep, but then he's startled by what sounded like a roar. This continues for another day, until on the fourth night, Grandpa decided he had had enough. He was going to man up, march upstairs, and see what the hell was going on. So it was around one in the morning, according to him. And he said it was strange, because he didn't hear any more of the weird sounds, but he decided to go upstairs anyway. He tiptoed across the floor and reached the stairs leading to the third floor. Once he reached the third floor, he notices something weird. The lights wouldn't work, even though they were working fine before he went to bed. The only source of light was the moonlight, which illuminated the interior. He makes his way to the room that was above him on the second floor where the sounds were coming from, and what he saw made the hair on his back of his neck stand up. The floor was littered with claw marks. The windows were wide open, and there were blood stains across the floor. There were no signs of S or her parents anywhere. Freaked out, he went back down to the second floor, but then his nose caught a whiff of something he hadn't noticed before. It was coming from the kitchen. Curious, he went to go take a look, but it was so dark that he could barely make anything out. As he walked, his hand touched something that felt like a large metal pot. He opened the lid. A great number of flies escaped and his nose was assaulted. An extremely awful, putrid smell that he said nearly made him vomit. It was so dark that he couldn't see what was inside the pot, so he immediately slammed down the lid and run back to the room and forced himself to sleep. The next day, during lunch, as his mother served dinuguan, animal blood that's been cooked and mixed with herbs and spices. But my grandpa excused himself and lied that he was sick. He didn't want to know what was in the food. As his mother tried to coax him to eat, saying that he'll regain his energy. This is when grandpa takes the opportunity to find out the truth. You see, in folklore, to identify whether or not a person is an Aswang, is quite simple. Observe their eyes. If your reflection is upside down, then they're an Aswang. Grandpa stared at S's mom's eyes and reeled back in horror. His reflection was upside down. This is when the mom's expression completely changes. She went from concerned to angry and was glaring hard at Grandpa, an expression that basically says, according to him, you shouldn't have done that. That night, Grandpa didn't waste any time and immediately packs up and heads home, lying that there's been a family emergency in order for him to go. He finally returns home and spent a lot of time inside his house in complete fear. The following month, he breaks up with S. She looked at him in sadness and said that she understands. That was a wise choice for him, but it was quite a shame, huh? Grandpa ended the story. He said that it was a huge shame indeed because he really wanted to marry S. His name was Walt. So these experiences I have aren't necessarily mine, but of my parents and older sister as most of these events happened before it was born. I'm sorry if some of these seem a bit vague on details, but I'm trying to remember as much as I can from the time that I was told these. Some backstory. Walt had lived in our house years prior to us moving in, and he was an electrician and a lover of cats. Both of these are relevant later. And he lived by himself. He loved that house. So when things went wrong, he would fix them like when the doorbell stopped working. So he went to the basement where the wiring for the doorbell was, and I believe he either had a stroke or a heart attack and fell 
hitting his head on the corner table that he had down there, causing him to die. Like I said, he loved that house. He ended up staying after death. Subsequently, every person or family who's moved in after his death would move out around six months in. Three months if he really didn't like them. Until my family moved in in 1996. I was about to be born the following year. My mom's experience. So my dad was in the army at the time and was in for deployment. While my mom was doing dishes, she accidentally damaged her wedding ring. So she put it in a Ziploc bag and placed it in her jewelry box right on top. As she would go to bring it to the jeweler to have it repaired. Come the next morning and lo and behold, the ring is missing. She completely empties the jewelry box and searches around the room and it's nowhere to be found. Distraught, but resigned, as there was nothing she could do. A few months pass, and it's getting close for my dad to come home from deployment, and my mom is starting to get worried on what to say to my dad. Then one night, my mom's woken up by a strange feeling, and hears a man whisper, Check your jewelry box. Despite feeling doubtful, she checks, and there on top of everything inside is her wedding ring, still in its plastic bag. The next day, my mom goes out and notices a new jeweler shop, and she brings it there, because of them being new and they were offering discounted prices to gain new customers. So my mom was able to get the ring fixed, and for a cheaper price. My dad's experience. Like I said before, Walt died while trying to fix the doorbell. In all that time, the doorbell was never fixed. <laughs> So my dad, being the man of the house, tries to fix it, despite not having any experience being an electrician. He takes some tools, a how-to book, and gets right down to it for a few hours. He would call up to my mom to test the doorbell to see if it got fixed, but it wouldn't ring. After some time, the pages on the how-to book began to flip to the page that my dad actually needed, and as he worked, he felt hands on him, guiding him. Till eventually, when he called up to my mom to test the doorbell, she was sort of a humorist at him for the last time. And to both of our surprise, the doorbell worked. When my mom asked how he did it, he told her that he really didn't know what happened, but it felt like he was given help. My mom and dad's experience. When they first moved in, they noticed that some of Walt's belongings were still in the house so they were able to get in contact with his sister who lived not too far away. The items being a box of personal items in the master bedroom closet and his leatherman jacket in the mudroom's closet. They gathered items and placed it by the front door, so when Walt's sister came, she wouldn't have to wait for them to get the stuff. And then they went about their day. When Walt's sister arrived, Walt's stuff was no longer by the front door. They searched the house from top to bottom, and the stuff was in their original locations. Neither one of my parents claimed that they did it, and my sister, who was only two, so she couldn't have been able to put that box back onto the high shelf in the master bedroom's closet. When my parents explained what had happened to Walt's sister, she told them that was like Walt, and he didn't like people touching his stuff. Also, that he was a bit of a prankster. Also, this is how they found out it was Walt haunting the house this whole time. My sister's experience, and a bit of mine. My sister could see Walt, and she would have conversations with him often. When my parents asked who she was talking to, my sister would reply with, The nice funny man. Honestly, that's still kind of creepy. At night is when Walt would really make himself known. You would hear footsteps coming up from the stairs with no one there. Cliché, I know. But you would also hear cats yowling despite there being no cats around. And this was because Walt had a bunch of cats when he was alive. Essentially, crazy cat man. When my sisters would hear this, she would jump out of bed so she could play with Walt. One time, Walt didn't like the PJs my mom put on me. I was like less than a year old at the time, and took them off of me and put them to the side. Me being a baby, not liking the sudden cold feeling, started to cry. 
When my mom came into the room, she saw my sister laughing and asked her what was going on. My sister replied that Walt didn't like my PJs, so we took them off. Honestly, that horrified my mom, seeing how I was naked, but my sister wouldn't have been able to reach into my crib, as she was too small to do so. And such that would have been the only explanation available. Something has been following me almost my whole life. When I was 10 years old, I had very strange experiences. I think I brought something back with me. When I, a 44-year-old female, was a child, I would have strange experiences almost every night. As an adult, I'm still scared of the dark. I lived in the American Southwest. It began as constantly feeling like I was floating above my body at night. Sometimes I would see faces floating above me. Other nights I would sleepwalk, especially when there was intense thunderstorms. Still happens. And when I was ten, during a thunderstorm, the following happened. I woke up to an intense crash of thunder. My room was dark and my younger sister, six years old, had woken up as well and had fallen out of bed. I helped her get back to bed and laid back down in mine. I was having some trouble falling back asleep because it was hot and semi-humid. Suddenly, everything got extra dark in my room and the air became very heavy. I tried to get up and yell for my parents, but I suddenly couldn't move. I could hear voices calling to me in the dark and almost thought that I could see something coming at me through the darkness. I closed my eyes to not look at it, and then I felt a very cold air blowing on my face. I opened my eyes, and the only way to describe it is that it looked like I was traveling at light speed through a wormhole tunnel. I freaked out, of course, closed my eyes and tried to scream, but nothing came out. The wind stopped, and when I opened my eyes, I was laying down still, but like nothing was supporting my body that I can recall. I was just floating in this dark void that was also illuminated at the same time. Suddenly, these tall white beings began to float towards me. Some of them began trying to talk to me, but I didn't understand them. Then more and more of them began showing up. They were transparent and tall, similar to the beings at the end of the Dark Crystal. I didn't watch that movie until I was 13. Imagine how badly that freaked me out. Two of the beings began to touch my head while talking to me and each other. I tried to scream again and close my eyes, but when I opened them, I was back to the wormhole tunnel. This time I could tell I was traveling faster and I was very, very cold. I blinked and suddenly felt like I was back in my room. I began screaming for my parents. I was scared and freezing. There was ice in my hair. My parents came rushing in and I was understandably very upset. My mom was pulling ice out of my hair. My dad was just staring at the ice like he knew something but didn't want to say. They managed to calm me down and tuck me back into bed even though my hair was sopping wet. 80s parents. <laughs> My parents were obviously freaked out too, even though they tried to hide it. In the hallway, I heard my dad say to my mom that it was 88 degrees in the house and it didn't make sense that my hair was frozen the way it was. My mom wondered if I've somehow gotten into the big freezer and my dad laughed. Then they went to bed and I eventually fell asleep too. The next day, my mom wouldn't talk to me. I was scared still and also curious about what happened. I finally got a chance to talk to my dad about it, and he told me that he believed I somehow traveled to another plane of existence. Then he told me even though we all grew up Catholic, there were ten levels our souls must pass through before we reach heaven. Essentially, he said he believed in reincarnation. He said every time we die, our souls go up one of these planes. If we were a good soul, we return as a better, kinder person becoming better and kinder with each return. If we're bad souls, we return bad and worse until we become evil, eventually as we progress through the ten levels. We do have a chance to turn things around, but that's essentially why we had a really horrible, i.e. Hitler, and very good people, i.e. Mother Teresa, in our current plane of existence, that is. He believed that I traveled to one of the other planes where souls were waiting to come back, the 
white beings I had seen were good souls protecting me from the bad ones. I'm sure I believed him at the time. My mom just told me to pray and to still refuse to talk about it. I asked my parents about this last year, as they both still remember that this happened. Since that happened, I've noticed that when people treat me poorly, bad things begin to happen to them. But it also works the opposite way. When people are nice to me, their life vastly improves. There are unfortunate side effects to the bad ones. Every time something bad happens, I'm plagued with bouts of sleep paralysis, nightmares, and night terrors. I don't find out about the bad things until after. During the sleep paralysis, I've heard a disembodied voice tell me that they are making sure things are set right. Quote, unquote. I've also heard it say, don't worry, they're paying for what they did. I never wish bad things on anyone, even people that have hurt me or wronged me. I've always shied away from confrontation, but this presence has always made them pay. It also has made bad situations good for other people that are kind to me. It's told me very vivid dreams about how it improves their lives. I could give many examples of this, and it only seems to apply to non-family members, and also to people that maybe really didn't intend to hurt me or make amends. Like one bad encounter won't cause any problems, especially if it was unintentional. I don't know how to deal with it, though. It's hard to explain. I hope I at least gave enough information on what's going on. My Mom the Opossum My mom was my best friend, and I her caretaker as she became wheelchair-bound from a rare neurological condition when I was 14, which was 2008. I was probably about 17 when this happened, so summer of 2012. I was up late with her talking and watching TV. This is Texas, so despite being 2 a.m., it was still 90 degrees, and I decided to walk up to the gas station to get us some Cokes. I always enjoyed quiet, hot, late-night walks to the gas station. It was peaceful, and I never felt scared because I'd make the trip hundreds of times. I passed an empty parking lot from about 50 feet, and with the street illuminated by only nearby porch lights and the street lights. I clearly see a tiny pair of glowing greenish-yellow eyes staring at me. A couple seconds later, several more pairs of glowing eyes turn to me, all just a few inches from the first pair. I never stop walking, but I maintain focus with the eyes until I'm out of range for fear of whatever it is that could maybe charge at me. In my head, I was picturing a fat black cat, but it would have had to been massive big, 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 massive cat. On my way back to the gas station, it was gone. Back home, I recounted the eyes to my mom over Cokes and Snacks, and she was shocked to hear that I'd never seen a wild opossum before, you know, given how incredibly common that they are in this area. She said that they're all over the place in town, but they stay hidden very well when they're nocturnal. She said that they have two dozen babies at a time, and that I saw Mama and her babies were out on the prowl. And they were, of course, more scared of me than I was of them. I love animals, and opossums are cute, so it absolutely made my day that I had seen this little family of opossums. I started looking up at them on my phone, and my mom and I talked about them, and I read about them for several hours, because that's just the kind of stuff that we did together. In 2014, I moved across town into a house alone, but I'd still go see my mom every other day after work. April 4th, 2018. I found her peacefully passed in bed. Stage 4 kidney disease made its claim to my mom's life. The doctor that came to pronounce her explained to me that when an organ fails, it causes the heart to stop working and assured me that any pain was not long-lasting, and it was a very quick way to go. Ten years of suffering due to the neurological condition, plus the kidney disease, was more than I expected to get with my mom. She was ready to go long before that. I think she fought to stay with me, but just could I had not seen it.
still in shock. Stress, which I was completely unprepared for, but I didn't trust anyone else to love and care for them. It was late, about 2 a.m., and hot. I had the dogs outside to go potty for a while and decided that it was time to bring them in. And after I got them in, I got the urge to turn back around and open the back door again and look outside. So I did. The back wooden fence is only about eight feet away from my perch at the back door. To my right, about ten feet away, there's a tree that grows at the corner of the fence and the branches hang down and cover the corner. From the branches, I notice a slight rustling following the glare of glowing green eyes. Out ambles a fat possum. It treks clumsily over the wooden fence, occasionally looking up and glancing at me. I'm frozen in disbelief. It reaches the point of the fence and directly across from me stops and stares directly at me. I say hi, and it turns back the way that it came and slowly makes its way and disappears back into the tree branch at the corner of the fence. Those are the only two times in my life I've ever seen a possum. I think my mom had a short chance to say goodbye and bring me some comfort as an opossum. My mom and I also loved birds. They were our favorite animal. We were going to move down south and be bird watchers when I retired. We knew that she wouldn't live that long, but it was a fantasy that we always dreamed of. My neighborhood is full of stray cats, so unfortunately, we don't get a lot of birds. A couple weeks later, my bereavement, I guess my bereavement leave from work ended. The very first day I went back to work, I stepped out of the front door and walked up to the car to be distracted by the very distinct voices of two birds. I looked directly up, and on the power line above me is a blue jay and a cardinal sitting together. I had never seen a cardinal before, and a blue jay was just a rare treat to get to see at all. But I hadn't seen so much as a gackling or a sparrow in the neighborhood because of the cats. Maybe it's just the grief, but I feel as if my mom had something to do with the birds too, and it only adds to my belief that she intercepted the opossum to say goodbye to me. Am I schizophrenic or just seeing ghosts? My family has always been said to be spiritually inclined and I've always been on the edge on believing it, so I want people's opinions. The shadow figures that I've mostly seen in public, quite a few surround my house and reside in my neighborhood, but I've only really interacted with one. I was home alone, sick, out of my mind, and went to go take some meds. Then I felt a tap on my shoulder. It was a rough and urgent tap, so I turned around, and even though... I was leaning on the counter. I saw a man walking up to the window. I got down behind the counter because I kept feeling something pushing down. And I raised so I could see, but not be seen, and saw that he had a pistol in his hand. I ducked back down and turned to see a shadow that looked like he had a fedora and a trench coat on. He disappeared after. And now he just stands by my house's back gate. There's five in my school, ten in the middle school connected to it. I was in the middle school, and there was a small program called office work. We were like securities for APs and teachers. And they were working in the consular office. I went to pick a kid up from class, and once I stood in front of the room... But there were the ten shadows. I wish I never took that job or that room. They said some terrible shit no human should hear. It made jabs at my body, and one said I would rape her if she wasn't so fat. The teacher didn't do shit neither, and neither did the students in the room. I told the other workers, and from then on, they had been taking care of that room. But apparently a month after the incident, an old worker who left the school 
ran to the shit. I guess we're going to call these guys shitheads. Ran into the shitheads. And they were talking about going through what going through with what they had said and got into a huge fight. The ex-workers, a group of 10, and the 7th graders, group of 12. The ex-workers group, one being older. I haven't really heard of any of them since. The shadows at the schools have been showing up wherever bad things are just about to happen, so I've been avoiding them as much as I can. Dreams. I've had dreams where I talk to the dead, and I've cried even harder each dream, and each time I have a dream. The first time, it was my late grandpa on the night of my mom's birthday. I came out to the entire household two weeks before. I was in the park sitting on a bench when someone sat down next to me. I looked over, and lo and behold, there he was. We hugged and talked a bit. I asked him what had happened after death, and he said that he couldn't tell me. But eventually he had to leave. But the last thing he said was, Tell your mom happy birthday and that I miss her, and not to let my old hag get the worst of her. Also, congratulations on coming out. You'll make an amazing grandson, granddaughter, and grandchild. I wasn't out as gender fluid yet, but the fact that he knew made me sad that I couldn't tell him face to face, and even sadder that I didn't spend more time with him. I had a dream with several Asian ancestors from both parents, and they were playing poker, and they were making bets on grandchildren like my cousin, getting into med school or my younger sister dropping out. They were all written on sticky notes on a wall. I talked to them about it, and the one, one of them got up, I guess. Oh, this reminds me. He got up and pulled five sticky notes from the wall. One, with my name on it, gets into culinary. Two, my name again, getting into a toxic relationship. Three, yet again my name. Toxic relationship. Four, my name yet finally, traumatized. And five, I guess that wasn't finally, here's finally, my name is the first cousin to die. The fifth one took me back, and my grandmother, who was in hospice, walked in. Once I woke up, I was told my grandmother passed away in her sleep with a huge smile. This made me cry the most. I had a dream where I was watching a Victorian kidnapping slash murder, whose death was passed off as suicide, and ran from the killer, where they were safe for a month and eventually killed by an uncaught killer. They didn't tell me their name. They didn't talk. They just sat with me and wrote her will and wrote to me in a notebook. But I couldn't find any source other, other than a photo of her tombstone in real life. I watched as her life was taken from her, and I couldn't wake up or move. I couldn't do anything. From that point on, I haven't had any more dreams for a month now, but the shadow figures keep closing in on the house over the past week, and I don't know what it means. I want to know if I'm just mentally ill or if I'm actually seeing ghosts. Something used to harass me and my brothers in our beds. When I was growing up, whenever my brothers or I were too sick for school, we'd be expected to stay in bed and rest. No TV, no video games. And this was long before smartphones were a thing. My mother was a nurse and she would stay home and care for us. She would come into my room periodically and ask if I needed anything. And monitor my temperature. If I'd been sleeping, I would sometimes wake up to the sound of her opening the door. I would then hear her footsteps on the carpet as she crossed the room. And I would feel her sit down at the edge of the bed. After a moment, I would feel her place her warm hand on my forehead to check whether I might have fever. I would then either open my eyes and have a small chat, or sometimes just fall back to sleep without saying anything. The routine had been the same my whole life. One day when I was 13 or 14, I was homesick. I had been napping on and off throughout the day, 
and it was now mid-afternoon. My mom had come in to check on me four or five times. I was lying on my side with my eyes closed and I heard the door open. I heard footsteps walking across the room. I felt my mom sit on the edge of the bed, the soft mattress dipping dramatically beneath her and the blankets pulling tight across my shoulder. I wanted to feel her hand on my forehead, but it never happened. I opened my eyes and turned out to look at her, only to see that there was no one there. I was confused. I shrugged it off and I went back to sleep. Fast forward a few weeks, and it was the middle of the night on a school night. I was roused from my sleep by the sound of my door opening. I heard footsteps walk across the room. I felt mom sit on the edge of my bed, the mattress dip, and the blankets pull tight. I wasn't sick at the time, and even if I had been, I don't recall mom ever coming in to check in the middle of the night. I figured something must have been wrong, so I asked, What's wrong? No answer. I reached over and turned on my lamp. No one was there. I was confused again. So I shrugged it off and I went back to sleep. Fast forward a few more weeks, and it was the morning and I was getting ready to leave for school. I used to ride my bike to school, but on that day, Mom insisted on driving me. It was just me and her in the car. As we neared the school, she pulled over to the side of the road and asked me if I'd noticed anything weird lately. I asked what she meant, and she kept it kind of vague and just anything weird. I told her about the couple of things that I could have sworn that my mom was coming into my room and sitting under my bed incidents. Not really sure if it was the sort of thing that she had in mind. She then told me that one of her brothers had been experiencing the same thing. After that, things got a bit more distressing. I would sometimes hear what sounded like footsteps walking on the roof in the middle of the night. And I would get that sense that something dark would loom over me at night. It would feel like all four corners of my mattress were being sat on at once. Or sometimes it would feel like something was lying beneath my bed and pushing up on the mattress from below. Going to bed became a source of great fear and anxiety. I'm sure some, if not most, of these experiences could have been in my mind, fueled by fear and adrenaline playing tricks on me. Sometimes I would hide under the covers, and sometimes I would hurl myself out of bed and flick out the light switch as I ran out of the room. These experiences persisted for months, and at the time my younger brother was reporting his own terrifying nighttime experiences. I'm sure that we were contributing to each other's fears, and the level of hysteria in the house was quite high at that time. The final part of this story happened one night when I was home and my older brother was hundreds of kilometers away at a school camp. I was woken from my sleep when I felt something in my hair. I first thought that it was a large spider or a cockroach crawling in my hair. I reached up with my hands and tried to catch it or brush it away, and the sensation came back. Something crawling through my hair deep down near the roots close to my scalp. I sat up in bed and with both hands ruffled through my hair until I was convinced that I had evicted all the unwanted creepy crawlies. I sat still for a moment and didn't notice any more movement, so I lay back down and tried to get back to sleep. Suddenly it felt like a hand grabbed my hair and gave it two or three violent tugs then let it go. That terrified me. I pulled the blankets up over my head and kept them there for the rest of the night. In the morning, my older brother phoned us from his school camp. He was talking to mom when he mentioned that he'd had a bad night's sleep and had resorted to wearing his beanie because it felt like something had been pulling his hair. I hadn't mentioned my hair pulling experience to anyone at that point. After that, my mom sought advice about what to do. Had someone come and cleanse the house and would be regularly performing cleansing rituals herself including smudging and reciting verses and leaving Bibles out around the house. Things improved soon after that, and the nighttime encounters practically stopped. Black figure or shadow. First typing this and then telling the story happened last night. 
Last night I was smoking. Late at night, because my mom doesn't like that I smoke, I live in a neighborhood where you can hear the city, and at the same time, not really being a part of it. But you can still hear birds and see animals walking around, including deer, because of the patches of forest that we have here. Basically, I live somewhere with middle-class people, but decent-sized lots to retire in. Note, I'm talking about Austin, Texas, where it gets quite expensive. The point of me telling you all this is that last night, like each night, I stay up late to 3 or 4 a.m., except Saturday night. To see how the market's doing, I tend to get a little anxious if I'm down or up. Either way, I sparked one up, and I called my friend over the phone. I was talking with her since it was 1 a.m. We haven't seen each other in over a year, and she's a mother now. There was plenty to talk about. At one point, she asked me what I was doing. She sounded a bit concerned, and I asked if, you know, she was doing all right if there was something wrong. I was confused because we had smoked together before. She said that she thought she had heard something. I was confused and took off my left earbud. The reason behind was because I believe my right ear, for some reason, listens better. So I did, and around 2.30 a.m., I hear a branch snap. Not like the movies where it's just one huge snap. It sounded like it was slowly pushed or pressed in, where leaves move around it in the process. I'm not much of a paranormal believer, so I tell my friend what happened. She hates scary stories and believes everything. She wears gold because apparently it deters away witches, which is kind of funny. I don't even think that's how it works. Also, people put scissors next to their babies at night. That's supposed to deter witches as well. She tells me to go inside, but I remind her of the one time where we were driving to my house around 2 a.m. and something hit my car, the top part of my Corolla 2014S. The reaction of anyone would concern and a little bit anger, since it could have been anything, maybe a neighbor throwing something at me or an accident like a branch falling. My reaction first was thinking that it was a neighbor because it sounded like a ball. Then when I step out of my car, and it's a cemetery, dead silent, nothing at all, then I start thinking about how the rolling or hitting was, almost abounding like an animal breaking its fall then running away. I told her that night, and last night, that it was a duende. I don't know how to say duende in English. Sorry about me telling her the story that happened to us, it was kind of funny. It helped me forget about the branch cracking. That's when I started to walk home from the patio where I was smoking. Sorry, not telling y'all where I was. When I'm ten feet away from my house, I feel this heavy sensation. The way I could describe it is like warmth and a lot of little spikes on top of the back of my neck. I decide to keep on walking when I'm touched by the doorknob and I look left to my neighbor's property. It's about six acres or point six acres. He always has a blue light turned on on the back of his house as I look to see a black, dark figure darker than the trees. It was a very dark night last night, so I don't think that there is any reflection of the moon. Maybe a new moon was out yesterday or close to it. This figure was three or four feet taller than me. I'm on top of a five-foot deck to enter my house. This thing was huge, but very skinny for some reason. Maybe one and a half feet across. I stood frozen for about three seconds, but it's true what they say. Time really does feel slower and longer. I see it move behind a tree, but I kept opening my eyes harder and harder, closing them and making sure I saw what I saw. I was looking at a person, I think, trying to see if the figure moved up and down, but it was sliding across. Zero sound all the way that I could tell that something was moving because the blue light my neighbor has. To end this story, I go inside my house, and I don't really think about it, but I wake up at 7 to make plays on the stock market. Investing in E-E-E-N-F long term. Also, should I be concerned? I'm not much of a pussy. I'll smoke again tonight. I think there's a live stream option on Reddit. I'll be down to do that. What I think happened was the scary story. Maybe that got to my head. 
to imagine something. It could be that simple. And maybe I just saw something else that was moving across my neighbor's property. I would believe it even more if it wasn't a tree. Or I lost sight of the shadow or the black figure. Other than that, maybe I should just put y'all on my plug. My life story with ghosts so far. This is a bit of a long story. Hey, I'm a 22-year-old German guy. I live in a pretty old area, so to speak. They found Bronze Age stuff here, and even a Stone Age stone burial kind of thing only 10 minutes away with the bike. The house we moved in, when I was around four, was haunted. It may be a bit tame, but still terrified me and my sister. I don't know how old the house is, but I had still ventilation holes in the sides to cool the house in the summer. The house is a two-story house where the floors are two apartments. A bigger property about 3,000 square meters excluding the three garages in the house and the barn, all completely white on the outside. My sister told me later, she's older, that there was a pigeon with its breast and stomach cut open and intestines spilling out. My parents first looked at the house. The seller said it was one of the wild cats doing that, but there were no bites or scratches on it. We, my parents, my sister, and I, in the ground floor, my grandma upstairs, I would sometimes hear heavy footsteps in the middle of the night, which was odd for two reasons. First, my grandma was a very small, frail woman, and second, I wouldn't normally be awoken by this kind of stuff kind of a heavy sleeper and you can make quite a bit of noise before I wake up. These footsteps managed it every time. In addition, I heard this really old bunny plushie which my parents put in the bag opposite my bed. So it would be looking at me while sleeping. My parents said I liked before. Well, I guess they said that I liked this thing before but I didn't like it anymore after we moved in. I can just barely remember that the bunny sometimes seemed to kind of move at night. I brushed it off until it fell down. My parents put it over 10 centimeters back, so even if it would have fallen over, it would have fallen down. My parents got rid of it after my absolute refusal to keep it. I also had terrible nightmares almost every night, until the incident further down. After which I got a dream catcher, and it majorly improved. Also, I always got this unpleasant feeling walking around after 10 p.m., even when I got older. My grandma died of a sudden heart attack one time, on her way to the bathroom at night. When I was up there in the bathroom, and the small extra room with the hatch to the attic, both those places gave me the creeps. After my parents divorced and I got older, it got worse. The footsteps were more frequent. When I was alone, a door would suddenly swing shut. That door was partly glass and made a special sound. Maybe the draft? But the door was closed before, and it would repeat that sound multiple times. Also, sometimes felt like a cold rhythmic stream of cold air in the back of my neck, in bed. My sister later told me that she heard the footsteps too, by the way. My mother always brushed it off as my imagination, and I should stop bothering her. The worst experience happened, though, when I was 16 in summer break. At this point, I got partly used to the home ghost, and I knew how he felt. He came a lot closer over the years, but never showed himself. This felt so different, like not just an extremely uneasy feeling, I guess, but also the pure primal terror. I was playing games at around 2 a.m. My room door is at the right side, so it's always my peripheral, and I always closed it. I just remember seeing the door be open in my peripheral vision, and then suddenly this dark figure with bloodshot eyes, which looked as if he was completely insane, and a painfully big grin with completely, completely even, synchronistic teeth. I panicked so hard I fell to the side away from it. I couldn't see it anymore, but it still felt like a panic. I closed the door as fast as I could, 
still felt like I switched on every light and I crawled in the corner of my bed, which was located in the corner. I didn't sleep that night or the next. After that, the feeling vanished, but the other one never came as close as before, and I never felt the cold air in my neck again. Later, we finally moved, but to a hundred-year-old old farm, which is still in use but modernized a bit. We had to tear it down and the old living house to build a new one, which we did. While the construction tools were going missing and electronic devices would often short circuit or stop working altogether, I got a terrible feeling there for a good year. And they were angry, I guess, because we teared down that house. But that calmed down a bit after I tried to talk them away, and now they feel more like protectors than unpleasant. Well, let's just call them entities. Or subtenants. Apparently, I freaked out my friends and work colleagues at times. My dad was the ultimate skeptic and raised me to think the same. However, there's been a lot of weird happenings in my life. Some I put down to being observant of smaller signs, like the time I was having dreams and the company I was working for suddenly collapsed, leaving us out of work. I was laughing about it with one of my colleagues about the constant dreams. Three weeks later, the company suddenly collapsed. My coworker asked me if I had any other feelings, so I told her that she was pregnant and my boss would be a father within a year. She denied it at the time, but came back six weeks later to tell me that she was seven weeks pregnant at the time that she asked me, but didn't want to say anything until she reached the twelfth week mark. However, with her, I'd noticed her not drinking alcohol at work functions a week before, so maybe I just picked up on the subtle signs about her and the signs about my boss. My boss and his wife had their first child about eight or nine months after the collapse. With the company collapse looking back... I remember staff expenses not being paid, payroll inexplicably not going through on time due to banking errors and other signs. Others are a bit more unexplainable, but were verified by people who remembered what I had said. A few examples are as follows. 1. The night I had a vivid dream about being out on a boat with a friend while diving gear, or with diving gear. I hate boats, I can't swim very well, and I've never used diving gear. But I could smell the sea, feel the weight of the diving gear, and feel the boat rocking. A small plane flew overhead, crashed into the sea, and the plane sank with the pilot and passengers inside. My friend and I put back on our breathing gear, grabbed the extra tanks that we had with us, and went down to go get the pilot and passengers out and brought them back up. I remember looking at a depth gauge on my wrist, we were almost to the plane and saw how the wreckage landed on the bottom. I told my friend that I'd shared an apartment about maybe the next morning. And she didn't know that I didn't like boats, and I knew that she would find it hilarious, which she did, until news broke of a missing plane. She thought I couldn't have picked up on, on I guess, this particular thing, so she wrote down my description of the plane that had come overhead. The distance I remembered being from the shore and the depth I remember diving down to. I had the distance from the shore, the depth of the water the plane was found in, the number of people in the plane, and pretty much the description of the plane itself. A few years later, a little girl in my country was reported missing by her mother and her mother's boyfriend. She was about the same age as my child. I was heading to work one morning and thinking of her wishing that she could be safe from harm. I was taking a shortcut through a walking path going past trees, and I looked to the side that I swore I saw her in, standing next to an old half-open suitcase near the trees, just looking sadly at me. I looked at her and thought, Where are you? She just looked down at the suitcase and back up at me, and she was gone. We were talking at work about the disappearance. Everyone was worried and hoped that she would be found soon and safe. I mentioned I must be too wrapped up in this case due to having a child the same age, but how could I have sworn I saw her on my way back from work, standing in the trees next to a suitcase? Yeah, funny how your mind plays tricks on you. 
when you really, really, really want to find someone safe and okay. Eight months later, her mother was arrested. It came out. She had been killed by her mother and put in a suitcase for days. She had then been buried in bushland. Rest in peace. Three. I was going to a dressy dinner function with my husband. The only dress I could find that I liked was a dark navy blue. I remember looking in the mirror and thinking, well, at least if I can't wear it for dinner, I can wear it for the funeral. And then thinking that was odd. No one I knew was ill and I definitely wasn't going to a function that next night. That night, I got a call letting me know a family member was seriously ill and had been admitted to the hospital. I didn't go to the function, but went down to sit by their bedside. I was really worried, but after a week they came through it. They were released from the hospital and all was supposedly fine. I was speaking to a family friend after they came home and saying how worried I had been when I heard that they were ill and the story of the dress purchase and how glad I was so wrong. A week later, my family member was suddenly readmitted to the hospital and died the very next morning. At the funeral, the family friend came up to me, looked me up and down, and said, So that is the dress. And I said, Yes. Yes, it is. My Grandma Cursed My Family Another Long Read When I was 11, our old home was haunted. We would see shadows, our things would move and go missing. We would get touched aggressively, and we would hear people have conversations at night. But we lived in an isolated industrial area, and we barely had neighbors. At 12 years old, my parents had taken me to a medium, and she confirmed our experiences, and even let us know that something dark was attached to us. At the time, I was angry for no reason, and I hated everything and everyone. I was also suicidal even though I knew I loved life and my family. When I was outside the home, I actually felt normal and happy. I was getting attacked emotionally and physically. Something would try to pull my covers so I can fall off the bed and I would wake up with unaccounted for bruises. I was beaten. I couldn't sleep anymore. If I did, it was only for a few hours. The medium had confirmed that this was a demonic entity and that it was sent to us purposely. My family was suffering because we didn't know how to fight something that we couldn't see. As the energy in our home got worse, my parents thought that it was best that we move. We moved into a new home and it felt like a good place to live with good energy. A couple of months into our move, my dad decided to get his parents a visa to visit the U.S., even though he knew his parents didn't like us or my parents' marriage. He did his best to give them everything that they didn't have. Also, my dad was in denial about his mother's feelings and behavior. They stayed in our home for six months. When my grandma would make lunch, she didn't like it when we ate her food. They took over my parents' room and told my mom to sleep on the futon. Of course, my mother swallowing her pride, she accommodated My grandma didn't like it when we would go into the room, our parents' room, because we were quote-unquote intruding. They finally left and everything started to pick up again. Again, we would see shadows, but this time they would come out of the mirror. The furniture would creak as if someone applied pressure to it, and you felt as if you weren't alone even though you were. My mom had stated this is happening because of my grandma, but of course my dad didn't believe it. My mom and sister began to talk, curse and scream while they were sleeping. I started the sleep paralysis again, and I would get scratched in threes, and I had bruises again. I couldn't sleep or experience my new home in peace. My grandparents had visited again two more times. The last time they waited till my dad was at work and they packed their things and left. Their excuse for that was my mom. My mom did her best even though they would belittle her in their own home. My dad was heartbroken because he was doing his best to provide and they disowned him. 
in 2019, my mom had traveled back to Mexico to say her goodbye to a dying cousin. People in the village let my mother know that my grandma was a bruja, a witch, and she was known for doing brujeria, dark magic, and excuse my pronunciation. And she would let people know that my mother wasn't the woman for her son. While my mom was gone, I was being attacked. Things were being thrown aggressively and photos of my mother fell off the shelf. Whatever was in our home was waiting till my mom was far away to hurt me and my little brother. When my mom came home, she let my dad know and he was devastated. He felt guilty because they were using him and because she was mean to us. We consulted another medium and she came to our home and confirmed that something was sent to our home to hurt us. We found out that my grandma had stolen some of our knickknacks. She had left her personal things in our house and hid them in the closet. And she also left dark magic work in our backyard behind the shed and in the dirt. It turns out that she had been cursing us for years, but we just didn't seem to get rid of the work that she's done. I went to visit my grandma, and she hugged me and cried crocodile tears because she missed me so much. I've been experiencing this since I was a kid and I'm 22 now. I know it's a demonic entity because I've been, I guess I've seen it in its form and I've seen others too. They still haunt me and attack me to this day. They like to follow me from my home to my boyfriend's house. When I sleep, they're in my dreams and they like to hold me down when I'm in sleep paralysis mode. I do my absolute best to protect myself spiritually and I feel less scared and stronger now. Whatever my grandma did is strong, but I was told that when one demon knows you, they all know you. I hate that this is my life, and I don't seem to know anything else beside it, and I don't have anywhere to confide in. The White House with the Red Stairs when I was a young child, three or five, my father moved around a lot. He's ex-military, and at the time, we had just settled into his second marriage and moved on to a house in Pocatello, Idaho. I remember how excited I was the first time I saw it. A real house. Not an apartment or a manufactured home, but a real house. Old and sturdy. The thing that stuck out the most was its paint job. Snow white over the old wooden paneling and scarlet red stairs leading up to a large black door. Something about the red stairs weirded me out, but I was so excited because it was such a big house in a town I liked, and I was given a room all to myself. Weeks passed, and by the way my father tells it, little things began to happen. He would stay up late into the night, when he would get ready for bed, he would notice the basement light peeking through the old black wood floors. He would go down there and turn the light off, only to be confronted with the light shining through the floorboards upon reaching the top of the stairs. This little game continued on and off for a few weeks, with his frustration and concern growing. Then one day, something happened that changed the atmosphere of the house completely. It was around midday and I was in my room with a friend from school. We were playing with the realistic little animal toys that you could usually find in craft stores. My father's wife came in to tell us that the boy's mother was outside waiting to take him home. We said our goodbyes and I heard them exit the house. I began to clean up the toys that I usually kept in my closet. As I turned to carry the box of toys into the closet, I looked out the window into the garden where my father and stepmother were having a conversation. Alone in my room, and my back to the door, I placed the box in the closet and began rummaging through more toys. That's when I felt two large hands on my upper back. A powerful shove sent me tumbling into the closet and the door slammed shut behind me. Alone and in the dark, I could hardly comprehend what had just happened. When I felt a horrible and overwhelming sense of dread and a strong compulsion to not turn around. I began to do what most children would do, scream and cry. My 
My father heard my panicked screams from outside and charged into the house and bolted from my room. Grabbing the closet doors and attempting to yank them open to no avail, he began to beat on the door, shattering them with his strength and commanding whatever it was to release them. Then, as if nothing had happened, the doors just opened. After this, the house seemed to become darker and feel colder. A looming sense of dread or being watched began to grow and none of us liked being alone in the house anymore. My father, who's a fervent believer in Christ, didn't want to talk about it and would spend much of his time in the workshop or outside. Hoping that denying the situation might solve it. My stepmother took a different approach. She took to spending most of her time in the kitchen and began reading about cleansing the home. She eventually saged the house with my father's permission while he was at work. After that, things seemed to go somewhat neutral. Months passed, and I left to visit my mother. Upon returning to the house, I no longer felt the excitement I once did. The feelings of pride that such a lovely home was ours were replaced by the dread of walking up those scarlet stairs and looking down the dark hallway by my room. I could tell things had gotten worse, but my father wouldn't allow discussion of it until one night the final straw broke. According to my dad, he woke up in the night and got up to go get some water, figuring that he would check in on me in the process. He walked to my room and opened the door to see me, his son standing on my bed with my eyes rolled into the back of my head. Nothing but the white showing, wording something but audibly speaking anything, my arms just jutting out in a stiff manner. Terrified, he grabbed me off the bed and immediately began praying and commanding whatever it was to leave in the name of Christ. Shortly after that experience, we moved in with my grandparents for a short while. Twenty years later, my father surprised I remembered these events with such detail, given that I was so young. It is still talked about in hushed tones. The only thing my dad will really say about it is that he thinks I was making the sign of the cross with my body but he always described it like I was making more of an arrow with my body. I have some theories of my own, but would like some thoughts and opinions as well as to what the whole wording but not speaking when it happened was all about. Signs from my father. When we got to the hospital, the morning of the 22nd, he passed within 30 minutes of my mother and I arriving in the room. He was medically brain dead and hooked up to so many machines that were keeping his vitals stable. What I thought was the craziest part was a minute before we lost him and we were saying our goodbyes. I noticed he had a small tear come from his left eye and pointed it out to my mom. I'd like to think that he was saying his goodbye to us as well, even though we couldn't hear him. I had my phone on a table that was about four feet away from us. A couple moments after the passing, Siri was randomly going off. I took comfort in knowing that he held on to us for so long that he could still say his goodbyes. The next morning on our drive home from the hospital, roughly two and a half hours away from our hometown, right when we got off the exit to get home, I get a notification from eBay. Last summer, he got a couple of NASCAR jackets to flip on eBay. One sold back in September, and the, notifi and the notification that I got was the second jacket sold. I thought to myself, this is too much to be a coincidence for it not to be a sign. Over the next few days, when we were figuring out life insurance policies and such, my mother got visibly angry because she took out an extra policy for him. But supposedly he didn't have any extra for himself. Don't get me wrong, we aren't greedy or anything like that. Hell, I don't care if I get a dime. I just want my mom to be taken care of and minimize her worries. I was about to get ready to meet the priest. The phone rings and it says invalid number. That's what shows up on the caller ID. I never answer unknown calls, but I didn't want my mother to deal with it, so I picked it up. I said hello a couple of times and then the sound of a broken cell phone comes through and the voice sounded like that of a man in his mid-twenties that was real sad. 
It said, don't worry, or no worries, breaking up noise. Where are you? Miss you. Break up noise. With grandpa, love you. I said what a couple of times, and then the phone hung up. I was baffled. I looked at the number again, and instead of a 1-800 number, the number was 11800. I did a reverse lookup of the number, and it was some communication company. I decided to call the number, and it was a standard touch menu. I stopped at that. Turns out, since time has passed, more things were sorted out and she didn't have to worry. There were secret accounts or policies or anything like that. I've had signs here and there from him. He's even shown up in my room once when I was sleeping. My mother's signs have been things that she had disappear, only to reappear. Her big one that she got, and took a bit for her to realize it. My parents' lawn was one of my dad's pride and joys. He wouldn't let anyone touch it at all, and was very particular on how it was cut. He would joke with my mother, When I'm gone, who's going to take care of the lawn? To which she would just hold up the phone and say, Hello, lawn boy. About two weeks after his passing, a landscaper called and left a message, asking if she would like a price for the quote for the lawn. She didn't call back, and a couple of days later, the person called again and left the same message. Then it clicked for her. That was a sign for her. Mind you, it was December in Wisconsin. No one is worried about their lawn at that time. Here's some other things from different family members. The day after his passing, one cousin shot the biggest buck of his life. My father had his heart attack while he was out at deer camp. One of his sisters he's close with said that he found a white feather on his writing desk the morning after he passed. One of my other cousins, who was the funeral director and worked with a few years toward the end of his life, had a dream that seemed too real. She said that she went over to the house and he was in the garage putzing around having a cigarette in his usual habitat. She said to him, Uncle Mickey, what are you doing here? You're dead. To which he said, Yeah, I know, but I'm doing just fine. Like I said, she said it seemed like one of those dreams that was too real. Now for what we found out today. My dad owned a barbershop for roughly 30 years. Today my mother went to the shop to give the guy he mentored one of his clippers as a memento. He showed her a picture. It was a picture of an old customer, or rather one that an old customer took. The picture was of a hearse parked in front of the barbershop. I guess the guy took the picture because he saw it there when he went into the store. When he came out 20 minutes later, it was still there. So he snapped it because he thought it was funny. Well, the date of the picture, November 21st. The day my dad had his heart attack. Story number two. The Sound I live in a small apartment with my two older siblings and my mom. We have two cats and a dog. Recently we had to move, leaving behind a memory of our old apartment that I doubt I'll ever forget. I don't quite remember what day it had been, but around three or four in the morning I headed downstairs to watch a short horror series, ironic I know, with my siblings, specifically one of the Alien episodes. I had excused myself to go get a snack from our kitchen just to the side of the living room, which had a TV up against the wall and our big black couch facing it. This unfortunately meant that each time I sat down, my back was to the staircase, and its inky black darkness never failed to unnerve me. As I sat back down, my siblings started up the episode, and I relaxed into the comfortable cushions awaiting for the fun night of laughter. We were probably like 10 or 15 minutes into the episode, laughing and joking around as we usually do, and something happened that shook me to my core. The only way I can describe the noise I heard is as if someone was trying to choke a canine of some sort, and its final sound was a gurgling growl of anger. It was the most guttural, animalistic snarl I'd ever heard. I have a fear of dogs due to the past and my experiences, and I've heard my fair share of dogs' growls. 
This was nowhere near similar. My head had been leaned against the top cushion when it happened, and it sounded like it was directly behind me. It almost seemed to echo around me, causing me to freeze up in complete confusion and fear. I remember my shoulders tensing as I ever so slowly turned to my sibling, a look of shock on both of our faces. I swiveled around to look over at the couch, shouting, What the fuck was that? My brother had been in the kitchen at the time, rummaging through the fridge. He hadn't heard it. My sibling had. But when we both described the event, they described the noise as if it were quieter. Which makes me feel like it really might have been directly behind me. My brother poked his head in from the kitchen after hearing us freak out, asking what was wrong. We explained and I remember him staring at us in disbelief and confusion. It was probably just Scully, he said. Scully is our dog, and the idea that it might have been her wasn't exactly reassuring, but enough to calm me a little, since she isn't paranormal. I felt my shoulders untense momentarily, and a breath of relief escaped my lips. Before I heard thumps coming from the staircase, thump, 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 I turned my head just in time to notice a familiar canine making her way down the stairs. She hadn't been anywhere near me when I heard the sound. I remember beginning to panic again, confusion and denial clouding my mind. Nothing made sense. If it wasn't Scully, what was it? What did we both hear? Why did it sound so enraged? Me and my sibling stayed confused and shooken up for a few hours after that. My brother retreated to bed, offering us some reassurance. At some point, I ended up sitting in the farthest corner from our couch, shaking and trembling like a leaf. My sibling joined me and comforted me as time passed. We likely sat there for an hour at least, because soon after I heard my mom start to come downstairs to get ready for work. She was doubtful when we explained what we'd heard, since she so closed herself off from anything paranormal. She comforted me, blamed it on the dog or something wrong with the couch, and got into the shower. My sibling went upstairs, leaving me alone with my thoughts. For as long as my mom took her shower, I sat in the same spot on the couch, my phone clutched in my hand. I had started filming. I wanted to see if I could catch it again. I was tense and on edge the entire time, just waiting for that unexplainable sound to happen again. The video ended up lasting eight minutes before my mom came out and ushered me off to the other room. I didn't catch anything, but I had a hard time sleeping, and till this day, I can't get that sound out of my head. I really have no way to explain it. It was an angry, guttural, almost pained snarl directly behind my head. It wasn't the dog. Our cats were in front of the couch. So what the hell was it? To this day, even after moving, we joke about having a possessed couch. Each day the sound fades more and more from my mind, shocking me so much in the moment, replaying it in my head over and over, yet fading so fast. I can only hope we didn't bring whatever it was with us. Late Night Parties and Ouija Boards Sometime last year in September, I was at a party at my relatives for someone's birthday. The party went as any would, with a sprinkle of chaos here and there. Taking the opportunity of everyone being distracted, me and my cousin Robbie went into one of the unused rooms and hung out. After only a few minutes, he looked at me and says, Cody, I have a Ouija board, remember? I knew what he meant by that, and I grinned enthusiastically. Hell yeah, I've been looking forward to this. He nods, leaving the room, and during that short wait, I looked around the room. To the black chair in the corner, through the most, uh, mostly blinds on the window, back to the closet, and the empty spot on the mattress in front of me. Robbie quickly came back in with the board and sat down on the mattress with me. He made sure to turn off the lights and light a candle it being our only source of light because of how late at night it was. Is anyone there? 
The first question most people ask when in a situation like this one. Both our hands were on the triangle, but only our index fingers. Why we were being so gentle with the triangle made out of plastic was beyond me. Only a few seconds after we asked that question, the piece moved. Yes, it said. I sent a small glance up to the Robbie. Or rather, I sent a small glance up to see Robbie looking down at the board. He'd done this before, he told me. Now I could tell for sure. He looked so calm and casual doing this, which eased me a little bit. With subtle excitement, I asked a question. What's your name? The triangle piece moved to the two characters, Z, D. Question after question, she never failed to reply, not to mention the little time that she took in answering. Robbie asked a few, but not as much as I did. Suddenly, though, Robbie came forth with one. Are you in the room right now? The triangle slowly moved to yes, and Robbie and I looked up at each other and back down at the board. We asked where exactly she was inside of the small room. Slowly, a word formed, but only a single one. Chair. We turned our heads to face the black chair, and I half expected to see a dip in the leather to tell where the ZD was. There was nothing, though. Without thinking, Robbie blurted something out. Damn, you must have really long arms. I burst out laughing at the random comment. As we continued, Robbie and I moved to the floor after discovering that ZD slept on the mattress where we were sitting on. I asked a question that had wriggled its way into my mind. Do you have the ability to touch physical things? Like us? This time, the triangle took more time than usual in replying. It dragged down the board and landed on, yes. Curiously, I asked if she would touch my hand, as I've heard that a person would usually get the chills or it'll be cold. She silently gave me a yes, and I put forth my hand, waiting. Turns out it's true. I felt a subtle cold on my hand and I looked over at Robbie, confirming his silent question. We continued this little conversation before the subject turned dark with four words. How did you die? Her reply made me shudder and remember the cruelties of this world. Slowly, one by one, the letters began to form a word. M. U. R. D. E. R. I asked about it, trying my best to choose my words carefully. Was it by someone you knew? She revealed it to be her brother and I quickly went over to my phone to find him. I did indeed find the guy. But then I snapped out of it, and I asked if she was uncomfortable with me doing it, and if I should stop. I was going to regardless, but she said yes. After I closed the tab, we continued. I remember so much from that night, it was thrilling to say the least. However, the one thing that's been lingering on my mind is the answer to one of her asked questions. She said yes to being able to contact physical things. Despite being able to do so, she doesn't and prefers to be a peaceful spirit. I could only look up to this person who'd already passed away. She even mentioned her forgiveness for her brother and only wonder why such a person had to die. Story number 10. A Strange Happening One day, my cousins and I were playing in the back garden. It was a warm, sunny day in mid-July, and the air was kind of hazy and full of sounds of summer. Insects hid in the long grass just outside the boundaries of our safe garden. The garden and heath ran right through without a fence, gate or any other type of barrier dividing our private back garden to the public, a very busy heath. For example, if you were playing in the back garden and a random person walked past the, past the way to the heath, they were clearly visible from anywhere within the vicinity of the garden, as well as being very audible, 
even down to the point if the person knew our family, they were able to conduct a simple conversation with whatever kids were playing there. Gran always told us kids that the area directly behind was outside the limit of the garden, was strictly forbidden, and because she knew us three girls better than the back of her hand, the statement came with an extremely stern warning that if this rule wasn't followed, we would all receive smacked bottoms. We all abided even though the three of us had adventurous spirits. At the time of this incident, we were all playing on the crazy pathing path that our builder uncles had made to make it easier for my wheelchair to run safely along the ground as I played with the other kids. Elle was pushing me as fast as she could, and I in turn was pushing the ancient family pram that's been there longer than any of us had. We were playing mummies. As usual, being the oldest, our cousin G was mum and picking flowers for the milk bottle in our tree and bush. It was more of a cluster of bushes at the bottom of the garden with a clearing that was easier to adapt into a wheelchair-accessible treehouse where all us kids played at the time. Suddenly there was a sense of not being alone. I think Elle and I both noticed this at the time because we raised our heads and looked in the exact direction where the creeping... well, I guess the creeping feeling had resonated. Just outside the back garden's entrance stood a strange-looking figure. We all said after the incident that the figure appeared to be a middle-aged, stocky man dressed in shabby dark clothes. We called out, Hello, how are you? We didn't get any answer, as we usually did with passerbys, who we knew. The stranger continued, I've lost my dog. Have you seen a little white dog? Being ever protective, G answered curtly, No, we haven't seen any dogs at all. The stranger didn't look at G, but kept his attention on L and I. Although he didn't respond to G's remark, Oh dear, will you help me look for her? She's not very old, and she might be lost. She couldn't have gotten too far. I automatically began to feel uneasy, and I knew L felt the same. The stranger was motionless throughout this discourse, indeed. It was eerie how still he was. G just turned eleven and was adamant. I'm sorry about your dog, but we can't help you. We aren't allowed to leave the garden. The stranger remained still and measured. Come on. You won't be away for long. I will pay you five quid for the help. Just then, our older male cousin came around the side of the house, pushing his bike, followed by a family friend who also lived at the house. They had both returned home from work, and our attention was momentarily distracted away from the figure by their sudden arrival, and when we looked back in their direction, the stranger had been... he was completely gone. Seeing his sister's G's perplexed look, our cousin H said, What's up with you? We all excitedly told H and our family friend about the strange happenings and the man. While the family friend, slightly unnerved by our account, rounded the three of us up and hurried us inside, H immediately marched out of the back garden in the direction of where he had said the man must have gone cursing under his breath about dirty old men perving on little girls, quote unquote, only to return twenty minutes later hot, bothered, and cross. Were you three having a laugh or what? He said angrily. There wasn't a man on the way that I went back, and the fact that I never saw anyone at all. It's too hot to play stupid games, little brats. The three of us were obviously indignant at this slur, as we had all seen and spoken to the same man. Later, when we were in the bedroom with my mom, she asked us about the incident. I still often talk about that day with my mom and cousins. We still have no idea where the strange man could have gone, or who he even was. Haunted Mine in California Near Central California, there's an old mining community that you've probably heard of, called the Mother Lode. It's an area of California that has a large part to do with the gold rush. That's where this story takes place. On the way out of town, down a long road almost like a stretch of highway, 
You suddenly veer off to the right and go down a rough older road, less than a quarter mile down. The road dead ends into a circle parking area with a gate at the end, which is kept locked by the city. If you were to go past the gate, you would end up at a popular lake in my area. When you park at the end, you are basically surrounded on one side by steep hills dotted with poison oak and tall pine and oak trees. The other side is a steep downhill slope to the lake, so basically you're in a bowl. We were told that if we were to go up to the left, up the steep hill, that there would be an old mine, long abandoned by the miners, that the country didn't close. About 250 feet up the steep hill, we found the old mine, almost hidden in its sight. A slight divot in the hillside that you wouldn't see unless you walked right up to it. To get into the mine, you had to climb down a slight slope into the ground and go over some medium-sized rocks, left over from when they blasted into the mountain. The mine itself was about 7 feet tall and 6 feet wide, which formed a tunnel that was about 250 feet into the mountain. The mine had rough rock walls with a colorful vein running along the left wall. This vein is said to indicate the presence of gold by its ribbons of color. The tunnel followed along that vein, taking at least two turns with a couple of short dead ends and offshoots. As you got deeper into the mine, you sort of had to step carefully to avoid mud, which is what the you know, old ore cart tracks were handy for. Ore carts hauled blasted rocks out of the mine, unlike a mini railroad track. Once you were inside the mine, it was completely and utterly dark and silent, except for the sounds of wind howling and dripping water. We took our time walking into the dark tunnel until we eventually reached the tunnel's end, a wall of solid rock. Disappointed, we started our way back to the entrance. My buddy decided to stop near the entrance to chip some sample rocks from the vein in the wall. He promised to be quick, so we just stood there and waited for him. I maybe stood there for a couple of minutes before I heard the first strange sound. It sounded like a small pile of rocks toppling over, echoing up the shaft towards us. I tried to tell my buddy what I had just heard, but he didn't hear me, so I just let it go. Not even two minutes later I heard it again, that time closer. That time I got his attention to tell him what I had just heard, but he thought I was just being paranoid. He said, you're just hearing echoes from me. I tried to take his word for it, but again, not even two minutes later, there it was again. That time the sound came with a feeling of panic and fear. That was when I literally just said, You only have to be faster than your slowest friend. Then I just took off running over the rocks and out of the mine. When he came out a few minutes later, he said he walked back to the end and didn't see any fallen rocks. I didn't go back there until a few years later with another buddy of mine. Same as before, up the steep hill we went. The mine looked exactly as it did before, front to back, with no signs of a cave-in. Just as my buddy had done before... My other buddy had just stopped on the way out to chip away at the damn vein winding along the left wall. As I was standing there waiting, I heard another strange, scary sound. But that time, it sounded like a rattle, and we both heard it. The only way we could describe it was it sounded like a baby rattle. We both froze and looked at each other, puzzled and anxious, illuminating each other's headlamps. Not even a couple minutes later, we both heard it again, The sound of a baby rattle. We both grew up here, so we knew it wasn't a rattlesnake or anything like that, which are common. When we heard it the third time, the creepy feeling came right back to me, and I ran out there as fast as I could, practically tripping on the rocks on the way out. I haven't gone back since. I can't describe it. Something about that old mind just... came to me bad. A scary feeling and both people that went there with me felt it as well. An evil attachment to my mother's remains. I feel like enough time has passed to be able to talk about this. 
like there is a dark, evil attachment to my mom's remains. This evil entity cannot be destroyed, only sealed away. Some may already know what I'm referring to. For those that do not, the entity was a die book. For those unfamiliar with die books, they originate from Jewish folklore. It's an entity that was never human. And the longer it's allowed to feed, the stronger it can get to the point where it can kill. Here's some background information. My mom passed away from pancreatic cancer of the liver in early 2018. This was her fifth cancer. Due to where she passed and where she lived, it was cheaper to have her cremated. At the time, I was in the army, so my sister held on to the remains. After I got out in 2020, I got a place to live. In 2021, my sister and her husband decided to move to Florida to live near his parents due to how they panicked. Or rather, due to how they packed, they were unable to take the remains with them. And so I had to take for a long time. So, well, excuse me, the writing is inconsistent here. So I had taken for the time being, I had taken them for the time being, since I just lived down the road. At the time, I suspected nothing about the remains. At this time, I had been starting my path as a practicing witch, strengthening my natural abilities. Especially since I could sense spirits but not see them, slowly with practice, I was able to see after images of spirits. In early 2022, I met someone online and started to form a relationship with. In April of that year, I had taken a trip to see how living with them would be. It's when I got back that things went south fast. The night I returned, I was woken up in the middle of the night, and above me was this black mass in the shape of a sphere, dripping darkness. I was terrified. This thing radiated evil. I felt like it wanted to kill me, but it couldn't. The next day, I consulted my friend, who's an experienced witch, and she searched for it. The entity tried to hide from her, and when she found it, it attacked her. My friend was able to confirm that it was, in fact, a die book. She found that the die book was attached to my mom's ashes, and that it had been attached to her for a long time. Looking back, it explained so much. And going through my memories, the townhouse that we moved into when we moved to California felt evil. It's where my mom got her first cancer, and where I first started having suicidal thoughts. I remember seeing this darkness at the top of the stairs by my room and by my mom's room. I believe since my mom had more negativity around her, the die book attached itself to her. Since she was raising two kids, my dad left her for another woman. He also ruined her credit. And ever since that townhouse, we'd been plagued with misfortune and mishaps, some that nearly killed my mom. After my friend discovered what it was, she gave me a chance and a charm for protection. A temporary one until, you know, the thing was dealt with. And I think it was trying to attach itself to me. We planned for a day to seal it. I believed it was a new moon. Due to my friend being a lot more experienced, her and her partner, who was also a practicing witch, took the reins. I can't go into much detail on what was done, but I can say is that my friend lured it out and her partner sealed it away, creating a die book box. My friend reassured me that it was sealed and cannot hurt anybody anymore, even me. The heaviness that was in my apartment was gone. Shortly after the sealing ritual, my sister asked for the ashes back, while I wanted to bury the box so my family could finally be rid of the demon. But because the ashes were sealed away in the box, I had to send it to her. I did warn my sister not to open the box as the die book wanted to attach itself to our family. I don't know what she did with the box, if she unsealed it to retrieve the ashes or not. She hasn't told me. Since then, I also went into went into, I guess, a, a time of no contact with my sister due to other past issues. So there really isn't a definitive ending to this encounter.
Story number eight, The Clearing. One Saturday when I was around 13, my uncle came round with his girlfriend and two younger cousins. Our other two cousins were staying at the flat for the weekend, and a further younger female cousin had asked mom if she could also stay. This was a regular occurrence for us kids. The weekends and school holidays were a free-for-all, quote-unquote, and a constant stream of kids staying at one place or another making makeshift beds with beanbags and floor cushions or just crashing out on the floor with sleeping bags. My mom and aunties all used to joke that on holidays their homes turned into a regular old dollhouse. Apart from my five cousins and I, my friend Jay was there. He too was at our flat every weekend, and his parents knew he would be okay. Mom had the reputation for being cool yet very strict. We all hung out together and had a sandwich and a drink and played on Sega. Then Mom and my uncle's partner said that we should all go for a walk. Everybody thought it was a great idea, so the ten of us sent out. The three adults decided that we should go to Donkey Woods, which is a bit of green wildland owned by the council, much like Heathland. As kids, we used to go over and in the spring, summer, and autumn, on our own with the family. And it was reasonably safe and kid-friendly, and it still felt wild enough to make you adventurous and not in West London. We all walked the half-mile down the road from the flats to Donkey Woods, where we walked along the river until we got further into the woods. And while Mom, my uncle, and his partner all sat down to have a cigarette, us seven kids went exploring. As I've mentioned before, We all knew Donkey Woods really well, and we were totally at ease and comfortable over there. We weren't expecting anything unusual or creepy at all. For us, it was just another mid-August, late Saturday afternoon, and we were all just messing around. My cousin T, my friend Jay, and I were all talking, and suddenly the other four kids came running up. They hadn't been too far away, just slightly down farther to the river, and they were all out of breath, and they looked rattled. The four of them told us that they had seen something weird in one of the small clearings. They wouldn't tell us, they just said, You have to come see. We all thought it was just a major wind-up, but when we got to the clearing, our mood changed quickly, not to fear, more like a sense of unsettling apprehension. In the middle of the clearing were three small tents in a rough triangle, and in the middle of the tents was a small, still smoldering fire, and around the edges of the clearing were several small dead birds, sparrows, I think. The whole scene is very unnatural and eerie, and I felt a distinct drop in temperature, most likely my imagination, but still quite evident. Now, the rough sleepers of the area did use Donkey Woods as a base, but not in that particular place in the woods, as it was too close to the main road, and the homeless people avoided harassment and abuse from certain unpleasant individuals by going further into the woods to prevent any kind of confrontation. The homeless people who lived over at Donkey Woods also didn't use tents. They usually would make a shelter from pieces of wood and plastic sheeting, and Donkey Woods isn't a place where people go camping recreationally so we felt like there was something very strange about the scene in the clearing. I told the four younger ones to go and get the adults, and me, or I guess me, J, and T didn't move. T, who was still, as tough as nails, was completely colorless. You couldn't see her freckles at all. I didn't even move my wheelchair around the area as I normally would have done, and Jay just kept saying, what in the actual... When the adults came back with the other kids, they were clearly unnerved by the odd scene as much as we were, and was soon greeted by everyone that we should leave the clearing in Donkey Woods immediately. The most creepy part of the incident was the next morning my uncle went to see my other uncle, and together they went over to Donkey Woods to look around more. They went to the clearing, but there was nothing there. Not even marks in the ground from the tent poles, no sign of a fire, and no tiny dead birds.
Story number five. The day I prioritized logic over fear. I was around 19 when this happened. I was all alone in the house. My family went to attend a wedding ceremony. For study purpose, I remained home. Also, I always keep my door locked after 11 p.m. as I quite like the environment to study and I also have a bad habit of smoking. That day I did the same. I was alone in my room. The main door of the apartment was also locked. I locked my room, turned off the light, and it was pitch black. I went to the balcony, smoked a cigar, and went back to the room. Turned the light on in the washroom, went there, washed my face, came out, turned the washroom light off, went back to the balcony, collected my towel, went back to the room, and I saw the washroom light was still on. It hasn't been even 30 seconds that I had turned it off. I clearly remember that it was no way that it was turned on. To further examine, I turned the light of the room on and checked the switch of the washroom light. It was still wet, so there was no chance that somehow I mistaken it and turned it off. This incident baffled me. Then you rechecked the door lock and found out that the door of the room was still locked so there isn't any chance of intruders coming back in and doing the deed themselves. Later that night I was lying on my bed and I was watching some random YouTube video and soon I fell asleep. About 2.15 in the morning I woke up suddenly. I had blurry vision of everything around me and as I just woke up and everything was dark. As my vision got normal I could clearly see someone standing beside my bed where my legs was. The figure was standing in between the bed and the attached washroom. The balcony door was on the right of the washroom door. It was about maybe four or four and a half feet tall. It was wearing a gray or black gown covered from head to toe, just like any typical ghost figure we watch on cartoons or something like that. At first I was so scared seeing that. I closed my eyes and prayed that I hallucinated, and I was trying to keep calm, taking deep breaths thinking that the next time I open my eyes, it'll disappear, as I might just be hallucinating. The next time I opened my eyes and I saw it still there, standing still, not moving an inch, nor making any sound. I was literally having difficulty breathing, could feel my body going numb, and every hair in my body was standing in fear. I again took the time to calm myself again, by taking deep breaths, closing my eyes, and thinking that Maybe the f any other rational explanation, really. A few moments passed and my inner skeptic kicked back. I was thinking of the possibility of it being an intruder, but then I thought, how could he enter the door to my room? It was locked. Then I realized the balcony door was still open and I forgot to shut it. But till then, I was too scared to open my eyes, so I kept on thinking. I came to a conclusion that there is only two possibilities. There's no way I hallucinated twice and I saw the same figure. So it must either be a ghost or an intruder. In my mind, I gathered enough strength in those few moments to rationally think it through. But to me, the chances of it being a ghost was slim, but couldn't disregard it also. So I came up with a plan. Logically, I should defend myself from whatever is standing before me. I thought to myself that I should punch the figure as hard as I could. But if it was an intruder, a punch was enough force. Maybe I could just knock him down. And if the punch doesn't connect and rather phases through the body, then it's a spirit or a ghost or some kind of thing like that and I should run the hell out of that apartment. It took a bit long to finally commit. In a blink, I stood up, gave the hardest punch I ever could, and it connected. I could feel that I've hit the target. But to my shock... It was the wooden chair covered with a towel I used early to wipe my face. There was no intruder nor any ghost, and the hardest punch I could give connected to a wooden chair. I was suffering from immense pain. The chair fell down, though. That day I gained two things. Firstly, rational thinking is not always necessary. And the second thing I gained was a fractured wrist. This incident was so embarrassing that even my family members don't know the real cause of my broken hand.
Did we enter another dimension? About a week and a half ago, me, my manager, and another colleague of mine were driving around 1 a.m. to try and find something that we could get some food at a drive-thru, maybe. Every 24 McDonald's appeared to be closed, so we ended up driving 30 minutes away to try to find somewhere that was open. Eventually, we gave up and pulled up at a service station around 2 a.m. It was eerily quiet, and we weren't even sure if it was open due to COVID, but we got out to check anyway. We walked into the doors, and it was mostly shut apart from toilets in a small shop with one lonely worker that was sitting behind a till. All the fast food places were shut and lights off. We used the toilet, and my manager recalled that she'd actually been there before. There was another part of the service station across a bridge that could be open, so we went off and searched for that. We found the walkway connecting to the bridge at the two flights of stairs. The bridge was covered with windows surrounding the outside, showing a view of the motorway beneath. My manager said that the bridge was giving her the creeps, and I had to agree. It was long and narrow and dimly lit, with nobody else around. We decided to run as fast as we could to the other side, and honestly, I was unsettled. We made our way down the stairs, and at the end, we were met with dead silence. Once again, we were faced and close to restaurants with dim lighting. There wasn't a single other person around, and we were walking aimlessly around a large, unoccupied space. A feeling of unease settled in. It couldn't take much more of the creepiness, so we ran back up the stairs, back across the bridge as fast as we could possibly manage. We caught our breath once we were back to the other side and commented on how strange the area had been. After that, we got snacks from the single open shop and walked back to the car to have a smoke. But the odd, chilling feeling remained with us. We all agreed that we all felt it, and as though a lot of time had passed, despite the whole thing taking about 20 minutes, the car park was empty and the air felt off. Like the pressure had shifted. That's the best way I can describe it. We went home after that and tried to sleep it off, but when we woke up, things weren't the same. Colors look different. Nothing feels normal or right. Things are the same and yet completely different. It's hard to describe. Life just feels more like a dream. And we all have a sense of being there in our day-to-day -day life, but not being present. We struggle to connect our minds to our physical bodies and be present in the moment. It sounds crazy, but it's been a very real experience for all three of us. And we all agree that this started when we left the service station that night. Then the really weird thing happened tonight. And this is the moment I decided to hop on Reddit and try to get some clarity. So far, Google has nothing for me. Anyway, tonight we're dealing with some pretty morbid stuff with a friend of ours that's suffering with her mental health badly. We left her with the police and my manager and my colleague and I set off driving to our home. We discussed that night at the service station again, noting that all the bad things that were happening with our friend and her mental health started after that. Other unpleasant events had followed as well, and we pondered the significance of our creepy adventure and the bad things that were happening now. I said, It's like, since that night, nothing's ever been the same. And then the weird thing happened again. We both started crying simultaneously as if someone had turned a tap on for the both of us. Water started leaking out of our eyes at exactly the same time. We were so freaked. I felt a wave of sadness and emotion, but it wasn't enough to make me cry. And my colleague never cries. Ever. We're sure now, more than ever, that something happened that night. We just don't know what. We've joked about ending up in another dimension, and I don't normally believe in anything like that. But this has me questioning it, because I'm honestly convinced that something isn't right. And we've encountered something that's changed all three of us. We just don't know what. Even as I write this, I feel off and a tad tearful. I have no idea why.
Story number 19. Something was watching me sleep through my window. Last week, I was at home watching a movie. I was reclined in my chair, which faces a window that faces another building with a small amount of grass in between. I live in a basement apartment, so the windows are at ground level, and they're about two feet tall and three feet wide. I dozed off and fell into a deep sleep. My dog is sleeping on my lap. I'll mention that my dog barks at any animal or wild rustling leaves outside my window. No people ever walk by it given its location, but occasionally a bird will come by. I wake up abruptly from my sleep with intense alertness. My eyes open wide quickly like an instinctual response. I remember immediately feeling like I was being watched. Simultaneously, I look straight at the window. I'm staring right at this face. Our eyes are locked on each other. I remember feeling nothing but extreme alertness and fear, but also very calm. I had this absolute knowing that it had been watching me sleep for a while. It felt more curious than threatening. It was bizarre, and I felt like I couldn't move, like I was hypnotized. Anyways, we stare at each other for a solid 20 or so seconds. I'm just lying there still, unblinking. My mind was shifting through possibilities to rationalize logically what it could be. I wanted so badly to believe that it was an animal, but its face was bare of fur with human-colored skin. It was very small. No way that it could have been human. It maybe had to be the size of a one-year-old child, if that by the size of its face. I couldn't see its body because it was dark outside, but my apartment was lit by Christmas lights. It looked like it was leaned on its arms with its face as close to the window as possible. It was strange to me that my dog wasn't barking. He lied there still with me. And this is when I didn't feel like it. It felt more like a trance state. I felt connected to it somehow. I get the nerve to remember my thought process being in slow motion and clear. So I looked up and I mumble, what the fuck? Then it backs away. I tell myself to listen closely to see if I can hear four legs or two. It gets up and runs away and this is when my dog starts barking. That's when I know for sure I'm not imagining it. I hear it run, distinctly on two feet. It sounded so small and I could tell by the sound that its gait was very small. I sit there confused. My dog just goes crazy. I check the time, and it's 4.47 a.m. Guys, I have no idea what to think. It does not correlate with anything, except for one thing. In late August, I started building a shrine and temple type thing out in the woods at a large nature park. It was my favorite spot to go to meditate or practice my harmonica, or write I became an encompassing spiritual ritual to go out there. The whole thing was a meditation type practice and it's basically a big teepee made of a dead tree, trunks and branches with stacked circles of sticks inside. I had worked tirelessly out there, being in a kind of union with nature in my mind as I built it. I meditated and carried out the meditation and I guess that meditation was through action of building this thing here. I remember one night at 1 a.m., a friend and I were sitting out there, and we were in the middle of a conversation when my friend's face turned into panic and worry. I stopped talking and I can hear footsteps coming toward us. It was already loud and distinct as if it, close, as if it was closing in on us. But we sat and listened for a long time as it kept walking closer, but it never got to us. We decided to leave and she doesn't like talking about it because of the feeling of the energy in the air as we acknowledged it. Anyways, someone totally destroyed my shrine in October and I left it as it is. It crushed me and I would often visit the ruins heartbroken. To wrap this tangent up, the day this happened, the creature watching me sleep, was the same day I went out there and suddenly felt a strong urge to rebuild it. I cleared everything and started again. After a few hours, I came home and fell asleep, and then this happened. Dead in the water. 
My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about eight years old, I used to visit them once a month for about two weeks each stay. Loved it. Smell of cow manure brings me to a special time in my life, but also brings me back horrifying memories. This ranch is located in Florida. I don't want to give you the name of the ranch for obvious reasons. Not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving, but shortly after the owner started to spill the beans. Bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of ten years. The land had some native history as well as an unfortunate suicide in the front house of the property. An old Navy sailor hung himself several years before, and the land has several different ponds and trails which made for awesome adventures. I had lots of fun until my strange experience. My father and I decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds, and at the time I had no idea what to make this, really what made this pond interesting. Later, when I was an adult, I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and had a small mound in the center of the pond, around 40 feet from the shore from all. It was perfectly centered. From my understanding, someone was buried at the center of this pond. I'm not sure if this is true. Mostly stories, no real evidence. Anyhow, my father began fishing, grabbed my small bait caster-sized rod, and began to hook a worm to my hook. I used a little red and white bobber, too. I was the type that wanted to fish away from anyone, as I thought it would raise my chances of catching something. But that day, something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in there. I felt like a man with rubber boots like my old man. After about 20 minutes or so, I noticed my bobber going under and back up, so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, it felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled my line, but it wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of my sight. So, in big boy fashion, I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it in a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I'm about four feet in and the water was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. Not sure if this made sense, but I felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed as if nothing was in it in the first place. And even my worm was still hanging on the hook. Feeling proud, I decided to walk out in the water and recast my line. This is where it gets crazy. So about one feet away from my foot forward to catch my balance, and a smaller stone dug itself into my shin of my left leg, hurt like hell. As I realized what just happened, I go to pull my left leg forward, and I couldn't. I felt my foot pulling back. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, Without spinning around, with the bum now in the water, I started to scream, yelling for my father, and it was like it was my scream was falling on deaf ears. I'm being pulled into the water by something, didn't feel my hands or anything actually on my foot, just my leg was not free, and I was gradually going further into the water. I was yelling bloody murder at this point, and after 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, whatever had my foot let go. I was soaked and horrified. I ran to my father screaming, bleeding from my left leg and in somewhat of a shock. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come when I was screaming? My father now shaking because of my reaction. Son, I didn't hear any screaming. I couldn't even see you from this side. I'm calming down a little bit at this point and I asked him again. His reply was the same. I didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, just shrugged it off and said my imagination got the best of me. I never fished on that property again. No one believes this actually happened. And trust me, this is something that sounds outlandish. Backseat Native 
I'd say around 2004, a friend of mine decided to move out to Seminole Indian Reservation and bought a house in town called Naples, Florida, off of DeSoto Boulevard. At the time, this road was a narrow dirt road, and only a few homes off of said road. Middle of nowhere and deep into the woods. Beautiful home, just very secluded. He decided to have a housewarming party, which lasted well into the next morning. I was the guy that got to the party first, and was usually the last to leave. I'd say that there's about 20 of us. I was spent and decided to leave around 3 a.m. or so. So I said my goodbyes and I took off, starting my journey down this dirt road. Mind you, no street lamps, and you're literally in the middle of the bush. At the time, I was really into cars, and one of my favorite upgrades was the audio system. Highs, lows, and mids. Thousands of dollars worth of audio equipment. Young and dumb. Anyhow... I'm driving down this road at about 30 miles an hour, windows down, music annoyingly loud. I got about to the halfway point of my journey when I felt a slight push against my seat, almost as if a small child kicked the back of the seat. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, it's a dirt road, and all I have is about 15-inch subwoofers in my trunk, so I lit up a smoke and turned down the radio. I started to feel a bit uneasy. The funny sort of feeling when someone's staring at you. But, given my surroundings, it was understandable, so I just kind of kept convincing myself that there's nothing to worry about and to just keep driving. After about five minutes, I felt another slight push against my seat, and at this point, I decided to slow down and look into my rearview mirror. Nothing but a giant cloud of dust, with sort of a red from my taillights reflecting off the dust. I decided to take a quick look into my back seat, and what I saw will never leave my mind, and I'll never forget. It was a white face, no eyes and a mouth slightly open. I slammed on my brakes and jumped out of my car. Now picture yourself in my shoes, dirt road alone, and just witnessed something in your back seat, and the only light is coming from the very thing that you're supposed to feel safe in. I'm panicking at this point, Smoke's cell phone is in the car. After about ten minutes outside of my car trying to collect myself, I decided to approach the car. And of course, nothing was in the back seat. So I cautiously just sort of jumped back into my car and floored it. Grabbing my cell phone, trying to call anyone that would answer. And of course, no phone service. I didn't care about the speed limit, cops, or anything else for that matter. After about twenty minutes of recklessly driving, I got home. My mother was in the living room as I ran into the house, and she said the most appropriate thing possible when she seen me. You looked like you've seen a ghost. I was pale white from head to toe. I sat down on the couch and told her about my little encounter. I am like a good mother. She waited till I got home before she went to bed. So a few hours later, no sleep, I went back to my car to check for any damage. And of course, the back seat. Nothing was out of the ordinary. I decided to go to my friend's house, who was also a Seminole Indian, and explain what was happening earlier that morning. After hearing the story, she explained that years ago her great-great-uncle was killed on that road by a group of men who didn't take kindly to Seminoles or black Americans. This happened in the 1940s, and all the police found was a body that couldn't retrieve the head. She thinks his spirit haunts that particular road, and apparently this wasn't the first time that this happened. Others have had similar encounters while driving on that road. The road is DeSoto Boulevard, North Naples, Florida, near the avenue of Maria University. It's paved now, and tons of homes are currently built in the area. I've tried to find police records, but in those days, in the Deep South, not very many incidents were documented especially that of natives or black Americans. Story number 16. Possibly contacted my boyfriend's dead relative. So yesterday, I got high with my boyfriend at their mother's house in the shed. 
As I was coming up, I suddenly felt really nauseous and dizzy, and like a burning was all over me. And then I felt, quote-unquote, minty fresh, as high me described it. And the whole room was oddly really cold. I was just closing my eyes, relaxing, when out of nowhere I went, there's someone else here too, and pointed into an empty space of the shed. I had my eyes closed, but I could sense the presence and track them. I walked over to the spot where I could feel a presence, and I started shaking every time I went super close because of the energy I could feel in that spot. I then decided to sit back down because I was shaking, and here's when things took a turn. Still with my eyes closed, I could now see the energy I was picking up on. It felt really warm and loving and protecting, and I started to describe a man which I could feel my boyfriend tensing up at. Because it was their grandpa... I've never seen any pictures of him before, or even a description, but I know his death had a really big impact on my boyfriend. They were really close when my boyfriend was a child, and started uncontrollably crying. My body felt so heavy with longing and sadness, but also love. I felt so overwhelmed with protective love that I started to cry. I kind of lost control of my mind and I just started speaking everything I saw or heard, and I was able to feel their grandpa's thoughts and memories and, like, speak to him without any words. When I asked a question, the answer I just realized. I knew even though it wasn't something I knew before. For example, I was telling my boyfriend I wanted a hug and that I really missed him and I wished that I could hold them again. Just, that's what my brain felt. I hope that makes sense. It ended up hugging my boyfriend and, or I guess I winded up hugging my boyfriend and telling them how much I loved them, but not my kind of love. I felt like family love in that moment. I felt like their grandpa's protective presence and I saw him smiling at me and being happy as I told everything that he felt to my boyfriend. It's so hard to explain how it felt when his grandpa was there and how I just knew what to say. Although I knew everything, it felt hard to translate what I knew into words. It was like speaking two different languages that were remotely different. I felt a female presence watching from outside the shed, but being too shy to come forward and just being like, nope, that's their business. The way the woman and men were speaking to each other, my boyfriend said was very typical of how they acted when they were alive. I then remember seeing my current boyfriend as a child, but in memories from the perspective of the grandpa. I kept on seeing an image of them two gardening together, which my boyfriend teared up at as they used to garden together as a child. And I only found out then when I brought it up. A few small other things happened to do with memories, but I'll keep it brief for now. I then felt his grandpa and grandma's presence leaving, and I felt the same nauseous feeling as they had left, and it grew weaker. Shortly after, we went back in the house and started to feel energy. In the kitchen, I sensed loving meals and a good food, which my boyfriend's grandpa made them. And in my current boyfriend's current room, I said productivity and focus, which used to be his grandpa's old study. I then later on at night started to name words like wood, paint, project, model, eventually to model kit, which my boyfriend said they had in the attic above us. I also kept on feeling a memory of staring out of the window into the garden, which my boyfriend said their grandpa used to do a whole lot. Lastly, I told my boyfriend the ground here had been lived on and has a strong feeling of family love and turns out, despite their great-grandparents building their current house and the land space, it's been in their family for generations and I didn't even know that. Demonic Encounter When I was younger, my parents had gotten divorced. My dad was an abusive alcoholic who drained my mom of a lot of money. So my mom and I left, and at the time my aunt offered to let us stay in her house until we got back on our feet. Now my aunt lives in a rural part of the country. It's miles of farmland and a few houses every now and then. 
Her neighborhood is small, but everyone keeps to themselves. The area my aunt lives in is called the base. Apparently, soldiers were housed there and eventually died and were buried in those lands. Don't know the exact history, though. Driving to her place at night is super creepy and confusing. You can easily get lost, so everyone aims to reach home before the sun sets. Now, back to my story. My aunt had a second house not too far, where her family would go and do gardening and just chill sometimes. So my cousins and my aunt there thought that it would be a great idea to spend the night. The house was an old abandoned Baptist church converted to a house that my aunt inherited. The previous owner was a seer woman and would do readings and even exorcisms for people. My aunt took care of her when she was ill, so she gave the house to my aunt. The inside was run down. One couch for about ten of us. Yep, big family. And a dirty bathroom with an annoying leaky pipe. Light barely entered the house during the day and also gave an eerie vibe because being in that house or land, it was always dead silent despite being surrounded by nature. That night, we all had these little rooms to sleep in, so being so much as we had to share, my mom and I were in one room, and when I woke up to the sound of a wooden door being creaked open, I turned to see my mother upright, shaking, obviously full of fear. No one came through the door, but you can hear these loud, heavy footsteps around and inside the house. It woke everyone, so we all huddled in the living room. All of a sudden, the lights cut off. We lit some lamps, and my uncle was getting ready to check out the noise outside when a loud banging came at the front door. It was around 1 a.m., and this place is almost deserted. We all stood still and quiet, and then the banging got even more violent. The door began to shake, and a guttural demonic voice was asking to be let in. Panic and terror struck all of us. My younger cousins began to scream and cry because the voice was unnatural, pure evil. The adults sent us into one room, and they formed a prayer circle in the middle of the living room. Everyone's backs were turned to the window, but I was the only one facing it, and I remember very clearly seeing a tall man with horns and a red aura looking back at me from the outside, and he was smiling at me, motioning me to come toward him. He had these long black fingernails that he began scraping the window with. At this point, everyone could hear it, but the time that turned to the window, when they turned to the window, he had vanished. However, all the doors started banging and the windows were rattling. We kids all ran out to the living room and joined the prayer circle reciting the mantras from my religion, and then it suddenly stopped. The sun was now peaking, and it was 6 a.m. Everything felt like an hour, but we couldn't account for the rest of the time that had gone. We stayed for a few months in my aunt's original house without ever visiting that second house. My mom eventually got remarried, so we moved. It's been about 17 years or so since that incident, and we rarely visit my aunt, like once or twice a year. And since then, however, the house has been demolished. My aunt said that strange things occurred whenever she was on that land after that incident, and she felt like she was being watched. She couldn't handle it and eventually sold the land too. Currently, there are no residents on the land. My College Ghost Story It was around 1 a.m. on the weeknight of December. My roommate Jason, friend Jack, and girlfriend at the time, Vic, had all been hanging out. Being oddly warm for a winter night, around 60 degrees, we decided to take a walk around. On a limb, we tried the door to the F.A. building, and to our surprise, it was open. It was during the exam period. So we went in there and find that the door that led to the costume storage room, which was effectively a basement, was also unlocked. Curiosity got the best of us, and we headed down into the cold cemented crypt. 
Except for Vic, she made the right choice. Upon reaching the bottom of the staircase, there was a long stretch of clothing on hangers that seemed to go on forever. When we looked to the side to see that the door was saying, keep shut at all times. Now obviously we were going to open the door. I mean, come on. So we opened the door and peeked in, just to see some pipes running across the top of a longer hall, a pile of logs to our right, and another door to our left. Unimpressed, we closed it and proceeded down to the end of the hall of hanging clothing. Underwhelmed to start and head back, but then my friend Jason made one last interjection. I kind of want to check that side room again. So we did, and as I'm holding the door that shouldn't be open, I realize something. Wait, nah, hell no. I've seen way too many horror movies to allow the door to slam shut behind me. Jason, grab me that piece of wood. Jason was just looking at me like an idiot, so I said it more aggressively. Jason, grab me that piece of wood. Like a deer in headlights, he didn't move. So I said it again. Jason, grab me that piece of... Suddenly the side door flies open, and a gust of aggressive wind. We hear a slam in the distance, and then we fucking book it. And we get out, and Jason claims that he heard a girl's voice as he went up the stairs. Eager to share our findings with the group, we did just that, and returned the next night with a larger group. Scared as I was, I had my doubts about what happened and wanted to see if I could debunk this phenomenon. I checked the side door that flew open to realize that it didn't have a hatch that fully closed. So that was that. It was most likely just a draft coming from the, I guess, the wide open stage above that caused the door to open. I returned with relief, but was also kind of let down. I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a ghost story of my own? Well, it turns out I would get exactly what I wished for. The next day I was on aid duty for my best friend and roommate Bryce. He's physically disabled, so he needs somebody to help him with everyday tasks. And we were chilling in his room after we had just told his dad about my adventure. Mid-conversation, we hear a faint three-toned whistle. Did you hear that? Bryce asked. I assured him it was nothing but a bird or a gust of wind, but then it happened again. Bryce insisted that we get out of his room and head into the living room. I wasn't convinced it was anything out of the ordinary, but I didn't want him to be tweaking, so we did just that. We set up our computers and headphones and just got started on the work that we had been procrastinating about. I could tell Bryce was pissed at me, so I figured I should just keep my mouth shut and continue doing my work. The three-toned whistle returned right in my ear. I played back my music to double-check, only percussion. Reluctantly, I informed Bryce, to which he responded with full curiosity against his better judgment. Okay, that's it. If you're here, fucking whistle. Three, two, one. The three-toned whistle returned as if it was in the room with us. We booked it out of our dorm to the lobby. Soon, our other roommate returned, confirming that it was not in his room. We knocked on neighbors' doors to test how well the whistle could travel. It wasn't audible. I have no explanation for what happened. The whistle happened a few more times that night, but never again after. I'm fairly certain I brought something back from the night prior, but I'm not sure what it could have been trying to tell me. I think my family finally realized I'm not crazy. So, since I was 13 or 14, I've been having episodes of sleep paralysis and I kept seeing different versions of the same generic, black smoke humanoid creature. I didn't really think too much about it, as I thought that those were only hallucinations. So fast forward a few years later and I was 17 and, well, I saw it. I was awake and because I was bored, the pandemic had me dying. I was just sitting at my desk in one of those chairs that can spin and go in circles. At some point, I saw this tall black shadow at less than a half a meter away from my chair. I stopped spinning and turned to look at the place where I saw it in, but it was gone. I 100% saw something. I wasn't dizzy because of the motion. I wasn't tired nor dreaming. It was legit. I went upstairs to tell my family, 
and I looked a little scared but brushed it off as maybe one of the possible reasons that I stated above. Now, I've had lots of weird things happening only to me in this house. There were things like objects launching from their place to the floor, or disappearing and reappearing later in different places, or weird sounds in the night. Scariest experience happened when I was one of those, you know, I was having one of those girl nights with my sisters, just us watching a movie and then sleeping in the same room to talk and spend more time together. And during the night, after she fell asleep, I stayed on my phone for a bit when I started hearing a very specific music that I knew came from the carousel music box that my mom had. It sounded as if someone was holding the thing and walking around the hall outside my sister's room, but with the smallest of steps. I listened in absolute horror as the music was getting closer and closer, and I kid you not, the moment it got to our door, it stopped. But the sound of steps continued through the door and onto the carpet, getting quieter and quieter until it stopped as well. I was so damn scared that I woke my sister up to tell her that I wanted some water. I was too scared to tell her about what happened. The next day I went to my mom's room to see if the music box was still there, but I couldn't find it at all. I asked my sister whether she knew where it was. She told me that my mom took the thing to decorate her desk a long time ago. Therefore, it wasn't in the house that night. I didn't say anything else because I knew that it wouldn't really be believed. And well... After that, a couple of months ago, now I'm 18, my grandma got very sick and we brought her to live with us so that we, we, so I guess that way we could take care of her. Yesterday, my sister and I spent the night at my friend's house. We all got tested for COVID before and our country allows it. And when my dad came to pick us up, granny was with him in the car. That confused me because I know that she gets tired pretty easily and she doesn't really like leaving the house because of that. I asked her if there was something that was happening. She didn't really want to tell me at first, but then my dad said, she saw a ghost. After that, she finally explained that in the morning. While my sis and I were gone, she was sitting at the edge of her bed taking her meds, and she saw a body of a person as it went through the door. The thing then told her, I'm coming back, before disappearing again couldn't believe my ears. For context, my granny may be old and sometimes forgets things, but she never, ever in her whole life saw or heard something that wasn't there. No history of mental illness, no hallucinations for meds, nothing. Mentally, she's in a really good state, despite her age. Everyone believed it. Hell, they even believed me after I told them all the things that happened. I don't know if we saw the same entity or if there's more than one. But honestly, it doesn't bother me. I got used to it and I'm not scared anymore. I'm still not even sure if I believe in the paranormal myself or if there were logical explanations to all these events. But I'm just glad that I could get it off my chest. I'm still in shock and seriously debating all my former beliefs. Shadow person follows us. My husband and I have been together since we were 16. We're now 24 with two kids, and this all started before I met him. His stepmom came into the picture when he was around 13, and brought with her my husband described as a satanic book. It gave everyone the creeps, and my significant other's dad decided to burn it, which resulted in ear piercing screams when it hit the fire. After that, they started experiencing strange activity, such as items being moved. The most unexplainable was a laundry hamper that was found at the top of their roof. His sister also had an experience of being woken up to a black figure hovering over her, choking her. A boyfriend at the time witnessed this. When my husband and I got together, I spent many nights with him. I always had a bad feeling over there. But what changed me to from a skeptic to a believer was when I placed my phone on a TV stand and not a minute later my significant other watched my phone fall from the ceiling, the corner of the room. 
We moved into our first apartment together in 2018. Whatever it was followed us, and the activity went from sparse to almost daily. Unexplained footsteps, items not being where they should be, cabinets opening and slamming shut, doors opening and closing. We moved in 2019, and we were followed by this entity again. Nothing about the hype of activity changed, but this is when it started showing itself to us. The first time my husband and I were relaxing on the couch, which faced towards our dining area. The kitchen was behind the wall where we had our TV set up. I'm not sure what compelled me to stop our conversation and look in that direction, but what I saw chills me to this day. Peeking out from behind the wall that separates the living room and the kitchen was a shadow figure of a tall man. It stayed long enough for me to get a good look at it and know without a doubt it wasn't my imagination. As soon as I noticed it, it pulled itself back behind the wall. During the moment, I was more curious than afraid and pursued it. There was nothing in the kitchen. And when I think about it now, I wonder just how many times that this thing was spying on us. Why would it pull itself back into the kitchen instead of disappearing right then? Did it want me to follow it? Shortly after this incident, my daughter was born. The activity got worse again. It became a nightly occurrence that her door would open by itself. This also happened during her naps. Not only was my husband now seeing this figure too, but it started touching us and being vocal. One night while laying in bed, I dropped my phone off. While leaning down to grab it, I felt a hand stroke my arm. I'd also often feel like my husband was getting in bed with me and hear breathing in my ear, only to roll over and find myself alone. My husband also had his foot grabbed one night while playing video games. Night was when the most activity happened. Our daughter was waking up screaming over 20 times a night. Her doctor said it was the worst sleep regression she'd ever heard of. We moved again in 2021. Our very first night being there, I was unpacking the kitchen while my husband was putting our daughter down for bed. I turned around to see a huge shadow of a man go from one end of the kitchen to the other and disappear. Another night we were woken up to banging on our walls, which faded out into tapping. This was the wall that separated our room from our daughter's room. My husband decided to tack back. The tapping would repeat every pattern my husband did. We let our daughter sleep in our room that night, and when we woke her up, she pointed to the doorway and told us that there was a man. We moved in 2022 to our current residence. And I'm not sure what's changed, but the activity comes and goes now. Sometimes there'll be a little bit of activity for months, and then it's a rush of seeing figures, doors opening and closing in front of us, etc., etc. I can say that this activity does pick up during stressful times. My daughter's now four and will occasionally bring up the shadow that visits during the night. An Empty Encounter I just got done eating dinner at my parents' house. It was a typical Sunday, and the year was 2013, and I was 22 years old. My parents, sister, and my two nieces all left to go shopping, which left just my brother-in-law and me at the house alone. For years, whenever we got a chance to hang out alone, we would play Halo. We were in the last bedroom down the hall on the left, playing Halo 4 and just enjoying the bro time, when we heard something down the hallway. I guess this would be a good time to tell you that I have an identical twin brother, and at this time, he was away working in California. We haven't seen him in months. The noise coming from the end of the hallway sounded like a low beating, but quickly turned into what sounded like footsteps. We didn't pay much attention or attention, thinking it was just my parents or nieces coming down the hallway. Even though I thought to myself that it was oddly quick for them to be back. The footsteps were slow, but continued to grow louder. I paused the game, and my brother-in-law looked at me confused as to why I stopped it. I quickly held up my finger as to shush him and pointed at the door. We sat there looking at the door as the footsteps got closer and closer until they reached the outside of the door of the room where they were in and they stopped. 
I was still not scared or shaken by this, since my nieces were young and my dad likes to try to scare us. I still just thought that's what it was. We sit quietly for about 30 seconds, and all of a sudden there's three beats against the door. It wasn't extremely loud, but it had an irregular beat to it, and it made both of us jump a bit. I thought it was weird that they knocked instead of walking in like they normally do. Still optimistic as ever, I was still thinking that they were just trying to scare us. I jump up smiling, thinking, yeah, you got us. As I walked to the door to let them in, but right before I got to the door, a voice said from behind the door, just loud enough for me to hear it, hey guys. I was taken back because the voice sounded exactly like my twin's brother voice. I stood frozen, only turning my head to look back at my brother-in-law, who was looking back at me with his jaw on the ground and the same look of shock on his face. He jumps up and runs to get behind me. I grab the door and quickly open it, excited to see my twin brother, who's decided to come home and surprise us. The door swung open, and we're hit in the face with a cool breeze and an empty doorway. We look down the hall toward the kitchen. Empty. We call out his name. Dusty, is that you? No response. We scream out for my mom, my dad, my sister, and two nieces, thinking maybe it was some sick joke, but nothing comes back. Completely freaked and now thinking someone has broke into the house, I run back into the room where we just grabbed a handgun that my dad kept beside the bed and tossed my brother-in-law a large machete that we always kept in the corner to use for yard work and camping. Now with both of us armed... I clicked my weapon off safety, told my brother-in-law, watch my six. And we run through the entire house like SEAL Team 6. We check every nook and cranny yelling out, come on out. We know you're there. We don't find a thing. We ran to check the doors, the windows, all were locked and nothing was broken. We run outside to see if we can see anything. Nothing. We pull out our phones. I called my brother and he calls his wife. And that's my sister. My brother answers the phone. Are you home? I said. No, I'm at work. He responded confused. My brother in law just yells. They said that you're still shopping. We told everybody what happened and everybody acted surprised. But we know none of them believed us, even though, you know, and to this day. Now sometimes when I sit and think of all this in my life, I even start to doubt myself and I ask, did that even happen? Was it real? But then I remember I wasn't alone and I call my now ex-brother-in-law and ask him if he still remembers the same thing. And every time he says, dude, I will never forget that day. There's a man who took care of me. Andy's back. What do I do? So ever since I was a baby, there's been a man protecting me. But this man isn't really human, if that makes sense. I don't know if he's a ghost, a demon. All I know is he's protecting me. The first appearance of this man was when I was just a baby. My parents were having a party. Parents downstairs in the backyard drinking. Kids and teens are upstairs in the living room on their phones or playing video games or with toys. Me, the baby, is currently in my crib, alone in the dark door. A lady was going upstairs to use the bathroom. My mom asks if she will check up on me, and the lady said that she would. For some context, this lady was sober and didn't like alcohol. So she goes upstairs checking on me first. Upon opening the door, she notices a dark figure of a man standing over my crib, watching me as I sleep. The lady closed the door and ran downstairs to alert everybody. My dad and Tios are running upstairs to get me as fast as possible. Upon entering the room, he's gone. Not a trace of anybody being in the room. The adults ask the kids, and they all say that nobody had been upstairs other than for them and some people using the bathroom. From then on, everybody kind of left and just ended the party. This wouldn't be the last time I'd see him, though. I remember this story very vividly. 
I was around the age of four, and while running upstairs, I busted my head so hard my skin gashed open, gushing out strong amounts of blood. And that's when I saw him. He looked to me, and to my older brother, and waved his arms in front of him. With no avail of getting up, he turned and he goes to me and helps me up, and I'm able to get my brother's attention. Later I wake up in the hospital. I didn't mention the man to anybody. After reviewing, I ended up with a small stitch on my head. The doctor found it a surprise that I only had such a small scar. And from then on, I wouldn't see the man in real life for another two years. I'm six, and I'm walking across the street. As I'm walking, a car comes out of nowhere and it's about to hit me. Before the car can hit me, there he is again, the man standing in front of the car, as if stopping it somehow. I was interrogated by the police as the person was speeding, didn't have a plate on his car, and almost hit me. I tell them everything, and I don't mention the man. That night and for three years, he'd just be in my dreams. Around the age of nine, he stopped even being in my dreams. Having grown a strong emotional connection to him, I was very upset, and I thought that I'd gotten him mad. I thought this because often I was annoying my parents, and maybe that they'd neglect me. So after about three years go by, and I've completely forgotten about him. But on the night of June 3rd, he appeared in my dreams. He wrote out a message saying, What'll happen soon isn't your fault. When I woke up, I was confused of who he was and what he'd been talking about. I mentioned it later at breakfast to my parents, and they went silent. Then they told me about what happened when I was a baby. I began to remember him. At first I thought he was just an imaginary friend, but when I remembered the scar in the car accident, I got concerned. I just decided to forget about it. It's been two years and I'm 15, and recently my baby cousin mentioned the man and said that he missed me and enjoys seeing me grow up to be such an independent girl. When she said that, it felt like my heart had stopped. I don't know who he is or why he decided to be like that, almost like a parent to me, and just decided to disappear. And I don't understand if my baby cousin's making things up or if she's telling the truth. I don't know what to do. There's another family living in my house. There was a house in my area that burned down several years ago, when I was still a child and living in my old house. There's no reported deaths, but I beg to differ. When I was around 12 years old, and whilst the house was still relatively fresh from the fire, me and a friend decided to go inside and explore it for whatever reason. There was an unblocked window which we climbed through, and although my memory is a bit hazy, I do remember the staircase being black and ashen, the walls and ceiling ripped apart. I also remember walking into a room, which looked like a child's room. There was a framed picture of two girls, some family photos and whatnot, and me and my friend left soon after. The house got remodeled and, frankly, I forgot about it. Cue a few years later. Me and my family moved from our old, small house into a new two-story house in our area that we still live in in this day. And you guessed it, it's the same house that burned down. Now things were fine for a few years, I didn't experience anything weird. That, however, changed around two years ago when I began seeing and hearing things, mainly in my room and occasionally around the house as well. It started off with voices, especially when I was trying to go to sleep. I have no history of any mental health issues, so this was a new occurrence for me. I'd be lying on my side, trying to go to sleep, and I would hear a woman's voice singing into my ear. She would sing and whisper unintelligible things, sometimes speak to me, but I could never make out anything she was really saying. It was the most surreal thing ever because it would be as though she was right next to me or above me, 
but every time I'd turn around to see who's there, nobody would be. This then escalated to hearing voices of two girls. It would be in my ear as before, and rather around the entire room. They would sing kids' songs and rhymes. I then began hearing constant knocking on my door, and the floor creaking in my room as though someone was walking around. I even called out a few times to see if anyone was there. I'd ask my sister if she was at the door, and she's always saying no. This went on for a while before I actually began to see her. Not the kids, but the woman. I'd see her all the time. And they'd always be for split-second glances, and she would disappear. She would be in the creepiest places and positions, too. A lot of the time I'd see her in the corners of my ceiling in my room at night right above my bed, on all fours and clutching into the ceiling. I saw her like this as I walked past my sister's room as well. I'd see her walking down the stairs, head down, hand on the rail. Sometimes she would stand in my room and just look at me. Again, I would only ever see her for a second at most, but it's so vivid in my memory. Weird thing is, she's never scared me. Sure, the knocking and voices freaked me out at first, but when I began actually seeing her, there was no fear at all. It was quite calming, actually. I'd try to talk to her sometimes. She'd obviously never respond. Nowadays, I haven't seen her much. The kid's chants have gone, but I still occasionally hear her whispering or humming into my ear right when I'm about to sleep. I move rooms as well, so maybe that's why. Sometimes I do end up sleeping in my old room, and those are the nights where I hear her the most. My cat, however, still stares at the door and the ceiling, and at an empty spot in my room. Sometimes she hisses. Sometimes she just meows. I've told my mom my experience and my sister. Both haven't seen or heard her specifically, but they both believe me and think that something's wrong with the house. Getting Kinky Under a Blood Moon, Part 2 I'd like to preface this post with confirmation that I was not and never have been on drugs. I don't suffer from any mental conditions, and I'm otherwise in tip-top shape apart from some Christmas weight that's been around for about four years. Back to the story. So me and C, my girlfriend at the time, spoke about what happened about a week after just skirting around it. But not wanting to talk about any of it, as we spoke, I realized that we had both seen almost exactly the same things. She also saw the figures in the field, and when I went back there the following morning, there was nothing that could have been mistaken for them in the dark. No hedges, no bushes, nothing. I also spoke to one of my friends about it, and he didn't believe a word of it, so we decided to go back with torches and see what we could find. His name's going to be B. My other friend who joined us will be referring to as J, and C brought her best friend L. I went and picked up B and J, <laughs> and planned to meet them at the entrance of the grounds. We were laughing and joking about what we were going to find, and I was wondering if what I saw was even real, but I was feeling a hell of a lot more confident with my two buddies by my side. As we approached the entrance, we saw C and L sprint out towards us, both of their faces showing that they were real scared of something. After about five minutes of calming them down, they told us that they were planning on hiding down at one of the side paths and jumping out to scare us. But Elle found something touching her hair. She assumed it was a tree branch or something until something grabbed her hair as if it was trying to pull her back. She managed to get out, and as they ran, something threw three sticks after her. <laughs> I had a look down the side path, but I didn't find anything. Can't verify any of that, as I wasn't there for the moving part. It'll all be from my own perspective, I guess let's say. And what I saw, and what I heard. We started to make our back our way back into the ground. 
and we began walking toward the spot that we had last time, you know, saw nothing where nothing happened, but where we saw the figures. No figures stood in the field, no noises, nothing I remember, but it was deathly quiet, almost too quiet. It was so unnerving. This is when I shine my torch across the tree line of the forest and I can see a figure of a really tall man. The best way I can describe it is like Slender Man with a human face and he sunk into the floor as if his legs were sliced off at the knees. It was a fucking strange encounter. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. Again, I turned my torch off and I was able to see him so much clearer and he slowly turned around and walked into the forest, almost trying to lure me in. I looked at my friends and no one else had seen. We started moving as a group down toward the small stream that's near where the forest meets the path, and I realized to see is missing. I start freaking out and she comes sprinting out of the forest, white as fuck, and tells me that she saw a man that beckoned her to come into the forest, and it was like she didn't have any control of herself. She went into the forest and snapped out of it when she saw something grab her shoulder, making her realize how far into the forest that she had went, and she sprinted out. At this point, I tell everyone else to wait near the stream, and I start walking further in with B, and I heard something that still rattles through my head from time to time. It was a growl, borderline roar, but it was nothing like any of the wildlife that we have. It sounded angry, and the worst part, came from the sky. I could tell it wasn't echoing off of anything and it was just coming from the sky. That was more than enough for me and all of us to get the fuck out of there. Never spoke a word again of it and I'll never go back. Received a special Christmas gift. When I was young, I got married to a guy that I'm going to call Jack for the sake of the story. Jack's mom is involved in the story, so I'm going to call her Mary. Jack and I got married young, and divorce ensued a few years later. He had developed some issues that I wasn't equipped to deal with, including constantly threatening suicide if I didn't give in to his demands. The marriage was emotionally taxing and toxic. That being said... We loved each other very much. When I left for the last time, he did as expected and prescribed emotional blackmail. Jack said, as I'm sure he's been saying to others, I will not live without you. In a weird way, I believed him, but I wasn't sure how it would all really play out. Besides, that wouldn't happen to me, not really. Fast forward to 10 years post-divorce to this man. I hear he goes downhill. It's heartbreaking. I'm devastated. I try to reach out. For all the issues that there were, there were still tremendous amounts of love. However, I had to move on. 10 years later, I'm remarried. I have kids and a happy little suburban family. On my seven-year wedding anniversary to my then-current husband... He divorced me, and yes, this death was a factor. I get the phone call that would change my entire world. Jack had chosen my anniversary to slit his own throat. I could hardly process, and I fell apart. So we had just moved cross-country, and I drove red-eye back to my hometown to see Jack's mom, Mary, on Christmas Day. See, see his room, his home, his things. Say goodbye to him and maybe try to get some closure. Mary had let very few people in to do what I was doing, so I was very honored and grateful. I got the courage to ask for a memento as I had nothing left to remember him by. I knew that I needed something. She let me stay in his room for a while, talk to him, look around. I wasn't sure what I would really take, but I knew when I saw it that it would speak to me. Jack, among other things, was very OCD, a literal diagnosis, and his clothing was kept impeccable. 
It appeared that he had done laundry and there was a stack of precision folded clothing on a chair. I decided I might like a hoodie, preferably one I could remember him wearing. I knew the things on the chair were probably newer items, but I looked through them anyway. Mary talked with me the whole time, looking at each item with me. As I suspected, I found nothing on the chair. Then I looked through his closet and trunk thinking I might find older items. Nothing. Mary and I continued. I was happy to be there and say goodbye, see his things, his life. I told Mary thank you. I told Jack that I loved him for probably the 12,000th time. I was thinking of leaving. I, of course, had been crying and turned one last time to look at his room. I could smell him. I could hear him. and I just needed one last look. I knew I would never be in there again. When I turned around, on the top of the stack on the chair was a hoodie I'd bought for him when we were kids. I'd know it anywhere. He wore it constantly. He loved it. I know for certain, and Mary was with me, that hoodie was not on that chair, and I had not seen any of it in his clothing. I felt a gush of love and warmth, and I knew without a doubt that Jack was there in that room and had gotten a Christmas gift. I had gotten the Christmas gift. I still had a hard time wrapping my mind around it, even all these years later. Haunts me to this day. My friend and I walked home together every day. We'd always finish our school day, change into our normal clothes, and head out. We were 14 years old. Instructed on always taking the same route home, we were running late, so we decided to take a different route. The normal route has a bridge for cars and pedestrians. It crosses a six-lane highway, but closer to school. There is a pedestrian bridge that heads into the woods, but it's faster than our normal route. We head to the bridge, get there, no one to be seen, so it's all good. We go over the bridge, approaching the other side. We see a man sitting next to the bridge with his head between his knees. As we get close, we hear him mumbling. We approach him. His back is facing us. We don't know what to do, so we decide to leave him because he's probably drunk. In the corner of my eye, I see something. I turn to see a man in work clothes, his arms in front of him, one hand holding the other, just standing behind us. We leave, we don't look back, and this guy came out of nowhere. As we walk through the forest, we talk about school and sports, and my friend stops, points, and tells me that he wants to check out the weird rocks to the left of us. I agree and we approach the area. As we got closer, I see that there's a bunch of these rocks, stacked one on another, forming a circle, around slab stones in the middle of all of it, symbols engraved, dry blood covers the stones, small metal figures of some sort placed into the earth, with what looks like human hair on the ground. I stand in shock, as I'm not sure of what I'm even looking at. This screams caution, but I'm unable to move, so I can't leave. My friend makes a weird noise. I turn to see him looking into the distance. I see something getting closer. He grabs my shoulder. It sets me free from my status as a statue. We take to running. I hear movement of bushes behind me, breaking of branches on the ground, as if something is chasing us. I look back, but I can't see shit. I'm running as fast as my legs can take me, my friend pulling away slowly but surely. We kept running till we got to my house. It was about five kilometers from the stones and blood. My friend slept over that night, not wanting to walk home alone. We got to school the next day. Our friends told the whole story about the blood and the stones that we had found and discussed what that place could have been used for and deciding not to go there again. The school day went by, my friend and I headed for the gate so we could go home. 
stepped outside, said goodbye to our other friends, when I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn around expecting to see a teacher or a student. I turned around to look into the man that was at the bridge, the one in work clothes. The questions I ask myself to this day, why was he there? And how did he find us? I looked this man in his emotionless face. He opened his mouth and said, That man next to the bridge, he's dead. Then turned around and walked away, leaving me and my friend speechless. We don't know anything about the blood and stone and never went back there again. But we did see another one a few years later that also had weird shit going on. We spoke about this almost ten years later, discussing the possibilities that he killed the man next to the bridge and that we could have been next. But someone heard the story and phoned me, giving their opinion. He said, and I quote, Maybe it wasn't a person at all. Maybe it was death collecting a soul. We were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. He just tried to protect innocent kids by coming, maybe to our school, and telling us what he did. This has stayed with me 10 plus years, and it still sends shivers down my spine. Years ago, I lived in a cabin with my husband and young child, three years old and one dog. The layout of the house plays a role. The front door led to the living room, and there was a small hallway that led to the kitchen and our kids' room off to the right. In the hallway, there was a bathroom. In the main bedroom, off of that, our dog used to sleep in the hallway. It was late and my husband and kid were sleeping. I had been in the living room watching TV, but I heard a noise, like a whiner, like I was being called, and it made me jump. It was weird. It was sounding like my kid, but not really. But at that point, I had just assumed it was her, so I had walked down the hallway with the dog, and the dog was sitting up staring at my kid's room. So I stepped around her and walked over to my kid's room. My child was sitting straight up, looking straight, not making a noise. I laid her back down and went toward the living room. Again, I heard the same odd, hard-to-describe noise and walked back down to her room. Again, the same thing. The dog looked on edge as well. I stayed up for a little while to make sure that she had gone back to sleep and to get the dog to relax. I eventually went into the bedroom and laid down. Still, my ears were on high alert given the circumstances. I laid there for a while trying to sleep, but it seemed like something was stopping me from relaxing enough to actually fall asleep. I tossed and turned a bit. I had been laying on my right side facing my closet, and when I rolled back onto my back, I saw something that has forever stayed with me. I legit see it so clearly as I write this. At the end of my bed stood a small boy, probably seven or eight. My eyes literally couldn't blink. I was shocked but not terrified like most would think. I was bewildered because I could see him clear as day. Young boy with a hat and tannish clothes with suspenders. I swear on everything that he said, I turned away. Because now I thought I was losing my mind. Not only could I see him clear as day, but now I could hear him speaking. It sounded like help. I rolled back toward the closet and closed my eyes real tight and I was hoping he'd disappear. But nope, I was wrong. When I opened my eyes, he was now standing directly in front of my face. Like I said, he was like 7'8", so his face was right in front of mine when I opened my eyes. While looking this boy straight in the face, he said something, and all I could think of was the TV shows that say all you have to do is tell them to leave and it's okay to move on. So I had reopened my eyes, hoping he was gone, and as I went to say, it's okay to pass on, and to please leave my home, I got 99% of it out, and said the last word. I clearly heard him, and I watched him raise his hand slightly. And so, wait. And when I blinked, he was gone. Scared shitless, I got up, checked my kid's room. She was fast asleep. 
My dog was relaxed, now asleep in the hallway, and nothing seemed weird anymore. I laid back down, freaked out, thinking I was going crazy. At some point, I fell asleep. The next day, I told my husband and best friend. My boyfriend was completely taken aback by how out of this world it was. My husband was shocked that he didn't hear anything while it was happening. The image of this boy has stayed with me ever since. I googled the property that I was living in at that point to see if any children who looked like him had gone missing and never really un uncovered anything shady. The property was at the location of a war that was fought, and there were a couple youngins who had gone missing but nothing concrete. I've had random odd things happen like feeling someone <laughs> running my head from behind this. This is something that's always stayed with me. His face is just as detailed today as it was over a decade ago. I thought it was sleep paralysis. My family would often move due to my dad's job. We lived in around nine different states, sometimes moving houses within them. When I was six, we had moved to Wisconsin in an older Victorian home that we soon found out was once the only house on what used to be a large farm until someone decided to turn it into a small town. On the first year I had fallen asleep with my mom in the living room, I had woken up at about 1 a.m. There was a clock on the opposite wall that the TV was on, and I had seen that it was about 20 feet away. On the bottom of the stairs was a woman. She stood about six feet tall and had long black hair and wore a black and white striped dress that covered her feet. Her face wasn't visible. I panicked but couldn't move. It took about five minutes of squeezing my eyes shut to fall back asleep. I would wake up with small bruises on my arms and legs but thought nothing of it. The same thing happened nearly two years later before we moved. However, I was asleep in my bedroom and I saw her in the hallway still not moving. I woke up that time with bits of my hair cut around my head. I remember thinking it was my sister until she denied doing so, causing huge upset within the family about her abusing me, which wasn't true at all. Now, we had moved to Kansas in a rather nice two-door style house. Yeah, my parents like older homes. And if it was older than 80, yep, we had to live there. I was nearly 11 when I, once again, fell asleep on the couch with my mom. The house was smaller, so the living room was a bit cozier with the fireplace and stairs on one side and the den on the other, maybe 10 feet. I opened my eyes and again... She was at the bottom of the stairs, slightly illuminated by the streetlight outside. The next morning I woke with a migraine, the one and only I've ever had. It was only me, two of my sisters, and my parents at the time. Then five years later we moved to Florida in a rather new home, which was odd for my parents. Just one sister with us this time. Within the first month she appeared again. I still couldn't move or speak. All I could do was stare. She was in the doorway, maybe six feet away, watching me, wearing that same dress. The next morning, I had cuts on my breasts and neck. After we moved house about four miles away, it was one of the last times I ever saw her until a few weeks ago. She was at the foot of my bed, her face still covered, but I could almost see her breathing. I woke up untouched, but came down with a nasty stomach later that day. The last time I saw her, my parents and I just moved back from my childhood home in Michigan. It was my grandparents before they left. I had a room in the basement and I was rather happy with the setup. That was until exactly one year after I moved in did I sort of experience her. This time I refused to open my eyes. Tired of being afraid, but I could hear her. She was right next to me, breathing in my ear. She didn't say anything at all, just breathed. The next morning, I was unable to eat due to a nasty sore throat. See, I would assume this was just some sort of sleep paralysis, a demon or an overactive imagination. However, I still can't shake the feeling that something was or is here. 
I still get random bruises on my leg, and I take iron supplements, otherwise I'm very healthy. And I randomly feel nauseous when I'm alone and just before bed. It's something I've gotten used to, but I always get a creepy feeling on my neck when I'm alone. I still panic when my parents leave, and I sort of fill my work and school schedule as much as possible to avoid this. I don't see anything wrong with my surroundings, and it only affects me. We had the same nightmare. This was a story from several years ago, staying at a cheap hotel in New England while visiting family. Before I begin, it's important to know that I'm not prone to nightmares, and generally pretty skeptical about occurrences that are out of the ordinary. The hotel room was closer to an apartment in some ways, with a full kitchen and a couple of chairs arranged in some attempt in a sitting room. It wasn't exactly clean, the floor tiles were sticky, and the windows sat streaked with grime. One large stain in the carpet was the color of dried blood, Murder Hotel, we kept calling it. But really, we didn't care. We were 15 and ecstatic to have a space away from our parents. After spending the day with family, we settled into the queen beds along the far wall of the room. There was no overhead light, and I remember how different the room looked in the glow of the sickly yellow lamps. Chills ran down my legs when I turned my back to the kitchen, but I didn't think much of it. I was a paranoid kid who read scary stories in the daytime but still slept with the nightlight. I decided that I wasn't chicken and that there was nothing to do but ignore the feeling. After tossing and turning a little, I fell asleep, reassured by the sound of my sister snoring from the other bed. I was standing in the parking lot of my hometown's shopping center, alone except for a single figure in front of me. Whatever it was took the shape of a man, he was middle-aged, greasy brown hair hanging loosely around his shoulders, padded with flannel. Patches of gray flooded his poorly kept beard. His clothes were expensive, clean, and crisp, as though tailored for a special occasion. But the presence wasn't human. He felt... hollow. Like under that skin was a cavity of slime and rot and darkness that lives in the space between the stars. The man turned to enter the building behind him, but before he could, dozens of creatures spring out from the shadows, sinking jaws into flesh and tearing claws into ironed clothes. I think they were dogs, black dogs, with an intelligence burning behind bright red eyes. They tore his body apart, snuffing out the darkness and the orange streetlights behind them. My stomach turned as I watched, and I felt hot blood splash across my face. The man cried out with an inhuman scream. Organs collapsed into messes of purple and red and skid sloughed away like wet paper. I wasn't able to look away. I woke up in the chalky darkness of the hour before dawn. I clung to the sheets, kicking my legs, trying to shift myself away from the lull of sleep. The air in the room was heavy and cold, just as, it, just as it had been in my dream. It felt like something wasn't right, so I buried my head in the sheets and waited until morning. We stayed at the hotel for two more nights. Each time I closed my eyes, it was the same man, standing outside of a familiar place, and each time the dogs were there, waiting to tear him limb from limb. I began to dread sleeping. But even the dream seemed safer than the alternative of lying awake. As we packed on the last morning of our stay, my sister mentioned that she had been having nightmares as well. She doesn't remember as much as I do, but she was equally terrified that there were no dogs in her dream. But there was the man. The exact same man. I don't know who lived in that hotel room before us, or what making in the dark. It's possible that something terrible happened there. Or that I gave myself a bad dream and simply missed my own bed. I think if the man had been allowed to go inside the buildings, we wouldn't have been safe. I haven't seen or heard from either of the entities in the dream since. But I think I can live with that.
hoping my sister played one last prank. A couple of months ago, I did just that. Completely conscious, trying to convince myself to just go back to sleep because the trek to the bathroom always ends up keeping me longer. Bathroom lights are insidiously bright and rude. I closed my eyes and I willed myself to go back to sleep. I worked on ensuring myself that I would pee later, but getting up was more convenient. When I sleep in my bed, I face a wall with the closet fully open. It is a closet that you'd expect a cheap sliding door to cover, but curtains cost less. I leave them drawn because I'm lazy. I'm just a bit of a divot in the wall with a dowel hung up, not a walk-in or anything fancy. These details are important to this experience, though. So I'm laying on my side, facing the open closet, trying hard to coax myself back to sleep by closing my eyes, when the loudest noise I've ever heard erupts from the wall. It sounded like someone scratching a heavy winter jacket, but in stereo. It was like a speaker on full volume had picked up something trying to scratch an itch while bundled up, but it was rhythmic, similar to the five knocks one would expect as a secret passcode to gain entry to a childhood fort. I was terrified, frozen in place, thinking that I must have started to doze off and dream when my fiancé woke up out of a dead sleep and turned over in my bed with a groggy, What the fuck was that? As soon as the noise had started, my eyes opened and I was actively surveying the room. I was on high alert, and I was 100% awake when it happened because my brain told me that it was an intruder. It must be said that it's common for me to fully wake up at this time of night, but mind you, the sound was only a quick couple of seconds. The fear that gripped me when my practically comatose husband woke up out of his dead sleep. Had I been standing, I'd have taken a hard seat. I desperately pawed at my phone and turned on the flashlight to hopefully catch the villain in the act, but I saw nothing. To be completely honest, I expected to see a person rummaging through my dirty clothes pile for treasures. But nothing. Not even a hint of movement. I started to get angry thinking that it was our 14-year-old cat scratching clothes hung up in the closet for attention, so I scanned the room with my flashlight, and I woke the cat out of her very comfortable slumber in the hamper on the other side of the room. Still confused but awake, my husband and I conferred briefly about the sound, and I turned on my bedside lamp because, well, I was terrified. Eventually I fell asleep, but my mind couldn't get that goddamn rhythm to go away. The next morning, I tried everything to debunk the quote-unquote noise. He was absolutely convinced that he had figured it out when he tugged on a small piece of exercise equipment in the closet. It was in my full view of the fateful night. It rocked, swayed, and scraped the wall with surprising volume, but it never held the cadence or static that the original sound did. We quickly debunked his theory, and he had to pull it out with two hands with a good amount of force to even make a sound. So we turned to check the underside of the house for rodents and or vermin. We had dealt with the raccoon issue a few years ago, but they never climbed into the walls. They just shoveled around in the dirt underneath the house. The fiber insulation between our wall and the living room, including closets, all pristine, no evidence of burrowing or chewing. I want so badly for this to be the case of asshole animals being just that, but I can't find evidence for it. If I've missed something, please tell me that I'm an idiot. I'd rather be an idiot at this point. But I'm also hoping that it was my sister playing one last batshit prank on me. Joke is on her. I never peed the bed. and knew Heath like the back of her hand. The river wasn't very deep at that part, so Mom tipped my wheelchair back and told Elle to hold on to the handle and we went in. The water immediately soaked our clothes through, and Elle and I started to scream and giggle and splash each other in sheer delight. Then we saw them. Weeds. Flowing with the current flow of the river, swaying back and forth like a woman's long, tangled, unkept hair, and I got the distinct impression that what we saw could have been either thing. 
I glanced at Al and instantly knew that she was having the same uncanny notion. The weed started to curl around our legs and the wheel of my wheelchair, making our progress a little bit more laborious. And our previous screams of playful fun changed to moans and squeals of unease and disgust as we felt the weeds gently tugging at our legs. At no point did Mom ever look anxious or phased by this experience. She just kept saying, It's only water weeds, you two. Come on, don't be silly. You've seen them loads of times. We finally reached the other side of the river, and as Mom dragged my wheelchair backwards up the riverbank, Elle climbed up and sat down beside me. We both just stared silently at the river and the sea of green for what felt like the longest time. But in actual fact, it was probably ten minutes before walking the rest of the way home. That night, after a hot bubble bath and cheese flan salad, in our flannel pajamas and slipper socks around fire drinking hot tea, we told Grandma about our adventure. Our Grandma took a sip of tea from her mug and told us the story of green hair. She had been a real person, though her real name had been forgotten by Grandma, conveniently. Anyway, she had lived in the village around 1912, before the area was built up and modernized, and developed into what it has become now. She was young and kind, with a pretty face and beautiful long blonde hair, a daughter of a gentleman farmer, and was deeply in love with a handsome young soldier. They were to get married, but before they could, the Great War broke out, and the young man was called up to fight. He was killed by a hand grenade on the front line, and when she found out she was widowed before she'd even become a wife, she lost the will to live and driven by grief-stricken insanity, she went to the same river that we waded through and she threw herself in. The river was as wild as the land at the time, and by the time her body was discovered, it was blue, bloated, and half-eaten by fish. Her long corn-colored hair had become interwoven with the slimy algae and long strands of evil-smelling river weeds, which clogged and choked the bed of the river. In fact, the pathologist who performed the post-mortem said that the body had been found sooner if not for the dark green weeds that appeared to have curled around her limbs and torso, anchoring her corpse to the riverbed for days. From that time onward, it was said that the river was haunted, cursed, or both. People claimed to see the spirit of the young woman kneeling beside the river and weeping bitterly. More commonly, people often saw the body of the girl floating to the top of the water, with long green hair and weeds streaming out behind her. And so she was given the name of Green Hair. Elle and I asked Grandma why we hadn't heard the story before. Grandma just smiled and said it's because it was an age ago, even before she herself was born. The area was developed and built up, and the river was tidied up and reconstructed, and along with it, the tragic tale of green hair was lost in the stream of passing time. We didn't altogether believe Grand's morbid tale, but when Elle and I talked about it in bed late that night, neither of us could dismiss the eerie feeling that we saw the green hair flowing in the river that day. White figure in living room apartment. When I was in sixth grade, around 12 weeks in of school, my family and I moved in with my aunt, my mom's sister, only because my parents were going to invest in starting their own business, so this led to spending as little as possible and saving more. Things didn't work out between my parents and it led to a divorce. My mom got her own place and my dad was still renting a room from my aunt's apartment. I had been living with my aunt until I graduated from middle school, and it was just about time for me to enter high school until both my dad and aunt moved out and went our own way. This encounter occurred sometime between 2014 and 15. I was around 13 or 14. I'm just estimating since I don't quite remember the exact year and grade I was in at the time. Moving along, it was a weekend, the morning, and my aunt and her family were on their way to the church. I decided to stay home and not go with them since I always found church boring. No offense. 
We'll be back later around the evening, my aunt said. As soon as they left, I put on Netflix. Relaxed, eating some chips with no worries in the world. I was watching Malcolm in the Middle, and I had my cousin's dog next to me on the couch sleeping. And eventually, a few episodes throughout the show, the dog decided to go into my cousin's room and sleep on his bed. As a habit, doors would always stay open from our rooms. A few hours go by as I'm watching the show, laughing, and suddenly my door slams shut. I assumed it was the air coming in from the window, but the odd thing was that I had my windows closed, so there was no way of the air coming in from anything other than the living room windows. I ignored it and said to myself, maybe I did leave the windows open, doubting myself. Shortly after, my cousin's dog starts barking for a quick five seconds and stops. A white lady-like figure appears from behind the wall, from the hall of our rooms. It was visible even though I was looking at it from the corner of my eyes. I ignored it and immediately thought that I was just tripping balls. Its head was becoming more visible as it was peeking. Skin was as white as paint with large black eyes and really long, wet-looking hair. I turned to look at it, and it hid. I go back to watching the show and once again peeks out once more. This time its hands were grasping onto the wall and it showed its face up to its nose. Hands so white, fingers long and clear. At this point I looked back towards it again hoping that it would just leave me alone. It hid. I immediately opened the front door and called my mom letting her know what happened. She was so confused and told me that it was because I was behaving badly. She offered to pick me up and go to her house, but I decided to stay. I kept the front door open to feel some sort of security. My aunt and her family arrived around 6 p.m., and I was afraid to tell my aunt what happened because I thought she would just laugh at me. But instead, she asked questions and was open to the whole situation. I've seen it too. She explained to me that she had heard footsteps and seen the figure staring at her from the kitchen when she would sleep in the living room quite a few times. And always early in the morning around two or three. Consistent. As she explained to me her encounters, I felt comforted. I knew I wasn't crazy and I wasn't just seeing things. When we moved out, we found ourselves... Well, we found out, rather that an old lady had died there. Maybe that explains this mysterious figure or demon. I've had numerous encounters with these types of figures in the past as a little kid, but to this day, this one has been the most recent one that's happened to me, and the second to scariest. Terror Unleashed Upon the Village 1950s and the heart of a remote village nestled on the border of West Bengal and Bangladesh. A sinister tale unfolded. It was the time when Charulata, a mere 11-year-old girl, bore witness to a horrifying chain of events. Whispers echoed through the village's lips, tales of an old witch lurking in the shadows of the desolate riverbanks. She dwelled in solitude far away from prying eyes. The locals believed that the presence of a practitioner or witch near their village would inevitably invite malevolence upon their lives. That fateful year, a ghastly disease ravaged the village, claiming the lives of numerous innocent souls. While some dismissed it as a natural calamity, others pointed fingers at the dreaded witch, attributing the deaths to her malignant influence. However, such suspicions remained more speculation. One mournful day, a villager succumbed to the disease's grasp, and a few gathered to bid farewell to their fallen neighbor. They carried the lifeless body to the river's edge, intending to cremate it and release the departed soul from its earthly vessel. Fearful of contracting the illness, the mourners hurriedly retreated, neglecting to ensure the corpse was fully consumed by the flames. Little did they know what unspeakable horror awaited them. The following day upon their return, a ghastly sight befell their eyes. Not all the logs had turned to ash, and to their sheer terror, 
they discovered that the partially burnt remains had been desecrated. Speculation ran rife, as some whispered of the witch's insatiable hunger for bones and the macabre consumption of the deceased flesh. Yet, the true terror was yet to unfold. It was the scorching summer, and most people preferred to sleep with their doors open at night, so they could sleep peacefully because of the gentle, cool breeze. Among them was a young family with a darling toddler. Her parents made her sleep on a cushioned jute swing, which was present at the entrance of their room. Her parents slept right beside her. In the dead of night, the mother stirred from her uneasy sleep. She sought her laughter, only to find an empty swing swaying eerily in the silence. Panic seized her heart, and she called her husband, their anguished cries tearing through the stillness of the night. The village was stirred into a frenzied action as neighbors joined the frantic search for the missing child. A chilling realization crept over the crowd when dawn broke. A group of searchers emerged, their faces drained of color, words frozen on their trembling lips. Then the village gathered, sensing the depth of their despair. With bated breath, they followed the traumatized search party to a distant location, close to the meandering river stream. There, the scene unfolded, a sight beyond human comprehension, etched forever into their souls. The lifeless body of the innocent toddler lay sprawled upon the earth, her stomach brutally lacerated by a rough and malevolent force. Her eyes, once filled with joy and wonder, were now mercilessly gouged, a chilling testament to the sheer terror she endured in her final moments. Whispers spread through the crowd, their voices trembling with terror and disbelief. Some ventured to suggest that it was the work of a savage animal, a fox or a wild dog. But as the braver crowd went near the child, they realized that it was laid directly in the exact center of a symmetrical shape drawn with twigs. Depression and the Paranormal Until the opossum incident in 2018, I had never experienced anything paranormal in my life, much to my dismay. I wanted entities to present themselves to me. I called for them to. I was a weird kid. As I recall, I only ever asked, though. I never taunted or tried to offend them. I have some memories before the age of six, but six is really the age that I remember becoming aware self-aware, aware of the fact that other people's process things, or, you know, other people process things differently, rather. Basically, I had my first existential crisis. I was overweight, even at six, and relentlessly bullied. Mom and Dad had straight hair, and I have extremely curly hair. Now, I love it, because I know how to maintain it, after having YouTube tutorials and the entire internet at my disposal. But as a kid with parents who had no idea about curly hair, I walked around with a rat's nest until my mom's just wound up French braiding it. The bullies told me to brush it, so I did for hours, which is why my hair was such a poofy, fizzy mess all the time. But I digress. I was bullied relentlessly for my hair and my weight. My parents were divorcing. I'm not sure if I knew what suicide was at the time, but I do remember thinking that if I was dead, I wouldn't have to deal with any of this. I believe I was so depressed at six years old, 2001. Not just sad. It got worse in 2007 and worse again in 2015. Looking back, I legitimately don't know how I'm alive. For 19 years, suicide was my first thought waking up every morning. April of 2018, my mom died. I was the one who found her. She was my best friend, so it was rough. Tragedy followed. Dude, how seeing ghosted me, but in comparison to the other things, it seemed so trivial. My best friend overdosed to death, 
and my Pomchi dog was attacked and died in my arms. And in November 2019, I lost my job because I was essentially coming to work, getting very little actual work done, spending the day trying to hide my constant crying and panic attacks at my cubicle. In any case, I was at rock bottom, just numbly existing. Didn't even have the desire to actively end my life anymore. Was just waiting to, I guess, for malnutrition or negligence just to kill me. And then it all went away. 19 years of intense chronic suicidal depression, gone. I wish I could bottle it and sell it and end all the sadness in the world. I'm now one of the happiest people that I know. I literally love life and wake up smiling every morning. To me, there's literally no explanation other than this crazy one that finally ties back into the paranormal. What if I had some sort of entity affecting me from a young age? I got to thinking of this because a comment in the sub encouraging a poster to ward off the evil entities that felt as if these entities can cause lifelong depression. That to us is purely that. Depression. No paranormal overtones or vibes from it. When I Google ghosts causing depression, I'm encouraged to evaluate for my own mental health. But I've read a few interesting things on this sub that sort of bared no Google results when I tried to dig deeper. I don't know if that's because commenters pull things out of their ass, or if they're just such niche topics. No one else is talking about them. Curious about the paranormal? Look no further. Paranormal M brings you real-life stories that challenge the laws of reality. Subscribe now and hit that notification bell to keep up with our otherworldly adventures. North African Dude, Paranormal Encounter, 8 Years Ago I was born in a North African country, left for studies but my family is still living there. Historically speaking, King Solomon had a fight with demons, and after winning, he sent them to my country, or at least in the region where I was living, as punishment and reclusion. So the place has a reputation of being a very active paranormal spot, especially when it comes to witchcraft and black magic. We're talking about territory of more than 800,000 kilometers squared. So basically the whole country is a nest of paranormal activities. I was on my late teenage years, maybe 18 or 19, can't recall this. We are all living in a kind of mansion house, three floors, 300 meters squared, so I'll let you imagine how big the thing is. My parents bought the field and constructed the house for almost three years. During the construction, they found a water well with more than three water sources. This wasn't suspicious when you look closely at the details. Spirits and demons are always looking for a source of conduction and water seems to be a very good source to them. Anyways, long story short, one so-called January night, I was chilling on my Xbox 360 on the second floor while my parents were in the basement sleeping deeply. As this place of the house is always the warmest during winter nights, and I wanted to stay alone in order to profit from my, you know, long gaming nights. I remember that I was completely sober, no lust of sleeping, and I wasn't tired. And as a person, I was always fascinated with the invisible world, but not scared at all. As a Muslim, my religion taught me to stay strong against the invisible world and understand that each being has its own life and own perception of living. But at the time, I was too young and never experienced anything of that sort. After six hours straight of playing Street Fighter and FIFA, FIFA, I decided that my eyes were deserving some rest. So I went to the toilet in front of my room. I left the door half open when I came back. I was preparing myself to lay on the pillow when I heard the sound of a door opening. I thought at first that it was the aftermath of me just moving quickly and impacting the door. But when I looked at the door, in what seemed to be like an eternity, I saw a woman. I couldn't see what she looked like, no eyes, shape, or color. Just a woman with long, blood-red hair and a white dress standing in front of me. With some reflection, I think she stayed for like three seconds before coming inside. Sitting in the bed next to me, there were two beds, because my cousin used to come over a lot, and told me in a nice voice, 
You've a lot of dead people in this house. It may seem nice in English, but in my local language, I can assure you that it was one of the creepiest things you may ever hear. I jumped out of my bed and ran straight to the basement. I waked my parents up and told them what happened. My father took a tire-changing tool, don't ask me why, and went to my bed to check if she's still there, and my mother was so calm that I thought I was just crazy. It turned out that she knew exactly what happened to me and didn't want to overreact. I'm 27 years old now, and I left my parents' house two years ago from that day. I was never allowed to sleep alone in that room. Three years ago, a friend of my sister, a medium, came for a visit and told us that the house looks like the maybe demons or a spirit hotel. We still don't know what to do, but I am glad I'm not living in that house anymore. Because what I told you now, it's the most notable event that happened, really. Other things like footsteps and noises and nightmares, things changing places randomly and the side eye of shadows are normal to me now. Demon Dog of San Bernardino It was the summer of 2006, and at the time I'm a 14-year-old little troublemaker. Skipping school, smoking copious amounts of weed, tagging up walls, all that. That day I was caught in the back smoking weed by the school's police. They confiscate my weed, throw my joint on the floor, and then give it a hefty ticket and a court date. I shrug it off acting like a tough guy, so I skipped school, walked home that day, trying to think of what I'm going to tell my mom or my old man. Slowly, hour by hour, just panicking, thinking, man, I'm going to get my butt kicked that night. On the verge of an anxiety attack, I leave my house at one in the morning. I walk around, wandering the street with my marker in hand, of course, tagging and just trying to distract myself. I say... Let me go down to the street and see if the liquor store is still open. And guys, I kid you not, I always have my head on a swivel. I looked in that direction multiple times. I was walking toward the liquor store, and out of nowhere from behind a street light, the strangest, ugliest, most menacing dog I've ever seen in my life. Its coat, its demeanor, its presence. I've never ever experienced that with a dog. Looked like a mastiff or a rottweiler and a boxer had a baby and just there in the light staring at me. Waiting for me to get an inch closer, I stop in full panic mode. I run across the street not looking both ways and in my panic is broken when the lights of a police car shine upon me and the officer parks, gets out of his car and proceeds to chase me. And when I finally stopped, I was asked, why are you running? I said, didn't you see the massive dog underneath the light? She said, what dog? There's nothing there. Till this day, people suggest that this was maybe some sort of evil spirit. Some say it's probably protecting you, but whatever it is, sure gave me a fright. Possession Moment? I give the title that name because you can let me know what you think after this story. Over the weekend, I went to a museum full of haunted objects. At this museum, you could rent spirit boxes and the guy in front of me and my friend had one. So while we were downstairs in the basement of the museum, with their most haunted objects, we went into this room with a doll chained up. You had to ask permission to see the doll before entering, and I missed the sign. I instantly felt nauseous and my vision was super weird and blurry. All of a sudden the guy's spirit box said something and it said, Page? What does that mean? And I was like, My name is Paige. My friend and I left right away because I didn't, like, feel right at all. I had a very similar experience with a real-life Annabelle two years ago, but there wasn't a spirit box there that said my name during that time. So crazy to think that it actually happened. For those wondering about my Annabelle experience, I went to see Annabelle two years ago, and I asked for permission to take her photo. I looked directly in her eyes when asking, and I can't explain the feeling I got when I asked. It felt so demonic, but yet I still decided to take the photo. Multiples. I ended up getting sick, to the point where it felt like my body was literally shutting down. No matter what I did, nothing helped. I went to the hospital, which is crazy for me in general because I never go to the doctors. They couldn't find anything wrong. 
never forget that experience because whatever entity is attached to Annabelle took over me. It took me weeks to get over. And now I hope I never come across her again. A bucket list item leading to absolute terror. Scarily Tangible This occurred in the real life. Southern Connecticut to be specific. I won't give out the location. My girlfriend and I were sleeping in our van overnight. After finding a good place to sleep, we went there and cooked dinner. It was fine. We heard an animal walking around, and it was kind of strange. It kept walking near us, but I didn't think too much of it. The weird part happened as we were packing up. Our dog was looking off into the distance near this house and growling, then stared, then put her tail between her legs. For context, our dog tries to chase bears, and I never really had ever seen her afraid of anything. I didn't think too much of it, though. She growls at trash bags sometimes, after all. We walk a bit closer trying to see, maybe, if we could see it, that we could maybe comfort her. But we didn't see a thing. She left to go in with her dog, but I linger. I knew something was going on. It took a few... or... I look a few times, and nothing. I then look again as I give up, not looking at anything, just staring ahead, not focusing. And that's when I saw it. What looked like a giant stag. The torso was too big for its body, and it seemed to stand about seven feet. It's walking along the side of the house. About two or three seconds into staring, it sees me. I immediately go into the van. Now let it be known that I never believed in ghosts. And I was just startled believing in entities in the past few years. I'm unsettled. I keep looking over from our van window and nothing. Still, I feel something, though. We brushed her teeth, went to bed, and that was that. Still heard rustling. I heard what sounded like a buck call. But I wasn't too worried about that. What I assume is an hour or two passing and I wake up to this clinking noise at the pace of a clock. It sounded like a thick shell and a mallet, or two bones clinking. I go back to sleep because I don't really feel in danger. I wake up three or four more times, and what I notice is it sounds like it's about ten feet or so by the van. This is just for me. It walked in straight lines, turned at ninety degree angles, and it's going along the perimeter of my body without waking my girlfriend beside me. Back and forth, back and forth. I remember dreaming that night. I've had many capabilities in what we'll call the astral realm, being able to visit people in dreams and create expanses, etc. I remember being in a white expanse and sitting with a being with gray skin, antlers, and crow feathers for hair. The skin wasn't gross looking, it just looked like gray skin. And it said, and I quote, No one else would be able to handle the pressure. That's all I remember. My question is, what in the fuck was this thing? Has anyone ever heard about this entity? I need some help here. I'll also say that for the few nights after, in different areas, I heard movement and two of the nights I heard the same buck call, and something hit our front window. There's also scratches on one of our windows on the exact door that I was sort of fighting the thought of coming through. These scratches are no way from a rock. They're intersecting an angular, in a basically a vague circle. Does anybody know what this thing was? About a year back, I had just gotten back from my shift, and it was about 2.15 a.m. by the time that I got all my stuff and put it all away and changed it into some comfortable clothes. I was the on-call guy, so I would be coming and leaving at random hours. I had trained my dog to wait by the door, 
when she needed to go out and do her business, and by the time that I'd walked back into my living room, she was whining, a sign that she really couldn't wait any longer. As soon as I opened up the door to my backyard, she took off into the darkness, and I sat there, looking at something on my phone, probably Amazon, but I can't remember. It was taking her a little bit longer than normally, so I got up and I started heading out into the pitch black. It wasn't unusual for her to chase crickets or lose track of time, so every once in a while I'd have to go looking around for her to go back inside. When I had just left the back porch and onto the grass, I heard my dog yelp. I couldn't tell if she had been spooked or hurt. My neighbors were real pieces of work, so I assumed that they had been out messing around and threw something at her, which I'd have to then yell at them for on a couple of other occasions. I ran out into the yard and barely saw her outline by the light of another neighbor's lanterns that was just strong enough for me to discern her from the shadows. She was crouched low in the back by the fence between my yard and my neighbor's yard, and as I got close to her, I saw that she was shaking pretty bad. I'm by no means a pushover, I'm six foot one, and at this point weighed around 270 pounds, but seeing her shaking like that made me immediately nervous. By the way, I've since lost 100 pounds and I put on more muscle, but I was still not someone people messed with. She was a German Shepherd chow mix, and even though she wasn't as big as typical Shepherds, I'd seen her stand down some pretty tough characters, so her being scared was a huge red flag. I tried to guide her toward the house, deciding to take a look at her, and came back later to look for whatever had her so spooked. But as soon as I stepped towards her, she started growling and fixed her gaze on something to my left. I turned, and not fifty feet away on the other side of the fence was the biggest dog I'd ever seen in my life. I could only see its outline because it was between me and the lanterns, but the thing's head was barely below the five-foot fence. We get coyotes around where I live, but this thing dwarfed them and coyotes never went to people's backyards. They just wander around the streets looking for trash or neighborhood stray cats. We all just stood there for a good two minutes before I came back to my senses and slowly reached for my dog's collar. I got a death grip on it, pulled my dog around toward the house, and took off in a dead sprint. My dog was hesitant at first, but once I got a bit of distance between us and the back fence, it was like she broke out of a trance and she beat me to the back door. By the time I got there, she was whining when I flung the door open, and we both barreled into the living room, and I double-locked the door. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night, and she didn't go outside that night again for the rest of her life at that particular location. She was about 13 when this happened, and passed a couple months ago. Aside from this night and a couple of other occasions... She lived a really happy life. I've looked up every big predator in the area. I live in Arizona, by the way. And I haven't found anything that comes anywhere near close to resembling this thing. Guatemalan worry dolls and other weird happenings. My wife, a long time ago, used to have night terrors. Some of it may have been due to the fact that she grew up in a legit haunted house. I can testify that shit went on in that house. Anyhow, her father also owned a turn-of-the-century piano, made in, like, 1910. This will be relevant in a moment, and her mother has all kinds of antique stuff from when her family came to New Mexico in the 1800s. Needless to say... Things could have been happening in her house because of all that stuff, or the fact that the previous owner decided to not live anymore and killed himself in the basement with exhaust. Well, as time went by, her night terrors continued and got bad. Her mom decided to use the Guatemalan worry dolls to try to help, I guess. The premise of Guatemalan worry dolls is to put them underneath your pillow and sleep. Afterwards, you place them in a box and bury them on a path you will never go on again. It worked. However, fast forward to right before my daughter's born, 
my wife and I rented a beautiful house on a hill overlooking the town. After six months into living in the house while cleaning, these Guatemalan worry dolls start showing up in random places. Thresholds of the house, odd nooks and crannies, stuff like that. And we weren't entirely sure where they were in fact coming from. Well, my daughter was born, and we remained in the house for another six months or so. But as we were moving and cleaning out the house, more dolls kept showing up. Well, we packed them away, and my wife forgot where she put them. As we were moving into a new house, not two or three days in, in the threshold of the front of the house, Guatemalan worry doll was lying right there. We'd get rid of old couches and bring new couches in, and sure enough... Lift the couch cushions, and voila, worry doll. For a long time, I believe the piano held something in it, because when we brought it with us to the house, shit would always happen. Never in front of me, but definitely behind me. But always in front of my wife and her friends. Lights inadvertently turning on, picture frames swinging on the walls and falling to the ground. Some really funky shit. I started accepting what was happening when it was in my child's room. That pissed me off. I'd come home when no one else was here and sternly tell whatever it was that it wasn't welcome. Reciting the Lord's Prayer in step, we eventually moved the piano out and a lot of things stopped. However, we were telling one of my wife's friends, who's very sensitive to this kind of stuff, that she was really creeped out. But about three days after, she was cleaning out her car and called my wife frantically saying, This is fucked up, you're messing with me. And my wife was confused as shit. You guessed it, worry doll in her center console. Most recently, my wife found one. The scariest thing to happen was the time my wife and I were stoned watching a Netflix comedy special for John Mulaney. A caption came on telling my wife when she was going to die. I thought it was a caption saying when John Mulaney was born, so I didn't even look at what it said, but later on my wife told me what it said. Another Reason to Hate Dolls So this happens a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. My parents are very friendly and polite, and people like them pretty quick. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free and even had these type of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we've ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items in the process. One time, my mom and I were in her bedroom, checking the loot of one of these type of deals, and we were having a good time while sorting all the stuff. We got to a big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There was a lot of them, so I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all in bed. So we started checking the dolls one by one, choosing what to keep for my sister, what to give away, and what to throw away. Since most of these deals included taking some trash but we didn't really care. It was fun. We have a half bag sorted out when we get this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips. My mom likes it. Looks like new and seems like a fun toy for my sister, so she wants to keep it. She asks me to test it and see if the doll, you know, actually tumbles, but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again, now with the new brand of batteries, but still no luck after a few minutes. So, I conclude that the doll just must be broken, and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the same old ones back in, and put the doll back on the bed. We keep sorting stuff. Fifteen minutes passes. My mom and I were taking a break, just chatting, when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears and an overcharged motor. We look at the bed, and the sound comes from the doll. And right in front of both of us, the doll turns its head at me and says, Mama! The movement was so abrupt that I even feel the bed shaking a little. My mom and I look at each other and saw her face turning white. 
I just punched the doll as hard as I could, landed on the other side of the bedroom. We went immediately to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to find out what just happened. Then my mom enters a full rage mode, goes for the doll, puts it in a plastic bag, asks my dad to take it to the trash and out of the house. My parents are religious, so after that, they were praying and blessing the entire house for almost an hour. Never seen my mom that scared. It truly felt like a scene from a terror film. I expected the doll to get up and attack me at that moment. I don't really believe in paranormal stuff, even though I've had a couple experiences that really scare me. And up to this day, I have no explanation for it. And this is one of them. Growing up, I always hated dolls, and I was scared of them. Even to the point of having really bad, effed up nightmares. Good thing this happens when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably be traumatized. What still bugs me is that even though if I find a rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switched off and by itself, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastic doll that was supposed to do flips. As if it wasn't new and no box, I probably will never know if this is one of those features. And I'm okay not knowing. The Tale of Child Ghosts In a small, sleepy town, nestled amidst rolling hills, there is a dilapidated Victorian house that stood abandoned at the edge of the woods. Locals whispered tales of its haunting, claiming that the house was home to the spirits of children who had met unfortunate fates long ago. Legend had it that a young family had once resided there, their lives filled with joy and laughter. However, tragedy struck when a devastating fire engulfed the house one fateful night, trapping the innocent children inside. The town mourned their loss, and the charred remains of the house stood as grim reminders of the lives lost too soon. Years passed, and the stories of the child ghosts grew more vivid. People claimed to have seen flickering lights and heard laughter emanating from the house. The town's children would dare each other to approach the eerie place at dusk, exchanging spine-chilling tales of encounters with the departed children. One evening, a curious and brave young girl named Emily decided to unravel the mysteries surrounding the house. She had heard tales of whispers among her friends, and her heart was filled with a mix of fear and compassion for the child's spirits said to reside there. Emily ventured into the woods, her footsteps careful and deliberate. As the sun began its descent, casting an orange glow over the landscape, she approached the abandoned Victorian house. The creaking floorboards and the overgrown vines clinging to the walls added to the eerie atmosphere. Emily pushed open the rusted front door. Inside, she found a world frozen in time, a place of forgotten dreams and lost innocence. Cobwebs adorned the corners, and dust danced in the rays of light that filtered through the cracked windows. She explored each room, feeling a peculiar presence, a whispered touch of the past. In a forgotten corner, she stumbled upon an old, worn-out teddy bear, its once vibrant colors faded with time. As she picked it up, a soft giggle echoed through the house, and Emily's fear transformed into warmth and understanding. She realized that the child's spirits had never meant to harm. Instead, they longed for connection, for someone to remember them, and for their stories to be told. Moved by compassion, Emily began visiting the house regularly, bringing fresh flowers to place on the windowsill, playing games with invisible companions, and sharing stories of her adventures with the departed children. Over time, the house started to see the abandoned house, or sorry, the town started to see the abandoned house with new eyes. No longer a place of dread, it became a symbol of resilience, love, and remembrance. The child ghosts, once restless and unseen, found solace in the presence of Emily and the town's growing appreciation for their memory. 
as years went by, the town transformed the old Victorian house into a community center, dedicated to honoring the lost children and providing a safe space for the living ones. The laughter of children echoed through its walls once again, filling the house with a sense of joy and healing. And so, the child ghosts found peace, forever etched into the hearts of those who had come to know their stories. Their presence served as a reminder that even in the afterlife, the innocence of childhood endures, and the power of compassion can heal even the most lingering ghosts. I went through a glitch in the Matrix on the London Tube. This happened in 2015 on the Piccadilly Line in the London Underground. If you're not familiar with it, you might want to get a map of it. So I was just going home after seeing a friend's concert in North London, and at the time I lived around Dollis Hill in Northwest. I was traveling back with a friend of mine, and we were both extremely sober. I only had a small beer at the start of the evening and drank water during the event. I hadn't smoked nor taken any sort of drugs, nor have we ever been psychiatric patrons. It was sometime after 11 p.m., and we were a bit concerned about the underground closing up, so we were trying to figure out the best route. As we approached King's Cross Street and Pancreas STN, we decided that maybe it would be best for us to change with the Jubilee line at Green Park, only to change ID at the last second. We got up from our seats toward the exit, and the train door closed right behind, rather right in front of us. Not a big deal. We decided to get off at the next station, Russell Square, as it was a small station, and it would have been easier after all to go back to King's Cross, where we had more chances to find trains still running. So we wait a few minutes for the train to get to the next stop. The monitors on the train and the voice over the speaker telling us that that destination will be the Heathrow Airport. The train reaches Russell Square, its name spelt out in the ceramics that decorate the walls. The doors open right in front of the short corridor leading to the staircase where the man is mopping the steps in preparation for closure. We go over the bridge and wait on the platform. Right in front of the billboard advertising David Bowie's latest release, I believe it was his last of his compilation albums, the monitor tells us that our train is only two minutes away and will terminate at Cockfosters. As usual, my friend and I can't help but chuckle. The train arrives, we both get in, doors close behind us. A couple of minutes go by and I can't help but notice the people with their luggage. That for whatever reason, they didn't seem like they were coming back from the airport. The monitor says, This is the southbound train to Heathrow Terminal 1, 2, 3, and 5. Must be some kind of mistake. So why is the recorded voice announcing the same? And why is it saying the next stop is Russell Square? My friend and I are a bit confused, so we ask a couple with luggage for their destination Heathrow. They must be on the wrong train and the computer system must have somehow fucked up. There's no other explanation. We wait patiently for our train to get to King's Cross, St. Pancras. However, as the light starts coming in from the windows, we can't help but notice the same ceramic patterns of Russell Square, its name spelt on the wall. Once again, the door opens in front of the same corridor and the same guys cleaning the stairs. I swear he glanced at me in a way that made me clear that he'd seen me already. Once again, we're greeted by David Bowie's face, and once again, we get on a train to Cockfosters. Only this time, we're not thinking about juvenile puns. We manage to both get home safely in complete disbelief, but sure that we've had the same experience. Nobody's ever been able to give an explanation of what happened. And I've done again the same route to find that it's perfectly okay. Story number 18. Feel like my dad tried to contact my family. My dad passed away in August 2020. Not from COVID, he had a serious heart disease. 
I'm 20 and live with my boyfriend in another town. My sister is 16 and lives with mom. So me and my boyfriend went to my hometown together for funerals. Anyway, I'm kind of a person who prefers to ignore pain as a defense mechanism. So I tried to keep the atmosphere as light as possible. I really tried to distract everyone from grief. So we spent some time watching movies and playing video games and talking about normal stuff. The first weird thing happened a few days after our arrival. Shortly before that, I began to get interested in 3D modeling and I spent a lot of time in the computer and phone studying this very topic. One morning I woke up and scrolled through some memes on Reddit and then saw that my battery's low and decided to put it underneath my pillow and I perfectly remember how I did that. From the morning till about 12 p.m., without even visiting a bathroom, I was in my bed with my boyfriend. We were making 3D models. No one visited the room, and I'm 100% sure that no one tried to grab my phone from a pillow. But yeah, a few hours later, I decided to check it out, and I didn't find it. We searched everywhere, and then I found it right next to where my dad's portrait was in his bedroom. My mom wasn't even home. My sister said that she didn't leave her room, we know that she didn't come out of her bedroom. I asked everyone a few times, and they all said that they didn't touch it. When my mom came back, I told her this story, and she jokingly said, Remember how Dad just hated that I was on my phone all the time? <laughs> Maybe he's just trying to say, forget about that phone. Spend some goddamn time with your family. My mom looked at us with all the seriousness and said that I might be right, and she didn't even think of that. Turns out she had been crying for a week every night she talks about my dad about how difficult it is for her. We went to the kitchen and spent a few hours discussing things. In the end, she said that it was dad and that he was right and that we needed to talk. Later, after we came back home, we all saw dad in our dreams in the same night. I saw him in the apartment where I grew up and he was in a white suit that he never had in real life. I run to him in tears and hugged him, and he said, Hey there, why are you crying? We're all going to the restaurant, it's going to be okay. I heard my mom and sister's footsteps, and then I woke up. I immediately messaged my sister about this when I woke up. Surprisingly, she said, Oh my God, I saw him in a dream too. She saw him in her old house working, like he had always used to, in the same white suit. She cried and immediately hugged him and calmed her down or he calmed her down. And finally we told mom and she said that she saw him too, same white clothes. In her dream, she was in her current apartment and they accompanied me to another city. My dad waved me, saying goodbye, and then he turned his head, smiled and told mom, well, I'm going to stay here, and hugged her. Mom even said that her dog was surprisingly happy that night. He was running and barking while sleeping. Maybe my dad visited him too. Anyway, maybe that's just silly, but I just want to believe that that was my dad. Hitching a Ride About 15 years ago, a friend and I decided to have a night out at a local club in Fort Myers, Florida. It was around 2.30 a.m. when we decided to leave and head back home. To get home, we had to take a State Road 82, about a 45-minute drive from the North Fort Myers. If anyone on this thread knows anything about 82, hundreds of deaths have happened on this road, from motorcycle accidents to semi-truck rollovers and everything in between. Extremely dangerous road, with a ton of very strange sightings. Anyway, it was around 3 a.m. when we reached the halfway point home. Windows halfway down, smoking cigarettes and listening to some Pastor Troy. When out of the blue, we heard what sounded like very heavy rain hitting our car. No other cars around and driving about 70 miles per hour. No rain in sight, just a bit foggy. It startled the hell out of us, and it lasted for maybe a second, like we drove through a very tiny rainstorm. We looked at each other and just sort of shrugged it off and kept driving. If you've ever driven down State Road 82, it's not exactly the safest road to pull over if you don't really have to. 
So we finally reached home and decided to fill up the car and purchased a couple of packs of smokes. I parked next to a pump and my buddy went to the store to go pay for the fuel and smokes. When I got out of the car, I decided to just check the car and see if I maybe hit something. And honestly, people laugh at me when I tell them this story. But from the middle of the front of my hood all the way back to the end of the trunk, I seen eight streaks. I was a car guy in those days. and My car was washed and waxed hours before we decided to go clubbing. My buddy came out of the store. I showed him what I discovered, and he was equally puzzled. After I pumped gas, I decided to go over to the self-car wash and see if I could get these streaks off the car. Must just say, I spent damn near 15 bucks and quarters using everything that was setting that car wash had to offer, and the streaks just wouldn't come off. I said the hell with it, and decided to drop Buddy off and head home to bed. The next morning, I decided to go have a look at the car. I just couldn't figure out what the hell could have caused this. I drop over to my grandmother's house to have breakfast, and I decided to let her know what happened. My grandmother is an old Latina woman who's very superstitious and knows quite a bit about Santeria. After I told her what happened, she stood up and went into her bedroom. When she came back into the kitchen, she had white sage, holy water, a rosary, and a small piece of silver. I chuckled and asked if she was about to perform an exorcism. She smiled and said, Kinda. So I walked outside with her and her items. She surrounded the car with white sage inside and out, held her rosary in one hand while whispering something. She put holy water on a small rag that she had in her pocket and proceeded to clean my car. I laughed and told her I tried pretty much everything to get those streaks off, and nothing worked. And she's now cleaning the streaks off with holy water. My jaw dropped. The streaks were coming off. I was honestly shocked. After she cleaned, quote unquote, my car, I asked her what she thought it was, and she said that it was a demon trying to latch itself to my car. To this day, I'm still haunted by this and wonder if she was actually right. Something weird happened when I was a kid, and I can't explain what it was. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I must have been maybe ten, and I was with another two friends, one my age and the other one was four years older than us. We'll call them Ava and Jenny. We were in Ava's house, and it was a two-story house in my town. The lower ground was a long garage that could fit several cars, and the first floor was the actual house. To get in the garage, there was a door on the left side of the staircase. She had her play area at the end of the garage, opposite side of the entrance, and about three to four meters of where her toys were, there was a storage room where Ava's parents would keep winter clothes, costumes, and the like. I was very used to her house, and she would celebrate her birthday in that garage, and I visited often. We must have been playing for a while when we swapped games and opened a dollhouse. I must say that there was no creepy talk at all, just three girls playing with the doll family. A bit later I started feeling something in that storage room that I mentioned. I remember this moment crystal clear, but I'm not sure I can explain what I felt. I've never experienced anything like that again. There was just something not nice in that room, and I just didn't want to be there at all. I didn't see or hear anything, but I had a very strange feeling toward that door. I'm not sure if it was something evil I felt, or if it was just a strange feeling, and because I was a kid, I didn't understand exactly what it was. But it was emanating from that room. It felt like the door was going to open wide by itself. The joyful playing stopped and the three of us went a bit quiet until we realized that we were all feeling the same thing. Unprompted and without any prior talk, we shared what we were feeling and started moving in the opposite direction from the storage room. The three of us were scared. Ava and I tried to get Jenny to check it out because, of course, she was the oldest. But she completely refused. We ended up brushing up and tidying up the toys so that we wouldn't get in trouble and sprinted toward the door and left to go upstairs. 
we were pushing each other a bit, and we were the last one left in the garage, but I ended up being the last one myself. The light switch for the garage was on the right-hand side of the door, so Ava went first and opened the door. Then Jenny, and when it was my turn, I slapped the light switch off and we went upstairs in complete darkness. That's just how scared we were, that we didn't even turn on the light of the staircase. Fast forward a couple of hours later when we were in Ava's bedroom, back to playing and feeling went away and we felt safe again. Ava's mom came back from work and went up to check on us. She asked why we left the light on in the garage because she just parked and all of them were on. Now I'm a hundred percent that I turned them off. We crawled through the stairs in complete darkness after all. So how the lights were turned on is a complete mystery. Unfortunately, I haven't kept in contact with Ava or Jenny, so I can't ask if they remember any of these experiences, but from my memories from my childhood, being as vivid as they are, and this particular one has always been there, I've never felt or experienced anything like that ever again, so any input is most welcome. I'm not exactly sure what to do with this, but I'm a bit worried. So I live in a two-story house that was built, I think, in 1950 or 1970, somewhere in there. I'm honestly not sure. As far as I know, nobody's passed away in or near this house. I don't think it was built on a gravesite or anything like that. There's definitely been at least three different energies or spirits that I've encountered. One was a little boy who would get mad at me if I said a bad word. Well, more disappointed or annoyed than mad. The second was a woman, which I'm not really sure what was up with her. She was just kind of there and was super intense and wanted to get my attention. The third was someone or moreover something. It wasn't bad, but it would observe me, and it would stand at the end of my bed and watch me, so a bit creepy. I haven't talked to or interacted with anything because, one, I don't want to unlock or bring something to the surface that shouldn't be messed with. And two, I didn't want to mess with anything that could be demonic or dangerous. So, I was recently watching a few videos of people going to haunted hotels and houses. I was pretty interested in what they did to communicate with the spirits. So I was binge watching a ghost hunting YouTube channel. I accidentally clicked on a YouTube short while scrolling of an edit of Sam and Colby. In the edit, the name was not said, but written. It was the name of something demonic. And it started with a B, and it meant something about a demonic spirit or entity that was very powerful. I let out the smallest laugh and said out loud, I'm so, so sorry, but... Insert name there. Probably Beelzebub. Then I let out a quieter laugh. The second I said the name, a card started moving. A pop-up card that was open. It started to close and open over and over again. And I, of course, said, I'm sorry, bye, and then left my bedroom. The way my bedroom set up is that I'd have to pass by the card to be able to get out of the room. It made me feel even more uneasy, knowing that the AC was not turned on and there was absolutely no airflow in that area. It felt hot and heavy and uncomfy, almost a little choky. So I quickly passed it and left closing my door. I told my friend about it and they said, that's weird. I stayed out of my room for a while and went downstairs, but when I came back up, I thought, maybe I should go back in. So I went back in, and it had stopped because when I went back over towards the card, it didn't feel as if it did before. It was actually cooler, not heavy, and I didn't feel uncomfy passing by it. I just think it's strange that reaction happened when I sort of mocked the name of a powerful demonic entity. I also want to say... The sound of someone walking up to the door and opening it and nobody being there has happened a lot. Recently, especially at night. And a lot of thumping on my window has also happened. So I don't know what to do. I've never really felt that type of energy in my house before. 
The area around the card, while it was moving, was weird and gross. I think that's the best way to describe it. Also, I wanted to say the name again. However, I thought maybe don't do that, especially in case it's like a Beetlejuice type thing. Experiences in my childhood home, Poltergeist. My parents divorced when I was four, and my dad went to go build his own house while I lived with my mom. My dad built his house on a site where the previous home had been burned down three years earlier. It was arson, but no one was hurt or killed, and the perpetrator was never caught. Shortly after finishing the house, weird things began to happen. The first story is one that I wasn't told until I was older. One night after the house was finished, but not fully moved into yet. My dad was working late upstairs in the master bedroom. It was probably midnight or so, and he was finishing up when he began to hear voices. He described it as a group of people talking. He couldn't make out any single conversation, just the general, maybe, sounds of a group of people talking. He couldn't make out any single word in the conversation, just the general buzz of many voices coming from downstairs. Confused, he left the bedroom and stood on the landing, just listening, the only thing that he had. And he charged downstairs only to find nothing. However, the voices were still talking. He entered the living room and stood there, listening. He said it sounded like the voices were coming from the ceiling, like the group of people were super tall or something like that. He began to get scared, and he shouted at the voices to shut up, which they did. It just fell completely silent. My dad left for the night pretty quickly afterwards. The next thing is something I remember. Sometimes when my sister and I stayed over at my dad's, and by the way, we would spend half a week with our mom and half with our dad, the smoke detector in our room would go off in the middle of the night. It never happened when we were with our mom, only when we were in the bedroom asleep at night at our dad's. The smoke detector in our bedroom was also the only one to go off. No other detectors in the house would do anything. My dad tried replacing the battery and even replacing the whole thing, but it would continue to happen for a few years. I remember waking up in the middle of the night to an alarm blaring and running to my dad's room to tell him that the alarm was going off again. This happened once a month or so for the first few years that we lived in that house. Finally, this is something my entire family witnessed. We had motion detector lights on the stairs leading to the basement. And one night we were in the living room, which had a perfect view of the stairs to the basement. We had a sheet in the doorway at the time because my dad just hadn't put up a door yet. Suddenly, the motion lights on the stairs turned on and the sheets moved up, like someone lifted it to walk under and then let it go. Except there was no one there. I remember being super freaked out, but my dad didn't seem worried, so I wasn't either. Years later, my dad told me that he was actually terrified, but didn't want to scare my sister and I, so he pretended to be fine. The smoke detector was the only incident that kept happening, but after a few years it stopped and nothing creepy happened in that house ever again. We moved out when I was 14 and I haven't been back since. To our knowledge, no one has died on the land or been buried there, so I'm not sure what this all was. Any feedback would be great. Strange Woman in My Dream This event happened to me last summer. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm more of a man of science than a man of faith. Even though a few strange things have happened to me in my life that I've not really been able to rationally explain. It was the beginning of August and nothing special was happening in my life. I had a period of depression, but it was no strange thing to me. I've had it since I was a child and it always passed. I have dreams almost every day, and this night was no exception, but this time it was completely different. 
I had a nightmare in which there was a tall, pale woman with black eyes and black hair. She looked almost human, but there was something inhuman about her. I guess I can't fully describe what it was. It was just my feeling. She looked very nice to me, and her voice sounded sweet as she spoke to me. But even in that dream, I knew that her intentions with me were not good. I don't remember her words. All I know is that the expression on her face gradually changed and she was mad at me. I woke up sweaty and my heart was pounding. I've never had a similar nightmare that would have such an effect on my body. But that wasn't, that wasn't all. My thoughts were hazy. And one thought resonated in my head. Kill yourself and you will be fine. Kill yourself and it will all end. It will be okay again. You don't belong here. I've never thought of hurting myself in my life. I love life and I love people. Like it wasn't even me. I got out of bed and went to the kitchen where I drank a glass of cold water and my thoughts slowly faded from me. I was a little shaken, but I still thought it was just a really bad nightmare. So I went back to bed and fell back asleep again. Nothing more happened that night. I woke up in the morning before my girlfriend, which I thought was pretty weird because she's a morning person in our household, and she looked very tired when she came to the kitchen. I asked her if she was okay, and then she replied that she just had a really strange dream. I told her to tell me the details. In her dream, we were in our bedroom. My girlfriend was awake in the dream, but I was asleep. A strange woman was sitting on the edge of the bed. She looked at her and then pointed at me. She told her, You have to help me kill him. He's worried here. He doesn't belong here. If you help me, he'll be happy again. You want him happy, don't you? My girlfriend started arguing with the strange woman. The quarrel led nowhere and the woman attacked her. My girlfriend fought the strange figure, tugging at her hair and scratching her face. She said that she felt like she was really hurting her because the woman had disappeared with a scream. At that moment, I was staring at my girlfriend in disbelief and asked her one more thing, even though I knew that maybe she knew the answer. I asked her what the woman looked like. Yep, you guessed it right. Tall, black hair, fair skin, big black eyes. She says she'll never forget how she grinned at her. I realized one more thing that morning. My depression was over. I felt as if someone had lifted a heavy stone off my chest and I could breathe freely again. Nothing like this has happened to me since. I'd love to know what those dreams meant. Red Eyes in the Window when my mom was around 15, she had lived in Germany for a few years. Her and her parents lived in an old three-story brick house. Though this was a rental house, which they were only going to be living in for a small amount of time. One night when my mother went to bed, she tossed and turned, unable to sleep for some reason. She didn't know why, but she had a horrible gut feeling. She finally decided to sit up in her bed knowing that something was definitely wrong. Though before she decides to go on her parents' room, she sees a figure standing outside of her window. The outline of a man. The only thing that can be properly made out was the fact that this man had red eyes. My mother wanted to scream for a second, but then something hit her. Her room was on the third floor of the house. There was no way anybody could be standing outside her window unless they had gotten a ladder and climbed it. But the noise surely would have woken up the whole house. If not, at least, she would have noticed. Something in my mother told her not to get up and just to go lie back down and pretend to be asleep, as if she didn't see anything. As much as she wanted to go running to her parents' bedroom, something deep down was sending off alarms telling her not to. The whole night my mom laid in her bed unable to get up, but unable to fall asleep due to the pure fear overtaking her. She sighed in relief, though she was still unable to go back to sleep, so she got up and walked to her parents' bedroom where she woke them both up and told them what happened. My grandfather, her dad, walked to my mom's room, 
though him and my grandmother didn't really believe my mom, thinking that maybe she was just having a bad dream or something like that, he told her it was nothing and that no one could have been at her window since they were far too up from the ground. My mom begged my grandparents to believe her, saying that she wasn't able to sleep all night nor get up to tell the two of them, though they still didn't believe her. Two weeks go by and my mother had only seen the man at her window five other times, though she felt like it was being constantly watching her, in the neighborhood that is. She kept telling her parents though each time that they didn't believe her, saying that she was just imagining it. Then whenever my grandparents were visiting with the next door neighbor, my mother's so-called nightmares were brought up by the grandparents to the lady. The lady went pale as a ghost the moment my grandfather described the man my mother had described to them time and time before in the last week. The lady said it was a spirit and that it had been around for decades just standing outside of the young girl's room watching them. No one knew why or when the first time the spirit had arrived, but when it did, it never left. Most of the neighbors believed it to be an evil spirit who would prey on the young girls, and once it had its eyes on its next victim, the girl would go crazy seeing the man everywhere they go in the neighborhood. Though it was just a rumor, this was enough to make my grandparents freak out and move out of the rental as quickly as they could, which luckily was extremely quick since they had just moved in and most of the boxes hadn't even been unpacked yet. This had to be one of the more creepy stories my mom had told me. Though many people wouldn't see it as bad, my mom was terrified. Even telling the story, which she won't do often, you can tell she gets freaked out. Ouija at the Park One Sunday about last year, my friend Jake and I wanted to do something fun and interesting. So we thought about doing a Ouija board. I got a sturdy piece of cardboard and Jake put the Ouija letters on it. We both thought it would be super fun or something. We knew about the stories of how they stay in your home forever if you invite them. And so we went to a park away from our neighborhood and set it up there. My friend told me that we had to allow the spirit to control us in order to have it work. And that sort of scared me. First we would ask... Are there any spirits who would like to talk with us? We asked that about 15 times. It started to seem hopeless. Let's just do it one more time. And then we should just go home, I said. We asked again. Are there any spirits who would like to talk with us? And then Jake moved the circle onto the yes. Jake flipped out. I thought he was just being dumb because he didn't want to go back home. I was convinced that he moved it. Dude, that's not funny at all. Stop moving it, I told him. He looked at me with a serious face and said, I didn't move it, I thought you did. That's when I started to feel spooked. But it wasn't enough to get me away from there. Okay then, I'll ask it something only I know, I said. I thought about my room, I had an old steel steel back iPod touch at the bottom of my desk drawer and I knew Jake didn't know about that so I asked what is in the bottom desk drawer at my house and we spun the circle around on the board it started to spell out I P O I took my hands away and yelled Jake did you go through my stuff he just looked at me in disbelief you're pranking me aren't you he asked that's when I realized this whole thing was real. We're talking to a spirit? Jake realized. Then we asked in a bunch of stupid questions, stuff like, What am I thinking? It would tell us correctly every time. We asked its name and it said, John. Then we asked, Are you a peaceful spirit? It said, No. Then we asked, Do you want to hurt us? The circle slowly moved to yes. Holy frick, man, Jake said. I don't want to do this anymore. Jake stood up and I was glad that he said that because I felt the same. We tossed the board into a gated area and ran back to my house. On the way, we passed a person walking their dog. The dog barked at us like crazy. I've never seen a dark, 
or a dog barking so badly. That night I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about that spirit. I thought it was in my room. I don't know if I thought about the spirit enough to make myself feel it in my own home, or if it was actually there. It was only a hint of a presence that I could feel, so I was unclear. A week later, I couldn't feel it anymore, and to this day, April 24th, 2021, I haven't felt it again. Don't mess with Ouija boards unless you want to screw up your life. We must have gotten lucky. What the hell just happened? I ordered two playbills online and had them delivered to mail to me. They're incredibly special to me. I keep them in a sealed bag. I would never be careless with them. I haven't had these playbills for very long. They came right at the end of January, at some point in February. I wanted to take a look at them, but I couldn't remember where I put them. I live alone in a small apartment. There aren't too many places to look. and There's no roommate around screwing with my stuff. I searched everywhere and the playbills were just gone. I remember while I was looking, I kept thinking, oh, they've got to be here, only to find that they weren't there. I have a pretty extensive collective or collection of crystals, I have an entire bookshelf dedicated to them. I don't keep anything on that shelf that isn't a crystal or doesn't have something to do with my crystals. I know every crystal in my collection, and I know where their precise spots are individually. So while searching for the playbills, I decided to check my crystal shelf. I was confident that they wouldn't be there, but I didn't know where else to look. On the bottom shelf, I have some small bags that I use to carry crystals, and I was unzipping them to look inside to see if somehow my playbills were in one of them. It gets weird here. I looked through a few bags with nothing, so was on to another one. When I opened the next bag, I felt as if it had something inside of it. I pulled it out and it was revealed as another, smaller bag that I had no recollection of. Inside that bag were two crystals that I'd never seen before. Like I said, I know all of my crystals and every crystal has its place. I have no clue where these two came from. Another thing I should add, I'm schizophrenic. I was so confused about this whole Playbill Crystal situation that I went into a psychotic episode. It was like two Playbills had materialized into two crystals. My brain got pretty delusional with that. After that episode, I just tried not to think about it too hard. I knew that if I started thinking about it again, I'd go into another episode. Every time I had a thought about the Playbills or crystals, I would quickly distract myself with thoughts of something else. So flash forward a few weeks till tonight. I was on my bed in my bedroom watching a video on my iPad. Out of absolutely nowhere, I had this urge to get up, walk out of the room and ask for my playbills back. So I did. I walked out of my bedroom and basically said to nothing and no one that there'd be no hard feelings if they could just put my playbills back somewhere I could find them. Then I walked back into my room and continued the video. A couple of hours later, I was on the couch and I started to get this sort of tingly sensation. It felt like my feet were falling asleep, but it wasn't sitting on them or anything weird or anything like that. I wanted to find a code for an online thing, and I knew that I had a code on a piece of paper in my room. I left the couch to go to my room and get the code. The code was in a drawer in a small table. I know I checked that exact drawer for my playbills. I know I did. I absolutely know it. I opened the drawer, and there was the paper with the code I needed, along with my two missing playbills. My dear gentlemen, my most fondest memory. I have always believed in ghosts, but most of my experiences were feelings or glimpses of shadows, etc., However, I've gotten more sensitive as I've gotten older, but it seems more so since this incident. My ex and I moved into a little flat in our local town. It was a tiny and squalid little building, 
but we were in our early 20s and it's our first place. We didn't notice anything funny until after my then fiance started getting abusive and we both began noticing this strange energy coming from the bathroom. Due to the layout of the flat, you came in the front door to the living room and kitchen and where we set up our sofa was opposite the bathroom door. So whenever we sat there, we'd get this odd feeling of being watched and this strange energy. We closed the door and felt fine but hated using that bathroom. Over time, things would move. The bookcase that we had was pretty solid and heavy, and it just suddenly tipped over. And the odd one was the kettle kept switching on and off, like someone was flicking the button on and off quickly. Nine out of ten times it would happen when my ex was gone, but one day it started when I was home alone. Usually I didn't feel frightened at all and just thought I'd make a cup of tea, made two, set one aside, and said, if you wanted tea, you could just ask for it. From that day onward, the kettle never did the flickering off and on thing again. I only began to feel the scary energy when my ex was home, and as soon as he left, I felt comfortable again. I still sensed him, but not in a negative way, like having a friend or a roommate. I'm not sure why, but I'd start talking to him out loud, just nattering about things, and I learnt about him. Not hearing him per se, but it just came to my head like I already knew it, if that makes any sense. I learned he'd been a soldier in the war and his name was William. The rest of it was just friendly, and I felt such great care and affection from this spirit. I often just referred to him as my old gentleman or lieutenant. My ex, however, referred to him as the shadow man or the dark entity. A lot of my friends felt the energy, and many non-believers ended up believing in it too, but they didn't seem to get the vibes of friendly or gentleman or evil shadow man, just that there was something going on. My ex and I split up, and he ended up moving out for a week, and I'd never lived by myself before, and I thought I'd be terrified more with the spiritual energy, but the whole time I was there, I felt safe and protected, and I hadn't slept so well in years. Unfortunately, I ended up getting kicked out by my ex and he eventually left the house too, and I regret losing that place, as I greatly miss my old gentleman and think of him often. Since then, I actually did some digging and I learned that in my home, a gentleman did live there until he died in the 70s and 80s. I can't remember the exact age as I searched it up years ago. But he was a former lieutenant in World War I and he had lived in that building, and his name was William reassured me that my memories weren't just a delusion, but it makes me miss the very real connection that we once had. A strange light keeps stalking me. I've always believed in aliens, despite never encountering any myself, until one night in July... These strange occurrences happened about two or three years ago in the southeast region of New Hampshire. I still can't explain what I saw, and neither can my mother. My mother and I got off work and driving down this back road. We were about five to seven minutes away from our house. I'm driving. We're approaching a hill that leads up a long, narrow road through the woods. I see a bright light hovering about 20 feet above the house, perched on top of the hill. My mother notices it too. I turn off the radio and roll down the windows. No noise. I drive up the hill and notice two cars stopped off to the side of the road looking up at the sky. I pass them and take a glimpse through the trees. I see a large square shaped metal object. There are circular lights shining from the bottom. My mom and I turned around in the first driveway that we could find. 30 seconds, maybe less, we went back and it was gone. I was freaked out but excited to have a UFO story of my own. The excitement gradually wore off the more frequently the sightings became. My friend and I were walking along the beach across from my family's restaurant. We saw a light hovering near the lighthouse. We assumed the light had stopped revolving since it wasn't moving, but suddenly the light jolted forward and began flying around manically. It dove behind the house alongside the beach and disappeared. At this point, 
I've had another person in my life experience with separate events. I knew it wasn't just a figment of my mom or my imagination. My mom and I saw it about once a week for the next month after that. The lights would be hovering in the distance completely silent and would disappear once we were too close. We chose to ignore it. As long as the light kept its distance, we felt moderately safe. Then came the close encounter. My mom and I got off work around eight and returned home with a trunk full of groceries. Our condo is at the very end of a cul-de-sac, and at the other end, a tiny hill with a line of tall trees. We were bringing bags into the house, and I notice a light off in the distance. The light starts getting closer and closer until it's above the tree line, which is about a hundred feet, give or take, from where our car is, and it stops. My mom is super frightened at this point. I tell her I'm done being afraid, and I stand there waiting for the light to approach me. As I begin walking towards it, it zooms off to my left and disappears above the forest tree line. I was shaken. The light had stopped and seemed to be observing my mother and me until we took notice. Since that summer, we've never seen it again. I guess we don't really expect another time but we just chalked it up to maybe being a drone. We've tried to explain it, maybe a helicopter, but there was no noise. A plane wouldn't stop moving. But a drone, maybe. But that still doesn't explain the uneasy silence. We began to think it was trying to abduct us. Or maybe it already had, and we just have no memory of it. I was being watched by something unearthly. Before I start, I'd like to give you context on the layout of the apartment where I used to live. It was a three-floor apartment building in which me and my family lived on the second floor. Now once you get into the apartment, there is a little walkway. You go through the front door and to the right, there's a closet which couldn't have been any more than three feet away from the entrance. You look to your left, and it was a little walkway that couldn't have been any more than four feet. You pass the threshold, and immediately, you're within the middle of the living room and the dining room. This will all be important later in the story. Now, this was back in early summer of 96 on a Saturday night. I was 15 at the time, and I was in the living room with my aunt, who was sleeping on the couch while I was laying down watching TV. It was 12.38 a.m., I remember the time because I was flicking through channels. The time was displayed on the top right of the screen. It was dark with only light emanating from the TV. I just so happened to be finding something interesting to watch when I suddenly felt a sense of dread. I tried to shake it off, but it stayed in the pit of my stomach. Minutes after, something told me to look in the direction of the small walkway where the entrance of the apartment is. It was almost as if something forced me to look that way. You know how if you were in class and you were just sitting there minding your own business and you feel like eyes are on you? Then you so happen to turn in direction to the person staring at you? Sort of like that. Once I looked, I immediately noticed that there was a tall, dark figure over six feet staring at me from the shadows. The man was blacker than the shadows that he stood within, I mean, like, jet black. I did a double take and then squinted under the expression that maybe I was seeing things, but he was standing there watching me. It was like once he seen me, he was dissatisfied. Or perhaps satisfied. It's hard to see his expression, but he slowly turned around and walked past the entrance to the apartment going straight through the closet. I was utterly shocked as well as terrified when I noticed it. My 15-year-old brain couldn't wrap around what i just witnessed. I sat there, still staring in that direction and trying to process the whole ordeal. I snapped out of it quickly, going to the closet to see if anyone was there, but to my horror, there wasn't. The front door never opened, nor did the closet door, which baffled me in utter disbelief. I went and tried to wake up my aunt to tell her about the situation that just occurred. 
My aunt, groggy from being awakened from her deep sleep, said, T, you watched too many scary movies. It wasn't real, now go back to sleep. But I assure you that it was absolutely real. The scariest thing of it all is that it almost felt like time stopped, like an outer body experience. I felt like I was stuck in limbo somewhere. It was like being present in between two different realities at the same time. I've had other strange things happen to me, but this one was by far the scariest encounter I've ever had. The Lost Mine A small town in the mountains, known for being built on the idea of riches for mining, has had its fair share of different personalities. Some of those souls had moved on and others have gotten lost. This town had many of mining structures and oxidized mountains of minerals all abandoned. But one name sticks out to me. My friends and a good amount of others in the town too. One mind that we call Sarko. This mine is about a good 20 minute drive past the other abandoned structures and up into the mountains. You get to a main gate that veers off into a dirt road. This takes you to an old tailing pond. A huge field elevated above the ground to hold water, where there's a lot of excess water, mind you. Across the field are multiple abandoned structures that sit lonely, right next to the inlet of the water. Me and my friend have never been out there, but we always heard of it. We ventured out to see it, and also look for paranormal experiences in the process. As we drive in, there's a herd of deer watching our every move as we get ready to sneak our way over. We start walking down the hill, and then... That had us just jump over a river, then a steep hill to get into that flat field that was once a tailing pond, like I said earlier. We get to the top and right away notice that the moon is lighting up all of our surroundings. We could see a shadow casted from the mountain behind the buildings. So in other words, a dark side and a bright side. The walk was about two football fields away from the start of the field. As we walked over, we watched the floor to watch our step. We walked what felt like 50 yards and my friend tells me, Hold up, we're already here. This spooked us out because it felt like we had teleported right to the base in a matter of a few steps. It was as if once we stepped into the shadow, the distance of walking was extremely tampered and felt unreal. We were looking to communicate with spirits, and we would hear taps on the building that would be a response to our questions. After that, we weren't experiencing too much paranormal stuff, so we decided to leave. As we were walking out back to the steep and long slope, I started to hear an extra footstep behind us, almost as if we were being followed out or even escorted. I told my friend and he heard it too. In my mind, I wanted to debunk it. I wanted to see if it was all imagination. So I stopped on a dot, and sure enough, right behind us, one extra footstep as soon as I stopped. We looked at each other in shock, and I took my friend and said, let's stay calm and just walk out normally. Once we started climbing down the steep hill, it felt as if the presence of something had just left us. And as we were leaving in the car, the same deer herd watched us drive out, and a little farther down, one deer jumped in front of the car, like the last go away from the spirits, if you will. Story number one, my late grandfather sent back to Earth. When I was 16 years old, I got hit by a car. I was an athletic kid and luckily nearly fully developed 260 pounds at six foot two, which likely enabled me to survive the collision. When I say that I got hit by a car, it wasn't one of those common kid jumps out between two parked cars, gets popped by a car going 10 or 15 miles an hour 
scrapes and bruises, etc. The driver of the car ran a red light going 60 miles an hour and hit me in a crosswalk. There are a number of strange things about the incident. I remember every second of it, with two exceptions. I remember seeing the car close enough to touch. I don't remember the impact of the car hitting me, but I do remember every moment after. I can still picture the Subaru logo to this day. Two, the car, a Subaru Outback, was totaled and inoperable from the impact, yet somehow I lived. I was with a number of friends at the time, as we were waiting in the corner for the light to turn so we could cross. I noticed that a friend's shoe was untied. I pointed it out and he stopped to tie it. If he hadn't stopped, he would have been hit instead of me. I'm glad it was me, though, as he would have almost certainly died. Up to this point, I'd imagine you're thinking that this is a pretty wild story, but not necessarily right for this Reddit. The last and strangest thing I experienced that night is why I'm posting here. As I'm laying in the ground bleeding out from a compound fracture in my leg and a cracked skull, I hear a man's voice. A man who's been dead for over 14 years. My grandfather Pop Pop said, Is that Timmy? My grandfather died when I was about three, but I still have tons of memories of him. He and I were best buds, and I know without any doubt that I heard my dead grandfather speak. Almost immediately, the devastating pain I had been feeling evaporated. As I lay there, I can't explain how, but it became clear that I needed to decide what would happen next. I could stay at peace and without any pain with my grandfather, or I could return to the pain and fight. I decided to fight. And the second the decision was final in my mind, the pain returned. I was rushed to the hospital when doctors spent the next 90 days fixing a cracked skull, six broken ribs, and a badly broken leg, not to mention a silly amount of cuts, scrapes, and bruises. I underwent seven surgeries, spent a year in a wheelchair, and had to learn to walk again. It's now 16 years on from that night. I'm 32, married, and have a beautiful four-year-old daughter, and I can't explain how happy I am that I decided to stay. The really surreal thing for me is that I now know unequivocally that there is life after death. I can't wait to see Pop-Pop again, but I have some more work to do here first. I was left with some lasting, let's say, side effects from that visit to the other side, but that's probably a whole thread on its own. Footsteps in the Snow This happened when I was younger, around 8 or 9. I grew up on a reservation in eastern Maine. I lived with my mother and brother, who was younger. We lived in a two-story multi-dwelling unit, or public housing. Vast wooded area was in my backyard, surrounded by deep woods that wouldn't take much to get lost in. But I always enjoyed adventuring, and it was very familiar with the territory. It was late winter with about four to five inches of snow on the ground. I heard knocking on the front and back at the same time around 1 a.m. in the morning. I noticed it first. Then my mother got up and told my brother and I to stay in my room. She called the police and went down the stairs to see if someone was at the door. We kept hearing the knocking, but my mother got closer to the door and it suddenly stopped. No one she could see was visible outside the door and police finally showed up. Lights lit up in front of our place. Neighbors came out to see what was going on, as we had five neighbors in our MDU. All of them said that they didn't hear or see anyone. Police searched around the property to see if anyone was hiding or ran off, but they didn't find anything. The cruiser stayed in our parking lot for a majority of the night in case anyone comes again. Sunrise came, and the officer had left early in the morning. My mother and the next-door neighbor went outside, I assumed, to talk about what had happened. Then she noticed it. The footprints in the snow that went along the building leading to our front door and the back all the way into the forest. But these footprints were strange. It's as if someone was wearing pointed boots. 
men's size between 10 to 12. The prints were inverted as if the toes were facing each other, not at an angle, either directly facing each other in a straight line. The creepiest part about them was the steps of the footprints moved side to side. Toes were inverted and looked as if they jumped like that side to side in a perfect straight line leading into the woods. My mother didn't say anything about it till later on in life when I was older. But I knew that there was something obvious. I know what you're thinking. Maybe someone was playing a prank or faked it. These were other footprints in the snow around the strange ones. But only around the building. I assumed the other footprints were made by the officers due to the fact that they looked normal. But there were no other prints in the snow leading up to the tree line. I followed the prints into the woods. No other markings around them. Perfectly inverted side to side hops or steps in the snow leading deeper and deeper into the forest. I got to the point where an uneasy feeling crept over me, like something was telling me to go back. But I knew where the prints were leading. As I said, I was very familiar with the area. And eventually, it would have led into a marsh or a bog area. I got chilled by the thought that for some reason, it might happen, so I turned back. I never said anything to my mother about it till later on. I never heard or encountered anything like it ever since. Red Glowing Light So I need some help on an incident that took place last night. A little backstory. I've lived in my current home for 10 years. I have had some paranormal experiences throughout that time. It's more of a nuisance than threatening or scary, such as my children's toys turning on, things falling over, footsteps, seeing movement at the corner of my eye. My son's radio on his power wheel was turned on and jamming out one night. I always have to go downstairs to turn whatever it is off. That particular situation after turning off the radio, I heard a woman say, Oh no, which didn't scare me. I never really feel threatened. But more made me laugh and say, Oh yes, it's a school night, party's over. After a few times, I've heard my lab Dane mix Benny whimpering, who after 10 years I lost last February to bone cancer. Well, last night was completely different. I'm a single mom of two children. My son, who's two years old, woke up around midnight after not wanting to go back to bed. I took him into my room so he wouldn't wake my daughter up. He kept sitting up and pointing in different parts of my room while making his excited, ooh, ooh, sound he does when he's trying to show me something important. I was half awake and looked over and saw a small red solid light underneath my desk. It looked like a small red light you'd see from maybe a home security camera. As I tried to focus, it began to fade and I dismissed it as maybe me not being fully awake. Then I kept catching it out of the corner of my eye over the next few hours while trying to get my son back to sleep. But every time I would look in its direction, it seemed to fade into the dark, causing me to question what it was that I was seeing. The final time I saw it, my son sat up, ooing, while pointing at my closet, which is wide open. This time, the red dot of light didn't fade, and it was about four feet off the ground inside the left of my closet. I'm fully focused in and trying to process what I'm seeing. My curtains were closed. There was no reflection or tracer you'd see if it was a laser. After a few seconds of trying to process this, I thought, Oh my god, is that an eye? Even though there was no light to reflect off of it like an animal's eye would. Scared, I turned my phone's flashlight on and then my TV for... I guess my TV just for light, because I was too terrified to move. When I shined the flashlight into my closet, nothing was there. Not the red light. Not an animal, just my clothes. I left the TV on at that point to illuminate the room. My son then went to bed within 10 minutes of that and I stayed up until I literally just passed out, but I never saw the red light again. I talked to my mom this morning and of course she wants me to search my room for cameras, 
since it looked exactly like a red light you'd see on security cameras when they record. The only problem is, that wouldn't explain it moving all around the room. I never saw it move, it would just pop up throughout the room, never higher than two or four feet off the ground. Scary Man in the Picture Two years ago, I took my wife, my father and son, then three years old, to visit family in rural New England, America. They live on a small farm with buildings that date back to the 1700s, which have been restored and modernized, and a guest house, which has been built about 20 years ago. My cousin is a prolific photographer, and my auntie had decorated most of the rooms for the main house and the guest house with her photos. We didn't notice much about the photos in the guest house when we first arrived, probably because we were all just jet-lagged. The next morning, after a sound night's sleep, we were sitting in the main family room eating breakfast and making plans for the day, when I noticed that my son was keeping his head down and not answering my father whenever he spoke to him which was unusual because even at that young age, they were very close. I looked over to my dad and noticed that he was sitting in front of a photo of a room in a rundown house. The room had a large window with sunlight streaming in, casting shadows across the length of the room toward a dark corner. I got an uneasy feeling from the photo, but didn't think much of it. We finished breakfast and we all got up from the table and I noticed my son was walking in a wide arc around the end of the table where my father had been sitting. Again, weird behavior, but I just dismissed it as a weird three-year-old thing. Over the next day or so, I noticed him becoming more and more uneasy any time that we were at the dining room table and doing whatever we could to avoid looking at the photo. I decided to ask him what was wrong, and he answered me very matter-of-factly. The bad man in the picture is looking at me. He's very cold and he's not nice. I looked back at the picture and got instant chills down my spine. There was no man in the picture, but I got the feeling that there was more to it than an empty room. I decided to ask my cousin about the picture. She told me that it was taken at an abandoned farm a bit further upstate. It was one of her favorite pictures, but had always given my aunt the creeps so it was moved to the guest house. Over the next couple of days, whenever I'd ask my son about it, he would say things like, the bad man is looking at me. He doesn't like me. He wants to hurt me. I didn't think much of it until we were going to bed one night and my son tripped and fell, seemingly for no reason in the middle of the hall and started crying hysterically. When I asked him if he was okay, he said the bad man hurt me on the leg. I checked his leg, and sure enough, on the side of his leg there was a large bruise that looked like he'd been struck with a blunt object. I didn't want to play into his fears, but I asked him how the bad man could hurt him if he was in the photo downstairs near the table. His answer was enough for me to pack all of our shit and move to my main house, with my aunt, uncle, cousins, and a big burly housekeeper, right away. He's not down there. He comes up here when we go to bed. We left soon after, so I never found anything out about the farm where the photo was taken, but I'm sure that there is some kind of evil presence around it. I've experienced several different apparitions over the years, but there's one that I think about often. This story goes back a while. I'm 40 now, and this takes place somewhere between the ages of 17 and 20. It was a summer night, and a few of my friends and I were hanging out along with this girl from across the street from my friend's house, who we used to vacation here with during the summer at her grandfather's house. We were hanging out staring at the stars on this large trampoline, talking about our thoughts of life, the universe, and whatever we were thinking at the moment. The girl, who will remain nameless, and I really start to hit it off. We were flirting and I ended up holding hands for a while. When it was time to go, I walked her across the road and we were hanging out in the front yard. Kissing followed and it started getting a little bit more hot and heavy. 
She decides that we go inside to her room, but her mom was sleeping, so we had to be quiet. This house is an old bungalow, so it's small and an odd setup. We open the exterior door that enters into the kitchen, and she sneaks across quick to her room at the opposite side of the kitchen. I step in, close the door, and start across. As I'm walking slowly, I look up toward the living room to make sure her mother isn't watching us sneak in. I freeze. She's looking at me from the doorway and says, Hurry up, what are you doing? With six to eight feet from me, there's an old sofa chair, and I can see an old man sitting in it with his back to me. I, without taking my eyes off of him, say, There's a man sitting in the chair. Her response is, That's not funny, that was my grandfather's chair. I realized he's not moving, and I think he's sleeping, and then it clicks. Was. I slowly look at her and say, I'm not kidding, and he's sitting right there. I'm now pointing and look back, and he's gone. Now I'm freaking out, but trying to keep my composure and stay quiet. I leap from my spot where I was frozen to the floor right into the doorway where she was standing, and we close the door. She's slightly upset and thinks I was messing with her. I assure her that I'm not, but she doesn't believe me, but we eventually start kissing. And again, I try to get back into it, but neither of us can let it go. I keep saying something along the lines of, I can't believe what I just saw. She's on and off being mad, and I would mess with her like that, and it just keeps saying, rather she keeps saying, that's not funny. So as you would think, it didn't go much further, and I ended up leaving for the night. We did hang out again, and we did make out a couple of times while we were partying, but it was never the same, and it went nowhere. She would never talk to me about it, and I think she always had it in her head that I could be just messing with her, or maybe it was just freaky that he appeared to me. Apparently, he died that winter before, so it was soon after. The next winter, my friend calls me. The house is on fire. They were back home in their state for the winter, and the house burned to the ground the year of him dying with no explanation of what started the fire. Possible Paranormal Event Back in 2013, my family and I took a trip to Italy for my aunt's wedding. They had rented this huge, gorgeous Italian villa in Toscano, Villa di Olignano. Olignano, sorry. To be exact, in case anybody wants to find pictures of the location to get a better idea, it's spelled U-L-I-G-N-A-N-O. The room I was staying in was a... Let's try this. Napoleone Giala. Giala? Perhaps. <laughs> the property owner told me Napoleon had stayed there in the 17th century, but I'm not sure if that's bullshit. And I'm not saying in any way I think that this was his spirit, by the way. The room was on the second floor, and there were two floors below us, with the large dining room taking up the first and second floor above the ground floor. Hopefully that provides some idea of the floor plan for the story. Anyways, one of the nights I went to bed pretty normal, like of course we weren't going to sleep around 12 or 1 due to the time zone change coming from the US, but other than that, I never had any issue sleeping. I can't remember what night exactly this was, but it was around halfway through the week-long stay. I had fallen asleep around the previous stated time, and almost as quickly as I fell asleep, I woke up downstairs on one of the small couch-like seats in the bottom floor of the dining room. My body was overcome with chills. I had this feeling of being watched the entire time, and I was just feeling super disoriented, mainly confused as to how I got there, as I've never been sleepwalking or anything like that. The strangest thing to me, however, was my trip back to my room. I had this constant feeling of eyes on me and a sense of being followed, but that wasn't even the strangest to me. As I said before, the dining room took up the first floor and the second floor, the one that I was staying on. 
the second floor of the dining room being a balcony type thing running along the wall, but I wandered the single staircase for what seemed like minutes. I swear I walked up the stairs to the second floor and would just be on a completely different floor. I began to panic a bit, but eventually went up the stairs into my floor and booked it to my room. My phone said it was 4 a.m. I told a few family members the next day, but it was just disregarded. My family telling me that I was probably just tired and sleepwalking and all that, but I'm absolutely certain about what I thought happened truly did. The whole villa was a strange place. One of the side rooms on the ground floor housed a small chapel-like room with a bunch of three, maybe three or four feet tall religious figures and an adjoining room with just a stone table in it. The trip just felt weird after that, and I couldn't have been happier to leave. Two years at a haunted apartment. I moved in with my fiancé when we found out that I was pregnant, around June of 2020. I worked as a baker for a local coffee shop, and often worked 4 a.m. to 12 p.m. shifts. My fiancé worked a lot from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. shifts. I spent a lot of nights alone, and I've always been scared of the dark, but this made it even worse. September 3.45 a.m. My apartment was on the second floor. The building was an old farmhouse that they turned into four small apartments. My fiancé and I were the only ones on the second floor, while two older women occupied downstairs. There was a door to the basement where we did our laundry. Everyone always shut the door, and it was heavy enough that if you didn't prop it open, it would shut anyway. I parked out back, away from the road, so I had to walk past the basement door. The hall lights were off, but I had my phone light, so I didn't mind. When I walked past the door, I noticed that it was about four inches open, I thought it was weird, but also not my problem. Just as I stepped out the back door, I heard the basement door slam shut. I blamed the wind. December 3.45 a.m. The doorbell ring just keep clicking on and off. Full charge. Kept showing me videos of an empty hall. It stopped when I grabbed the doorknob and never did it again. On and off, I noticed small things. Footsteps, soft tapping, things being moved around, lights that were on when I swore up and down that I turned them off. I blamed everything but what I feared. This last experience is the longest. Afterwards, we turned in our 30-day notice. April, sometime in the morning. My son was about a month old. My fiancé had gone back to work and I was enjoying my infant cuddles. I laid him sort of swaddled in his crib while he slept and took a well-deserved shower. The bathroom light flickered and went out while I was in there, but the sunlight from the window was enough to continue. I was almost done and I was rinsing my face with water, and it got so unbearably hot pulled back when I opened my eyes and the shower curtain was completely open and the water was all the way on hot. I started to get scared and I got out of the shower. I wrapped myself in a towel and tried to calm down. Almost instantly, my son started screaming bloody murder. I ran to his bedroom and found his swaddle perfectly open. Not like he had kicked it open, but laying in a perfect square flat in his bed. As soon as I picked him up, all the lights in the apartment went out. None of my neighbors had this problem. I was terrified. I quickly got dressed and got my son in his car seat, went to my mom's till my fiancé was off work. We kept hearing the knocking throughout our 30 days and spent the least amount of time there as possible. I still get anxious when I drive past the old place. terrifying FaceTime experience. So a couple of weeks ago I was on FaceTime, not the same call as the one referenced in the title, with my girlfriend and I had not experience. 
From behind me in my room, I heard an odd noise that sounded as if someone was pressing their hand against the window furthest from me in my room and was moving it from one side to the other. I saw the window at the tail end of the noise, and I didn't really see anything outside of it. I was a little weirded out because, well, you know, but I didn't think much of it. Minutes later, I heard the exact same noise, except this time it was the window right behind me. This time, I was able to see out the window through almost the entire duration of the sound, and I saw nothing whatsoever that could have caused it. I was pretty confused and frightened, but before long, I had forgotten about it. Fast forward a day or two, and I had my second encounter, and this time it was much scarier. Once again, I was on FaceTime with my girlfriend, and this time at around 3 a.m., and I heard a very strange noise. The noise kind of sounded like a combination of a woman screaming, a cat screaming, and a wolf howling. That's extra weird about this noise, is that it sounded as if it was traveling from one end of my house to the other, to my door behind me, coming from the aforementioned window. It's notable that my mother was in my house, though very much asleep, as well as my cat, once again asleep. It's also worthy of note that I live in a more country setting, with my house being in the middle of a ten acres of land, with neighbors quite far away and we don't get wolves here. But I digress. As soon as I heard the noise, my heart dropped and started to tell my girlfriend about it before I could utter any words. She told me to look behind me. I refused, as I assumed that she saw how startled I was and was just probably messing with me. She then told me that there was a face. I once again refused to look. Then she screenshotted the call and sent me the image. I looked and sure enough it was a face. The face looked male, pale, gaunt, and with what looked like three slashes beneath its right eye, bald also. I was in shock. I then looked and nothing was out there. I spent the next hour or so trying to rationalize it. I took, took the image in the exact same spot to see if it was a reflection. It wasn't. I checked if it could have been a person trespassing but the realization that a person would have had to have been extremely tall or maybe had like a, a ladder or something like that, which I would have heard or seen. After quite a bit of time of freaking out, I ended up hearing two extremely loud footfalls right outside my door. It sounded as if someone was trying to get my attention. There were two other people in the house, but I highly doubt it was them, as I likely would have been hearing more than two steps as the floor is quite creaky here. I'm not usually the type to really believe in ghosts or anything like that, but I couldn't rationalize this one. A girl from school is in a cult, and I slept at her place. It was creepy. I'm going to call this girl Lily for now. She was in my class, and I was her only friend. I'm a pagan, and I respect everybody's beliefs. She told me she's Christian, and of course, I didn't have a problem with it, since before I converted, I was Christian too. But at this point, I had no idea that she was in fact a Christian cult that believes that there are a salve to God and to take orders from him. Or, I believe they meant slave. From him, I made some research about this cult and found out that they in fact think God is actively talking to them in their head, and that they are just like robots fulfilling his wishes. Anyways, back to the story. She invited me to her birthday party to sleep over, and she lived about two hours away from me by bus. As soon as I arrived, I already had a weird feeling, but I brushed it off and ignored it. They had a huge Jesus hanging on their walls outside of the house. The statue was about five meters big, and when I entered the house, the first thing I saw was a huge altar, but that didn't bother me since I have an altar too, for my own work. As I said, I'm a pagan and I'm very open to everything. The afternoon went very well. I was talking with their family, which were very nice people, until we started to eat. They started praying to God and I didn't, since I'm not Christian. When they realized I wasn't praying with them, they forced me to do so. 
So I did, since I didn't want to come off as rude, and at this point I was already scared and felt very uncomfortable in this house. We went to bed, and in her room she had a glass wall with a glass door which led to the balcony. I really did try to sleep, but I kept waking up hearing weird noises almost like footsteps on the roof. I went outside the balcony because I thought it was maybe me being stupid, and I looked down and I swear there was something behind the tree. I saw it moving. It was a shadow. At this point, I just wanted to go home, but there were no buses driving at night, so I had to stay there. This night was an absolute nightmare. After ten minutes of staying outside the balcony, I saw her. A witch. Like a pastor outside doing some weird shit. I didn't even know what it was, but as soon as he saw me, he told me to immediately go inside, so I did. Absolutely scared, I drew a protection rune on my arm, which really hurt on my skin. I can still see the injury when I tried to go to bed again. I saw that shadow on the fucking balcony. Lily still asleep. The Das came in the room, and as soon as he entered, the shadow was gone. But he had this weird energy around him. We had this conversation, why I shouldn't go in the balcony. It's cold, it's dark. I should be asleep. It was summer, and it really wasn't cold, though. I stayed awake for the rest of the night after that, and I broke contact with Lily. But since that happened, I keep waking up to scratches on my arm. Sleep per- So back when I was like 16, possibly 15, a friend and I used to mess around with a Ouija board. We are both practicing Wicca, even though we didn't know what the fuck we were doing at all, and we found things like this kind of fun. So she'd come over one night, and when she'd go into the bathroom, and of course a naive young me was still a little bit suspicious of the authenticity of our session, and the thought of her of just moving the planchette. So she decided to play on her own, and when it pulled harder than she'd ever felt and started to spell, she obviously said goodbye and freaked out. Fast forward a while, I had started having sleep paralysis and semi-wake hallucinations of this guy in my room. Now at first, it was kind of how most people describe a shadow person. Just kind of a shape with no detail. But after a while, it began to look more and more like a person. I had done a lot of research into it and I could never really find out what it was because it never really did much, but I knew it was there and I knew it was real. And one night after a particularly bad fight with my family, I went to sleep crying. Immediately when I fell asleep, I got the paralysis and I felt something like holding me from behind. I freaked out and woke myself up and cried some more. It was so weird to me. Now for a long time, I thought I'd make this shit up in my head due to trauma from the abusive family and, you know. That was until Christmas, when I was at my mother's with siblings that now stayed in the room that I'd stayed in, and they began to ask questions about a shadow person or a demon that had been causing him some problems. Now this brother is not a liar. He also really doesn't believe in paranormal things. So when he came to me claiming that something resides in his room, that throws things at him. Scratches him in his sleep. It even knocked over his fish tank. Throws the closet doors off the rails. The little track thingies on a frame. And just causing general chaos, I was quick to think back about my experience with the shadow man. Also to him it looked like a shadow, not the man that I'd seen. It was very tall and had long fingers. No detail again, though. Also, when I say that it looked like a man, I mean that it's kind of like if you outlined a person and pressed fill in with the paint bucket in Photoshop. Like that shadow of a person, but like 3D. I don't know. This probably isn't the best way to describe it. I don't know what it could be. I don't think it's a demon or vengeful spirit because it never did anything crazy like that to me. I'm not sure what it could have been. You guys can think I'm lying or whatever, but 
that this is 100% true, and I didn't even believe it for a long time until my brother brought it up to me. Found a grave with same birthday. Suddenly my car stops working. So my friend and I were driving around, just going wherever. Earlier in the car, she mentioned that it would be fun to watch a movie at the graveyard sometime. Now, hours had passed and the sun had set. She didn't have to be home for a bit, so I asked if we should check out the graveyard nearby. The graveyard was closed, but you could get your car up a little hill and walk around the gate. So we're checking this place out, and it's relatively small. No mausoleums or anything, just graves. I start to read the names on the graves, to maybe pay my respects a bit, and I find this group of graves, all with the same last name, so probably a family. These guys were born in the 1800s, so I was excited. And then I found a guy with the same birthday as me. His death date was in February, but I don't remember the day. kind of wish I did. So fast forward, we get cold and decide to head back home. We get in the car and my steering wheel is so hard to move. I assumed it because we were maybe just in a grassy and muddy area, and I started to slowly back down the hill. The graveyard was directly off a busy road, speed limit around 45. But it was late and there weren't many cars out, so I assumed that I'd be able to back out and just head on my way. Spoiler, nope. I get down the hill, and I'm going to turn around and go forward, but I'm realizing that the gas isn't even working, and I'm in the middle of a lane. I push on my brakes, which are really hard to push on, and stop my car. I'm turning the key, and there's no sound. I'm starting to freak out now. The road's two lanes, so people are passing me, and I have my hazards on, but I don't even know what's going on. P.S. I'm a new driver, and I don't know squat about cars. Eventually, some guy comes around and asks if everything's okay, to which I reply, No, do you guys know about cars? They did, and told me my battery was dead. Looking back, if my battery was dead, the car would sputter. But I was panicking, and it sounded plausible. So they helped me get my car out of the lane and off to the side of the road. I called my dad at this point, and he tells me that the key's out and let everything turn off and start the car again. I do so, and it works like a charm, so I drive home and immediately take my dog and go upstairs. He, my dog, is freaking out for some reason. I hop into bed, and he jumps with me, but the hair on his back is sticking up. He then proceeded to get up and lay down a bunch. Tail between his legs, I calmed him down. I've been informed that my car wasn't working because I forgot to turn on the engine. But I've never only turned on a battery before, and I distinctly remember turning the key while on the road. Maybe it's all coincidence, and I'm just kind of hoping that it is, but I'm still kind of spooked. Was my old house haunted? A few years after my parents split up, when I was very young, my dad moved in with my stepmom. This was previously her grandmother's house. That had been left to her. It was a beautiful house that was right next to a stretch of country fields, and both my younger brothers were born there, and as a family, we all shared many happy memories there. However, as a family, and also with me personally, few experiences make me wonder if the house was haunted. I've always been the sort of person that's felt strange or unwelcome in certain places. An example, I hated visiting an old family friend's house when I was younger. I felt extremely on edge and almost heavy every time we visited. Which I then, several years later, found was previously an execution site where people were hung. Anyway, that could have maybe just been my own paranoia of being in a place that I wasn't too familiar with. In my dad's old house, we had several experiences. I never ever liked going upstairs by myself, even as I got older. It actually got worse. 
I'd always used to make the dog come with me. I also never wanted to be alone in the house, even just in a room alone. I always felt like I was being watched or unsafe. My stepmom told me that when I was a lot older, one night she was woken up by a bang coming from directly below her bedroom. This was the end of the kitchen, which had a door going out into the back garden. Worried about an invasion, she went downstairs and checked the doors. They were all locked from the inside. Then she noticed one of the square decorative shelves on the wall had fallen onto the floor. My parents kept photos of me and my brothers on these. She went over expecting to have to tidy up all the pictures, but they weren't there. They were stacked up neatly on the radiator in a pile. My dad hadn't touched any of them. and They were stacked up way too high for any of us kids to reach. No one else had been in the house. My stepmom told me years later, she always used to smell her grandmother's perfume at the top of the stairs. My dad and stepmom would frequently be watching TV in the evening and an old jewelry box would start playing. I would always feel like I was being watched in my room once it was pitch black before I fell asleep and I felt the pressure of someone sitting on the end of my bed. My dad built me and my brothers a treehouse at the bottom of the garden. My brothers were slightly too young to play in it unaccompanied, so I mainly played in there alone. But I always felt a sense of dread and immediate danger there, like I was being watched. I always used to sprint up the garden like I was being chased and back into the house until I found one of my parents and the dog. My late mom emailed my sister for her birthday. A couple of years back, I met up with my sister for her 35th birthday, and she told me about something very strange that happened that day. She noticed an email in her inbox that appeared to be part of a chain between herself, the Beto Senate campaign, and me. It looked strange, so she opened it, thinking that she had mistakenly forwarded a campaign email to me and that I was now replying to her. Strangely, when she opened the email, there were no messages from me. At the top, sure enough, there was the Beto campaign email. But then below that was this old collection of emails between my sister and my mom from about five and a half years earlier, when my mom was still alive. My sister had been opining at the time that she was almost 30, among other complaints, and my mom was giving her a lot of encouragement and also saying things like, Lie about your age, good old mom. My sister showed me her email on her phone, and I saw exactly what she was talking about with the email chain thing, and I got to look through them a bit. Fortunately, she wouldn't let me read through in detail or forward it to me, because she was too embarrassed about the admissions that she'd been making to my mom so many years before, which I get. But it's too bad. I recently asked her if she could find the emails again, but they seem to have disappeared now, which is also pretty mysterious. At any rate, my sister felt, and also I feel like this was our mom trying to reach out and give my sister this gift for her birthday. I mean, it doesn't seem like a huge thing at first, maybe a glitch, but in addition to the auspicious timing, this is just not how email works. I've never heard of an email glitch like this. Have you ever had a very old email chain show up in your inbox just short of attachment to a new email from a different person for no apparent reason? but it looks at first like it came from yet another person, because I haven't. And the timing of this friendly ghost email isn't just notable because it was her 35th birthday. The other reason has to do with where my mom's ghost might have gotten the idea. Because when my sister told my dad about the emails, he sent her a screen snap of a text conversation that he had been having about my mom only two days earlier, in which he wrote the phrase, why can't we send emails to heaven? I've often heard the idea that spirits are more on a level with electronics and technology, and they can manipulate it more easily than other things. So I just wonder if she got this idea from his text and somehow seized an opportunity. Ever since this happened, I find myself really pondering the nature of the afterlife. 
Is my mom literally always hanging around her family now that she's passed? What's that about? Honestly, it freaks me out a little bit, especially when I'm doing things I don't think she'd approve of. I feel a little weird even writing out this story. Hopefully, she's just around for special occasions and when people talk about missing her. Deceased family member giving me a heads up. I'll start by saying that my mom, grandmother, and I are pretty familiar with the paranormal and that we had our fair share of strange experiences to this day. I've always been someone interested in the paranormal, even though it scares me a bit. I've had many experiences since I was around six or seven years old, but I'll start by sharing with you guys something that happened to me three days ago. Sorry in advance, it'll be a long post, so here it goes. It was last Sunday. I came home from my boyfriend's place at around... 20 hours. I went to my room to sit back and relax and I decided to light a candle for a little bit of ambience. All of a sudden, the candle flame became very tall and agitated, so much so that I checked if I had left my window open. It wasn't. My door was closed as well, so no possibility of a draft affecting the candle. By saying that the flame was tall, I mean a good 15 to 20 centimeters long, very unusual for a rather small candle whose mesh had been trimmed before. The flame flickered and stayed that long for minutes, never returning to its usual length and strength. I then decided to ask questions to see if the candle flame would react, since it had been said to me that when a candle flame does this for a long time, a spirit or a presence is near. I started to ask if anyone was there. The flame flickered a lot. I waited to see if it was a coincidence, but it didn't seem like it. I then had an idea. I have three pendulums that I use for divination, so I took one of the three, went back to the candle, and asked again if anybody was there. The pendulum started moving clockwise, which means yes. I waited for the pendulum to become steady again and proceeded to ask if it was somebody that I knew. There again, the pendulum started moving clockwise, so yes, again. I waited for it to stop moving, and I asked if it was someone of my family, and the answer I got was yes. I then asked if it was there to watch over my family, and it said yes. Finally, I asked if it wanted to continue communicating me, and the pendulum started moving counterclockwise, meaning no. I then thanked it, and I said goodbye. As soon as I said goodbye, the candle flame returned to normal, so burning steadily with a length of two to three centimeters. For a good part of the night, I heard the floorboards just outside my room creaking as if somebody was there. Both my parents and my brother were already asleep, and my dog was in my parents' room. The next day, when I told my parents what happened, my dad was surprised and told me that her dog was pretty agitated for that part of the night which wasn't unusual for her. He said she seemed a bit scared of something. Weird Experience I was around five to seven years old at the time. It was in the summertime, so school was out. I slept in to about 10 or 11 a.m. because I had stayed up from playing video games. I also have to mention that I was home alone. My brother and Ma had gone grocery shopping. I was used to this and I knew what I would do since I was independent even though I was so young. Even though my Ma and brother were out, I had no idea that I was alone. The very first thing on my mind as soon as I woke up was to hop on the game and get ahead. One of our gaming systems was set up in my brother's room, so I walked down the hallway towards his room hoping that he wouldn't be playing on it. Now my brother's room is right next to my ma's room, so you can see a little bit into it if you were sitting in the chair while playing on his gaming system. So as I approached his room, I saw in the corner of my eye my brother appearing in the doorway of my ma's room. I didn't really full-on look at him because I was walking fast and all I had in my mind was wanting to play this game. I just said, Hey, 
Since you're in Ma's room already, I'm going to go play on your gaming console if that's okay with you. He didn't answer, but I just ignored it and got comfortable in the chair and waited for the system to boot up. As I was sitting there, my brother continued to be in the doorway of my Ma's room from the corner of my eye. I finally started getting an uneasy feeling because from the corner of my eyes, my brother just seemed off. His face was covered in a shadow and the whole doorway was also super dark as well. His body was visible though. It was just his face that was shadowed out. I couldn't make out his face at all, so I finally decided to look at him to question what the heck he was doing. When I did, he vanished. I was super confused at first and then yelled out to him. No answer. Then I yelled out to my ma. No answer again. So I yelled out for both of them. No answer. I soon got a super creepy feeling that someone was watching me and I quietly got up from my seat, turned the console off, put away the game, and then walked out of the house. I waited on the porch until my brother and my mom came home. My mom was puzzled why I was on the porch in just my pajamas and I just said something scared me in the house. My mom looked everywhere in the house but there was nothing. I will admit the house did give me the creeps at times. And that's the only moment where I can't fully explain what I experienced. Just wanted to share this because everyone I've told this to finds it interesting that a skeptic like me also might have experienced something. Also, further context of the house. Apparently a little girl had died in that house. There isn't anything about that little boy that maybe possibly passed away in my old house. So I really don't know what I saw. Also, me and my brother's friends would refuse to sleep over at my house because they thought it was super scary at night. But this happened during the day, so I really can't explain it besides my wild imagination of my mind when I was five or seven years old. My dead ex-boyfriend visited in my dreams. I was a mess, wanted to die too, and just full sad that day and night. That's when I dreamt with him the first time. I told him I missed him, and he told me he missed me too. They told me he was pissed because his mom and aunt started giving away his stuff, then told me that he wanted me to keep his drum set. He was a drummer. But I told him I didn't want it. But I could keep a hoodie or something told me that he wanted no one to keep his drums, and I said sorry. I had no space to keep a drum set. Next day I went to his house and his mom told me that she wanted me to keep his drums. Told her the same, grabbed a hoodie, and she told me that he didn't want anybody else to have this, you know? I was weirded out but left. Next day the house was robbed, and they just took the drum set, the PlayStation, and some food. Weird. Then he came back a couple of times just to walk and talk. And one of those times he told me that his mom and aunt were all creepy, logging to his Facebook and MySpace account. And he was pissed again. I laughed and told him, well, maybe it's their way of dealing with all this. He told me he didn't care but wanted me to change the passwords. I laughed again and told him that I wasn't going to do this but insisted and gave me the passwords and told me what the password that he wanted both accounts to have. It was just random numbers and letters. Days passed and I haven't dreamt about him in maybe a week or two. Funny thing is, I remembered the passwords. I'm easily distracted and I forget things in a matter of seconds. So I decided to do it. I changed the passwords to see if, maybe with this, he would come back in my dreams. I logged in and changed the passwords to the random numbers and letters that he provided. And just as I clicked save or whatever, I forgot those passwords. Days later, I went to his house and his mom told me someone changed his passwords. I felt really weird but said nothing. Last dream I had, we were laughing and talking. He told me that he wanted me to come with him somewhere. I guess it was a funeral. I asked who the funeral was for, and he just responded, You'll see. As we arrived, they asked me to come to the coffin, and I went and saw. And as I looked down, I realized it was me. On that exact moment, I woke up and I was really scared. 
I don't remember how many time passed or how much time passed, maybe three or four days, maybe a week. I received a call from this aunt to let me know that his mom committed suicide. I was really sad as she was an awesome person, but she fell in depression. Her mom was recently deceased and now her only son. The Thing with Red Eyes I'm kind of bad at writing, so I apologize in advance. This is also all true. And it might be brutal to narrate. Let's go. So I like to explore abandoned places. Me and my friend were walking through the woods. And we were finding an old mine shaft. It was about 8 p.m. last Saturday. So as we were walking, all the animals would go completely silent randomly. And shortly after, we would find a bunch of flat stones stacked on top of each other, along with branches crackling and rustling in the woods. This happened probably about four times. So further in the woods, it became completely silent and stayed that way. So during this walk, we're looking around when my friend spots these red eyes in the distance. About group height. Whatever that means. We stopped for a bit and just stared at it. We got kind of bored, so we continued on our walk. We soon spotted them again, but this time waist high, so we ignored it and continued on. Once again, we came across the eyes, but this time they were closer and about five feet tall, leaned slightly to the left behind a tree. I should mention that we forgot our flashlights and did this whole thing with the lights on our phones. Our light source didn't really go out that far, but we sat there looking at this thing for what felt like an hour. We could see it blink and look around, but it never moved. Occasionally, we would get the smell of rotted flesh, and at this point, we said, Fuck the mine, we need to leave. I knew there was an old road not far from where we were headed, so we headed towards that. But we came across what I think was a coyote. A big-ass dog-looking thing. So, we debated if we could walk around it, but by the time that we decided and realized it, we had become surrounded. We had six of these animals around us in every direction except directly behind us. In that instant, we looked at each other, pulled out our buck knives, thinking we'd rather die fighting. But the coyotes never approached us. They just stood in front of us. So, he suggested that we would just walk backwards till they left us alone. As we walked backwards, the coyotes followed us. But if we started to go off left or right, they would kind of jump at us. We made it out safely, but looking back now, it's been almost a week since this happened. I kind of feel like coyotes were guiding us to safety from whatever thing was there with the red eyes. But I'm no quitter. Me and my friend will be going back to those woods again as soon as I get a weekend off. I need to know what those red eyes were. And I really want to explore that mine. That was written perfectly fine. It wasn't a forest fire. This event occurred back in 2001. I want to say as I was still in college at NMSU at that time. It was fall and me and three other friends decided to take a camping trip up to Gila National Forest. There was snow on the ground at our campsite, so it must have been mid to late fall. Anyway, we decided to take a day trip to go to a remote lake. That I know was a very picturesque and serene place. It took a while to get up there, but once we were there it was great until the storm came. It seemed like it came out of nowhere, and it was on top of us in a ridiculously short time. We didn't even make it back to my jeep before sleet was pelting us. Once we were in the jeep, we figured we'd be better back at the campsite, so we headed back down the winding trail, in four low, mind you, because by now the ground was beginning to freeze over. 
while we were driving through the forest trail on an iced road, tons of animals started running out across the path from left to right. And in that direction only, there were deer, elk, raccoons, rabbits, skunk. But that was weird in itself. But when we got to the small one-road town between the mountain and our campsite, we saw something weirder. Six black military-style vehicles with tarp-like coverings on the cargo areas were all driving in a convoy back up towards where we had just come from. No idea what they were doing going back up to that remote, stormy location. We finally arrived back at our campsite, and we immediately noticed a huge orange glow on the horizon. Just over the area of the lake that we were at, it looked like a forest fire, except it didn't taper off at the ends like a firewood, and it vanished after about two hours. Forest fires do not do that. So, what the heck? After the weird fire-looking light disappeared, we started seeing long white streaks in the sky above us that would disappear and reappear in counts of three, four, two, and five and alternate. This freaked out the two guys to the point that they retired to the tent, but me and the other dudes stayed up staring at these white light streaks for some time before they vanished into the night. Needless to say, we were more than eager to pack up and head back home in the morning. One last curious thing is that we stopped at a cafe on the way back to civilization to gas up and use the restroom. Outside the cafe were copies of the daily newspaper that read, Solar Flares Seen in Night Sky. Really, I'm no expert, but I don't think our encounter that night was very indicative of solar flares. The Hat Man visited me in 2013. This story happened about eight years ago, and it still pops into my head from time to time, so I thought I'd share it here. If you've experienced anything similar to what I'm about to tell you, please let me know. So, it was around 2013, and little 12-year-old me was laying in bed. It was probably around 10 p.m., I'm assuming that, because that's usually when I went to sleep. I was laying on my side facing a wall, and I heard what sounded fairly close to me like walking. Thought nothing of it because I thought that maybe it was just my sister or something going to go use the bathroom. From what I can remember, the walking was very slow-paced, which I thought was kind of weird. The walking then stopped, but I didn't hear the door open for the bathroom, and I know that I'd have heard it knock because it's just across from my bedroom. After a while of facing the wall, I decided to turn on to my other side, which would have meant that I'd now be facing an open room. When I flipped over, I gasped and froze. I couldn't move at all, and I was holding my breath. I will never forget what I saw. It was a tall man dressed in a long black cloak with a big hat on. The man was very tall, and I know this may sound odd, but he was darker than pitch black darkness that swallowed my room. He was standing in the farthest corner in my room just staring at me. He didn't move whatsoever and neither did I. I don't know how long I was frozen staring at him holding my breath for. It could have been a minute but it felt like forever. I can't describe the terror that came over me when I saw him standing there. I can't even remember what I was thinking at the time. Then I woke up in the morning don't even remember falling asleep or exhaling. I just woke up. Now, some of you may be thinking, that was all probably a dream, maybe even sleep paralysis. I would think that too, had it not been for the two large footprints in the carpet right where I saw him standing the night before. I did take a picture of the footprints, but sadly the picture's gone. I've looked for it everywhere and I just can't find it, so you'll just have to take my word for it. I told my sister about what I'd experienced the next morning, and she said, Have you ever heard of the Hat Man? I said no, and she explained to me who he was. After researching a bit, I found that there are a few people who've also seen this man, and they also say that he doesn't do anything but stare at them. 
It's been eight years and I haven't seen him since. Maybe it was all my imagination, but it felt so real. I refused to sleep in that room for years after that because I was afraid I'd see him again. Luckily, I never did, and I hope I never do. Floating Spectre on my local park. Interested in what you people think. I live in a relatively rural town in the UK, so it isn't considered too unnatural to go out late at night and walk around the area as a teen. When I was 16, I began struggling with a rough bout of depression, meaning I often couldn't sleep at night. Therefore, a late night walk to clear my head was a common activity of mine. I did this often, and despite the occasional drunk stumbling home from town or a rambling junkie, I never experienced anything that put me off or going on walks. This was until I experienced one of the very completely unexplainable moments in my life. One evening, I was laid in bed watching YouTube, and as usual, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to do a quick walk around the block. It was late spring, so I wasn't apprehensive about any bad weather. I planned to walk around the area and finish the walk by going through the park at the top of the street. For context, the park has an alley-like entrance at the top of my street, and then another entrance on the other side that connects to the main road. I did my usual walk through the suburbs. Nothing unusual happened, of course. And as usual, I ended up at this top entrance by the main road. I walked down the path at the road side entrance, opening out to the park's big field. The park was completely pitch black. The only light was sort of from the entrance of the alleyway, up at the top of the park. As I looked across the park toward the alleyway, I noticed underneath the lamplight stood a thin black silhouette, moving side to side in an unnatural floating, swaying motion. I stood there frozen in absolute terror, and anyone who's ever felt that type of impending danger or fear will know the paralyzing feeling you get in that situation. Focusing my eyes on it, I noticed it slowly sloping toward me, still doing this floaty swaying motion. The only thing I can compare the movement to is the scene in that first Harry Potter movie, in which Harry encounters a hooded figure drinking unicorn's blood that almost slinks towards him like a snake. I must have stared at it for ten minutes, unable to move before I got the courage to slowly back out of the park all the while not breaking eye contact, mind you. I then decided to take a lit up the suburb or the suburbs route home. I now go to university in Liverpool, yet when I come home for summer, I never go on late night walks anymore. But I am interested in what people could think it could have been, as I've never seen anything like it since. I'm completely against the idea of it being a person at all, as the motion simply wasn't human. Whether it was an animal casting a strange shadow under the light, or maybe even the shadow of a bush of maybe discarded trash, this moment still creeps me out to this day. Something was there in my room that night. So it happened a few years ago. Sometime in winter in 2016, I randomly woke up in the middle of the night and the first thing I noticed was how dark my room was. It was supposed to be dark as I had all the lights off and the windows closed, but you know, a little tiny bit of light from the outside street always finds a way to enter from the edges of the closed windows. Like you can barely distinguish the pitch black from the slight aura, right? But there was none of it. It was pitch black all around. I thought it was probably a power cut, and I started to think random stuff like, probably this is what blind people see. All their life must be sad. And slowly drifting back into sleep, when I was suddenly reawoken by a feeling of my bed shaking, I thought I'd fallen asleep and this is one of those sleep jerks that happen when you fall in your dream. But then more stuff started to happen. Soon after the first shake, there was a second one which I felt much more clearly. A big rat had been invading our kitchen for a while, and I thought maybe it had sneaked into my room. But how can a rat shake my bed? 
Then, a few seconds later, I felt a literal punch under my bed, as if someone punched the underside of my bed, like right under where I am. I felt my bed bump up right around my back. Oddly enough, instead of freaking out, I became extremely calm for some reason. And oddly enough, again, I started to think of a logical reason. My mom made me check underneath the bed before sleeping. And as she thought some thief might have sneaked into our home, she overthinks. I thought maybe someone actually sneaked in this time. But why will he disturb me instead of, you know... And I felt another two consecutive punches from under me as I'm thinking. I froze for a solid minute, finally realizing things might be abnormal here. Maybe I'm bragging, but after freezing initially, I went weirdly calm again, almost as if my brain went, Oh no, it's a ghost anyway. Then was a final punch, followed by the bed shaking. I remember as the bed was shaking that I got up almost subconsciously walked straight to the light switch on the other side of the room and turned on the lights. Nothing out of the ordinary. I looked under my bed with the flashlight. Also nothing. I should have freaked out here, but I didn't, which is odd for someone like me who gets nervous and shaky from even the simplest of social situations. My body worked almost like its own here. I turned the lights off, took the flashlight with me to the bed, and fell asleep as soon as I hit the bed. And then it was morning. Nothing ever happened after that. Shadow people in my office. I work in an extremely old building. My office is just like a small resource room that's inside the library. The first incident took place a little over a month ago. We were going through a grieving period on campus and while I had no connection to who had passed, I couldn't help but wonder if it perhaps was them. I was sitting in my office with the lights dimmed, as I usually work better that way. I was so focused on my laptop that when I took a moment to write down some notes, I looked back up and I saw what appeared to be a tall, slouchy figure behind me for a second. And then it suddenly took off. I was so scared and caught off guard because I could see the shadow reflecting on my wall. My desk faces it. I followed it with my eyes as I saw the shadow slowly move on the wall. However, I was too scared to turn around, and I remained in my seat for a moment before I gathered the courage to get my things and leave. I'll never forget that feeling. It was as if my blood had run cold and my breath was caught in my throat. I felt frozen and scared to death. The second instance was right before we left for Christmas break. The same scenario again, where the lights were dimmed and I was heavily focused. Except this time I didn't feel scared. I looked for my laptop at the wall in front of me for a brief second, and I saw the shadow walk slowly right behind me. It felt different somehow. The energy didn't feel threatening, but just calm. Something overcame me, and I simply laughed and said something along the lines of, Hello there, want some peppermint candy? And as soon as I said that, it went away. I don't know why I chose to speak to it. It just kind of came out without me thinking. I truly don't know if it was the same entity as the first, but strange nonetheless. The very same day, my sister said she also saw something later that afternoon as she works during the evenings. She and her co-worker were needing a pair of sticky notes, and as my sister sat in one of the chairs of my room, which faces directly the door, she looked up from her phone briefly and saw what she describes to be a tall shadow figure zooming past my door. She thought it was a student at first, but realized that it couldn't have been that, since they had already been dismissed. The lights in the library were off, and the only light shining was from my office but she claims to have seen it clear as day. Freaked her out, but nothing really new to her, since she tends to see a lot of shadow people. Anyway, I just felt like sharing this because I've never experienced something like this before, and if anyone had any thoughts as to what this could be, I would definitely appreciate it.
voodoo curse. My grandma is from Olancho, Honduras. In those times, the only way to reach her area was through plane because there were no roads and it was very unsafe to travel on car. At the time, my grandma was fighting for my grandfather's love with another woman. Of course, my grandmother won and had four kids and many grandchildren. Fast forward and I'm 14 years old staying at my grandmother's apartment. The reason behind that we were going to drive to Florida. It was going to be me, my little brother, my mother, my aunt, and her friend. But I was staying at my grandmother's until we left in the morning. I was sleeping in the living room and I had to pee so I put my pants on. With that mission accomplished, I looked for the light switch on the exit door of the apartment. For some reason, I couldn't see even though it wasn't really dark at all. The living room was just dimly lit. You could see everything in perfect clarity. For some reason, there was no switch, so I turned my head towards the left, where there was a hallway toward the bathroom. I walk toward the switch, but before I do, I see a black figure. Not a shadow, but a completely black hooded figure, just standing there. I was thinking that my eyes were adjusting after just waking up, so I walked toward the switch, but as soon as I did, the figure walked towards me. I got scared and walked faster toward the switch, and the figure began to walk faster as well. I thought that if I turned on the switch, it would go away. I get to the switch and turn it on. The figure was in my face for a split second after turning on the lights. I didn't say anything to anyone because I knew nobody would believe me. Fast forward to the next day on the road to Florida. We all heard albums, told stories, and one story my aunt said revealed everything. Apparently, she met with a palm reader from El Salvador. She said that the palm reader told her fortune and future, and something from our family's past. Apparently, when my grandmother was fighting with one of the other women to win my grandfather's love, the other woman went to her mother who happens to be a voodoo priestess, and put a curse on my family. She went on to repeat what the woman told her about the curse. Your family will be haunted by a voodoo god. It's a black figure, no face. Will not harm you, but it will let you know it's there. I said fucking bullshit. Tell me you're lying. Say you're fucking lying. I then told them what I had seen the night before. The rest of the drive was quiet after that. A couple years after my brother saw the figure on my bed. But I'll tell you that story tomorrow if anyone's interested. I think I have a Civil War soldier protecting me started a few months ago. I want to say November, but I'm not sure. I'm a theater student at a, at a pretty small school in a smaller town, but it has a lot of history. Most notably, the college I go to is very old, and it used to be used as a Civil War hospital way back in the day, but that's beside the point. In November, my teacher had the idea to make some monologues based on some of the people who have passed in her small town. The role I was given was a soldier, a confederate. His name was Abraham Jurganus. The monologue was that a friend of mine and we were playing these characters in a funny way. Abraham was mad that he didn't die in battle, and he was complaining about it. Him and several others died of smallpox. It was funny, but never sat right with me. That wasn't the weird part, though. One day, me and my girlfriend were bored and decided to go to the graveyard to find Abraham's grave, figure out more about him, and do some field research for the show. We get there, and we go over to where the Civil War graves are, and I found him. His grave was renovated and looked considerably nicer than the others. I found out that he was a private, which meant that he was no older than me, maybe even just as old as I am, 19 but I also realized that he died on Christmas Day, which is awful. But I kneeled down to put some flowers down and just said something like, I respect you even though I'm playing you in a humor-like tone. I did it because, well, why not? And ever since that day, strange things have been happening. 
The first time I knew something was off was when I was driving with my girlfriend. It was late and we were just driving and talking. But I make a turn and I see a man standing in the middle of the road. He was black as in his whole body was black, like a shadow man. I looked at him, blinked, and he was gone. And I knew it was Abraham, like I sensed his presence. But the strange part is that my girlfriend bursted into tears out of nowhere. She said that it was an overwhelming feeling. She just felt so upset and hurt, and it's gotten even bigger from there. Now the weird part is that he's not hurting me, and whenever I see him I don't feel scared or in any danger, I feel safe and calm, like he's my protector. And another thing is that our college is notoriously haunted, but all the spirits I've seen have been white, like a standard spirit, but Abraham is black. I just wanted to share this and get other opinions. Again, I can't stress this enough that he doesn't want to hurt me, or it doesn't feel like he wants to. I just want to know, like, why is he even here, I guess? I heard a voice, but nobody was there. So this was about four or five years ago. Not too sure about the dates, but here's what happened. I went away for my parents' friend's birthday. We went to a place in Italy. I can't remember the location, but we all slept in this old cottage and the owner lived next door. Everything was okay for a day and then weird things started happening. Like I'd go to sleep, I'd close the bathroom door and then I'd wake up and it would be slightly open with the light on. It was just small stuff like that. Anyways, let's get to the day where it gets even weirder. So everything was going good this one particular day. Small things were happening in my bedroom, but I thought nothing of it. We went out for the day and came back, ate, then chilled. Fast forward to the night. I did what I did every night. I went to sleep. I closed the bathroom door and turned the light off and then fell asleep. Next thing I know, I wake up and I heard a little girl's voice saying, Help me. I tried getting back to sleep, but I noticed that the bathroom door was open slightly and the light was on. I left it like that and I went back to sleep. I woke up again to the same voice saying, help me please. She sounded young, like seven years old, maybe eight. I stayed away as I couldn't get back to sleep and I was genuinely terrified. I managed to entertain myself when I heard the voice shout, Bree, continuously. I tried getting back to sleep, but I couldn't. And this all continued to happen and it was like 5 a.m. before I shouted for my dad told him everything that's happened and he said nobody was in the room and nobody heard anything. Let me help you sort of picture how the room was laid out. The door was on the far left side of the room and the bed was placed in the middle between the side table and the door. The bathroom door was on the right side of my room and on the wall next to me if that makes sense. Anyways as the day went on and I was more and more scared and didn't want to stay in the room so later on that day, the owner of the cottage's grandson came to visit, and they had a swing outside in the front, so me and the boy decided to go swing and talk. I mentioned what happened, and he said that he stopped in the cottage once he heard his name being called, and the same situation happened to him. The rest of the time that we were at the cottage, I kept away from that room, and nothing more happened. I haven't been back since. And now I'd love to, as I'm fascinated with the paranormal. Also, just so nobody can say, it was probably someone playing a prank on me. It was confirmed by the owner that there's a little girl ghost in the room that I slept in, who says people's name. But also, apparently, she's completely harmless. Getting freaky under a blood moon would not recommend. So this happened about five years ago and it hasn't left my mind since. It never occurred to me to post anything about it because I thought people would think I'm insane, but here we go. So me and my girlfriend at the time were having a bit of a stale point in our relationship. 
We thought we would do something to spice it up, so we decided to go to a large, stately home turned to museum near where I lived. Just to give you an idea of where the area looked like before I go any further, it was a huge three-story house that a duke or a lord would have lived in. And opposite it, there was a large path with trees along the side of the path, a field on the other side, and a forest at the end of the path. So, me and my girlfriend, who I'm going to be referring to as C for the rest of this, walked down the path to find a nice quiet spot. Now take into account, this was at around 11 or 12 p.m., so it's pitch black. I believe they mean 11 p.m. or 12 a.m., so it's pitch black other than the reddish moon in the sky. So we put down a blanket and start to talk. As soon as, as, soon as things start getting a little bit frisky, I hear something coming from the end of the path that sounds like a town crier's bell. I sit up, confused, as it seems to be coming towards us, but there's nothing there. There was a bush next to me, and as soon as I sat up, it was like something big moved in it. So I jumped up and went to fight mode, hearing what sounds like multiple voices in the bush, the bell still going off. When I jump up, I looked around to see if I could see anything. And this was where things got real weird. Being able to see the field in between the trees, there were figures standing in the field. Spaced out, but they were wearing what looked like black KKK uniforms. And they didn't look real. And the way that they didn't look solid, looking at them was like looking at liquid. They seemed to phase in and out. It's very difficult to describe it. At this point, I grab C up from the floor and I say, We need to go now. And we start to make our way out of the field. While we're walking, I look to my right and see a circle of those people just standing in our direction and start to hear a real heavy footstep coming from behind us. We start to run and it's like something grabbed C's bag. There's no bushes or trees for at least 30 feet, so it wasn't that. But we get out and we look back and it's like it was slashed with a knife right through the strap. It wasn't like the clip had broken, it was straight through. Story number 15. Tapping three times. Me and my partner have been experiencing some paranormal activity over the three years that we've been together. We're currently living in a new flat, so no one lived here before my partner, as it's his flat, and I'm sort of living between his and my parents. At the beginning, our experiences just started out with the kettle turning on and off, so we thought it might have just been faulty, and we bought another one to find out that it does the same as it had done before. After that, it progressed into objects moving around and finding themselves in places that we know are definitely not where we put them. For example, finding keys in a sock drawer or something silly like that, and even things that have been thrown at us from the wardrobe and onto the floor in the early hours of the morning, which is the worst. Gets it really gets my adrenaline going. A few moments back, I bought an EMF detector and began working with it. Of course, it goes off quite a lot to the yellow and red zones for a few minutes. And then, it'll be it for about around an hour. I wrote this section, but just to give the range of what the spirit can do so you guys can give me some information, hopefully. This month, it's decided, nah, I'm a proper shake things up and it started tapping under the bed three times every night, and it waits for you to just about fall asleep, and then you hear the tap, 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 and it wakes you straight up with the vibrations of the taps on the mattress, and you can also hear a lot of rustling in the corridors at night. I went home the other day to my bedroom at my parents, which is miles away from my partner's. I has a bunk bed from when I was younger, but without the bottom bunk and the desk instead. So there I was at 3.30ish in the morning, cuddling my cat in bed, going to sleep, and tap, tap, tap. And this time I shot straight up because my brain, I was processing the fact that I'm in a different household, and it was literally following me home to tap at me. 
and it was much louder than at my boyfriend's flat, which honestly really shook me up, as it was the last thing I expected when nothing had happened like this before. Last night I was super tired and I fell asleep really quick, and it banged on the mattress this time until I woke up. And to be honest, I'm getting a little bit frustrated as I don't sleep much anymore and I'm running out of ideas as to what's going on and how to stop this development from coming into something more. When I tell it to stop, the EMF detector goes wild. So I'm assuming that's a no. Any ideas on how to get this thing to stop doing these things? I don't mind it living here. I just sort of want it to slow down and I kind of want to sleep. My Nan's Last Bathroom Break In December of 2018, I got a message from my stepdad that my nan had been taken to a hospital with pneumonia. The second I read the message, I called him to ask what was going on, and he told me that she'd been a few days and she wasn't doing too good. I immediately got myself showered and dressed and then went straight to the hospital to see her. When I got to the hospital, I went straight up to her room and saw her lay there, and it broke me more than I've ever been broken before. She looked terrible, thin, weak, barely holding on. I broke down and I just had to leave the room as she was still somewhat conscious of what was going on. She even thought that she was going home that day. My mom and stepdad were just looking after her and trying to do what they could do to help her. I spent a few hours there talking to her, but she couldn't even really respond back. But I have a couple things that she did say, that she needed the toilet, and of course she could go to the toilet when she liked, given the situation. I head home later on and head to bed. I wake up the next morning and I tell my parents that I'll take over watching her so that they can go home and sleep. I don't remember what time I get there, but my uncle's there, and it's late at night, something like 10 p.m., and he stays and chats for a bit, then leaves. I thought at least... After he leaves, I just look at my nan and I wish, man, I wish I could talk to her and just tell her the things that I wanted her to know. Not sure if she could even hear me if I tell her anyway. I turn away briefly and check my phone and there's something missing in the room. I don't hear my nan's breathing anymore. I start crying again. I love my nan greatly and I wait till she passes on, call my uncle and tell him. He comes back because he's not too far away. And he'd not left long. It had only been like an hour since I saw him last. And by this point, we told the nurse. And she says that we have to wait as the doctor was busy. A bit of time passes by, and the doctor comes in to declare her death, etc. And we went, and we were told to wait outside the room, so we leave and wait. While waiting, I'm talking to my uncle and partner. My partner's been with me the whole time and we see someone walk by us and head to the toilet outside my nan's room. They close the door and the light comes on. A few minutes go by and the door is open slightly and no one comes out, and the light goes out. I go to check and, well, there was no one there. We all look at each other confused as hell as we all saw the exact same thing. So my nan decided she needed the toilet before going on to whatever awaited her next. The Little Girl I spent most of my childhood in a small town in Pennsylvania, a childhood home that's been long since feeling like a fever dream to me. For as long as I can remember, my family will tell me stories about how a little girl would frequent the halls of my grandfather's home. He would see her peeking around the corner every now and then and hear her footsteps and hear her giggling from time to time. He was even seen f with floating objects from time to time as well. I'd spend most of my summers at his place and would go back home after some time there. One night I woke up, sleeping at the foot of my parents' bed, and I saw a little girl dancing in front of me, spinning in circles with a dress and I couldn't see the color of because it was see-through. 
I hopped on my parents' bed and hugged my dad while I cried myself silently back to sleep. One night I woke up in my room and I was sleeping on the top bunk, and for some reason I was searching for my sister. I hopped down and looked under the bunk and didn't see anybody there. Mind you, everybody in the house is fast asleep. I look down the stairs and there's only one light on down there, which leads to our dining room. I then see a little girl walk from right to left, past the bottom of the stairs into the dining room. I thought, oh, I found my sister. Let me see what she's doing. I walked down the stairs and into the dining room and there was nobody there. The kitchen was dark, the laundry room was empty, and the back door was locked. I then went back up the stairs and seen my sister was fast asleep in the bottom bunk the whole time. There's no way she would have walked past me without me knowing. That house was always strange to me, because I'd see her from time to time, along with a very tall man who would walk her hallways also. My older sister will also talk about how she'd see the little girl on different occasions, hear her giggles, and see her footprints in the carpet throughout the house. Anyways, my grandfather passed not too long ago. My uncle says that the little girl has been moving through his house. He lived with my grandpa, as if she's looking for something, hearing noises and movements way more frequently than normal. My grandfather passed away in the hospital, and I believe that she's upset that she hasn't seen him again, or that he may never even come home. She's never given us the energy that she's an evil spirit. Maybe she's just a lost soul that enjoys her company. I had a dream about my grandpa. He was with family that passed away a long, long time ago, so I know he crossed over. Rest in peace, Grandpa. I love you. Icky feelings and one weird experience in an old townhouse. Before my husband and I got married, we rented a tiny townhouse built around the 70s. This was around 2010. My husband is the definition of a skeptic and always worked overnight in the hospital. So he can't and would never back me up on this. But when I think about it, I still get creeped out. So the townhouse has a downstairs with a kitchen and a living room, with stairs straight off the front door that led to the two rooms upstairs. Everything was very open, and you could spin around in the living room and see almost every corner. From the moment we signed the lease, I got a bad feeling emanating from the top of the stairs, which shared a corner with the door to the spare bedroom. A friend came to visit once and refused to enter the house. After driving 30 minutes to see me, immediately, quote-unquote, feeling something peeking out at her from the spare room. She was pretty woo-woo, quote-unquote, and said that it was evil. I laughed it off, but can't deny my own icky feelings about that room and the top of the stairs. If I tried to watch TV in the living room, I could often feel someone looking at me from the stairs. I would run up them and across the hall to our room at night when we went to bed. One last very weird feature of the townhouse was that there was a cutout ledge of the bedroom wall. And you guessed it, it opened straight to the view of that icky spot on the stairs. And you could look down into the living room and the front door from there. So, here's the experience. I was asleep one night, and I woke to a super bright quick flash of light from our closet thought it was a power surge and I expected the closet bulb to be burnt out, but then it turned on by itself at regular brightness. At that point I was scared. I decided to get up and just turn it off, ignore it, and go back to sleep. I was trying hard not to look out of the ledge, but I could feel that something was coming from the stairs. As I started to gather myself and sit up, I hear a click and downstairs the TV turns on. My heart was pounding, but I just froze. The volume starts increasing on the TV like someone's holding the button down. In a few seconds, it was blaring loud. I just speed walked to flip off the closet light, down the hall, down the stairs, and grabbed the remote to turn it off. Turned around and ran as fast as I could back to bed. Nothing I can think of explains it. 
Nothing else that dramatic ever happened there again. But I did often feel the bed compress, like someone sat on it. And I haven't had that feeling anywhere else that I've ever slept. A woman's voice tried to lure my brother and I toward it. This happened around 20 or 25 years ago. I don't remember the exact year. I must have been around 10 or 13 years old and my older brother is two years older than me. When I was a kid, every year for Easter, school holidays, my family would go out camping on some land that my grandparents owned. The best thing about it was having somewhere to legally ride our motorbikes. My older brother and I would often jump on our bikes and head off riding around the property together, racing and making up silly games. One year we were both out riding, but had gone our separate ways, so at this time I was on my own with no one else anywhere in sight. Suddenly I heard a voice say my name. I heard it clearly over the sound of the two-stroke bike engine, and it didn't sound muffled through my helmet. It sounded more like it was being spoken directly into my ear or as if I had a headphone or an earbud in my ear. At first, I disregarded it. I thought maybe it was some strange interaction of the exhaust sound, the ear cavity of the helmet and the wind blowing across the helmet visor, basically some kind of auditory illusion. But I heard it again and again, the woman's voice calmly saying my name as if to get my attention. It would occur when I was riding in one small area and nowhere else, say the area was a radius of 50 meters to 75 meters and it was an area that we had to pass through to get to camp from the motorbike trails and back. The voice persisted for days in the same spot and it increased its vocabulary. It would sometimes say my name and it would sometimes say come home and it would sometimes say come to me with my name in there too. It started to creep me out and I would feel anxious when approaching the area where it would happen. After a few days and me not saying anything about it to anyone, I was out riding with my brother and he signaled me to stop and pulled up right in the middle of the area I had been hearing the voice. He turned his bike off and removed his helmet, so I did the same. We then had a short conversation where he asked if I had been hearing anything weird and if so, what? I told him I had been hearing a voice. He went pale. I described the voice and he said that it had matched what he was hearing. I asked what the voice was saying to him and he told me that he would say his name and tell him to come to it. We rode back and forth and told her parents. Dad came out riding in the area with us. He didn't hear anything. and We didn't hear anything while he was there either. We kept hearing the voice over the next few days, always saying the same things. I remember this happening just one year, but I brought it up with my brother recently and he seems to think that it also happened in the same place the following year. Ask Reddit. My stepmom had a dog, a bison cocker spaniel, so fairly small. That kind of became my dog after my parents got married. My first ever dog I lived with was him, and I knew that he loved me. A couple of times in the four or five years that he was in my life, I'd saved him from some large dog attacks while on walks and saved him from drowning and I think he quickly realized that I would do anything for him to protect him. The house my parents bought and moved into has a basement, like most do, and this house is fairly new, like a decade or so. So it's not like a super creepy basement, dark and dingy, stuff like that. Before I moved out of my room, it was in the basement, in the corner where you could see the whole space and stairs from the doorway. There always felt like there was something in the corner of that basement, and every now and again my mind would see some sort of four-legged threatening creature that would growl towards me, and something would just come at me. Usually the dog would be asleep with my parents in their room upstairs, but he started a new habit in this house of before going to bed, he would take a trip downstairs, kind of say goodnight to me, make a round in the open space, and then go back upstairs. Kind of odd, but the space always felt clearer after he did that. It was a habit that he didn't do before living in this house, but 
but he never missed a night of it, even after we moved out. One very sad day, poor little guy died of cancer that came from nowhere and spread through him like wildfire. He was cremated and the ashes were spread all down by the river, the dog park that he loved. Even though I don't live there anymore, I of course could go to visit, and the basement has mostly been turned into an entertainment center, so we do spend a decent amount of time down there. I still get that feeling that the creature is there and watches us. One night, however, as I was leaving the entertainment area to go upstairs, I felt the presence of this thing again. Couldn't make myself turn around, so I kept walking, but a little bit faster. I swear, out of the corner of my eye, a little white dog rushed from my side to behind me. On the bottom step, I turned around and I swear I could see her dog sitting confidently, staring in the direction of the creature. He looked to me for a moment, and his face told me, You had me. Now I have you. He got up and walked around the corner, out of view. The feeling of the creature was gone. Never felt it again. But every once in a while... I can sense my little man making his rounds. On the night shift. So I used to work as a security officer. I was asked to work on a Saturday night shift at an old warehouse in Dudley. I turned up at 5 p.m. where the building was a huge brick warehouse with some makeshift offices at the front. I walked in, took the keys from the day officer, and locked the doors behind him. Everything seemed normal for a while. It was a bit creepy as the building was so old. But I was used to that. Around 1 a.m. I got a call from the warehouse manager. One of his night drivers had forgotten his paperwork and asked me to go into the office right at the back of the warehouse, and collect it for him so that way he could pick it up. I said fine and headed to the office. The warehouse was pitch black. I had a small torch, but only slightly lighting my way. I walked through until I got to the office door, which was a huge metal sliding door. It made a screeching noise as I pulled it open. As I walked in, in front of me was the office's fax machine, which was blinking and the paperwork was printing out. I grabbed the paperwork, but as I turned around, I looked to the other end of the office and saw what I can only describe as a dark figure hunched over, shivering. I could hear what sounded like breathing, but like if you were freezing cold. I stood there for about 30 seconds motionless, staring at this figure. I turned back slowly and closed the door behind me, rushing back to the front office where I locked the door and waited for the driver. An hour later, the driver collected his paperwork, and for the rest of the night, I'd convinced myself it was just the dark playing tricks on me, but didn't stop me from unlocking the office door or checking the cameras every few seconds. 5 a.m. turned up, and I got a knock on the door from the day officer. I handed him the keys, expecting him to come in, but he locked the door from the outside. I asked him if he was going in. He said he doesn't go inside when there's nobody else in, but sits in his car in the car park and waits. I said, that's a bit strange. He looked at me and asked if I went anywhere else other than the security office. I told him that I went to the back office to get paperwork for a driver, not telling him about the other part. I never forget the look he gave me or what he said then. He looked me in the eyes and said, well... You know why I don't go in there alone, then. It gave me the chills, but I shrugged it off and just said, Okay, then, and left for home. Safe to say on the way home, I called my office and requested not to go back there. What my father saw made me a believer in the paranormal. My father's a policeman, a no-nonsense guy who lives very much in the here and now and believes only in what he can see and feel or hear himself. At the time of this story, he was in the police force for more than 20 years and I was a teenager. My father worked night shifts and on a regular basis he would come home early in the morning to have breakfast with us, 
before he would go to bed and he would go to school or we would go to school. <laughs> He's in the police. He would usually be in a pretty good mood and tell us funny or interesting stories from his day or night at work. At this morning, he was unusually silent and he didn't eat either. My mom asked if he felt all right. It took a while to actually get an answer, but he said, I'm not sure what I experienced tonight. He didn't want to say any more in front of us kids, but we prodded him enough and long enough until he told us the following. It had been quite a night, and he was out with his colleague in a police car. At some point, they were informed over the radio that a car chase was going on not far from them, and their assistance was required. They drove off toward the chase and soon caught up with the suspect's vehicle. The radio had informed them, and two men were in front of the car. My father's car pulled up almost beside their car so that he managed to get a good look in the inside. He saw that two men in the front were arguing heatedly with each other, and he saw another man in the back. He had no hair and he was so pale that he seemed almost white. He was dressed in all black, and he looked directly at my father, his face almost pressed against the window, with very dark eyes, and he grinned widely. My father was deeply unsettled by this person. He seemed to look directly into my father's eyes, and my father was so sure of this third person that he informed the other police cars about him. The chase ended with the car crashing into a fence and the suspects fleeing into a field. They were apprehended only minutes later. There were two men, not three. My father asked all of his colleagues at the scene if they were sure they hadn't seen another guy. No one else had seen the third man. I can't explain it, he said to us. I saw him as clear as day and he grinned at me like death himself. This place, or rather this took place in 2004 and 2005 in Germany. To this day we have no logical, no logical explanation for what he really saw and experienced. My experience from about 12 years ago. Anyways, the first night something strange happened was after my surgery around August as I was about to enter fifth grade. I get home and I was about to go to bed with my parents and they ask me if I can walk up the stairs and I say no, so I struggle. But honestly, it was just because I prefer sleeping on the floor than the actual bed and I still do. Around maybe three or four in the morning, I randomly woke up, and I hear a laughter coming towards a closet. I kind of was hoping it was one of my mom's Halloween decorations, going off maybe because my mom was obsessed with Halloween and had a bunch of decorations. But I'd say maybe like five minutes later, I hear some scratching on the couch directly behind me. Then my dad walks down maybe about 30 minutes later to get ready for work, and I tell him what happened just for him to search the house and find nothing. Things go on for months, and it's always little things like seeing shadows as I'm in the shower, things like that. There was also this one time where I was hanging off the ladder at the top bunk upside down, and that was some scary thing to wake up to another time when I'm asleep. I wake up to me basically punching myself, or punching a shelf. It's hard to discern. Me punching the shelf, I can understand as maybe being an involuntary movement, but hanging upside down from my bunk bed seems pretty hard to do, and that was also the only time that it's happened to me. I'm not entirely sure if these two instances really had anything to do with what I experienced, but when it happened, it just felt super strange to me. Okay, so now the last thing to ever happen to me, or at least last thing I noticed, was the most strangest thing to happen to me in my entire life. I can't really remember around when it happened, but basically I'm lying down in my bed, and as I'm trying to sleep, all of a sudden my vision goes black. I was confused and scared thinking I went blind as I knew my eyes were wide open. And then about 10 seconds later, my vision basically turned into something like infrared vision. The whole room was blue except for a guy who looked like they were sitting down on a box in my closet. The door was closed and I wanted to get up to open my door, at least make a run for downstairs. 
People have told me that it couldn't have been sleep paralysis, but I had full control over my body, so to me, definitely agree with them that it doesn't make sense. I was just too scared to do anything, so I pretended to be asleep. And after maybe 10 minutes later, my vision just went back to normal. I had a very creepy experience at work last night. I had a very creepy and unexplainable experience last night at work. I work in residential care at a house where five people with autism live. Yesterday, one of the girls called A was in a very bad mood all day. She was throwing tantrums, screaming, and hitting herself. Sometimes she had some absent moments and stared at the ground or at the wall. This is a very unusual behavior because she had always been the most active and most well-behaved patient in the house. A has had some seizures recently and hasn't been herself since her most recent seizure last week. The experience happened at about 2050, as we were waiting for the night shift staff to swap with us. Me, B, and C were standing in the hall, chatting as we waited. K was standing in the laundry room in the dark, staring at a wall. We stayed outside the door in case anything happened to K. We were at the end of the hall, and behind A was three doors. The kitchen door to the left, the sitting room directly behind, and the playroom door to the right. The kitchen and playroom door were open and held open by specialized door stoppers. The door stoppers are designed to lift and let the door close when lots of noise is made. The reason for this is if a patient is trying to attack staff and closing doors slow down so the patient and everyone can run. These doors closed by themselves without any loud noise being made. First the kitchen door closed, and then the playroom door. We thought nothing of it since the playroom door stopper is faulty anyway. As soon as the playroom door closed, a vintage radio inside the room started playing static at full blast. B went into the room and took the radio out and showed it to me and C. We all freaked out because the door closing and then an old radio coming on. I got up to check on K and she was still standing in the dark room staring at nothing. I was so freaked out and I couldn't even look at her because I had kind of an idea that maybe she was possessed or something. I have no reason to believe that, but my imagination didn't. Night staff arrived and I ran for the hills. I was told the house I worked at was haunted, but I always laughed it off. I've seen shadows in the corner of my eye in one of the bedrooms, but I always came up with an explanation for them despite being very unsettled. This event has unnerved me badly, that I'm afraid of what I'll see in the house. A spirit, maybe? I'm 18, turning 19 on April 14th, and I work in dining at a large retirement home. I would say there's anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people. I've worked there since July of 2020. In the beginning of this March, myself and my co-worker were assigned to set up a meeting room with coffee and scones and clean it when it was finished. About two hours after I set up the meeting, my manager told me to go check to make sure that they still had enough coffee and whatnot. I was reluctant to walk in, as I just had a general sense that I shouldn't, and I could hear people crying inside the room. When I walked in, it looked like a AA meeting but with seniors, and the two hosts were the heads of the CC, the Continued Care Program. Basically, if you already have a disease like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, things like that, before you move in, they won't allow you to. However, if you develop one while you're a resident, you get sent to the CC wing once it's needed. The lady who was talking had half of her face looking like it was melted she was also drooling as she talked. She said she was being sent to CC and that she wanted to be killed or die. The atmosphere in the room was palpable. Then, like the idiot I am, I asked the host if they had enough coffee and scones. She took me outside and yelled at me for being rude, but I told her my manager made me check. 
The host said it was fine then, but to please not come back until the meetings was over. When it was, my coworker and I were sent to clean the room up. We were both faced with the left wall closest to the door, stacking plastic cups, when a very intense wave of nausea came over me for about five to ten seconds, almost making me vomit. Along with that was a feeling of dread, almost like I wanted to die or that I was convinced Elle was going to. After my nausea faded away, my coworker told me that she suddenly felt very nauseous too. That really creeped me the fuck out because I never even told her that I felt nauseous. I told her because I didn't want to freak her out. Or sorry, I never told her because I didn't want to freak her out. Until I left the room, there was a very uneasy feeling. The feeling you get when you're in a place you're not supposed to be in or lost in a building. I never saw anything or remember a temperature change of any kind. And I've been back into that room and nothing's happened. Maybe it was just a really strange coincidence. I don't really know. Have you experienced something like weird pitch black shadows or other apparitions? 13 years ago, my dad and I moved into an apartment here in Germany. I was 12 back then, so it took me some time to realize something was off. I had a pitch black shadow in my room, exactly in the corner over my bed. From time to time, I would feel random discomfort or even feel scared a little bit. One time I showered at night, and upon entering my dark room, a bright white light, almost like a ball, flew from the right corner where the shadow was to the other side of my room. I was just so shook. I immediately closed the door and I went to the living room to sit up with my dad till I wasn't scared anymore. It didn't even bother him by telling him. Anyway, that's when I realized that maybe something is off. I asked my neighbors and I turned out that an old man was living in our apartment a very long time before us and he supposedly died asleep in his armchair. I immediately knew where that must have been. I started to also realize that the shadow I mentioned before was actually really strange. I always assumed that something was throwing shade, since the light from the streetlights and the moon would always cast different shadows into my room at night. Like a lamp and a shadow resembling it. But there was actually nothing to throw that shadow in the corner. And it was, as I said, pitch black unlike the other shadows. Well, some years passed and one day I realized that nothing scary had happened for some time and the shadow's gone, just gone. I guess the old man finally left this realm or something. Maybe this isn't the place to make jokes, but maybe he was disturbed by my puberty, my awkwardness, and the first sexual encounter. Who knows? Anyway, years later, 2019 actually, my dad passed away. Two minutes away from home, and we still lived in this apartment, and for the first few months I could feel his presence. I felt like he would come around the corner any moment, or I could swear I could hear the sounds that he would make. Sometimes I felt like I saw him in the corner of my eye or a shadow or something. It was getting actually jump scares from that. Like thinking that there's something standing there walking past me, and then me screaming at nothing. But that suddenly stopped a few months after as well. The dark shadow in my room is the strangest thing I've ever experienced, especially since I was seeing it every night for years, and then it just randomly disappeared. Something tried to make me commit suicide. It's 2016. My aunt had an event and the entire family was headed there. My mom tried to convince me to go since my aunt lived quite a far distance from where we lived and it made her uneasy knowing I'd be home alone and they wouldn't get back till late. However, I chose to stay home because at the time, I had an A-level exam and I was glad to get alone time to study in peace and quiet. It was about 6 p.m. when my family left. I locked the doors and decided to take a nap before I started studying. 
I was in the living room on the couch for about 15 minutes when the air suddenly became stuffy. I sat up and looked around, and there was something different. The lights looked dimmer. There was a slightly cloudy look, and the three fans, including the ceiling fan that I had on, just stopped working at the same moment, which was kind of strange. Despite the place being really warm all day, I also noticed a huge drop in temperature. As I was about to get up, I started feeling this heavy pressure surrounding me, and eventually it was on top of me. It weighed down on me and immediately I was engulfed by feelings of sadness and depression. I started to cry uncontrollably and began hearing faint whispers. I closed my eyes during this episode, but when I opened them, I saw I had a razor blade to my wrist. It had only been about five minutes. I know I hadn't moved and there were no razor blades lying around. At least any that were easily accessible. I tried pulling the razor away, but it felt as though there was a force going against me pushing it closer to my wrist. I literally had to struggle to pull it away. As soon as I managed to get it away from me, I felt the pressure of the room increase. I felt a gripping fear and was compelled to run out of the house. I threw on some decent clothes and bolted out of the house. I called my parents to come get me. I locked the door and I was just waiting outside when the door began to shake violently, as if someone was trying to come out. And it was accompanied by loud banging sounds. I saw my neighbors outside at this point decided to stay in their view until my parents arrived. When they did reach, my mom, who's usually sensitive, felt the sudden drop in temperature and her hair stood on end. My stepdad, who's a pundit, Hindu equivalent to a pastor, performed a quick fire ritual and smoked the house out. Thankfully, I haven't experienced anything like that since then. Compilation of Life Events My earliest memory is roughly four years old. We lived in a very old house in a neighborhood where needles would stick to themselves on the sidewalks. Our laundry was an unfinished basement. To say it was creepy was an understatement. My mama used to take me with her to go do laundry. In fact, I can't even remember a time that she went by herself. She made it a game with me and would carry me in a laundry basket. She always teased that if I refused to take a bath, she would stick me in the washer with all my clothes. There was always a shadow on the wall, though there was nothing blocking it. If you looked at it long enough, you could swear you saw it move. Fear was a new thing at the time. I may have lived in a bad neighborhood, but my parents protected me. And honestly, that basement is probably the first time I ever felt uncomfortable or anxious. When we moved out, I remember my mother whispering to my grandma that she hopes Shadow Man doesn't follow. She never mentioned it to me as I'm a grown man now, but I still feel that basement has a lot to do with why we moved. Sometime during elementary school, my best friend, and we're going to call her Ash, oops, I think I might be a girl and I said I was a man, I apologize, lived in a perfect family. Pastor for a dad, kindergarten school teacher for a mom, a perfect family of six. We were playing hide and seek at her house. We put the bedrooms as off limits. We could hide in the garage, the family room, living room, kitchen, and two bathrooms. When it was my turn to hide, I went to the top of the stairs and around the small corner and laid down flat next to her bedroom door. It was pretty dark, so I thought she wouldn't see me. As I listened to her to come find me, I turned my face toward the door and looked underneath it. I saw a face looking right back at me, human, but very pale with dark, sunken-in eyes. It was centimeters away from my own. I froze in fear, and we had a staring contest for what feels like forever. Then it blinked. I went home early that night. Ash's family moved to a new state about a month later. Their family plunged into hell. Her sister getting abducted, or sorry, her sister getting addicted to drugs and trying to commit suicide. Ash herself following in those footsteps. Her little brother ran away all the time. All of them hospitalized at some point for trying to OD or shoot themselves. We still talk, 
but it's never been the same. A very weird coincidence with some history. So my house is pretty old. It's built in 1920. I've had some weird experiences here, but nothing as interesting as this. Between the ages of six and eight, I had at least 20 different experiences where I would be in my basement bathroom, either getting ready for school or, you know, using the bathroom, when I would suddenly see a figure out of the corner of my eye in the mirror. It was around a 25-year-old man in a blue Navy sailor outfit, and he would always just stare back at me with a pale, blank expression before disappearing after a second or two. For some reason, this didn't scare me, not even whatsoever. And as a kid, I never felt like it was evil or a malicious being. I didn't even tell my parents about it. It just kind of accepted it as an every time, you know, like an everyday thing. So as I get older, this phenomenon stops happening to me. And I kind of just store it away in the back of my memory. Until one very interesting Saturday morning in 2018. I'm 22 years old at this time. And I was in that same basement bathroom getting ready for the day when my mom called me upstairs. I go up to talk to her. She tells me that earlier in the day she was enjoying her morning tea on the front porch when an older man approached her house. He described himself as a sort of local historian who was researching veterans of World War II in my town. He went on to tell my mom that through his research he discovered that one of the first U.S. deaths in the war was a Navy sailor who originally lived in my house before going off to war. Apparently, he was one of the first to die during the attack on Pearl Harbor. He told my mom that he would come back with more research on this guy, but he has never since returned. My mom knows I'm kind of a history geek, and I thought that I'd love hearing about a little bit of World War II history with our home. As she tells me about this, a flood of memories come to my mind about me being a child and seeing that pale man in the mirror stare at me. Since then, I've told my parents about those childhood experiences, but nothing else weird has happened, and the local historian has never returned. I've always heard that children are more susceptible to coming into contact with the supernatural. That would explain why that only happened to me as a kid. Was it an evil being? Was it the spirit of that sailor just checking in on his old home? I'm not sure. I still always get a little bit freaked out when I walk into that room and look into the mirror. Uncle's Encounter with the La Giablesse La Giablesse is a character in Caribbean folklore. It's a human woman usually having an attractive body and clothing, but a hideous face which she keeps hidden. She has one human foot and one cow hoof. She lures males into the forest so that they get lost and can never find their way back, so they end up dying either by getting eaten by a wild animal or by some other gruesome means. This happened in Trinidad in the 80s. My uncle was living in the house that I live in presently, my grandfather's house that my mother inherited. In those days, it was my grandparents and their eight children. My uncle was one of the older siblings and would work late night shifts, so he would return at home between the hours of 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. Now, my street then wasn't as developed as it is now. There was a lot of bush and forested area with a few houses scattered in between. My house is about a quarter mile in and the road wasn't paved in at the time and it was kind of more of a track than a road. So one night when my uncle returned home from one of his late night shifts, he saw in the distance a woman walking down the street. From the look of her clothing, he assumed it was my senile great-grandmother. She had a few instances where she would wander off and reach far places, so initially my uncle thought it was her. He saw her familiar dress and the white shawl that she always had draped over her head, and he could make out pieces of the tattoos that she had on her arms. Now, he thought it was strange, 
It was the latest that he ever saw her outside of her house, and was at least ten minutes away from ours. He called out to her a couple times, but she didn't turn around and she just kept walking. At this time, my uncle decided to follow her and get back to her home. As he neared her, he realized something really weird. He kept calling out to her, and yet she didn't turn around. When he looked down, he saw that my great-grandmother had a cow hoof where her left foot should have been. He was really close to her now, and when he noticed it, the woman stopped dead in her tracks. My uncle, in sheer terror, turned around and said that he never ran so fast in his entire life. He raced on home, and since that incident, he's always had my grandfather wait up for him until he eventually left that job. I met a woman I never knew visiting my mother's grave and greeted me by name as she left. Last Sunday I was visiting my mother's grave like I do every Sunday. I always take some flowers and gardening equipment with me to keep her grave in pristine condition. As I hang out there for a good chunk of the day, I know everyone that visits the grave in the same row my mother's grave is in. We all know each other by name and generally have warm conversations talking about family, how life's going, usual chit-chat. My mother's grave is in the last of the row and almost directly at the fence, with only a strip of grass separating it from it. And that allows me to look at her grave when I approach the gate. On that occasion, however, I saw a woman standing by my mother's grave and talking. Sadly, I couldn't understand what she was saying but she was seemingly mumbling to herself. This obviously occurred strange to me, and I was curious. So, I was well on my way as the lady came towards me, leaving. She was probably in her late fifties, shoulder-long gray hair and glasses. As I wanted to ask her what she was doing at my mom's grave, she beat me to it. She smiled at me and wished me a nice day while calling me by my name, not even interrupting her walking pace, but dropping it while passing by. She wasn't rude or creepy. Actually, it came off as rather kind, but it gave me goosebumps and a shiver. I just got a stumbling good day out myself. I turned around and saw her heading for the gate. I got to my mom's grave afterwards, and there were fresh sunflowers on her grave. I looked over the fence, but I couldn't spot her. I got to work and left the flowers I brought too. When I got home, I approached my dad about it, if he knows such a woman, relative of him or former colleague of her. He didn't. He just shrugged and suggested that she might know me from overhearing conversations at the cemetery. I also asked a friend of mine, with which I'm often together on the cemetery, to visit her relatives as well. She didn't know anyone of that description either. It's really a small cemetery, and generally, an everyone-knows-everyone kind of thing. So while it's not particularly creepy, unsettling, or frightening, it was very puzzling, at least for me, and the way I got a shiver really got the gears in my head turning. set of strange events that happened with me as a nine-year-old, and I'm still looking for answers. Maybe when I was nine or ten years old, my dad used to go into the office on his motorcycle or bike, and he used to come back in the evening at like 5.30 or 6.30. I remember he used to come home before it starts to get dark during summertime, leaving two houses, or maybe they perhaps meant living, Living two houses from our home, there was an empty ground where all the kids used to play in the evening. So just like any other day, I was playing there. I saw my dad on the bike. He stopped the bike and nodded at me, like, let's go or come here. But he did not stop for me. So I thought he obviously was going home, which was seconds away from there, where we were playing. So I thought he directly went to home and wanted me to be home. That's why he nodded at me. 
to my surprise, as when I went there, my dad wasn't there. So, of course, I thought he went straight to the house, which was strange, because as I said, the place where I was playing was just seconds away. And how fast he went inside the house at the time, I remember being a little bit confused, but went inside the house. There was no one there inside the house, and I checked different rooms, and still no one there. We also have an upper floor. Now as I'm looking around the house, I heard a voice from the first floor. Someone clearly calling my name, like, repeatedly. Like when someone calls you if there's something urgent or if you're getting late. And I went upstairs to find out that there's once again no one. I was so confused, what the hell is happening? And suddenly I remember being scared and confused that I ran out of the house. Not panicking or anything, but I still went out in a hurry. So few things that is not normal. Number one, that was not my dad because my dad arrived later that evening. Number two, when I said that I was playing, I remember my mom and brother also used to be out with me, so our house was locked as no one was there. I later asked my mom about this and she told me that she was also outside and the house was locked. Number three, about the voice calling my name that was not my dad's voice nor my brother's voice, but it was a male voice. I've asked about this for my parents many times, but they, of course, as I was nine at the time, just ignored it. And I'm currently 22 to this date, and I still don't know what it was that set that course of events off. Micro dream or paranormal experience? I worked overnights for over a decade at a shelter for mostly mothers and children fleeing violence. Throughout my time working there, I would have clients sharing strange experiences that they've experienced. Meanwhile, it was a different group of people throughout the years, and all firmly believed that the house held a sort of energy or had apparitions dwelling there. I had a few questionable encounters myself. On two occasions, I literally felt someone standing immediately in my personal space to the point that hairs on the back of my neck would stand. And when I turned around to say back up, no one would be there. There was one experience in particular that left an indelible mark on my memory, and I'm uncertain if it was a micro-dream or a paranormal experience. Being that I worked overnight between 3 to 5 a.m., if all the folks were asleep, and I had done my rounds... I would relax in the office at my desk with the TV on. If I became groggy, I would rest my head on the desk for a few minutes at a time. But that would be enough to sort of awake any sounds and they would jolt me out of the nap. On this particular shift, it was quiet and all felt safe. I had my head on the desk and immediately began micro-dreaming. However, my dream was me sitting at the desk at work in the office and seeing a woman slowly walk down the stairs past my office door. The ironic part is, in my dream, I knew that this woman wasn't staying at the shelter, and I'd never seen her before. She was an older black woman dressed in her Sunday best, all pink, and her hat was indicative of 1920s or 30s era fashion. I remember in my dream thinking, I don't know her, but I feel safe with her. I won't bother her and I'll let her be. And then I immediately woke up to the same panoramic view outside of my office door I had just seen in my dream and no one was there. Side note. Also, the shelter was an old mansion for a very wealthy folk at the beginning of the 20th century. I imagine the apparition I saw or dreamt may have been a hired house help for the family who resided there initially. It became a shelter in the mid-70s very odd. I'll never forget this experience. And I often sort of just left to wonder if spirits are better able to show themselves and communicate through dreams than with the living. Are you brave enough to confront the supernatural? Paranormal M invites you to delve into the mysteries that defy explanation. Subscribe now and turn on notifications to stay updated on the latest spine-chilling tales. Have you ever worked in a haunted nursing home?
the unit I'm currently on seems to have the most activity from my own personal experience. I've worked on a lot of the units, but on this one I've seen the most. Almost every single day I see shadow people. I catch glimpses out of the corner of my eye, or I just see a shadowy figure straight on. I work evening and night shift, and strangely, I've experienced more on the evening shift. The unit I work on is also the COVID unit, so that might be partly why it's more active. The COVID wing consists of two very long halls that meet together at a door that leads to a kitchen area, where there's also another residential room. Kind of a weird setup, but hey, it works. My coworker was behind a double door one night, taking care of one of the sick residents, and she'd gone out to the kitchen area to take off her PPE. She saw and heard two children running around playing, but it was late at night and we weren't allowed to have inside visits. Turns out everybody at work says they sometimes see two children, and that means someone's going to die. And it's true. We have a chapel in the nursing home for the residents, but it's behind two sets of double doors, and the residents can't get in there on their own due to codes and locks. There's a series of stairs behind the first set of doors. And everybody has repeatedly seen a bald guy sitting in the chapel late at night through the window of the hall looking into the chapel. We had a resident who used to be a child molester. One night he woke up to hysterics and crying, absolutely unconsolable. He said there were children surrounding him standing by his bed and laughing at him. He died the next day. I went into a resident's room late one night during rounds at 3 a.m. I was working on the dementia and wander risk unit. Standing next to the resident's bed, and she asks, Who is that man standing behind the curtain? I didn't think much of it because she usually hallucinated, but within an hour or two, residents from different units passed away, and the resident that I was with. Their roommate fell out of bed and got hurt really bad. Lights turn off and on by themselves constantly late at night when everyone is in bed. The Man with a Soft Face It first happened when I was four years old. I had a very strange dream where I saw a very tall, maybe six foot five creature. Its skin was pinkish brown and it had bulging eyes, a red round nose and triangular teeth in its wide mouth. The creature was smiling and its smile reminds me of what people now call Uncanny Valley both sadistic and happy. Also, even though I don't remember it in details, the creature seemingly had four fingers on each hand. In my dream, it tried to catch me, grabbing and carrying me somewhere. I attempted to fight it, trying to punch its face, but my fists got stuck in it, as if it was made of bubblegum. This is why I called it the man with the soft face. But that dream was not the end. It became recurring, and I saw this creature in my dreams till I was six. Sometimes it was just carried, or it would just carry me somewhere without saying anything, and sometimes it started choking me from behind. But the scariest part that made me fear this thing was its smile. Not even the feeling of total helplessness. Not that I had in these dreams, not as disgusting to the touch the warmth and the sticky body in which my hands always got stuck. Its smile was the worst. Why did it always look so happy? Once when I had this dream, this creature was carrying me somewhere at night in the middle of the street. It was snowing and I could hear its feet stepping on the snow. I saw the street lights, the buildings, and the creature's face smiling as always. Strangely enough, its eyes never expressed anything total empty look. It carried me for a couple of minutes and then just stood somewhere. After a while, another creature approached. It looked similar to the man with the soft face, except its nose was long, like that of Pinocchio. The man with the soft face showed me to the creature, 
and they started to discuss something. I don't remember what they said, I don't even remember their voices, only the creature's lips moving as they were speaking. When I was six, these dreams stopped, but I still remember them quite vividly, and they still feel scary. Has anyone else seen anything similar? I'd be glad to know if anyone else encountered this creature in their dreams. The Man in the Cowboy Hat When I was roughly 18 years old, I spent a lot of time at my best friend's house just outside the suburbs in Toronto, Ontario. One night a group of us was heading out to the bar. There were about five of us in total. We were all in the house together before heading out. My best friend and I had been there most of the day, and no one else in the house but us. At around 10 p.m. we all headed out to the car and piled into a Pontiac Sunfire. I was in the passenger seat, my girlfriend was driving, and three people were in the back seat. The front of the house was mostly windows, including some blurred glass on the door and very few places without glass of some kind. As we were backing out, I looked up and watched a dark, featureless man in what looked to be a cowboy hat walk from the left out of the house coming from where the stairs to the basement were to the front door, only to disappear before the window to the den. There was maybe four feet of wall before the next window, and he was just gone. At first I was stunned, but I managed to say, did anyone else see? Without missing a beat, the girl sitting in the middle seat behind me said, the man in the cowboy hat. I was amazed when someone else used the expression, looks like you've seen a ghost. That was the look on her face, like a mixture of fear and excitement, just enough to make you nauseous. My best friend seemed less surprised. It was a family house and the property going back for generations. There was a chandelier above the basement stairs that his father told us dated back a few hundred years and was converted to electricity a long time ago. The area the man came from was the basement stairs. Only we realized after that we saw him that there was no way that he could have been walking from where he was walking. There were stairs and his height didn't change. After a few minutes of trepidation, we all went back into the house together. We searched everywhere for the man, and I mean everywhere. If there was a man living in the walls, we needed to find out. All the doors were closed and locked. All the windows were closed and locked too. There was nobody else there. To this day, I have zero doubt that we saw some sort of paranormal entity. My best friend mentioned his grandfather, and we did ask his dad, but we still don't know for sure who or what it was. The fact that the two of us saw the exact same thing at the exact same time made it extraordinary. It made me feel a bit less crazy. Bad Omen Haunting My House I must have been seven or eight when I had my first and probably only encounter with the supernatural. My father got transferred to Dehedon from Almora when I was seven or eight. We moved into a rented place. Our landlord seemed sweet and helpful at first, but they were not like that at all. After a week or so, my mother started feeling uncomfortable in the house. Things would fly off the shelf on their own, and once a glass broke on my mom's hand and it made a cut as if someone deliberately cut my mom's hand. Our landlord's wife used to talk nicely with my dad, saying stuff like our family's the best, but would go tell my mom that we needed to leave as we're not welcomed right after my dad would leave for work. She was trying to drive a wedge between my mom and my dad, Things started to go a bit south, but we also did our research. Then the entire horrific story came out, including black magic. Before us, there was a couple that used to live in the same house. The landlords would play the same game with them like they played with my dad and my mom. This led to a huge fight between the couple, and the wife literally killed herself by burning herself alive. The situation worsened as the landlord's wife used to do black magic. She used black magic to control the guy and brainwashing the man into not believing his own wife. 
It had been said that the husband was so brainwashed that he did nothing to save his wife and watched her burn alive right in front of him. When we came in, we knew nothing and moved in. After my mom experiencing things, I started seeing things as well. I used to see a Batman action figure everywhere at night, even on my bed when I didn't have any action figures back then at all. I was a car kid always. I always saw a giant doll in front of my cabinet. It was like five or six feet tall. It was their whole night. It was as if something wanted us out of the house. I don't know whether it was the woman who died or because of the black magic that we were seeing these things, but it was very strong and a very obvious presence. I'm 30 now, but we still sometimes visit the Dehedron, and that house is now empty. Even the landlords have to sell the place and went somewhere else. No new renter was able to live there for more than two months. We lived there for no more than four. Two foot long praying mantis. It happened in Brooklyn, New York in the late 90s. I was in the second or third grade. S was around four years old. We had a back porch overlooking a small fenced yard and lawn. We'd get the occasional regular sized praying mantis. According to S, one day she was playing in the yard while my mom was hanging laundry up in the back porch. Apparently this thing just suddenly materialized right there in the middle of the yard. Because S says she turned around and there it was. She just stared at it for a few moments, not sure if it was a toy or what it was. She said it looked like a two and a half to three foot long praying mantis with big red eyes and tiny black pinpricks for pupils. When the fear finally hit her, she ran up the stairs shouting for mom. She could express at the time that it was just a big bug. My mom barely reacted, of course, because kids get scared by normal bugs all the time. Well... The damn thing followed us up the stairs. For so long, I've imagined what that thing must have looked like. She was convinced that my mom, or rather she convinced my mom, to go inside with her. That's when mom finally saw it. While she and S were watching it from inside through the mesh door, the praying mantis perched itself in one of the chairs on the porch. Not like on the top or the back of the cushion or on the armrest or something. Just in the chair proper-like. When my mom went looking for a camera, all at once it just disappeared. I asked if it flew away or what, but neither of them had an answer. It was just gone as instantly as it showed up. When my dad brought me home from school, around half an hour later, they were still hiding behind the mesh door looking terrified. I never got the full version of the story until she was older. For years, she would become hysterical if she ever saw a praying mantis or even an image of one. I wonder about what this thing could have been or why it showed itself to my mom and her. I do know, however, that as I got older, I found that my mother was a very abusive woman. And her, I believe, suffered the most because of that makes me wonder if one of the people I've told this story to is right about it being maybe a demon or at least a bad omen. I am no longer a skeptic about paranormal existence. Before this, I was skeptical about paranormal stuff, and I didn't give it much credit but I kept an open mind. I have no dealings with witchcraft or rituals or anything to do with a Ouija board. My girlfriend has been supportive and has experienced many of the same things that I have, and some of her own. March of 2020, I bought my first home and everything was fine until a few months in. At first, I was confined, or rather it was confined to electronics powering off, so I wasn't really clued into something paranormal at first. I'll spare you my list, but there were things moving around the house, doors found opened, scratching heard in the walls, glass bottles on the fridge jingling, 
and the area fan in my bedroom was found turned on multiple times. The three instances that really made me feel uneasy are the ones that I can't pin on my pets. Midwinter, I was at my gaming desk, and all of a sudden, I got an intense campfire smoke smell. I immediately ran down to the furnace room hoping that nothing was on fire, but could not smell smoke anywhere else in the house, and it was gone when I returned to my room. I live in town, and the two adjacent neighbors don't have a wood-burning furnace. Just last week, I went to the kitchen to grab a soda, and at the bottom of the stairs, I smelt an intense lavender perfume. I asked my girlfriend if she had been ambitious with her mojo before leaving, and she had not applied any perfume that night. The smell lingered in a singular spot for a bit, and I haven't smelled that perfume or the campfire smoke since. The last is what happened last night. I work night shift, and I come home to let the dogs out on my lunch break. After letting the dogs out, I'm eating in my office chair, and I hear a muffled thud from downstairs. I immediately checked where the cats are, and they're right beside me begging for handouts. I dismiss it and I finish my lunch. When I walked back into the kitchen, I found the little carpeted man that sits in front of the oven square in the middle of the kitchen. This I cannot explain away, or pin on the pets, as they weren't in the kitchen at all, and the rug was not there when I walked in and made lunch. The Man in the Cowboy Hat When I was roughly 18 years old, I spent a lot of time at my best friend's house, just outside the suburbs of Toronto, Ontario. One night, a group of us was heading out to the bar. There was five of us in total, and we were all in the house together before heading out. My best friend and I had been there most of the day, and no one else was in the house but us. At around 10 p.m., we all headed out to the car and piled into a Pontiac Sunfire. I was in the passenger seat, my girlfriend was driving, and three people were in the back seat. The front of the house was mostly windows, including some blurred glass on the door in a very few places, without glass of some kind. As we were backing out, I look up and watched a dark, featureless man in what looked to be a cowboy hat walk from the left of the house, coming from where the stairs to the basement were to the front door, only to disappear before the window to the den. There was maybe four feet of wall before the next window, and he was just gone. At first I was stunned, but I managed to say, did anyone else see? Without missing a beat, the girl sitting in the middle seat behind me said, the man in the cowboy hat. I was amazed when someone used the expression, looks like you've seen a ghost. That was the look on her face like a mixture of fear and excitement, just enough to make you nauseous. My best friend seemed less surprised. It was a family house and the property going back for generations. There is a chandelier above the basement stairs that his father told us dated back a few hundred years, and it was converted to electricity a long time ago. The area the man came from was the basement stairs, only we realized after that we saw him that there was no way that he could have been walking from where he was walking from. There were stairs and his height didn't change. After a few minutes of trepidation, we all went back into the house together. We searched everywhere for the man, and I mean everywhere. If there was a man living in the walls, we needed to find out. All the doors were closed and locked. All the windows were closed and locked. And there was nobody else there. Till this day, I have zero doubt that we saw some sort of paranormal entity. My best friend mentioned his grandfather, and we asked his dad, but we still didn't know for sure who or what it was. The fact that the two of us saw the exact same thing at the exact same time made it extraordinary and made me feel a bit less crazy. So I've had a few experiences in my past. Can someone please explain? I have a couple questions about my own experiences. I don't have enough money to actually talk to a professional. My grandma was a psychic, 
My mother has experiences of her own as well, with speaking to spirits and such. My mother isn't open to talking about her experiences because she fears them and my grandma had passed away quite early. First Experience My own experiences have all been in different houses, though two of them have been in the same property. When I was maybe four, I was up somewhere from midnight to two in the morning watching TV. At the time, I heard voices and looked out the window. There were some soft talking sounds and three yellowish-white floating orbs passing the window. I immediately ran to my room at the time and spoke to my grandma in the morning. She had told me that they were guardian angels protecting me. Second Experience I was in fifth grade when two of my grandparents passed away. One was the psychic. This was in 2016. I moved into that same house in 2020. I was sleeping on the couch in the room where my grandpa had his old library that we took out. I was drifting off to sleep when clear as day I heard, She's going under. It wasn't someone's voice I remembered and it sounded as though it was next, maybe the next room over. My parents were across the house, and at the time, it wasn't a good place for my mental health. Third Experience Later that year, after I had left the negative household, I was living with my mom. I was writing in my room when a tall figure with black hair had appeared. He was maybe six feet tall or so, and he had a pale face and dull, empty-looking eyes. Still to this day, I see him sometimes. He's thin, though. Normal human thin. Every now and then, when I see him, he looks as though he had been drowned. It's strange. He's silent, but it's almost like he's watching over me in some ways. Possibly just watching me. I feel a weird unease around him, though. Strangely comfortable. I've had other experiences of hearing deceased family members' voices when I'm really depressed. Though that's more comforting than anything. Man in my bed. For reference, I could always see or feel ghosts for as long as I can remember. My mother says I was born with a gift, though it sure doesn't feel like one. I was quite young at the time, but sometime when I was in middle school, my mother, dad, and my older sister were at work at the time, as it was pretty early in the morning. We lived in a basement there which had one room with two beds next to each other. Our living room, or rather our living, would be right there as soon as we opened the door. Since it was summer, I had no school and therefore I was home alone, which wasn't new. I have back problems, so every few hours I had to wake myself up to switch sides on which I was sleeping on. I think it's important to note that there were no windows in the bedroom, so there couldn't be a reflection of anything from outside. The morning went like normal. As I woke, I turned around, and when I opened my eyes to check what time it was before moving, there was a shadow man laying horizontally in the middle of where the two beds were connected. At first I thought it was just my eyes playing a trick on me as I just woke up, so I stayed in the same position, blinking my eyes, trying and thinking maybe that might help. It's safe to say that it didn't help. I stared at it long enough to catch some features. He had a hat on like a cowboy hat and some really pointy shoes. It was like something out of the 1920s. He wasn't exactly a shadow as I could see all of this. It was like a different shade of black compared to the rest of the room. I don't know how long I stayed there, but he disappeared as soon as I moved my feet. I told my sister when she came home, as it scared the hell out of me. Later, we googled the house address and found out that there was a fire that burned down whatever house was there before. It didn't say in the article if anybody died in the fire, and we couldn't find anything else on it. But I will say this. The fire happened somewhere between 1920 through 1940. I can't remember the exact date. But with the clothes that he was wearing, it kind of just makes sense. This was the first time I physically saw him, but I've heard his voice multiple times after this. 
I no longer live in that house. But I just couldn't shake that memory. Shadow person followed me from Warsaw. I went to Warsaw for work in November of 2019. I met a girl and we kicked some stuff off. After ending up in my rented apartment going to sleep, I woke up around 2.30 a.m. to find her packing her stuff, which was on a chair in the bedroom. She walked to the door and I started asking her, where are you going? Thinking it maybe it wouldn't be a nice move to just try and walk out in the middle of the night. I couldn't see much detail since it was dark in the room, just the black silhouette of the girl. She then walked to the door, but stopped and turned toward me and seemed to proceed to just stare. I started calling her name, thinking she's sleepwalking, until I hear her in my right ear. Looking over, she was still next to me in bed, slowly waking up. I looked back at the girl I saw, and she was still there too. I freaked, lunged to the lamp in the bedside table, turned it on, and she was gone. I've been told about sleep paralysis, but the thing was, I could sit up, move, and think clearly. Now flash forward to the start of 2020. I was back home in Almere, a city close to Amsterdam. And ever since I moved into my new place, I hear footsteps around the house. Once, while on a video call with my colleague in my quote-unquote office on the first floor, right across from the staircase, I could hear someone or something bolting up the stairs, straight through my headphones. After half a year, it didn't bother me anymore until two weeks ago, when my current girlfriend was here, not the girl from Warsaw, by the way. I had the same experience I had in Warsaw. This time, however, I thought more clearly and I grabbed my phone. I turned on the flash and I aimed it at the figure. When pointing at it, it was gone. I then moved the flash away and I could see it again. This really boggled my mind. The figure then seemed to bow down, I believe, but proceeded to go downwards until it just disappeared into the floor. Every now and then I find chairs moved. I wake up next to the sound of my office chair rolling, and I still hear the footsteps. The Man in My Nursery My mom has always been able to see ghosts and spirits. She has many different experiences, both good and bad. This has always made me a firm believer in ghosts. I can't see ghosts, though I've always had a very good sense of what many people would consider vibes and such. Whether it be from a person or just from being in the house. One day, a few months after I was born, I had finally been placed into a different room than my parents. My mom got up in the middle of the night to go get some water. She didn't know exactly why she woke up so suddenly, but pushed it off as maybe not being a big deal as she... You know, just wandered into the kitchen. When she got into the kitchen, she had her glass of water, and she seemed like out of the corner of her eye, she saw a sort of figure, and it was walking into my room. My mother, of course, decided to follow this said figure. She didn't know whether she had just been imagining it, or maybe she wasn't going to risk it. When she was walking walked to my room. She could hear giggling coming from inside. Once she gets into my room, she notices the figure standing next to my crib with a smile. It was an old man wearing large glasses. The man notices my mom in the doorway and nods slightly before walking out the door of my crib without a sound. My mom stands there for a second, making sure I was all right. I was. In fact, I was smiling myself. She then walked out of my room and headed back to bed, not mentioning any of this to my dad, who was asleep. A few weeks later, my mom and dad were going through some old photos of my dad's family. While looking through the photos, my mother notices a picture of an old man with large glasses. 
She immediately recognizes the man as the same man who was in my room. She asks my dad who the man was, and he explains that it was my grandfather who had passed away years before he had even met my mom. My dad and his grandfather were very close, and my grandfather's death had a huge impact on my dad. My mother told my dad about how she'd seen his grandfather in my room that night, and she got up for water. This honestly has to be one of my favorite stories my mom told me about, because it made me know that even though I never met my great-grandfather when he was alive, he still cared and wanted to meet me. Story number 17 Scary Experience the Other Day My friends and I were hanging out at a little park in our hometown, which is right behind a Taco Bell. We were just chatting and having a good time, and then one of my friends decided to go to the Taco Bell to use the bathroom. We live in a small town in Northern California where no crime really happens, so we let her go on her own. It was around dusk at this point, and the park was bordered by a creek and undeveloped land. While my friend was gone, we heard her voice yell my name, and she sounded incredibly scared. She had a slight accent which makes her voice hard to imitate, and I have my own very unique name that's difficult to pronounce, so there's no way someone else was just playing a joke on us to scare us. I obviously got scared that she was being kidnapped or something, so I jumped up and headed over while calling her name. I was with two other people sitting at the table, my other best friend and her boyfriend. They're both skeptics and don't really believe in paranormal things, especially the boyfriend. But when they heard the voice screaming my name, they both recognized it as hers and jumped up alongside her. I started screaming her name, trying to figure out where she was and how we could go help. And then we saw her coming from the complete opposite side of the park, where the Taco Bell was. There was no other way that it could have made it all the way to the back of the green space and back in the amount of time that she had been gone for. She also hadn't heard the voice calling her name. Even though she should have, as the Taco Bell was maybe 150 feet from where the three of us were sitting. She's one-fourth Native American, and although none of the rest of us are, we were speculating on what it could have been, and we were thinking that it might have been a skinwalker or something related to that as our experiences seem to line up with stories that we've heard about skinwalkers. Our entire town was built on Native American burial sites. It's awful, I know. So there's definitely activity related to that happening. I've had weird experiences in my own house, and both of my best friends have witnessed them as well. Do you think our experience might have been skinwalker related? If not, what are the other possibilities? a very anxious person, and I'm a little bit on edge about this whole experience, so any insight that you could offer would be very much appreciated. Paranormal Experience in a Friend's Home When I was about 17, I stayed at a friend's house overnight. We were up quite late giggling and messing around in bed. You'd come into the house and in the living room was on the left. Through a short corridor on the left was the stairs. Straight on through the corridor was a biggish room that mostly had lots of boxes and unused stuff below my friend's bedroom, which then led to a small kitchen. Her dad's room was on the right when you came up the stairs. Her room was on the left and the bathroom along a landing leading from her bedroom, so it was directly on the left of her bedroom. The layout helped set the scene a little as quite late at night. Way after midnight, and we'd all gone to bed, her dad included. I started hearing noises downstairs. The noises seemed to start directly below us in an unused room. I whispered to my friend about it, who couldn't hear anything. At first it sounded like a dull thud followed by a dragging noise, moving slowly through the room. My friend kept trying to whisper to me as normal, but all I could focus on was the noise getting gradually closer. As soon as I heard it reach the bottom of the stairs, I started panicking, whispering to my friend about it and feeling more freaked out when she still couldn't hear it. 
It felt like time slowed down as the same noise moved up the stairs. Thud and a long scrape. I was crying a bit quietly at that point, hoping that if I pretended to be asleep, then nothing would happen. I remember feeling like I was aware of my presence, even at that point. My friend was silent too, and pretending to be asleep, because she'd often be spooked by me. It finally got to the top of the stairs and went silent, as it reached and stood outside her bedroom. I was holding my breath at this point, and staring into the dark, hoping it would stop. It started moving again into the bathroom and then stopped as suddenly as it had started. After that, I felt instant relief, and like a pressure had been lifted from the air. We went to sleep, and we didn't mention it again, or to anyone else. I slept at their house quite a lot, but never experienced anything like that again, and never felt worried about being there afterwards. Lights in the Woods This happened a couple years ago, when I was working at my childhood summer camp. I've certainly gotten strange feelings around the area before, but nothing especially malevolent or frightening. My coworker and I were taking our group for a sleep out, up in some shelters about half a mile into the woods and away from the rest of the camp. I'm used to being in the woods and I generally don't scare easily, even at night. So when I woke up in the wee hours of the morning, I set out for the latrines without a second thought. I figured it was maybe around 4 or 5 a.m., based on a red glow on the horizon. The light fell softly through the trees, illuminating the path and the color sides of the shelters. The walk was only a few hundred yards, but felt longer with only my flashlight. I was about halfway there before I heard something behind me. Again, I know those woods. I know what most animals in the area sound like. From the camp's horses to the local family of black bears. Whatever this was, it was huge. Its presence seemed to close in on me from all around and I could hear twigs snapping, vines tearing, mud squelching underfoot. I'm not fast, and I knew that running on the uneven path in the dark wouldn't get me far. So I walked. I walked like I owned those woods, slowly and deliberately until I reached the light on the side of the latrine. The presence has faded. I was even starting to feel good, confident, like I could keep going, keep walking through the dark woods until I reached the sunrise. I had to tell myself to stop, to turn where I meant to turn, and I eventually returned to my shelter and I fell asleep. Maybe I would have forgotten about it all, if not for that sunrise. I've watched so many sunrises over the lake, I should have known better. That red light in the woods wasn't in the east, where it should have been. It was out by the western side of the pasture, blood red, and a little too bright from what I was pretending to be. The more I think about it, the more it felt like I was being herded somewhere. I haven't met anyone with a similar experience, but my friends have theories from fairies to alien abduction. I'm not sure what I believe, but I'll never go to that part of the woods alone ever again. Shadow Man Encounter? Question mark. So take it back about three years. I had just finished my workout for football, and I'm happy heading home to relax for the rest of that Saturday. My family was out of town for the weekend, so I was home alone. I proceeded to make food and watch TV in the living room, and keep in mind, it's about one in the afternoon, when I just get an odd vibe. Not really sure how to explain it, but as if I had a perception to know something was danger. Thirty minutes go by and I can't seem to shake the feeling, so I decide that I'll watch Netflix till I fall asleep. I don't remember falling asleep, but I wake up with my eyes closed and proceed to stretch my body from being sore. I sit up on the couch, wipe the crust from my eyes, and look to see if the television was still running, and I notice that it was still light outside because there was a dark thing in my vision, and I try to readjust, and I finally realize that there's a shadow of a man standing there facing me. 
My mind feels as if I'm being fried with information and it's processing whatever it is that I'm seeing. And as I sit there dazed and confused, a shadow was in the shape of a man. And it was about eight, nine feet tall. The shadow lowers its hand down to me in a gesture and leaves it out there outstretched. There were no words that were spoke, but in my head I could just feel that the meaning was to take the hand. At this point, I'm beyond scared because I think I'm going to die. I have no idea what to do or even what to think. So in desperation, I close my eyes and I go into prayer. And I ask God to just let it be quick if this is how I go. Please let it be fast. And about as quick as I was rattling it off in my head, the feeling that I had that was unsettling just went away. And I opened my eyes and the shadow with this outstretched hand wasn't there anymore. This was pretty long, but I had to get the whole scenario down so I could get some help in what I actually experienced. I know the argument of sleep paralysis is going to be made, and what I have to say is that I stretched and I sat up, and that I wanted to assume that it was sleep paralysis as well. I don't really know how long it was for this all to take place, but it felt like hours in the presence of the shadow wasn't anything I'd ever experienced in my life. Visited by a Wraith Back in around 2005, I was on a family vacation in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. We stayed in a cabin in the mountains. Two bedrooms downstairs and a loft bedroom upstairs. The loft was enclosed but had a large bifold window that could be opened to overlook the open living room below. I claimed the loft for myself. One night I had gone to bed before everyone else. The bifold window was closed, but the light from the living room leaked through the cracks. I put my headphones on, popped my Avril Lavigne CD into my Discman, and laid down in bed. I was on my back, eyes closed, and fumbled around with the CD player trying to change songs. I couldn't quite get it, so I opened my eyes to try to see where the button was. When I did, there was nothing but darkness. I was confused because the light from the window was gone and the room was pitch black. I suddenly realized something was covering my eyes because it began moving away from me, revealing the edges of its body in the light from the window. I stared, frozen, as this creature flew back, ending in the upper corner of the bedroom, and started disappearing into the shadows. I pulled the sheets over my head, crushed my eyes closed, and turned up the volume as loud as it would go. I ended up passing out like that for the night. The next morning, I was telling my mom what happened. She tells me that she also had a strange experience that morning. She was sitting on the edge of her bed putting socks on when one of the dresser drawer handles, styled like a door locker, started lifting and dropping against the dresser. She watched it continue for a minute before reaching over and holding it down. Then another started doing it, so she held that one down as well. When a third one started going, she bolted out of the room. Several years later, I was relaying this story to my new friend, and his response to the creature's physical description was, Sounds like a wraith. And I admittedly didn't know what that thing was. I grew up in a house with a lot of ghost activity, so anything remotely spooky was not of interest to me. He pulled up an image to show me, and instantly tears were rolling down my face. Not sad, just my body's response, which felt weird to me. It was exactly what I had seen that night. Trapped in a Haunted House Me and my girlfriend liked to go on midnight drives. We were driving our usual routes down some country roads when we passed three oddly large sharp turn signs when my girlfriend said, Wait, there was a road there, let's go down it. Because there was nobody out at this time, I was able to reverse back and go onto this road, and it was exactly 2.22 a.m. It was one of those narrow farm roads. It seems to go on forever. When we finally got out into the main road, we saw some eerie orange streetlights. The town name sign was a lot more bold than others. Something about it made us feel uneasy. 
Upon entering the town, we laughed about how creepy it looked, all empty with orange streetlights. Suddenly, as we're driving through at around 15 miles an hour, we hear what sounded like a knock at the bottom of the car. It definitely wasn't just a rock or a stick bouncing off the car. It was a distinct knock. We sped out of town, soon again laughing it off. However, little did we know that there, that wasn't the last time that we'd see this creepy town. We attempted to get away from it to go back to our usual route, but we soon realized that no matter which way we turned, it led us right back into the town, and every single time driving past the same exact place, and we always heard that knock. We must have drove through the town at least six times before we managed to get out. When we finally got back home, the first thing I did was Google the town. To our horror, the official Wikipedia page of this town states that the town is haunted by four ghosts. The strange thing is we've never seen that town before. We haven't seen it on any of the street signs. Yet now, every time we go on our usual country roads, we see it on every sign, almost like we unlocked a new area in a game. We basically gone back a couple times since, but now it seems a lot more lively and normal, even at night. We've also tried to find the farm road that first led us to it, and it's been a few months since all of it happened, yet we still can't find that farm road. It's like it disappeared. Duen tried to get me to play. So I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, located in the Caribbean. According to our folklore, a Duen is the spirit of a child who died before baptism. They have no faces except for an O-shaped mouth, feet turned backwards, and a large hat. They usually lure children into the woods so as to make them lost and die. They also tend to be present at rivers and bamboo patches. Growing up, my grandparents and elder relatives would always warn me about them, considering that I live near a forested area and there's a river right behind my house. They used to say if Juens heard somebody call your name, that they can take on the voices of those persons and use it to lure you in. I usually ignored their warning and would play close by the river by myself because I was an only child back then. One evening when I was about ten, I was in my hammock in the patio. And note that I had a clear view of the river and the bamboo patch from where I was. It was around 4 p.m. when I realized the atmosphere suddenly turned eerie. The wind stopped blowing. The trees were still as fuck. Not a sound could be heard from any animals. The street I live in became too quiet, and it was like it was frozen in time. While rocking in the hammock, I heard my mom suddenly call my name. It was as if she was shouting, and she just kept calling me for two minutes straight until I shouted back, All right, I'm coming. Now, this is where it gets weird. All the time she was calling, it was coming from the direction of the bamboo patch across the river. I was confused as to why my, my, why my mom would be there, but my gut told me to check inside the house first. Walking through the house, I could still hear her calling me until I reached the back room and found my mom doing laundry. I asked if she was calling, and she said she never called me. I looked out the back door, and the calling stopped. I asked my mom if she heard somebody calling my name, and she said she heard nothing. Since then, I stopped playing outside, and I had never heard my name called again, at least not from the other side of the river. Story number 14, Death Premonition. Dream. At the time, it made no sense to me. In the dream, I was walking through my garden, and not far from me, I could see my father. He was sitting in a sofa, but his facial expressions were blank. He was staring at nothing, and his head was tilted to one side, arms beside his legs, and he wasn't moving. I could see a lot of people I didn't know walking behind him, 
talking about where they would get his car and who would keep his watch and other belongings. After I heard this conversation, I felt angry and I started to yell that he wasn't dead and to go the hell away for acting like vultures over his possessions. That was the end of the dream. A few days go by and I told my best friend about it. It made no sense to us because our dad was alive at the moment and he was healthy. Three months forward, I was at another city and received a call from him. My sister and I lived together. But when we reached the cell phone, it was too late. We tried to call him back, but he didn't answer. Later that day, our mom called us to let us know that my dad was ill and a car would be picking us up to come home. We arrived home early to learn that my father passed away that very day. A few years before, there was one day I couldn't find him. My parents were divorced and I was living with my mom. I went to his house and the TV and the lights were on, but he didn't open the door, so I came back crying thinking the worst. Somehow he knew I was looking for him and arrived at my mom's house like 20 minutes later. He asked why I was crying, and I told him that I thought something had happened to him. He just hugged me and laughed, but he made a promise. He said, when I leave, I promise I'll call you to let you know. And he kept his promise. Only after the funeral, I noticed I dreamt of his death. My mom was the one who found him. And when I told her my dream and how I saw him, she looked at me scared. The position and the place were the same. After losing my father, I developed a strange ability. I can now tell if someone has a long time to live or if their time is almost up. Former neighbor's spirit roaming my old house. So I used to live in a council house before my mom moved in with my stepdad. While living there, it was just me and my mom. I had three experiences living in that house. I'm glad to be out of there. Before I get to those stories, my former neighbor died while I was living in the place. The neighborhood didn't know this until his garden started smelling and becoming untidy. He definitely didn't leave the house, as any of us would have, I guess, just noticed. People knocked on his door to no avail. Eventually, the police were called and they broke into his house to find his body there. I can't remember how he died, but yeah, it may be related to what happened to me. I'm a bit suspicious. Now, on to the experiences. So once I had a late night, my mom went to bed and I went up like 5 to 15 minutes after. Anyway, I turned off my laptop and I headed for the corridors. The doorway I was going to went two ways. Left, the kitchen, where beside that doorway was the front door and a staircase, and right, a little room where you sort of top the electricity with a key. I went left, obviously, since I was going to bed, and then the lights turn off, like some paranormal activity shit, and I saw a fucking white figure walking from the sink. I didn't full-on scream, but I did yelp. I blinked, and everything was back to normal. When I think back on it now, I think that my mind was just fucking with me. I'm a superstitious person, but I'm thinking of a rational explanation here. But then, this experience... Oh, mighty God, this experience. So I was in bed, like 2 or 3 a.m., and I get out of bed for a piss. And then before going into the toilet room, it's one of those bathrooms with the toilet only, mind you, I peek into my mom's room, and there's a fucking hand looming over my mom's head and what looked, and it just disappeared. Mind you, no one was in that fucking house but us. I, being the dumbass I was, went into the bloody toilet before warning my mom instead of pissing myself. Impossibly bright, human-shaped figure down the hall. When I was around eight or nine, I lived in a large house that was built brand new. So new, in fact, my family paid for the lot that the house was built on. A suburban neighborhood, it was tucked between some mountains on a large hill. 
Growing up, I had more than my fair share of odd encounters at this house. Looking back now, I often wonder if the land that we were on had some sort of history. It's worth mentioning where I live. Native American artifacts had been discovered throughout the area. One night, I had an uneasy feeling being alone in my room. I then opted to sleep in my parents' room, so I made my way out of mine. I had to make a sharp right down the hall to get to their room. As I turned the corner, I immediately saw a tall, blindingly bright figure standing in the middle of the hallway. It was so incredibly bright. It was hard to look at. Not that I wanted to. But the weird thing about it was that it didn't emit light. It just was light. I'm unsure if that makes sense to most, but I guess the way that I'd best describe it is like a five-foot-plus figure of light that didn't illuminate the hall, but was just impossibly bright on its own. Fear kicked in immediately, and I instinctively buried my face in my arms and followed the wall past it. I was too scared to do anything else. To this day, I have not seen anything like it since. I've tried to rationalize it for a long time, but I come up with little explanation. You know when you're in a bright room, and then once it goes dark... You see those bright flashes for a second while your eyes adjust? I thought it just may be that, but it doesn't make much sense for it to be the reason as my bedroom's fairly dark, with the exception of a small nightlight in the wall. It doesn't seem drastic enough to change light to see spots. Also, this didn't occur right as I left my room into the dark hallway, but when I was walking down the hall and made a turn, I don't know, I've never looked much into it, but might do some research now that I've found this thread, and I've seen some of its users have explained something similar. My Room So for some context, my whole life I've always had weird, unexplainable encounters, and to be honest... I think it's because my mom is kind of witchy and does some sketchy shit. Anyway, I'm pretty sure that I have an attachment. I live in a new house with different family members. This house has gone through generations of family. I don't think spooky shit happened when others were living here, so that's what makes me believe the attachment because weird shit and vibes just follow me around. Anyway, to the story of my room. So my room is always the coldest or the hottest in the house, and it sucks. I've had shit fall off shelves and my TV will turn off or my light will flicker on and off. And I'll just wake up in the middle of the night to my closet door and it'll just be open. Whenever I come back from anywhere. Just regular creepy shit. But a family member told me something about a year ago that kind of freaked me out. It was the day after Christmas, like super early in the morning and said family member woke up on the couch and went around the house to make sure everything was turned off and locked before she went to bed. She came upstairs and saw that my door was closing, so she just thought I went to the bathroom and I was closing my door back. So she checked the other rooms that came to see if I was awake, and she opens my door and I'm sleeping, so she says my name and wakes me up. I was pissed because, like, what the fuck, the sun is barely up, and she asks me, Did you just come from the bathroom? And I said, no. And she just casually goes, well, your door was just closing. And at the time I was like, okay. Then I rolled over and went back to sleep. The next day I asked her about it and she told me that after that happened, she went back to her room and her bathroom fan and light were on. She didn't leave them on. And ever since then, creepy shit's happened, like moving in empty bedrooms and the front door that we don't use just being wide open. Then she saged the... Excuse me? Then she saged the house, because she saw something dark following me around. Just creepy stuff happens. Not a lot, but yeah. My Creepy Dorm Room I had an uneasy feeling after my parents left me in the dorm room this past September. 
The first few weeks were uneventful, no trouble sleeping. A detail that's important to this story is my room decorations. I brought two tiny strings of mini Himalayan salt rocks to hang in my room. One was wrapped around my mirror and the other on my bookshelf. One night I woke up around 4 a.m., rolled over to the side that faced my room. I noticed the Himalayan salt rock lights around my mirror glowing. The light flickered a few times before going out. I got out of bed, flipped on the light, and inspected the battery compartment. Sure enough, they were switched off. It was weird. I decided to take the batteries out and deal with it in the morning. I managed to fall asleep. Fortunately, I had one of the scariest, most vivid dreams. In the dream, I woke up and saw the lights hanging on my bookshelf flickering. I remember getting out of bed and going to turn off the lights, but froze when I heard a voice from behind me. I don't remember exactly what it was said, but it was something like, "Uh Uh-oh, not again. I woke up and I was completely terrified. I raced to turn on the light and refused to go back to sleep for the rest of the night. I kept glancing over at the mirror, because I've heard mirrors can act as portals. I covered the mirror with a blanket, which made me feel a little bit uneasy. It gets weirder. At about 5 a.m., I decided to text my boyfriend. Strangely, he texted me back about 15 minutes later. It was weird that he was up at such an hour, especially since he was up late the night before on the phone with me. I FaceTimed him to explain exactly what happened. After my story, I asked him why he was up so early. And he said that he had a scary dream and all he remembers from it is being upset and crying. He told me that he had this uneasy feeling and an urge to check his phone. That's when he saw my text and texted me back. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it was just a dream. I'm home for winter break now. and I'm thankful to get a break from that room and not be afraid to fall asleep. Twice I've heard random noises in my home. I rent a house, and so far, I've never really had any bad vibes. It just feels great, to be honest, and I love it here. I've previously lived in potentially haunted houses before and had weird vibes in places, so I certainly know the difference between a welcome home and an uncomfortable one. However, on occasion, twice now, I've heard mysterious noises. Only this afternoon, I was in the kitchen preparing food for myself. I was home alone when I heard a loud chatter from somewhere in the house, but I couldn't pinpoint to any one room. It was loud enough to think something moderately heavy had fallen and perhaps clattered against something. Like multiple items clattering together, if that makes any sense. Perhaps books or CDs falling off a shelf, or maybe my son's toys. My first thought was maybe my child had stacked something awkwardly on his desk and then something had knocked them off. But I checked and all of his toys were fine, nothing had fallen. I also perhaps thought that maybe some clothes had fallen off the coat hangers and perhaps landed on something. I checked the bedrooms, the living room, etc. Absolutely nothing had fallen or been disturbed. But this isn't the first time. The very same thing happened about three or four weeks ago. I was having a smoke at the back door of the house and heard a load of tumbling, crashing sounds, but couldn't locate the source. I know it's not an intruder. The house is tiny and I've checked everywhere. No cellar, sealed off attic, etc. I have no pets. My son wasn't home. It genuinely sounded like a phantom noise, loud enough to make me jump, so that rules out any sounds coming from the neighbors. I never heard either neighbor. The walls are quite thick. There's nothing in the back garden that could have made the noise either, nor from the front street, which is generally quiet. Utterly baffled. What makes it weirder is that I couldn't tell if the sound came from upstairs or downstairs, just somewhere very close, like a room or two away. That said, even after that, I still feel safe here, so I don't think it's anything malignant. I should also add I was sober both times it's happened. In 
encounter with a witch in an Indian village. When I was seven or eight years old, I used to play with my buddy in a large field behind my house. It was winter, and when the terrifying incident occurred, the sun was setting down at 5.30 p.m., casting an eerie glow over the surroundings. My buddy and I had wandered quite far from home, and a thick layer of fog began to blanket the area. Knowing it was time to head back, we started walking, hoping to find the distant lights of our neighborhood. After a few minutes, we stumbled upon a small area filled with bamboo trees, a place we had seen before. In the middle of this eerie grove was a small pond. We grew uneasy as we realized that this was the opposite direction from our home. Confused and frightened, we turned around and ventured forward, our vision obscured by the fog. We walked carefully through the dried-up winter rice fields, barely able to see anything beyond our feet. Suddenly, we encountered an old lady in our path. She was hunched over, clutching a dusty cloth that resembled a bag. Her old sari was torn and worn, and she appeared to be a beggar. We approached her, thinking that she might be trying to convey something to us. But she uttered an incomprehensible gibberish, a really bad rotten smell filled the air. Looking up at her, we saw her eyes glowing with a sinister yellow-red hue, and she began to laugh maniacally. Overwhelmed by fear, we sprinted away, desperate to escape her clutches. After what felt like an eternity, we finally reached our home. Trembling, I recounted the horrifying encounter to my family. My grandmother's face turned pale she hurriedly sprinkled ganja water, holy water, on me, muttering prayers under her breath. She explained that we had just come face to faith, face to face, with a daini, a witch. The next day, I fell gravely ill with a high fever that lasted for an entire week. To make matters worse, my friend contracted a severe case of pox shortly afterward, and his condition far more agonizing than mine. I saw a ball of light. This has been many years ago. I was 13. It was at night. I was watching TV with my mom and she fell asleep, so I went to go to the computer as the movie ended. I was 100% awake and fully conscious, not tired. I've always been a night person since I was a little kid. As I entered the room with the computer there, was a ball of light floating in the air. It was a little below my eye level, and it was slowly moving straight from one wall to the other side of the room. I don't remember how it disappeared, if it went through the wall to the other side or just vanished. I was somehow mesmerized, and I was just calmly standing there and watching. I felt calm and peace. When it disappeared, I just normally continued to go to the computer. Just after 15 or 20 minutes, I realized I saw something weird, so I became afraid. I woke up my mom and went back to sleep. It's interesting that I wasn't afraid at that moment, but after I realized it was something weird. There was a camera right in front of me, but I was somehow mesmerized and I just didn't think to take a picture. It was a very light blue, almost white, but it didn't look electrical at all. It was made of milky, ethereal light. It was a small ball that was inside and maybe more dense. Well, the inside part was more dense, but then a big ball around it. Just like one thing that you can see through a layer outside, the inside ball and the outside layer were connected by two streams, and the light was slowly moving between them was all about the size of a human head, and inside the ball was about the size of a light bulb. I was really 100% awake, haven't seen anything like it in TV, and I'm 100% sure I literally saw it physically with my own eyes. I've never seen anything like that before nor after. I don't have hallucinations, and I was 13, so obviously I didn't use any substances.
Story number six, Astral Traveling with My Mom. When I was small, about four or five, I went on a journey with my mom. Right up until 15 years later, I merely thought it was just a lucid dream until my mom and I were talking about different things and she happened to mention the time that she accidentally took me astral traveling with her. It's a family talent that I discovered years later. In fact, on many occasions before this particular time, Mom, who was 23 at the time, used to go astral traveling with my 19-year-old uncle, who was in his youth very well practiced in the craft of our ancestors, and taught me a fair bit about nature magic, quote-unquote, as he used to call it, and the positive magnetic energy of the planet. On this night, my uncle, and his girlfriend, and my mom, was initially alone. She told me that she felt herself slipping away from her natural state as usual, but remembered that I was laying in the bed beside her. So not wanting to leave me alone unattended, she linked our psyches before transcending to the other state of being, and it was there that I took on a dream. The first thing I noticed was the sound. It was a low-toned buzzing that I couldn't relate to or recognize. The nearest thing I can liken it to now, and even still it won't really be able to accurately describe it, is radio static. I was also aware of all the colors. They were all very muted pastels, lilacs, purples, blues, and pinks, all looking not quite real, dreamy. The light around and the color simmered and pulled gently. I felt the wind, a constant, chilly, silent wind, which slightly made my cheeks numb and fingers tingle. I remember Mom holding me tightly around my waist. It actually felt as if we were flying. That doesn't explain the sensations as well as I thought, though. There were several other feelings, too. I don't have much recollection of anything else, just waking up the next morning beside Mom and remembering all the really vivid, happy things in the dream. My Dad's Best Friend, Long Read I'm from New York City, and a week ago, my father's best friend of 15 years plus was murdered in a hit and run, and it made the news on the Daily News website. I've seen and experienced the paranormal in my whole life, but nothing quite like this. My dad's friend, Jackie, died tragically. He was run down by an impatient driver. The driver parked their car and left leaving Jackie pinned under the car. He was dragged for 50 feet. It seemed like he was going to survive, but he passed away at Bellevue Hospital. My father told me the news on Monday. I only met Jackie when I was a kid, like 13, and I'm 23 now. I had no connection to him, and I only knew him as my dad's best friend and co-worker. I was distraught at first because my dad was in pain and I'd never seen him that way before. That same evening, around 10 p.m., I start to feel agitated and angry and in denial. I knew I was feeling pretty neutral, but for some reason I was angry and confused. I tried to brush it off and I went to go lie down in bed to relax. I'm wide awake. I suddenly became very cold, but the heat was on in my home, so I had no reason to be freezing. I then began to go numb and I felt something enter my body. I hear his last two loud heartbeats, and then something left my body. I got up fast, and I heard someone whisper and ask, Why? In my left ear. I never experienced this before, and after that day, he hung around near me and in my home for at least two days, and I felt his emotions in all the stages of grief. Anyway, I just wanted to share this experience never really told anybody except for my mother, and she has a gift where she can see, hear, and talk to spirits better than I can. So she was able to validate my experience for me, and had her own experience with Jackie as well. It's been a week since he passed, and his funeral is later today. I hope he gets justice, and they find the person who hurt him.
just had a genuinely spooky moment at an old Cold War bunker. This place is not known to be haunted, nor are there any deaths associated with it, as far as I know. It's open to the public and maintained, so not an oozy, cold, and dark ruin. I was standing in a hallway outside of a telephony museum room, and my friends were still poking around inside. I was looking at a blueprint map of the facility. In the wall opposite the door to the room where the fluorescent light above me just went off. None of the many other lights in the corridor were out. Every one of them were working fine. I chalked that down to maybe a random failure. A few moments later, most of my friends exited the museum room, but one stopped at the doorway, noticing a hole in the floor beside the door, and suggested I come and take a look. So I re-entered the room to investigate it with them. The door closed behind me and we were alone. Just as we were about to peer down the hole, a woman's scream came from behind us, in the corner of the room that was filled with old 50s and 60s technology and floor-to-ceiling high cabinets full of wires. Nowhere for anyone to hide. All fully lit, so no dark spaces. We both head toward the scream, both looked round toward the source at the same time. Now there was a video running on TV explaining the uses of the tech in the room, a typical monotone instructional archive type of deal. But I cannot see why they have a random scream in a portion of the video that was explaining how the telephones worked. In other rooms, they do show films of old public information reels. There is some screaming in those, but you can't hear them outside of their designated areas, and certainly not in the room we were in. I've been to this bunker twice before and never heard the scream, nor had a light wink out above me. This did freak us out a bit. The rest of the group didn't really think much of it as we explained what we had experienced, and the friend that was with me does not entertain any notion of ghosts or spirits or anything like that. I think I accidentally opened a portal in my home. So let's go back to when I first moved into my house just over a year ago. There was nothing in this house. I know that for a fact. My nan was a medium. She checked the house and it was all clear. And I also have some empathetic abilities. So I can usually feel when there's something going on and I got nothing from this house. After my nan passed away, a few ago, I noticed more and more happenings in the house, but it didn't feel like it could have been my nan visiting. It started off with little things here and then, a couple little taps throughout the house, but over the past couple months it's been more active, and there's a very dark energy lingering in my spare bedroom. Once again, it didn't start off very strong, but it's been getting stronger and stronger over the past few weeks. More activity, setting off motion detectors, and just like the feeling when you go into a spare room is horrible. There's something bad in there and it's getting stronger. I've been racking my brain trying to think of what I brought into the house that I might have attracted it and maybe brought it in. I've done multiple cleansing rituals, but it hasn't gone away. It seems to just be pissed off that I'm trying to get rid of it. Even going so far as to hide my sage stick, so I had to buy a new one yesterday. I was talking to my sister on the phone yesterday about all of this. We got around to the subject of mirrors and how having two mirrors directly facing each other can create a portal. She asked me if I had any mirrors facing each other in my home, to which I said, no, I don't think so. Then it hit me. I went to check the spare room and as it turns out, I do. I have some wardrobe doors with mirrors on them that I haven't put on the wardrobe yet and I've just leaned them up against the side of the wardrobes until I got around to fixing it. The mirrors are directly facing each other, and they're in the spare room where the dark energy lingers. I'm thinking I should just move the mirrors and cleanse the house again, but is there anything else I should do to make sure it's definitely gone?
Is there any truth to the suggestion that emotional distress invites or facilitates paranormal phenomenon? There have been a few times, probably a dozen occasions over the past five years of our relationship, where my fiancé was swept into a serious, dire headspace. It was and is a pretty dramatic departure from the person that I knew. She's bipolar and emotions are a lot more than just emotions for her. She's currently having a rough time, the worst in nine months. And two things happened just this evening. A single wooden chair that sits adjacent to us as we lay on the couch made a thud and a whine against the tile floor, as if someone had slumped down into it. Our eyes were on the TV at the time, but we both jerked our heads towards it. The other was when I was alone in the study. A piece of folded paper at the end of my desk darted a few inches my direction. It was in the corner of my eye, granted, but I know what normal paper behaves like under gravity. This was flicked. Prior to these, I caught a door moving on its own and a trash can lid. Those flip ones, flipping on its own. It's only ever small and innocuous things, but it's always during these severe, depressive, or mixed episodes. I'm pretty rational, and I'm an intelligent person, but I also think instincts count for something. I've spent 30 years around everyday objects like chairs and paper and doors, so I'd like to think I'm pretty familiar with how they should and shouldn't operate. She herself experiences much more distressing phenomenon, too. Regular sleep paralysis, guaranteed hallucinations if we don't have a nightlight. And of course, they always get worse when her emotional stability declines. Her mother has a habit of sporadically declaring deaths as soon as we walk into a particular building. Sometimes she won't do it for months, and then she'll announce, you know, insert person here, died, at this location, the moment that we cross the threshold, as though it's spoken through her rather than by her. Story about my childhood at my stepfamily's house in North Carolina. I live in New York with my mom while my dad moved to North Carolina with his new wife and the house that they live in is supposedly haunted by spirits that follow my oldest stepbrother. Now, lucky me, I've never actually seen these spirits with my eyes, but I have felt and heard them. I visit each summer, and a situation I even wanted to talk to you all about was this one time where me and my stepbrother, Ellie, were home alone while my other stepbro named Gabriel was at school. It was midday and sunny out when I decided to go upstairs and grab my PS Vita, but as I was walking up the stairs, I heard something from the attic that sounded like Gabriel screaming, saying, Ellie, Ellie, help me. And I froze and had never been that scared in my life. Something kept me from even talking to another since the scream was coming from directly above me. I looked down at Ellie, who was under the stairs on the couch watching TV, and asked if he had heard Gabriel. He said, fuck that, bro. And just started running out of the house, and I followed him, like the brave hero I am. But no joke, that was by far the most I've ever felt fear in my life. Whatever was talking to us, or I guess talking to Ellie, sounded evil, even though it was talking in Gabriel's voice. The school they went to was about an hour bus ride, so Gabriel didn't get home until 4.30ish, and of course we told him about it, and he thought that we were all crazy, but I would see him run to the bathroom at night sometimes. <laughs> but anyways, the most I've ever seen up until that point was a door closing on its own while we were playing Smash or something on the 3DS. And another time at night, I felt a blanket pulled or tugged off me. But this time was different. That voice, hearing that desperation in its voice yelling for us, still sends chills down my spine. If any of you ever heard of these stories, or things like it, what would be, maybe mine look kind of lame in comparison, especially my oldest stepbrother. My uncle visited me the day of his death. 
I'll start by saying that my uncle, my mother's brother, had been quite ill for some time and was living in Guadalajara, Mexico. My family lives in Southern California, and I haven't seen him in 20 years since we couldn't afford to take the whole family to Mexico for regular visits, but we would speak here and there throughout the years. On Easter Sunday, my husband and I were putting up a new gate, and he and my son made, had made it the day before. I turned around to grab a tool and saw a tall, dark man with messy, curly hair walking toward me from the backyard. He came around me and then disappeared. Full disclosure, I see figures quite a bit, so this didn't really scare me. Yet, when my husband came back, I told him about the man and described him. He didn't recognize him, but we joked that it may have just been a nosy spirit wanting to see the quote-unquote construction happening at the house. Later that day, I took my kids to my brother's house where my mom is currently staying. She received a call from my aunt, her sister, but my mom didn't want to answer right away. She wanted to play with the grandkids and said that she would call her later. After I got home, my brother called and said that my aunt had called to try to tell us that her uncle Rito died earlier that day. My mother was devastated, and after speaking with her and consoling her, I remembered my encounter with the dark figure. I searched through some old pictures. As I said, I had only a 20-year memory of my uncle, and I realized that that's who visited me, or I guess visited me. Except for one thing. My uncle was short, maybe five foot eight, and this person was about six feet tall. But they both had curly, disheveled hair, had a bit of a pot belly, but still thin in the shoulders and legs. I haven't told my mother because I don't want to make her feel bad, but I think it may comfort her to know that my brother came by to say a final hello and a goodbye. A ghost? Something woke me up at seven. On a weekday, during the time of lockdown, this was the time when students had to do their schoolwork from home, I was half asleep in my bed and I didn't get up for school, considering the fact that my alarm didn't go off. I laid there in my bed for a while until I heard a knock at my bedroom door. I don't know the specific number of knocks, if that's relevant, but all I know is that I heard a woman's voice talking to me. Cody, wake up, it's 8.30. I assumed it was my mom because she's the only lady in the house and looked at my phone to check. It was 7.30, an hour before I had to wake up to start school. I was still dazed from laying there for so long, so I replied. Mom, I still have an hour. About an hour later, I went to the table for breakfast, and when my mom walked into the room, I brought it up. She looked at me confused and then answered my question. I never went to your door. I was walking the dog at that time like I always do. That's when it hit me. That female voice at the door didn't sound anything like my mom. I shrugged it off by the time I had to show up for class, but during the break between the Zoom meetings, I soon realized something. Whoever that was, why and how did she know my name? Later, when all my classes were done, I told my family what happened. My older brother just brushed it off and said that I was probably still dreaming, which didn't make much sense because it felt so real. Everything I came into contact with, I could feel. Meanwhile, my dad just frowned at me. Did you respond to it? That's all he asked. And when I confirmed it, he went on a rant on spirits and ghosts. My dad very much believes in this type of thing. Whenever we bring up this topic, he always mentions that he has a sixth sense. All he told me was that it's a bad thing that I responded, and it's even worse that whomever that knew my name. So, yeah, that happened. I just find it odd that whoever or whatever that was only did it once and never came back. Did I invite something into my apartment? My first post here, but 
I felt the need to share, lest I go crazy. I've been a paranormal slash witchery follower for my entire life. It's interesting, and it's led to quite a few minor experiences. My mother, who's had many more experiences and has more knowledge than me, always warned me not to mess with things, and until now, I really hadn't. As a short background, I recently moved into my own apartment, and I've been super stressed due to uni life. Looking for a way to de-stress, I was scrolling through TikTok and found a video about manifesting by putting yourself into a trance-like state and willing a connection. It honestly seemed like a good idea at the time. I did it, nothing happened, but I felt calmer, so I continued for a few weeks. A lot of the time, with nothing specific in mind, just putting myself in a trance and reaching out. One time I felt a sudden sharp pain in my wrist that snapped me out of it immediately. No outside injuries, but it continued to hurt throughout the day. After that, things started getting weird. Phantom pains throughout the day, my plant suddenly began to flourish, then die, especially all my sage. Strange noises like hearing my cat despite him not living with me or randomly smelling smoke, often coupled with the noises. But weirdest or worst is when I go to bed. As I began to drift into a place between sleep and wakefulness, I become acutely aware of a feeling of someone sitting at the end of my bed. Then I swear I can almost see a silhouette. I'll get a burning feeling in my legs, like something hot's being held against them. Sometimes it's widespread across my whole calf, or it's just smaller pricks around my knees. Once it even felt like something wrapped around my ankle and pulled along with the sound of laughter. Being alone, this is something that's actually starting to creep me out. I don't know if I'm just connecting weird separate occurrences, though. Ghostly phone call. I live with seven people. Four of us reside upstairs and four downstairs. The downstairs entrance is at the back of the house, so I didn't really see much about the inhabitants. This particular night, my parents and sister weren't at home. The people downstairs were home, but everyone was locked up after 8 p.m. I did the same and decided to get an early night's rest. Around 1.30 a.m. I heard a loud banging sound coming from the front door. Thinking it was my family finally home, I tried to get up, but there was a heavy invisible weight on me that prevented me from doing so. Also, my family had a key that they couldn't open the door easily with. And usually, even in my sleep, I hear the front gate opening, but I didn't hear it unlock or even open. Strange. I eventually got up, and it was as if something possessed me to pick up my cell phone. I hurriedly made to the front door, which was not too far from my room. The banging was louder now, and it was closer, and the door was shaking. Then something made me stop. My parents would call my name no matter what when they came home, and they wouldn't be violently banging on a door like that. I quietly went to the room nearest the front door and peeped out of the window. The banging was still occurring, but there was no one at the door. Then, at that moment, my phone rang. I answered, and a man with a gruff voice said, Open the door. At this point, I was terrified. Obviously, I did not open the door. I texted the number and even tried to call back, but each time I called, there was static on the other side. I don't know how I managed to sleep that night, but when I woke up, I immediately told my family about the incident. They tried dialing the number as well, but again, static. Later that day, I found out that the number was out of service and had been so for the past 20 years. It was definitely one of the scariest experiences I've ever had. We saw the same thing, but we didn't know it at first. One night, me and my boyfriend were in bed, and he was already sleeping, and I was watching on my phone. 
After an hour of watching, he moved and said, Stop touching my feet, I'm trying to sleep. And I was confused because I wasn't even moving. I just thought that maybe it was our dog. I shrugged it off and continued watching. Fast forward to two or more episodes or so in, I decided to sleep. I was sleeping on my side around 2 to 3 a.m. and I suddenly woke up. Something was telling me to lift my head up and look out the corner of the room. As I did, I saw a large shadow, but I wasn't scared. It was super tall and it, I stared at it for a good minute thinking I was just dreaming because I just woke up and my thought hasn't really processed yet. I was thinking to myself that why that part of the room was so dark. I have my Wi-Fi router there and it's supposed to be lit up, but it was super dark. And I can make out this tall shadow and its head. I decided to sleep it off and worry about it the next day. My boyfriend woke me up because he was pissed at me because apparently I was moving all around all night and he hadn't had much sleep. I went to pee, and when I came back, I told him, Hey, I had a really weird dream. He looks at me all confused, and I told him, Last night, I think I woke up and I saw a shadow here, while pointing at where I saw it. I saw it too, he said. I saw it when I woke up, and I told you to stop moving. I was going to tell you, but I don't know. I don't want you to get scared. So I just ignored it. I asked him what he saw and he told me I got goosebumps running all over my body. He said, it was very tall, but I can't see his body or face. It's like a shadow and it felt like a man. After that, I told my mom who was very superstitious and had my room blessed. New House is Haunted A couple of months ago, I moved into an old house, built in 1902, and I felt something was there. I just didn't know how to activate whatever it was that I felt it would be. At first, it was small things, windows not being open or shut like how I left them, doors opening on their own, footsteps down the hallway when it was just my cats and I at home. Like I said, small stuff but things have grown more active in the past week. I've been poked and had someone say my name as if trying to get my attention. I went into my room right after I got real cold real fast. This was the first contact that he attempted to make. The days following this, I felt kind of an uneasy feeling, as if I was unwelcome, and I was being glared at. This feeling wasn't constant, but I could feel where it was coming from, which let me know where he was. Footsteps became louder, banging could be heard throughout the day in various rooms. Although never my room, my cats seem to love my room and often claw the door until I let them in. Once they get into my room, they refuse to leave, hissing at the hallway as I get them out of my room. I believe there was just one spirit in my home, but last night left no doubt that there are two at least. I was laying down for bed watching TV at a very low volume, and all of a sudden, clear as day, right in my ear. Hey. I froze from the shock of a female voice loudly whispering in my ear. I keep watching my show, ignoring it, and then again, hey. More drawn out than the first time. I keep my eyes forward, but I see someone standing at the foot of my bed out of the corner of my eye. She disappeared after a few minutes. She didn't feel malicious, but her energy definitely felt authoritative. A minute later, my cats started zooming as they do, but I heard human footsteps following theirs, and I was the only one awake. The ghost demon that kept following me. So when I was 14 or 15 years old, my parents owned a trailer. One of those that you attach to the bumper of a truck, so a travel trailer. I had bunk beds in it, and I would sleep on the top. We went on a trip near Cloudcroft NM during COVID. 
we went to get out of the house. On the third night, I remember getting up in the middle of the night. It was pitch black because we were out in the mountains. When I peeked out of the curtain, I could see this figure in the dark. And the only thing I could see is its piercing white eyes looking at me. I lay back down trying to sleep again. But not longer after do I hear scratching on the floor. I didn't get up, but I felt a presence behind me as if it was just looking at me. I remember crying to sleep that night. The next encounter I had was with, well, was in my own room. I was 16 at the time, and it was around 12 a.m., maybe to 1. I was just scrolling through my phone before bed, and I turn off my phone, and after 15 minutes of trying to go to bed, I open my eyes and look at the foot of my bed, and it was just staring at me. Again, I put my head underneath the covers, trying to get rid of it or make it go away. It was just observing me. I could feel its eyes seeing through me. My last encounter was also on a trip, this time to San Antonio. It was night again, but this time my parents bought a new fifth-wheel trailer, and I had my own room with the door. I was staying up on my phone once again, but this one is different. I couldn't get it all. But this one is different. If couldn't get in all I remember, interesting wording, is that I was scratching the door. Trying to get in, after a while, I think it gave up and thankfully left. I apologize for my abbreviations there. Waking Precognitive Dream Slash Vision The vision or waking dream, or whatever you want to call it, happened in the summer of 2004. I was driving home from work on a route that I could drive with my eyes closed. I was so used to it. When my mind began to wander, I saw me and my husband going into my stepdaughter's room and finding her hanging in the closet. I was a paramedic at the time, so I saw myself performing each step involved in the beginning of the process of CPR. My husband was hysterical. I knew that 911 had been notified. I just kept focusing on performing CPR, thinking about the crew who's about to get the call. And then I snapped out of it. And I felt awful for thinking such a horrible thing about her, like I had fantasized about what was happening and wanted it to become real. No way did I feel that way. Almost exactly a year later, it actually came true. All of it. We went to check on her and noticed her CD player was skipping and she wasn't fixing it. We went into her room and ultimately found her hanging in the closet. My now ex-husband begged me to save her, so I took a deep breath, pried her mouth open and began CPR. As I performed CPR, another person who happened to show up right as I was running downstairs for the phone actually ended up being the one who was talking on 911, replaying everything I told her to relay. We never spent another night in that apartment. We stayed stayed in the same complex, but we stayed with family while we were waiting for them to get our new apartment ready for us. That was on 9-3-2005. I still wonder if there have been any paranormal experiences in that room. I had a visitation dream a couple weeks later. That was really sweet. I felt awful for having thought it. Then when it came true, I felt even worse. It's not the only prophetic experience I've had, though. Is someone watching me? We've moved into a new house, and some odd things have been happening since we've been here. My wife is aware of activity, and she's walked into our bedroom one night to a black figure sitting on our dresser, looking in my direction as I slept. Nothing has happened since bar-smelling cigarette smoke every now and then, but we got that at our last place too. She told me earlier today that a couple of nights ago she woke up to see someone standing at the bottom of the bed, but to my right side. She asked, what are you doing? No answer, 
and this black figure walked from the wall to the door across the room and stood there. She said to it, Do you realize I can still see you, right? Then it went. I've not seen anything, but a lot is gone in my life, or a lot's been going on, rather. Main ones are a new position in my job, which is causing me to be exhausted daily. Also, this last week, my mom's come to contact with her biological father, who she's never met before. I was the one who dived into the history, finding her grandfather who passed, and then finding her dad. So there's a lot of emotion at the moment. Also, my dad's been having problems health-wise. A side note, a few weeks ago I had a dream. I had driven my car alone to a park, walked to a graveyard where I saw a woman pushing a pram and visiting a grave. I turned to leave her, and as I entered the park, a man was shouting, Get out of here! You know you're not allowed here, right? I asked what was going on. His reply... The man who came in your car was trying to enter, but he's not allowed in here. I was alone in the car, so I asked who this man was. The guy said his name was Michael, my wife's father's name, who had passed away before I met her. He wanted to tell you everything was going to be alright. My thought within my dream was, WTF? Why is he trying to enter my dream? What's going on? Story number four. I may have seen a ghost when I was a kid. When I was around seven, I used to wake up early, because at the time, I thought I was wasting valuable playtime if I woke up late. I had school at 1 p.m., so I liked to enjoy every moment of the morning, waking up sometimes usually at six in the morning or earlier. When I woke up, I usually started playing with my Lego minifigures. I liked them more than the characters than actually build things, because in my mind I was making movies with them. To emulate the camera, I liked to lay on the floor, approaching myself to their faces to make sort of kind of close-ups. So this particular morning I woke up, and I was doing my usual routine, playing with Legos, and my bedroom door was wide open. I was playing, and then I looked back at the door and saw the legs of a person walking in the corridor, right in front of my door, and then going out of my sight in the direction of the living room, and they wore white tennis shoes. I said, Hey, Elza, because I immediately assumed the person was my nanny, who usually arrived pretty early, but she didn't answer. I went back to my Legos, and then for some reason, not much later, I went to the living room to talk to her. She wasn't there. I got confused and went all around the house looking for her, But she wasn't in the house at all. I ran to my brother's bedroom and woke her up and my stepfather, telling them what had happened and asking if Elza really wasn't there. My stepfather said, still sleepily, I heard someone opening the windows. Then they went back to sleep, and I got creeped out for the rest of the morning. Sure, it could have been my active imagination or maybe my mind playing tricks on me, And maybe my stepfather imagined hearing someone opening the window, or I had opened a window and I didn't remember. But at the time, I was very scared with the whole thing. My nanny only arrived around 9 or 10 a.m. that day, if I recall correctly. So I'm no longer allowed to talk about paranormal things in my household. I'm married 23, and now I have four dogs. Because I've had quite a few things happen to me growing up. On July 4th, 2020, in Alaska, me and my wife, my buddy, and his wife decided to go to the hot springs and rent a cabin. While there, we came up on the subject of the paranormal and I explained the things that had happened to me previously. We laughed about it and I started playing around later in the restaurant. If you're there, flicker the lights. And weirdly enough, one did flicker hard. Ignoring it, I saw a bird feeder out of the window and I decided, if you're truly there, make this bird leave. Thinking it would fly away eventually. 
Instead, it got absolutely bodied by a much larger bird. Horrified, my wife decided that that was enough for me. That night, my buddy's wife had something tug her hair in her sleep and had also seen something. My wife had something wake her up, but it was completely silent. After going home, our household there continued to have paranormal noises and our two dogs at the time occasionally stopped and stared at the doorway with nothing there or where they were looking, and they'd just growl and bark viciously, like hares standing on their backs more than I've seen when there's actually fighting or they're fighting each other or anything scary like that. Also, something wouldn't let my wife sleep for four days straight by pushing on her legs when she was almost asleep and making noises in the hallway. I even talked about it at her friend's place, and soon after that, had experienced paranormal things too. So consequently, I've been banned from talking about these things out loud. Not really sure what to make of it, but sounds like a Ouija board is the last thing that I should touch. My tormentor from childhood paid me a visit at 3 o'clock in the morning over 10 years later. When I was between 8 and 12 years old, I grew up in a very haunted house. I believed that there were many spirits there, and I got a glimpse of one who I always believed to be demonic. The best way I could describe its appearance was that it looked like a mummy from the movie The Mummy, but it had huge white eyeballs with small pupils. I started experimenting with using crystals. I would wear them around my neck for protection. I wore rose quartz, amethyst, and black onyx. Not at the same time, but separately. I was very careful about where I purchased them, too, and I made sure to cleanse them. I never wore them in bed, but the one time I did, I regretted it. I fell asleep wearing my black onyx. Around 3 a.m., I'm jolted awake because I had a bad dream. I look at the side of my bed and I saw the same demon-looking creature standing beside me, hovering over me, smiling with a face that looked pure evil. I started freaking out and screaming and I woke my boyfriend up. When my boyfriend woke up, it was gone. I got out of bed and shut off the light. A few weeks later, I saw a shadow person pacing back and forth at the foot of my bed. Then I saw and heard a shadow person walking down the stairs after I caught them staring at me. My amethyst crystal completely disappeared without a trace, but I got rid of my black onyx and haven't experienced any activity since. I still have my rose quartz, and I've had no problems with them. I'd like to also mention that when I was younger, when I saw this thing for the first time, I lived in southern Pennsylvania. Now I live in western New York, so I think that thing may have followed me, but I don't know why I'm seeing it again for the first time in over ten years. Playful Spirits at My Old Workplace I used to work at a retail pet store. Many people don't like that. I sell purebred puppies. I worked in the kennel area taking care of the puppies every day, feeding and grooming them, giving them medicine and weighing them and taking temperatures the whole nine yards. I'd heard before from one of my managers that a couple playful spirits roamed the building, especially whenever it was quiet, like after closing or in the morning before customers arrived. Occasionally things falling off shelves when they were pushed against the back wall a pen that kept falling out of the pencil holder, and giggling when no one was around were the stories that I'd been told. A couple of weeks after hearing about this, I had my first paranormal experience in the store. And I want to preface this by saying the way the store is built. The kennels for the puppies are built into a long wall that divides the retail section of the store from the work area. I was closing up the kennel area and I was about to take out the trash and I saw a man standing in the retail section of the store looking into one of the kennels, looking at a corgi and a shibu inu that we had at the time, who were playing. I 
I was thinking that it was my manager. I pushed through the doors into the main area, and I went to go ask him a question about my shifts, and he's gone. I look across the room, and he's down the hall in the office, and there's no one else in the store besides my co-workers, who had been in the back with me, and the cashier, who was also in the office. I asked my manager if he had just been looking at the puppies, and he said no. Throughout the rest of my time there, I heard giggling, and I saw a few running across the floor. But no one was walking through a curtain, and a human shape was visibly underneath the curtain as it passed through, and I had a pen cap fly off the table as soon as I set it down. Definitely not the worst part of the job. That was actually one of the only perks, actually. Fuck that job, it was terrible. My ghost story from when I was a teenager. So I was around 17 or 18 at the time, and I slept in the basement of a house I grew up in. I had a mattress there, and I would sleep in front of our dryer, with the mattress pointed away from the dryer and my pillow on the end farthest from the dryer. Nothing spooky or weird had ever happened in this house in the time I grew up there before this story. I should add that when I slept, it was pitch black in the room, because being a basement, there really wasn't anything or anywhere for light to get in from. It was so dark that even after your eyes adjusted, you still couldn't see a foot in front of you. I never had a problem with that since I slept well that way. Anyhow, one night I'm snoozing away, and sometime very late in the night, I suddenly awoke to see something standing in front of the dryer. And my feet. A transparent woman dressed in an old-style clothing, like something from the Old West. Long skirt, button-down shirt of some sort, and hair pulled back in a bun. She was holding what looked like a modern laundry basket, and as I laid there for a couple of seconds trying to understand what was going on, she suddenly emptied the laundry basket by tilting it forward towards me. Out of it fell a waterfall of transparent laundry, which I couldn't see clearly since it was bunched up like laundry usually is. At this point, maybe four to five seconds into the incident, I jumped backwards off the mattress and crashed into a bunch of cardboard boxes filled with household items my parents stored in the basement. To say I was scared is a major understatement. The crashing around I did the whole... Well, the crashing around that I did woke the whole rest of my family who turned on the basement light to see what was making all the noise. At this point, the woman had vanished and I was completely alone. This incident shook me pretty good, as I'd always been a skeptic of the existence of spirits and ghosts. Little Snowy Cabin so I live way out in the thick of it. The place looks like a Bob Ross painting. I have a little cabin with a loft that I sleep in, and an outhouse just a few steps away. Not a bad place, except for the stupid ghost noises that happen nearly every night. So it's pretty cold and the cabin is somewhat new, like 2019-ish. So with extreme cold, there's going to be some creaks. But I'm not hearing creaks... I hear footsteps in the snow just outside the windows, despite there being no footsteps in the 10 foot plus snow, sorry, 10 inches plus snow that's around my cabin. There's thumping along the walls, even though there aren't any trees that are close enough to touch the cabin. And even if there were, for the whole time I've been here, there hasn't been wind faster than five miles an hour. They act like to do their thumping, maybe by my heating oil tank which makes a nice metallic clanging sound. Originally, I thought it was someone trying to steal my oil, but again, no footprints other than my own. Sometimes I could hear faint footsteps directly below me while I'm trying to sleep. Ever since I put on one of my spare Bibles down there, where the ghost activity has been contained to, outside of the cabin. If you think I'm going to apologize for formatting, please fill out the apology request form. It can be found in your butt. So at this time, I'm pretty used to it. But it's annoying when I hear something banging on the side of the cabin while I'm trying to sleep. Is there a way I could at least get them to help with the rent since they won't leave? In all seriousness, 
I don't really know what to do. I was raised in the bush. So, I know that if I hear some weird noises in the wood during the night, that I should mind my own business. And I know that I don't want to get mixed up in ghosts and spirits. So how can I make it clear to them that they're not to go in the cabin? Mother's Day this year, Ghost Experience. I went home to Indiana for my four-day weekend off at work. I visited my mom Friday night and Saturday. Sunday, I stayed at my dad's to visit my stepmom. They live in a state park because my stepmom is the property manager. I slept on a twin bed on the floor, and my daughter slept on a cushion bed on the floor next to me on my right side. She's two years old. I woke up in the middle, middle of the night because I heard what I thought was my daughter whining and getting up. I looked over, and it was standing like it was where she already was. Where she had already... Where she was already, and walking to go into another room. I said, quote-unquote, my daughter's nickname. Once I said that, I realized it wasn't her, because she wasn't wearing a gown and it was kind of transparent. It was a white, transparent color. It turned and looked at me. It stared at me long enough that I was thinking, what the heck should I grab? Maybe my phone for a flashlight? So I did. By the time I did that, it vanished. My phone said 305. I know I saw what I saw because I wasn't in sleep paralysis, and once I'm awake, I don't see things like this. I wake up at crazy hours for work sometimes. I know what I seen was there. I checked on my daughter because I was worried about her. She was whining in her sleep a bit, but maybe about two minutes after my daughter woke up, we went to the kitchen and got her some more milk in her sippy cup. I left the kitchen light on because I wanted a nightlight after this. Prayed for my daughter and then went to sleep 40 minutes after this incident. The next morning I told my family what I had seen and they said they had a few experiences there too, but never seen anything. I felt like this little girl didn't mean to show herself to me, thinking I was asleep. My dead granddad spoke to me through the phone. I must state that I didn't believe in spirits or the afterlife until this moment. It's baffled me since it happened. Around four weeks ago, I was getting the kids ready for school and randomly had this sudden urge to go see my granddad at his grave. Like a strange urge which I've never had before. Until then, I hadn't been able to visit his grave in probably close to eight or... Maybe, maybe nine years or more. I'd say more likely ten years. Anyway, I took my youngest son with me as he isn't in school or nursery yet. We visited him, spent about fifteen or twenty minutes there, sobbed my eyes out while I sat in front of his grave. I never got to really see him as he died when I was three. And I have like one pretty clear memory of him. So this was completely new to me, but something overcame me and I just lost control over my emotions. I said goodbye, cleaned his tombstone up a bit before parting ways. We got back to the car and proceeded to exit the cemetery. I must stress that the radio was on. There was no noise in the car at all. My phone was in the cup holder upright, with the case closed so impossible for me to touch anything or catch something by mistake. My son was being quiet in the back, very rare for him, and we drove out of the cemetery. We got no more than 15 or 20 seconds down the road when my phone's voice, Bixby slash Siri, literally said, Hey, that was really nice spending time with you today. You've made my day. I pulled over in disbelief of what just happened and called my mom to tell her. When I couldn't hold it together and absolutely cried my heart out until I could drive again. It was a little creepy, but also very, very heartwarming. Story number 13 
Could eye floaters be the answer to why animals, like cats and dogs, sometimes act as if interacting with something invisible sporadically? FYI, floaters are those things that you can see in your eye, which look like little worms and move along within your eyeball. They're actually tiny particles that are too small to affect the eye, and too big to be completely transparent. They stick to the eye's surface and move as we move our eyeballs. They also form as a result of gradual decay of the vitreous humor. Look it up if you're still confused. Edit. So there seems to be confusion in what floaters actually are. From asking my teacher and googling it, it seems like there's more than one reason for floaters. Microscopic debris, decaying of the vitreous humor in college and floating around. In any case, these floats, or floaters, <laughs> rather, move around in your eye and cast a shadow on the retina, which creates a semi-translucent projection where you see it. Anyways, my cat was sitting beside me, and she sort of randomly put her hands in the air, as if reaching out for something. Then she acted like she was trying to chase it, like a bug or something. After some time, she settled down, and quite intrigued, and admittedly a little bit weirded out, because it's midnight and completely silent, I thought about what it could have been, as I'm not really a believer. After a while, it struck me that it could have been a floater. Since animals aren't the smartest, maybe they see floaters floating about and attempt to go after it, thinking that it's a bug or something similar, since they obviously can't understand what it really is. And when it settles down, they return to their normal behavior. Animals have eyes that are obviously larger and more pronounced than humans, so maybe such floaters are more likely to stick to their eyes. An entity grabbed my legs. To preface this, I, a 29 female, live in a home built in the 60s with my mom, a 51 female, and roomated with a 62-year-old female and my husband, 38-year-old male. Our landlord's father passed away not too long ago and things have been going on since we had her bathroom remodeled. A year ago it was small things, items being thrown, hushed whispers heard at any time of the day, and a shadow of a child seen in a few rooms. Last month, we had the master bathroom remodeled, as it was causing structural damage to the house and things have been crazy ever since. The first night after the remodel, I could smell someone smoking right in the living room. Granted, our roommate smokes outside and doesn't ever smoke in the house. The smoke smell would follow me into the bedroom, where it would feel like someone was standing over me, constantly blowing cigarette smoke into my face day and night. Then it led into me not being able to walk into my bathroom without letting the air know that I was coming in. Because if you don't, whatever it is is in there, it gets so angry that the air gets heavy. The day I was grabbed, it was roughly 4 or 5 a.m. since I worked the night shift, and I was trying to go to bed. I was laying next to my husband when I felt a rope or a tail wrap around my left knee then switch to my right. I was so scared I ended up smudging the whole home salting the doorways into and out of the house and putting salt on the three mirrors in the bathroom. I don't have any spirit board or anything like that to communicate with on the other side, and I don't want to. There's still hushed conversations happening, but I don't smell smoke anymore, and nothing has ever tried to touch me since. Lady in White, protecting us. For the past four days now, starting on April 10th, whenever I'm sitting on my couch in the living room, out of the corner of my eye I see a lady dressed in all white in a robe. I usually dismissed it as a trick of my eye or a curtain flowing, but each time the family dog, who never barks at anything, rushes the door and goes insane. Every time I notice and turn my head to look, she's gone, except for one time when I saw her and looked into her eyes. Her face was kind, and her eyes, these are air quotes, you can't see them, but I'm air quoting, 
not only eyes, and not really a face either, so not really so much a female, but I'm just going to say feminine, because something just feels like that. And they were soft, but dangerous, like this thing is powerful and yet gentle. I've grown up in a fairly religious Christian household, and I've always been really sensitive to spirits and their general intentions. Ask me why I hate going to most churches. Her intentions feel protective, and I've only ever caught a, I guess, a glance, really, as she paces our front porch in front of our door. So I'm not so much scared of her, but more scared of her presence and its meaning. I've tried to think of anything out of the ordinary, such as a new item in the house, or a deviation from normal schedules, or something like that. Anything, really. But nothing. The, the only thing I can possibly think of is Friday, April 9th, into Saturday, April 10th. And there was a severe storm that blew down a really, really old tree in our neighborhood, across the street from us, in the front yard. My brother finally sees it. At this point in time, I was going through a phase where I would jump scare people. It was funny. I don't know. My brother got the majority of the jump scares. So he was paranoid at every turn because I could be hiding behind something. We were living in a two-bedroom apartment and we had a shared closet, bathroom, and a room. So one summer night, I'm outside in my car, smoking a cigarette and talking to some people. My phone rings and it's my brother. He asks where I'm at and I say I'm outside the apartment smoking. He keeps asking me where I really am and to stop lying. I'm getting pissed and scared because I hate being called a liar and he never acts like this. So I ask him in a serious tone, what the fuck is going on? He says he thinks he saw it parked my car and I go home. I asked him what happened and why does he think he saw it? He says he saw our bedroom door slightly open. As soon as he opened the door to my bed, well basically as soon as you open the door my bed is right there in front of you. The room was dark but he says he saw the imprint of someone sitting on the edge of my bed. He says he spoke to it thinking that it was me trying to scare him. He told me he said, Nando, is that you? I know it's you. Stop playing. Stop trying to scare me. I can see you, bitch. Then the figure gets up and walks into the closet. He continues. Nando, stop playing. I know you went to the closet. I'm not stupid. He turned on the lights and went into the closet to look for me, but it was empty. That's when he called me. His opinion on the paranormal changed after that. He knew not to mess with any of it. The Blue Boy I was fairly young, probably about 12 years old. Me and my family were up in Scotland visiting, and on the way back we stopped off in a place called Alnwick in Northumberland to visit the infamous Chillingham Castle. My uncle, who lived in Burnwick, upon Tweed, was very much a skeptic of the stories of the castle and claimed he slept there overnight. We got to the doors and my parents paid for the tickets for the tour. On the way in, there were signs saying no flash photography, which I noticed. The tour was amazing, so much history and especially the dungeons, where they had on display all the instruments of torture that were used in the castle dating all the way back to the 1200s. At one point in the tour, we were walking past one room called the Pink Room, which was roped off, where I saw a blue flash of light inside. I looked at my mother and said to her that I thought people had to go into the room and were taking photos, and that it was naughty as it wasn't allowed. My mother agreed and we continued the tour. On our way out of the castle, my little sister begged for a book of the castle and its history. My parents gave in and bought, brought, her the, brought her the book. On the way back home, my sister mentioned that there was a section in the book 
listing all the known ghosts of the castle, one of which being known as the Blue Boy, which is commonly seen as a blue flash or halo. The owners of the house believe that the Blue Boy is linked to a child's skeleton, which was found hidden behind a wall in one of the rooms in the house during renovation. The very same room I saw the flash. My mother looked at me and said, I think that's what you saw, son. Weird frickin' book. So about 10 years ago in 2011, I moved out of my family's house into my first apartment. This is a small town of Colorado, with its only real claim of fame being a big hole in the ground. I moved in with a buddy of mine who I knew in high school, and all was well for a while. My friend needed to move out of state, leaving me to a cycle of replacements to cover as part of the bills. The last roommate I had... I had almost no contact with, but he managed the money and mostly kept in his room at the back of our house. Eventually, one day I get a knock on the door. Police with a warrant to step inside to his room, cuff him, and leave. I still don't know what it was about, but I haven't heard from him since. The police interaction was the last straw for my landlord, and I received a three-day court-mandated eviction. While cleaning his room, I removed mostly trash and a toolbox that was mainly screwdrivers and what seemed like a sketchbook or a journal that he might have bound himself. Until recently, when I found it on top of a closet that I was expanding, I had completely forgotten about it. I have no idea how it made it through the cleaning and the subsequent moves over the last decade. I can think of at least three places I lived, not to mention couch hopping. Yet somehow this book made it through? I'm not sure where to start researching this thing, but the pen work is so detailed and painstaking. I felt it must be something of note. The book itself is mainly blank, but it has some writing. English. Backwards. Other stuff that looks hieroglyphic. Whatever help would be appreciated. Story number nine, my mom's weird bus stop experience. A few years back, my mom was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's cousins and their kids. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she'd experienced waiting for the bus. We come from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mom, although slightly skeptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors have passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events of her own. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, suddenly she saw movement from the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three youths. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all, as the shops are a regular meeting place for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd with these young people. Mom said that they were dressed up in the period of the 70s when my mom was a young teenager. People were milling all about around them, very near them, but no one was acknowledging them, their existence totally overlooking their presence, as if they were invisible to the passers-by. Mom was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious youths had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop, as she thought they might have gone in. She waited until her bus came, 20 minutes, but they didn't come out. There was nowhere else that they could have gone in the time that my mom wasn't watching them. Mom said the most unsettling thing about it was the normality of the three figures and the fact that she was apparently the only one to see that they were even there. think I might have had a visit. So I'd like to share something that happened to me when I was about 9 or 10 years old, and I'm 26 now. 
So to set the context, I was back in England living with my family in an old Victorian house with my sisters and my mom. Just us girls, and I loved the house. I never felt spooked or whatever in it. But one night, I was in bed ready to sleep, and all of a sudden my bed cover went perfectly neat and flat, like no bumps, creases, nothing whatsoever. And then loads of symbols started to appear fast. I can recall vaguely what they were. It is really hard to explain. When I try to rethink it through, I get all uncomfortable and I kind of feel sick if I concentrate on what I saw. So then it all stopped suddenly and I felt a weight on my feet as if someone was sitting down on my bed with me. So I was petrified and not moving, like as if I were stuck, not able to even shout. I then found myself surrounded by a bright light and I had all these people leaning over me. The way I explain it is, you know when you're getting ready, maybe for an operation, and that you're in the operating room and everyone's waiting for you to fall asleep and start the actual operation? They're all there, you know, looking down at you, exactly like that. Well, this was too much for me and I leapt from the bed and jumped down the stairs. Four by four, ran from the house screaming, they're going to get me. My mom grabbed me before I could get into the road and I can't really remember what happened after that. I was talking about her with this yesterday and she actually told me that this went on for two or three nights before actually stopping. The State Hospital slash The Hippie Tree this happened the day school got out in 2023. Me and my buddy Corey had made plans to go to two local haunted places in our beautiful Michigan town. One is called the Hippie Tree. It's a tree in the woods in our city, Traverse City. You can look up pictures if you like. It's a fallen tree that had graffiti painted all over the years. There's been many suicides and it's alleged that it's haunted. Despite its story, it's actually really cool. Google describes it as a nexus for the unquiet spirits of those that once inhabited the hospital. Number two is the state hospital itself. It's nothing special, just a local abandoned hospital. Pretty sure it's been a few things, but the last time it was a mental hospital. Anyways, if you want to see what it looks like, just search up Traverse City State Hospital. To start the story, we were in Corey's basement and it was around 9 p.m. when we went to the hippie tree to hang out and smoke the stuff we bought. After about 15 minutes of just chilling at the tree, the sun was setting, and we started our walk from the hippie tree to the hospital, which is probably about five minutes. During our walk, Corey kept saying that he felt something, like we weren't alone, and he never lost that feeling that whole time. Nothing really happened at the hospital, so I'll skip through that and move on to when we got back to Corey's house. We were in his basement watching Simpsons and getting high off our asses, when out of the corner of the dark room we both saw a face peer out from the stairwell. I have no idea what to make of this, but Corey believes that we brought a spirit back from the hippie tree that night. The Heavy Pillow I remember being 15 years old. I never really believed in ghosts or anything, and I thought everything was just a wild coincidence. I was a skeptic, to say the least. One night it was me, my girlfriend at the time, and a friend all in my room at night and early morning. My girlfriend always slept with the pillow between her feet. Don't know why, but that was just her. So this night, my buddy was on the top bunk while my girlfriend was on the lower one with me, and she felt something heavy on her legs right where the pillow was, and for some reason all of us were just kind of freaked out. My buddy comes down, and I go to the corner of my bed with my girlfriend. My buddy just goes to the other corner, grabs the pillow that was between her feet, and places it near the edge of the bed, and suddenly says, If there's anything in this room, sit down on the pillow. Me being me at the time, didn't believe a damn thing and just kept my cool. It was basically saying everybody's acting ridiculous while simultaneously looking at the pillow. 
Literally a few seconds later, there's a butt print going down on the pillow in front of all three of us. And at that point, my body felt cold. I was too afraid to scream or do anything. My girlfriend was beyond scared, and my friend just began to cry. None of us knew what to do, and we ran out of my room to the outside yard and just spoke about what we saw to make sure that we weren't all going crazy. I'm 31 now, and I'll never forget that day. Although that was my first encounter, I've had plenty directly after. And just speaking about it gives me goosebumps and still scares me and makes me feel uneasy. I felt compelled to just let it out, hoping it'd give me a moment's peace. Past Life Dreams I tend to have dreams where I feel strongly connected to one of the characters in the dream. All these dreams involve past life events. I recall a dream where I was just a small girl in an Indian village. I had the feelings that maybe it was back centuries ago. I had a dream where I was traveling along a river. Suddenly, we were ambushed and I was shot in the chest with an arrow. I felt myself rising up quickly and looked down to see the boat getting smaller and smaller. As I rose up, I saw the landscape laid out below me. It was a great plain with a forest in all directions as far as I could see. I had the feeling it was Russia, but I'm not sure when. I remember one where a man on board a sailing ship dressed in the style of an 18th century. Another dream was me and a lady friend walking along the southern coast of England, above the white cliffs of Dover. I had the feeling that this was in the early 19th century. I had a very odd dream a few years ago where I was a soldier making my way through a sewage system. I was surrounded with bodies floating in the water, which came up to my knees. I had no fucking feeling of fear or even revulsion during the dream. It was just a matter of pushing the floating bodies out of the way so I could get through to safety. I think these dreams might all be connected to past lives that I've had. That's the only way I can explain why I feel so connected to the individuals in the dreams. I've had a number of other dreams of this type, but that'll do for now. That'll do. Anyone else visited by shadow figures not attributed to sleep paralysis? Starting when I was 19, up until my late 20s, I would be pulled from a deep sleep to find what appeared to be a humanoid standing above me at the side of my bed. It was completely black. Think of a void, and that's the color, or lack thereof. And it would, it or they, or whatever, it would be there. It happened multiple times over the course of a decade. A lot of times I would just jump into flight mode, my heart racing, and throw my blanket at it, thinking it was an intruder, that the blanket would distract them long enough for me to get the upper hand. But every time I threw the blanket, it would simply flop to the ground. I remember every time I saw it again, and I scooted back in bed until I was practically sitting on my ex-significant other's head. She was pissed off at that. After each experience, I would lay in bed until I calmed down and then sleep the rest of the night. I've also seen a swirling mass of shadows on the floor one night after waking up, but I chalked that up to a friend telling me about how he experienced that and my brain tricking me. This happened in different dorms and houses and apartments and states, so I don't know really what was happening. It hasn't happened in quite some time, which I'm thankful for. I also remember my friend from high school who has roots in Southeast Asia telling me that when spirits come to you at night, if they're at your bedside, they're just visiting. But if they're at the top of you, it's bad news bears. Luckily, I've never experienced the latter. I've always been attuned to supernatural stuff, and so that's how I explain it to myself. This is going to sound really dumb. 
I'm currently house or cat sitting for a friend who had to go out of town for a family emergency. She asked me as I often spend time at her place and her cat's comfortable with me. When she told me I was going to be a few days, I packed a bag. It wasn't much, just a change of clothes and toiletries that included my toothbrush and a bottle of Listerine mouthwash. On the night I arrived, I put all my stuff away, my toothbrush and the mouthwash, I put on top of the bathroom cabinet, out of reach of her cat. Before I went to bed, I remember using the mouthwash. I poured some into the cap, knocked it back, and put the cap back on and put the bottle atop the cabinet. I rinsed, turned off all the lights in the place, made sure that the cat was okay, and then went to bed. Next morning, I wake up around 8 to feed the cat. And as I'm walking past the bathroom, I notice the Listerine is missing from atop the cabinet. My first thought was that the cat might have leapt up during the night and knocked it off. But scanning the bathroom floor revealed that this wasn't the case. I searched around the house thinking maybe I'd randomly placed it somewhere else without realizing, but no. The bottle has completely disappeared into the ether. I'm going home tomorrow and I'm thinking about maybe not telling my friend about it. How am I going to say I've lost an almost full bottle of mouthwash in your house? I spoke to a mutual friend of ours about it, and she said that she always found this house to be creepy and on one occasion her and her friend heard a voice upstairs. So my question is this, if ghosts are real, do they do this kind of thing? If so, where the heck would they stash a bottle of mouthwash? Story number 11, Bat Bear. Bat Bear was my childhood imaginary friend. He was a small bear-type creature the size of a six-year-old, with long bat ears dressed in a red jumper and blue dungarees with gold buttons. He was with me from the age of three to nine, and he was what my grandma thought to be a puka, pronounced puka. It's spelled P-U-C apostrophe A, however. The puka is a fae, a fairy, and a creature that's a shapeshifter, but it appears as a horse, a goat, or a dog, or a cat, a raven, maybe a rabbit, and most commonly a hare. It was believed that in the rural areas of old Ireland, they could bring ill or good fortune to the farms of hamlets that they haunted. Bat Bear never told me to do bad things, and never did anything creepy or crazy. If anything, he made me want to behave. When I got cross, naughty, or said something, he tried to calm me down and always led me to amend my behavior. Bat Bear wasn't good, nor was he bad, he just existed. He used to curl up at the edge of my bed to sleep, sit beside me on the floor as I played, and sat beside me when I was in my wheelchair and we read together. He was around for six years, and then he was gone as suddenly as he arrived. My grandma used to say that pukas were wild and Bat Bear was wild. Looking back at him now, I personally think that he really was a puka, a generous one. And I believe that Gran saw him too. I still like to think that he was there when I needed him. Double Mirror Reflection We have a full-length mirror in our bedroom that my wife will sit in front of when she's getting ready to go out. She sits down and puts on her makeup and sometimes listens to music. It's angled in such a way that I can see her reflection in our bathroom mirror as I come out of the shower. I see the reflection in the bathroom mirror of the reflection of the full-length mirror, if that makes sense. A couple of years ago, we were getting ready to go out, and I forgot a towel. I knew that she had washed all of the towels, and I forgot to pull one out of the dryer before getting in my shower. So when my shower was done, I pulled back the shower curtain and saw her in the reflection, or the reflection's reflection that I was just describing. Babe, can you get me a towel? Now her back is to the bathroom, but I can see her look up into the mirror and just stare at me. Doesn't say anything, just a blank stare. Babe? Nothing. No response but at that weird stare. 
I figured she was mad that I didn't grab a towel, so I walk out of the bathroom naked and wet and head downstairs to our first laundry room. It's on the other side of the kitchen. As I cross into the laundry room, I literally bump into my wife coming out of the laundry, totally scared the shit out of me. Why are you running through the house naked? I would have got you a towel. I can't remember my exact words, but it was something along the lines of, I didn't think you heard me. So I walked slowly back upstairs and slowly peered into the bedroom, half expecting some ghost to jump out at me, but there was nothing. No one in front of the mirror and no one in the bathroom. Not too sure how to feel about this. Myself and my partner were chilling together in our room. I was playing some PS5 whilst she was replying to voice notes. Then suddenly, we both hear a really loud booming TV sound coming through the wall. Initially, for about an hour, we thought it was our neighbors. However, I then went to grab a snack from downstairs and the sound became much louder. And I realized the sound was coming from inside the house. More specifically, in my mom's room. Trouble is, my mom hasn't been home for a few weeks as she's been away looking after a family member. And we're the only ones in the house. So essentially, the TV turned on, changed volume, and changed channel on its own. I should mention, it only changed channel when I walked into the room. Also, as I'm writing this, I heard a massive bang directly below us, which was loud enough to make me jump out of my skin. I've gone downstairs and investigated every inch of the house, and there's no one here. I even checked the shed outside. The only thing of note that I found was pliers outside on the back door. However, these belong to us. I checked out the front as I expected there maybe to be somebody there, but nobody. In terms of the TV, it's pretty old. It's not capable of an internet connection and the remote has to be directly pointed at it in order to operate the TV, which it wasn't when we found on my mom's pillow. I can only assume the TV's potentially becoming faulty in its old age, but still, it's pretty eerie. Friendly Entity tried to warn us of a fire. As a child, I lived with my parents and three other women who were renting a room in our flat. The building had only a ground floor and first floor, and we lived on a ladder. In the flat directly below us lived a married couple, and the husband's brother was staying over the night before the fire. I just want to mention all of this because I feel it would help the story make more sense. So the night before the fire, two of the women living with us stayed up past midnight playing cards on their bed. They said that they had felt something poking their bed from underneath. At first, they dismissed it, thinking one was trying to prank the other. But it kept happening until they realized it was neither of them doing it. They decided to just ignore it and go to bed since they have had previous experiences in the flat. But nothing that ever harmed them. Meanwhile, downstairs... The couple and the husband's brother were already in bed. The brother slept in the main bedroom that had a window facing the back of the building where the fire spread to first. He got up and complained to the couple that his bed was being shaken by something and he couldn't sleep as he was obviously freaked out. The next morning the fire happened and only our flat and the flat below us were damaged. None of the other neighbors had any damage from the fire and none of them experienced anything weird the previous night. It was also while we waited for the firefighters that the couple and the two women told my mother what they had experienced. My family likes to think that it was maybe an entity living in our home trying to warn us, since we already knew that it was living with us for the few years by then. And although it's shown itself a few times, it never did anything like that prior to that night. Is this something I should worry about? Basically, one day I was just sitting at home chilling in my bedroom watching YouTube. 
Then I needed to use the toilet, so I opened my door, and the minute I stepped into the hallway, I felt this deep chill, as if someone poured something cold onto my back. I stood in the hallway motionless, and my insides told me I needed to run back into my room, so that's exactly what I did. I sat in my room completely still, waiting for the feeling to go away. It eventually went away sometime around 12 p.m., Can someone please tell me what happened and if I should worry about it? Update. I was sitting in my house again reading a comic, and then I got up from the couch and began to go upstairs, as that was where my bedroom was, when I heard my mom call out my name and told me to come upstairs, except her voice sounded wrong in a way that I can't explain. I almost did, but then I remembered my mom had died when I was three. With the most calm voice I could really make, I said, no, and left the house. She started screaming and yelling the phrase, get upstairs, it's too hot. About three times before, she subtly started calling my name again. I'm currently sitting outside at a park in my complex. It doesn't even feel like my complex. There's multiple things different about it. For example, there are no trees at all. There's no buildings and there's more storm drains than there were supposed to be. I want to move away, but I'm only a minor, and I don't think my father would believe me if I told him this story. What should I do? Haunted After Deployment This story happened to me back in 2008. I was a soldier in the U.S. Army and I had just returned from my first deployment to Iraq. My mom had passed away during the tour, and I was in the process of a divorce, but the unit still made me having a housing off post. I mention these parts because they're relevant to the incident. I was living in an apartment alone, and always had what felt like an irrational fear of the bedroom where I kept my bed. Due to this, I usually slept in the living room on the futon. So... One night, I finally decided to sleep in the bed. Turned out that fear was more rational than I thought it seemed. Couldn't fall asleep, and then I remember falling out of the bed. But something cushioned my head. Instinctively, I asked if it was my mom. I knew it wasn't here when I felt pressure on my throat and struggled to breathe. Or rather, I knew it wasn't her. I said, nope and I attempted to flee, only to be yanked backwards hard, and next thing I remember sitting upright in my bed, thinking it was a nightmare. I took a breath and laid back, noticing it was around three or four in the morning, and what I saw next made me freeze, as I saw a dark figure meld into the wall. Needless to say, never slept there again, and I moved out soon after. I felt pretty sore, so I'm unsure if the attack was a nightmare caused by the figure or if I blacked out and I was just yanked back into the bed somehow. I would see the figure again when I lived in other places through the years, but usually only when I was living alone and during very stressful times. Dream Visits My granddad was my best friend. And when my nan passed away, I promised him that I wouldn't let him be lonely, and I'd like to think that I was a pretty good granddaughter. I was lucky enough to have him in my life until I was 27. As I got older, we got closer and closer, so it completely destroyed me when he died. I was five minutes too late at the hospice and missed him last moment, but I'll never forget laying on the bed with him and hugging him when I did get there. My heart really did break that day. I had a very difficult time coming to terms with his passing, constantly telling my then fiance that I just want one more hug, one more hello mate, one more anything. One dream I dreamt that I was going to go use the bathroom downstairs, and as I walked into the dining room, Granddad was just standing in the doorway. I ran toward him sobbing, and he simply said, no. I said, but I just want a hug, and he said, If you hug me now, you'll always want another one. And you can't have any more. I stood there crying, telling him how much I needed him, 
And he just smiled that gorgeous, cheeky smile of his, and I woke up. It felt and still feels so real. I'm so certain that he visited me, and it happened again four years ago. I had just given birth to my son, and I dreamt that there was a knock on the door. I opened it, and there was my granddad, wearing his familiar clothes and leaning on his walking stick. I just stood in shock while he said, Okay, Sam, let me see the boy. Dream about deceased best friend. You can always call me. Nine years ago, I lost a lifelong best friend to suicide. The years since have been difficult, but over time, I've made peace with it, and I've been doing all right. During the first few years following his passing, I had several very vivid dreams of him. While they could very well have been a product of mourning, they always felt more meaningful. I was always left feeling connected and reassured by them. About two weeks ago, I realized that I haven't had a dream like this in many years. It made me sad, but it seemed to make sense. His passing is no longer the main focus of my life, and still, I wondered if he was still out there, somewhere. A week goes by and I don't give the dreams another thought. Then it happened. I dreamt he was back as though he never left. I hugged him and told him how much I missed him. He said it was great to see me too, but that he's soon having to go away again. I begged him not to go, because that meant he would never come back. He told me, You know how to get a hold of me. Call me when you want to talk. I can't just call you, I replied. You won't be in this world anymore. He firmly replied, Just call me. You can always call me. I'll answer. And with that, I woke up both heartbroken and oddly comforted. I felt like I finally got to visit him again after all these years. Perhaps it was just a dream, but to me, it felt like much more. We were staying in the basement of an extended family member I hadn't met before, so I was already on edge being in a new place. Well, I woke up from a nightmare, the kind that sticks with you, when I woke up to an all-too-familiar feeling of being unable to move. I was able to move my head a bit, and upon waking, I noticed a figure about the size of a taller, bulky dude. There was no noise, but I watched it steadily move across the room from one corner to the next. We were sharing the room with my sister-in-law and her boyfriend, so I just figured it was her leaving. They had to head out around 5 a.m., so I thought nothing of it. What did strike me, after a minute after seeing this, was that I hadn't heard them leave. The house is a pre-manufactured one from the 70s. The basement ceiling is exposed, and it's 100% impossible for anybody to walk up the stairs and exit the house without hearing it. So I figured he'd gone to the bathroom, which is in the direction that I saw the figure moving. By this time, I could move my body, and upon positioning myself so I could see the bathroom, it was clear that no one was there. It was creepy, but what really did it for me is that when my wife, whom was laying on her side facing towards the bathroom, we saw the exact same thing. She said it went into the bathroom and never reappeared. So yeah, we're both a little freaked out. I'm naturally a skeptical person. And I've always felt comfort in knowing that my experiences were in my mind. But now, I'm starting to wonder if there isn't more to it all. Night's Fairy Ghost Later in the evening, at around 7.30 one night, a buddy and I were bored, so we decided to go to Night's Ferry, California. Knight's Ferry is an old preserved small town on a river for tourists to whitewater raft or explore the old bridge and brick buildings, which have bars on all the entrances and windows for obvious reasons. Since it was after dark, a small village was all ours to wander and explore as we pleased. We did this for about half an hour. Our 
footsteps echoing off the looming dark old brick factories and stores. My buddy realized that he forgot his phone in his truck and left me near the old bridge while he went to go check for it or whatever. About ten minutes later, I was just starting to wonder where the heck he was when he suddenly came jogging up to me, pale-faced. Through his huffing and puffing, he managed to get out that we had to leave because something had spooked the shit out of him. He waited to tell me until we were back to his truck and on our way out of there, he told me that he had seen a shadow of a shape of a man with glowing yellow eyes standing in the doorway on the other side of the bars in one of the main buildings. He said that when he lit up his flashlight, he could see right through it. Of course, I made him turn right the hell around so that way I could go check it out. When we got back there, he absolutely refused to get out of the truck. So I grabbed his flashlight and went alone back to the building to check it out. I thought I heard a couple of strange sounds and I definitely got chills and an eerie feeling. But unfortunately, I didn't see anything. Two examples of my many weird experiences. As a kid, I would see things that might have been spirit guardians, angels, or demons, or ghosts, who knows. Random people or creatures seemed to visit me. Some only came at night, but plenty came during the day. I had a huge crush on a classmate of mine, this cute guy named Kevin. He wouldn't say much, but he'd wave at me sometimes and ask me to play with him. One night I dreamt that he was hit by a train, and certain organs were missing. I went to school and wanted to tell him about it, but he didn't show up. In fact, I never saw him again. But when I asked him about him, neither my classmates nor my teacher knew who I was talking about. For the next thing, I'd like to add that I was born with some version of synesthesia, which causes me to see colors around every living thing. It allows me to kind of see emotions. Sounds weird, right? Well, it is. But what's weirder to me are the visuals that aren't linked to anything living. A guy I knew once took me to the park near his house. I'd never been there before and I didn't know this guy very well yet. I told him about this stuff and he asked me if I saw anything in the park. I pointed out four spots in the park. Two were spots that were violent crimes and they were taking place there. One was the spot where the emergency helicopter always lands, and the last was a spot on a low bridge. That's where he told me and his sister had fallen from the bridge and drowned. I know it's nothing too crazy, but it was the point where I started to believe in ghosts, and now I look back differently at weird experiences I had before that. About one and a half years ago, home alone and no pets at the time. Nice setup for a ghost, you know. And no, it wasn't 3 a.m., it was around 8 p.m. if I remember correctly. I was sitting in my room, watching a movie with the door to my room closed, as always. Suddenly I hear the sound of a door handle being violently pushed down. Then I can already see the door slamming open into the wall. After a second of shock thought my mom or sister were home or something like that, so I call out for them. But I don't hear anything, so I look for them. But after a few minutes, I realize that they aren't even home yet, and the door is still locked. So I looked out of the window to see if they were maybe playing a prank on me. But no car in sight. I checked everything that somehow could have caused the door handle to be pushed down and slammed open. But nothing is lying on the ground next to the bookshelf nor are there any windows open. So it couldn't be explained how the fuck the door was slammed open after that. I am and always have been a huge skeptic. But that's the one experience I was never able to explain. If some of you have any ideas of how this could have happened, I would be thankful, since believing in ghosts didn't exactly make my fears disappear. Ha! 
hat man, window, and curtain appear as shadow in TV. So this just happened tonight. I can't find an explanation anywhere. My fiancé and I were watching TV and shadow started appearing in the TV screen. At first, nothing distinguishable. It just looked like a backlight going out. Eventually, it's a very obvious silhouette of a person. I paused the TV at a scene where the screen was totally black. In the TV, there's a shadow image of a human from the waist up, wearing a fedora. You can see the coach behind them as if they're sitting on it. To their right is our window, and the window curtain. In the shadow, the curtain is pulled all the way to one side. Our curtain is currently drawn, closed. I tried changing what we were watching, but it remained. Both of us saw the exact same thing, so this wasn't one of us seeing stuff. I then turned off the TV, turned it back on, and the image was gone. But the Roku was flickering between the menu and the TV, showing no signal. I restarted the Roku, then everything went back to normal. I saw the cloaked shadow person once as a child, but that was over 30 years ago and in a different house. She never has. The difference here that's freaking me out is I didn't see them directly, but as a burned out blacklight type image in the TV screen that disappeared after I power cycled the TV in Roku. Reading about what I was sure was a dream, a flying head wreathed in flame. One night when I was young, about ten years old, I awoke to notice I was being watched through my window by what appeared to be an old man's face. I remember being paralyzed with fear and staring at it and also pretending to be asleep. It looked like an old white man's face angrily staring at me, but I also remember thinking maybe it's frost. Now here's where it gets weird. After staring in fear for what seemed like forever, it just locked eyes. And I locked eyes with this thing. I finally mustered the courage to jump up and run to my mom's room. I burst in there and remember disturbing her. And I got into her bed and she went downstairs for something and I can't really remember. Next thing I do remember is my head rising from the foot of the bed and then the whole room was on fire. The fire started slowly as just around the head and then completely surrounding the bed. It spoke a bunch of horrific words for a moment, and then when my mom came back in the room, the whole scene vanished. I only post this now because I've actually seen so many similar accounts on here of this thing. Anyone else have this thing show up? I've also had a life of lucid dreaming and some bouts of sleep paralysis. I can certainly feel things on people sometimes. When someone is really negative, I can feel it when they enter a room like a dark cloud billowing out with them. Owl Shadow Figure The other night, I was getting ready to go to bed. Even though I wasn't really tired... I had to get up early for work, so I gently tried to force myself to sleep. I set my alarm for the next morning and closed my eyes. After 30 seconds of having my eyes closed, I could vividly see and picture my kitchen. I often have pre-dreams. Dreams when I'm still conscious before I'm about to fall asleep. But they're never this vividly clear. Standing in my kitchen was this shadow figure. The shadow figure was looking toward my kitchen sink with its hands held out in front of its body. The shadow figure was standing pretty still, but after looking at him for a few seconds, he turned his head towards me. The figure had a large, dark, ominous owl head attached to its human-looking body. Since I was still conscious, and now slightly unsettled, I opened my eyes. After trying to analyze what I just saw... I tried to re-enter this pre-dream to try to investigate why the shadow figures in my home. But I was unsuccessful. I believe that my home has a few spirits, but I've never encountered one like this before. I tried to research if anyone else has documented seeing an owl shadow figure, but I can't seem to find anything. 
I discovered that there is an owl deity called Moloch, whom practices child sacrifice, but the illustrations and descriptions have no resemblance of what I saw. Bad memory or something more? So to start this off, I always chalked this up to maybe being a really bad dream, until I asked my older brother about it, and he remembered this incident too. I was probably four or five at this time, him being a year older. But anyway, we were play fighting in the room that we shared at the time. While I was running away, I ran to jump on the bed, but just before I hopped onto the bed, I felt someone grab my feet and pull me underneath. So from here, the story gets blurry, because what I experienced versus what he saw were two different things. He seen me get pulled underneath the bed, where he pulled me back out. He said I looked unnatural in the way that I fell in. What I remember was not right. I found myself in a dark room, almost medieval looking, but everything was huge, like a room for giants or something. There were two weird looking people speaking a language I still haven't heard to this day. When I noticed that the room I woke up in was my regular room on my bed with my brother asleep. From that day on, I would wake up and get pulled under by my feet. It happened so much that I resorted to jumping off the bed for almost a year. It finally stopped altogether and never happened since. I don't know what to make of it. Bad memory or just a nightmare? It stopped after that, but my memory was maybe messing with me. Or was it something more? Ghost Called Cousin by Name This incident happened a few years ago. Let me explain the backstory, which might be the reason for what happened. So my mom's brother, along with his wife and two children, moved into a rented house a few years ago, and they've already moved out because of obvious reasons. Someone had died in that house of unknown reason a few months back, and they moved in, and one of my uncle's friends died of cardiac arrest while asleep a month after that. So that day, well actually the night, me and my two cousins were playing video games late night in the same room my uncle's friend died in, and in the same bed. The lights were turned off, and it was around 12 a.m. when I heard someone say, Rachel. The voice sounded like a middle-aged male and had a serious tone to it. That's my cousin's name, and I thought I was hallucinating as I was sleepy, but then I see both of my cousins looking at each other. Both of them heard the voice as well. Rachel went to the door and to the backyard and didn't see anybody. We told our parents about this, and the next time, they didn't believe us either. A few months later, my cousin heard scary female voices, footsteps and thuds to the door and window while he was home alone. I've always been curious about this, and finally found the subreddit where apparently I could find answers. My ghosts hate my morning alarms. So I've been semi-aware of something, quote-unquote, in my house for a little time now. Usually just taps here and there, noises throughout the house, strange feelings, and something setting off my motion detector when nobody's home. Lately, though, I've discovered that whatever is in my house doesn't like my alarms going off in the morning. The first experience was with maybe a... Well, I guess it was a couple weeks ago. My alarm had been going off in the morning, but I hadn't woken up properly until I heard an irritated voice say my name as if to wake me up because my alarms weren't doing the job. The second time, same thing again. Alarms going off, but I wasn't getting up. And then I heard something hard fall on the floor in my bedroom. I got up to investigate, but nothing was on the floor at all. The latest one was the other morning. I'd snoozed my arms a few times because, or I guess, I guess they attended to write alarms. I snoozed my alarms a few times because I couldn't be bothered to get up. And when I finally did wake up properly, 
I realized that I hadn't heard any more alarms. I went to grab my phone, only to discover it had been taken off charge and thrown across the room, too far away to just have vibrated off the side table. This happened when I asked. I really feel that I do have some type of gift, or maybe it's a curse. My daughter Delilah, who's 23 years old, has always had trouble sleeping in the dark to this very day. I believe her sixth sense, is what I call it, is much stronger than I allow mine to be. Previous to moving into this home that we now live in, we lived just a few miles away in another home. At the time, I believe she was a senior or junior in high school, and we were talking in her room. I remember it was afternoon, still daylight outside. Delilah was telling me that her light in the bedroom on the ceiling at times is flickering, and she says it spooks her out. So I decided to really ask a question, but I wasn't really expecting for anything to happen because, frankly, I feel like I'm in a bit of denial when it comes to my senses. So out loud I asked there's anyone in this room with us to make the lights flicker twice. And what do you know? The light flickered twice. I can't tell you how fast my daughter and I ran out of that room. And of course, to this day, I'm stuck in between or in the middle thinking maybe it was just a coincidence. Or maybe not. loud crashes and scratching in the night. For the past week and a half, my fiancé and I have been hearing weird noises at night. They always happen around 3 or 4 a.m., and always in the same order. There's a loud crashing noise from the kitchen that sounds like plates crashing on the ground. Next is what sounds like our dryer or washer machine door slamming shut. Finally, we hear scratching noises around our room, my fiancé has claimed that she's heard footsteps, but I haven't heard them yet. I live on the third floor apartment with no one above us, but we have someone to our side. There looks to be a crawl space slash attic area above us, so maybe it's rodents doing the scratching and my neighbors slamming doors, but I can't justify the noise of plates crashing. Additionally, we're dog-sitting and the dog ran out of the room early in the night barking and heading for the front door. I want to say that it was maybe a neighbor leaving or coming home. However, the dog was growling once we got to him, and we got him to lay on the bed until we got up for the day. Ghost in Math Class This happened when I was in 8th grade. I was sitting in my math classroom, silently doing my homework. Keep in mind that my teacher had just yelled at the class, so absolutely no one was talking and no one was allowed to get up from their seats, no matter what. Strict teacher. As I was working on my math homework, and I felt a rather hard double tap on my left shoulder, I turned my head. No one was there. I sat in the back left corner, so no one could tap me from my left. The person who sat to my right was absent that day, and the person in front of me couldn't have tapped my shoulder. I would have seen them, and plus, they weren't allowed to get up from their desk. The teacher was also at their desk, so it couldn't have been them either. Before this experience, I didn't per se not believe in ghosts, but I was skeptical. But now that I've had an experience where literally no logical answer could be had, I most definitely do. Story number three. Me and my wife shared an experience, and now I'm really intrigued. I've dealt with sleep paralysis and EHS since I was a little kid. I won't delve too deeply into this, but it's not uncommon for me to either feel the beginnings of SP, which is the inability to move, or wake up seeing shadow people. I've maybe had three experiences in the past couple of years, so it's definitely become less frequent than when I was young. Honestly, it scared the shit out of me as a kid, and it still does sometimes. 
but I've grown almost used to it, and I figured it's all in my mind and not quote-unquote real. However, a couple of nights ago, my wife and I were visiting her family for Thanksgiving in Kansas. It's a tiny town of like 1,500 people, and also very quiet. Story number seven, green hair. We were about eight or nine the day mom took Elle and I over to Heath. It was hot and bright in the middle of the summer, and we'd been collecting natural materials to make a collage when we got home, and mom's backpack was full of stray feathers, wild grasses, leaves, and twigs, and we were on our way home when grandma was making a cheese flan and salad for dinner. As we were all very hot and slightly tired, Mom had decided that we would wade through the river instead of going back over the hills the way that we had come. The thought of pushing my tiny wheelchair through the muddy-bottomed, weed-tangled river never seemed to faze my mom. She was healthy, fit 26 years old, 